alhamdulillah, as we uh, enter into a new year, at least on the uh, Gregorian calendar, we are inshallah starting a new class. Um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, I see some new faces here, alhamdulillah, and it's so good to see everybody. We're going to be focusing this class. It's going to be about our the journey of the human soul from pre what we would call the the first stage of our life all the way until the afterlife. And so we're going to be covering a text um, known as the Lives of Man by Imam Abdullah bin Ali al Haddad. We'll do our best to summarize the text. We're not going to go through line by line. The intention, inshallah, is going to be to complete the class uh, right before Ramadan. So that'll be about nine or ten sessions, inshallah. Um, and then we'll complete this topic right before the month of Ramadan. So to start off with context um, and why this topic is really critical in the time that we live in. In order for us to know why we're here and where we're going, it's first important for us to know where we came from. And Allah has defined that very, very clearly in his noble book in the Quran al-Kareem. And his Prophet وسلم, has explained that to the human being. This gives the human being some focus and some purpose in life and it allows that purpose that informs our daily actions and informs what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to move towards that purpose. Absent any context of where we came from and understanding of where we're going, the human being loses their sense of purpose. And then we just become wandering people. Uh, and this is exactly the time that we're living in, where the vast majority of Western society has forgotten about their purpose in life. Most people don't believe in the afterlife anymore. There's no understanding of accountability for the actions that we have. There's no understanding of reckoning for what we do in this life. And so then what ends up happening is everybody just does whatever they want. And it becomes a life of fun, games, play, and a lot of injustice and corruption, as we're seeing now, and we've been talking about it, and we'll continue to talk about it, inshallah, all of us should keep our brothers and sisters in, in Gaza, and the West Bank, and Philistine in general, in our intention, um, as we are uh, having the, the, the blessing and really the luxury of being able to gather together in safety and in, in peace. And so when we lose that purpose, this wandering starts. And that's why in the West you have statements like, do whatever you want because you only live once. When in our understanding that that's not at all the case, you don't only live once, you actually live many multiple times and this life is a very short life as we'll be discussing. The life of the dunya is in the grand scheme of things a very small, small, small percentage of dot in the ultimate life that Allah has planned for the human being. Because the human being is actually created for eternal existence not for a limited existence in this life, meaning meaning that we will at some point with Allah's, uh, uh, that if Allah gives us this ability, have the chance to go into one of two places eternally. And inshallah is the Jannah and not the Hellfire, but that is the choice that the human being has based on the consequences of what they do in this life. But if we think that this is the only life I have, uh, so I should have all the quote-unquote fun that I want. I should bask and just enjoy all my desires, and then I can do whatever I want and there's not going to be any accountability. Then you get the situation that you have in Western society right now, where the concept of the afterlife has disappeared. The small um, amounts of, that are left with, let's say, Christian society and kind of some of the Christian thought that still exists, there's a carte blanche to do whatever you want because the, the belief is that Jesus died for your sins, and so you don't have to have any accountability for your sins. So you're basically left, again, at the will of your own desires. This never used to be the way of the Muslim, ever. The Muslims had a defined purpose, and they internalized this purpose by understanding where they came from, by understanding where they came from. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover um, five stages that he covers in this text, uh, and we'll have one or two classes on each of the stages, inshallah. The first is the life before we were born. There was an entire life that was lived before the human being was born. This is the day, and we'll, that's what we'll focus on for today's topic, the time in which Allah asked every human being, rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And every human being said, Alu bala. This is from the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf. So it's mentioned very specifically that every human being gave this covenant to Allah and promised him and told him, yes, you are our Lord. And they acknowledged it. This acknowledgement happened. 
His life was before we even came into existence. And just like we don't remember the life in the womb, we don't remember it. But that was, that was a period of time before we were uh, born. There was a life in the womb. And so you, you don't have to remember everything for it to have happened. For it to have happened. Um, the second is the life that we're in right now, which is the dunya. This is the small slice of reality, he says, that we're most familiar with. Just a small amount of reality. Because we live it day to day and we see it. The person who thinks this life is it, that this dunya is the only thing, they are ultimately going to lose out in, in, eternal, in the eternal race for, um, uh, for divine forgiveness and in the eternal race for divine pleasure. They will ultimately lose out. This dunya, he divides, and we'll cover these, inshallah, in sections, into five different parts. So you have childhood, um, you have the age of youth, where discernment starts to happen, you have the age of maturity, third stage, you have the age of seniority, and you have the age of essentially decrepitude when someone is on their way out um, and by their by their age. And he's going to talk through what the requirements are for the human being in each stage. Meaning what the child gets to do is not the same as what the adult is responsible for. So if the child just wants to play, like my son is here right now, he's about a, month, a year and a half old, alhamdulillah, and all he wants to do is play. You know, at some point he'll be running around, he'll make noise, Please uh, pardon uh, the, any of the disruptions, but that's what the child does. They just want to play, they just want to hang out, they just want to eat. There's no sense of, and nor does there need to be, because this is what Allah created, it's what they're supposed to do at this age, that there's no sense of responsibility at that time. But as the human being gets older, as he'll talk through, and especially as they get toward more advanced ages, responsibility kicks in. And now someone's life can't just be about play and about fun and about in consuming and so on and so forth. It has to start to be a level of, 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 of responsibility towards the rights that Allah has and towards the rights that um, their fellow creation has. So this is the second um, uh, part of, of human life, is the dunya is divided into these five stages. And the third begins at the moment someone dies. So now we only got to two lives and there's three other lives that are left after you die after we die from this lit world. So the third begins after the moment someone passes away. And this is now where someone, the, the next dimension of things starts to open up for the human being. This is known as the, they enter into what's called the barzakh, the intermediary realm. This is a dimension that exists while we are existing right now, but the vast majority of people don't have access to it. It's not, see, you can't see it. Um, and uh, just like there are certain um, parts of uh, that, that you have to look under a microscope for you to see, you know, molecules, and then you have to look under a subatomic microscope for you to see certain things with that you can't see with your naked eye. There are other, there are other creations of Allah. There are other forces at play in the unseen realm that you and I can't see, and they they are not accessible to the vast majority of people. Sometimes when you're in the dream, when you're in a dream, you access things from this unseen, from these unseen realms that you may not be able to access in the seen realms, especially um, uh, that the, 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 the uh, human beings who are working towards themselves and are working on themselves spiritually, perhaps they'll see a little portion of this. The prophets, they have access to the unseen as Allah wishes for them to, while they're still in this world physically. And then anyone who has a portion of their inheritance, they'll have an access to this. But the core here is the third life is the barzakh, the intermediary realm. This is from the time you die to the life in the grave. The grave is not just this six foot by six foot box that someone lives in. It can actually be a lot smaller for some people if the punishment is there from Allah and that a lot of terrible things happen to that person in the grave. And then it can be very, very, very fast for others. Like a full jannah, a, 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 a door is open to paradise for them in their grave and they don't really have, it says though they see as far as the eye can see, that's how wide their grave would be for them. It's all happening though in the unseen, because if you go to their cover, if you go to their grave and visit them in the cemetery, you won't be able to see that, you and I will not be able to see that. But that's what they're experiencing. So this is again, this intermediary realm. Um, so we'll talk about, we'll talk here about what happens when someone dies in accordance with our faith and our understanding. Um, and then what can we do while we're still alive to prepare for that? And then what can we do to benefit those who have already passed away? Uh, so, you know, there's a certain form of charity one can give and put on, one can recite and others, and we'll, we'll talk about that. The fourth will be the life on the Day of Judgment. 
The day of judgment is, is, is an, it's an entire life in and of itself. When human beings are resurrected, and while the judgment is taking place, there's a life that they live. Allah says in the Quran, it is. How, does anyone know how long Allah says in the Quran that the day of judgment is? 50,000 years. 50,000 years. So if we live till 75, right, in this life, 50,000 years is. How many times is that? Can you figure that? Someone, someone who's calculator brain, let us know how how how, how many uh, times you'd have to live this life to reach fifty thousand years without using your iPhone calculator. Uh, just kidding. No, go ahead. Tell us though. So, so that's but that's fifty thousand. That's the day of judgment. For some, it will be shortened. For others, it will be lengthened. This is based on uh, what Allah wants to do with them and based on their taqwa. So the Prophet tells us that for some it will be like two light rakah, like somebody prays Salat al Isha, they pray two quick sunnah after, their day of judgment could go by for them like that. But it is an entire life because there's a whole, there's phases. There's the time where someone is gathered on the concourse, there's the time where the trumpet the trumpet will blast first, and there's all, then there's the time people are gathered on the concourse and they are, are awakened. Then there's the time where um, uh, that somebody is has to face the questioning from Allah. Then there's the scales that someone has to face the balancing on the scales. Then there is the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's many other events that will take place on the Day of Judgment. And so one, we would we'll talk about what those events are. And then lastly, the fifth life. This is the eternal life. Either Jahannam or Jannah. Either Hellfire or Heaven. This is where somebody is going to be placed. Um, and so these are the five lives that the human being that he breaks apart in Muhammad Haddad in this text. He breaks apart these five lives. Um, some could might you know break them out into a few more, um, but that's at minimum the amount that somebody lives. So why is it so critical, as we were just talking about, to discuss these lives that the human being has? Because if somebody can really tap into the knowledge of what they used to be and where they're going in the day to day we will have the direction of what we're marching towards. And this is the best thing that we can offer to Western society specifically, but really to the vast majority of humanity because people are lost right now. Everybody's looking for something, everybody's searching for something, and when most people are lost, they're empty, their heart is empty, and then we fill it with all sorts of random things. Somebody will try to fill it with drugs, another person will try to fill it with alcohol, someone will fill it with both, someone will fill it with their sexual desires, someone will fill it with just all consuming media all the time, someone so filling it, filling it, filling it, but it can't be filled by these things. It will continue to remain empty, and, and, and uh, those things will, will not actually help give the purpose that the human being has. The only purpose that can fill the heart of the human being, this empty cup you could say that someone has, is their faith, and is, their, is Allah at the end of the day. It's a real deep, deep faith in understanding what is the direction that we're supposed to be going in. That's the only thing. So when somebody talks about happiness and fulfillment, true happiness is divine, eternal happiness. When somebody attains this state, it's not temporary happiness. It's not like, this makes me happy right now. You'll see in the society we live in, similar to this concept of, you only live once. But we just talked about how many times do we live? Five times. So none of us should ever say YOLO or any of these phrases because they're not, they're just not true, they're false, right? But, but they're, they're a way to get the human being just caught up in desires. But just like that is a, is a, is a, is a concept, um, and, and somebody might have a very, very short-sighted focus to this life, there are people who when they understand how valuable the time is here, does anybody here work in finance or ever done like any investments before? All right, we have one, two, okay, two or three handful of people. So you'll, anyone who's ever invested any money, you'll know, okay, if I invest the right amount of money in the right investment, right, you can't, you don't just invest in whatever, you have to make sure you invest in something that actually makes sense for you to, to put your money behind. I will have a strong ROI or a strong return on my investment and I'll get what are called dividends later on. This life is the life to make the investment in the Akhirah. Every minute or day that someone uses wisely in this life pays significant dividends and a major ROI in their next life. And every day that somebody wastes, they are in significant loss in the next life. And the, the key is here, 
unlike in our dunya and in our money, we know okay, how much we have, and okay, you'll know, like, hey, if I have $20,000 in, in my bank account, let's say, somebody has $20,000 in their bank account, they'll know when that is going to run out. The problem is you don't know when your bank account of days is going to run out. We don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be tonight. It could be in a year. It could be in 35 years. It could be in 70 years. We don't know. Like, subhanAllah, just today, may Allah have mercy on him. My brother, uh, Imam in a masjid in New Jersey was, was shot at Fajr, at Fajr time while entering or leaving the masjid. Just, and, 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 and he, I, I don't know if he would have, right, if someone would have expected that, that while they're going to pray, and that's something that's going to happen. But inshallah, what a noble action that they were going to do while that took place. So you don't know, though, the life that you have to live. Nobody knows the amount of days that they have in their life. This is why when the days are numbered, the days have to be meaningful. And which is why we have to now get away, and hopefully this, this will be a reminder in this text, of the distractibility of the society that we live in. Where, we, where our days are not meaningful for the most part. The vast majority of people in the society we live in, the days are very just, we use phrases like, I gotta kill the time, I gotta pass the time. The believer doesn't kill time. The believer uses time to leverage, leverages time to do what they need to do to accomplish in life. But they don't just wanna pass the time, Netflix show after Netflix show, this thing after this thing, this game after this game, and it just keeps passing and passing. That's not the point. But this just, the, the, when the purpose is gone, the empty, vacuous, distractibility starts to enter. And so this, when someone knows their purpose, you just won't, you'll, you'll know it. You'll know, the feeling will hit inside that I have to use my time wisely. And someone has a set amount of time for leisure and everything else is with purpose, whether it's with family or taking care of their relatives or working or so on and so forth. But the intention and the, the, the purpose is there with that. But that has to be the case if we know where we're going. This is why the Messenger of Allah, he told us to remember death multiple times a day. And this is the, the third life, um, uh, the third life is, that, we'll, that we'll discuss is about this um, uh, remembering death and, and understanding what does death actually mean. But that, that, that takes a, um, a really thinking, not just intellectually, but spiritually. So if we could go to a janaza prayer, a funeral prayer, it may have no impact on us. That means that the heart is, has, is dying, spiritually is dying, because we're not thinking, hold on a second, I'm going to be laying down here one day, and they're going to be praying janaza on me. And so when am I, how am I going to do in that time? And when that's the case, all of the things that we care about, what you want to worry about is what you're going to look like on that day not what we look like and how we act and so on and so forth, this life. Meaning, spiritually, the, how luminous your heart is inside will be, how luminous your face will be, and how luminous someone's existence in the um, barzakh will be. That, that is the, the case. And how dark someone is in this life, dark, how dark their heart is, how rotten it is, will be then how the type of death they might have, as well as the... Um, uh, the way that they'll experience the barzakh and intermediary realm. So we ask Allah for always for husn al khatima, a good seal and a good ending, to use the second life that we've been given wisely. So with that, we'll get to the um, the first the first life as he describes, which is from creation, the time Allah created us until we were conceived, until we were in the wombs of our mothers. There's an entire life that we lived. So. The first is, Allah, Allah mentioned this in the Quran, Allah created Adam alayhi salam. He created Adam alayhi salam. And he created human beings from our father and our mother, uh, Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam and Sayyidina Hawa uh, alayhi salam. So, so these are the parents of the human beings, so we are Bani Adam. Now, there was a moment at which all of the souls, so everybody here, everybody in our families, Every, all of our friends, everybody we know, and everybody we don't know, anyone who was ever created, Allah took them out and He asked them to take a covenant. He brought all of the souls out and He asked them to take a covenant. And this is known as the Day of the Covenant, in which, um, and, and, and it's mentioned in a narration, this happened in a valley near Arafat. Arafat is in, in Mecca, far outside in the, in the Mecca area, um, where one goes for Hajj. So this actually happened in a physical place. and. 
Allah says in the Quran, when your Lord brought forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their seed, and made them testify of themselves, Allah am I not your Lord? Palu bala shahidna. Yes. Everybody said yes. We bear witness and we testify. And then Allah says that is that that so you should not say on the day of judgment, oh we, we didn't we were completely unaware of this. Because it's deep entrenched inside the soul of the human being. So on one hand, the spiritual path is one of remembering and uncovering and unwrapping what's inside of you already. It already exists deep down inside. But the more, this is why the heart is so important, the more the heart gets covered and covered and covered and layered and layered and veiled and veiled, the harder it will, the harder it will be to remember this pivotal purpose that already is lodged inside of the human being. The more the heart gets peeled, all these darknesses go away and all of the, the sins that we do that bring about the darknesses go away, the easier it will be now to remember this, this internal longing. And this is why some people, they have a deep longing for Allah. Deep longing for Allah. They wish to be with Allah. They wish to spend time with Allah. They wish to, they wish to connect to Allah. They wish to be at Allah's house. They wish to frequent the houses of Allah, the masajid of the houses of Allah. They wish to frequent the Kaaba, and so on and so forth. Because that longing exists. Why does it exist? And why does the human being who's far from Allah have so much depression, anxiety, stress, tension? Because the only thing, putting that, that at a spiritual level, of course, there's other reasons for this, the only thing spiritually that can cure the human ailment is their connection to Allah. And all of it then is either you're longing for the one who created you and who wants you to be near to him, or you're far from him and kind of running far in the own direction. When Allah is trying to call you back regularly. Allah is all giving us many chances, calling us back, calling us back, calling us back. And we're not, maybe we're not listening, we're being rebellious. But Allah is patient with us and he continues to give us time. Because this longing was already deposited inside of your, in the depths of the human being. It was already there. At this moment, in this very real event that took place, Allah to be Rabbi home. Am I not your Lord? That was, that was the, the key. Um, and so, why do we say, we say thicker? What does, what does the word thicker mean? Remembrance, right? Remembrance. So you only have to remember if you forgot. Right? And so heedless, there's either you're for, we've forgotten or we're remembering. And the more we remember, what we're remembering Allah, and as we remember Allah, we are remembering this key, this key uh, uh, deposit that's been put inside of us of our purpose in life. Am I not your Lord? This is not a verbal statement only. This is a deep spiritual statement. Think about it. Am I not your Lord means that am I not the one who's in, you should have your entire focus on your life for, that's Allah. Am I not the one who you should put above everything else? That's Allah. Am I not the one who should supersede all of your desires, the desire for money and fame and power and sexual appetite and so on and so forth? That's Allah. And as you continue going on the Lordship, anything you give priority to above Allah becomes an idol for the human being. So at the time we live in, very few people have physical idols that they worship. People used to worship physical idols and, and, and so on, like the little, you know, they would make idols and they would bow down to them. Now, the, most, most people, we have figurative idols which have been, which we've created. So some of us worship ourselves, some of us who are narcissists, we worship the idea of, of how great we are and so on and so forth. That's, a, that's an idol in the human being. Others worship their looks. Gotta look this way, gotta make sure everything's perfect. Other, some, we were talking about this in the last, last couple of classes, like the, all the fake filters and everything out of social media. If it doesn't even, if it's not even how one really looks, why would one use those filters and, and amplify themselves? Because they want, they, the looks have now taken a status in the heart of the human being. Others worship money. It's all about money, constantly trying to earn more and more and more to the point, to a, to a limit, it's good. And then after that, it's excess, right? Others worship fame and status, luxury. I, I gotta have this luxury bag and this luxury car and this luxury watch so everybody can see who I am and everybody can see. Meanwhile, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are starving around the world and are suffering, and we we care only about our status and so on. This is again; these are idols that are created in the heart of the human. Allah wants you to say, when you say Allahu Akbar, all of the idols should be destroyed inside of the heart. And Allah to be Rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Is Allah not our Lord? That should come back. That chief meaning should come back. So this is the. Uh, 
wisdom behind trying to recall this event. So now that you and I know we've said this, Allah says in the Quran, you can't, you're not going to be able to say that it didn't happen. Because it did happen and everybody saw it happen. And of course Allah bore witness to it as well. So now it's going to be a, I could say I forgot, I could say that I didn't listen, but nobody is going to be able to say that no Allah, you did not create me. That's not going to be possible. So then this journey is one, and this life is a journey of what? A journey for your soul, for our souls, to find God. That's the purpose of life. It's, it's, and we only created mankind and jinn to worship me or to know me, to get to know me. Because experiential knowledge of Allah happens as you go through the movements of life. It doesn't just happen in one day. One will see, okay, this happens in my life, now I experience Allah in this way. And then this happens and now I learn about how Allah is generous with me. And then this happens and now I learn about how Allah wants me to be patient and so on. And one gains this, they have this relationship, this interaction with their Lord. This is the key focus for <coughs> in the life that we live in, is to have these daily interactions and these, um, these daily engagements. So all of the children of, of, of Adam uh, السلام, took place in this, uh, took, took part in this. Um, and there are some people who they can remember enough to remember this moment. We've heard this from some of the scholars, but, but that's not something that Awam, the vast majority of us, would be able to, to, to happen, right? But some people, their thicker can get so strong that they can remember this moment that actually took place. So spiritual, the dimensions of spirituality, the dimensions of the unseen, and the dimensions of the multiple lives that exist, the multiple dimensions that exist, can become unveiled to somebody if Allah wishes, and usually through a significant amount of, of spiritual effort that one puts in. Um, so this is possible, the closer and closer one gets to this station of gnosis, of ma'rifa of Allah, the more they might have these types of experiences. But that's not that the goal is not necessarily only to remember this. The goal is to remember Allah, and you will feel it. One will feel the unlocking of, you know what, I know now what my purpose is. And when one doesn't know, it's just cloudiness that has to be washed away, and we'll talk about how one washes that away. So differing degrees of people, as we mentioned, had different degrees of awareness during this event. So the Prophet, والسلام, he was fully aware when these things were taking place. He was aware in many, many, many moments. He mentioned in one narration, that his light was the first to be created, and in another narration, that he was a prophet already when Adam -Islam, was between clay and water. So there are narrations, is one of the strong opinions of the Ahlul Sunnah Jama'at, where the first to be created was the light of the Nabi, وسلم, and then from that everything was created. Um, but, uh, so he was already aware. And then he mentions in a narration that he was there when Nuh, -Islam, when Adam -Islam, came down from the, to the earth, he was present. In Nu Salam when he boarded the ark, when he boarded the 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the famous Noah's ark, he was there with Abraham Salam uh, when he was thrown into the big fire, into Nimrod's fire, and so on and so forth. So there's many events which the Prophet Salam was present in, and he took place in those events. But this happened in a spiritual way that you and I will not be able to to, to understand because it's a spiritual reality that the prophets are gifted. But his status as the chief prophet, as the Sayyid of all the prophets, as the Imam of the prophets, Imam al Mursaleen, gives him such a high status that Allah allowed him to be present. And so he also then, there was an awareness in this, um, in this stage. But the, the key point though for us is to know that this was real and that we will be asked about it. We're not gonna be asked about all the details of everything that's happened in our lives. But we have to know that we will be asked about this. And an example would be, does anyone here remember their birth into this world? Nobody remembers it? Hmm. But did it happen? It happened. Some people might, they, they definitely know what happened, right? And some, some might have, you know, some photos or videos of it, others might have a uh, you know, memento from the hospital or wherever they were born. It happened. So you don't have to remember something to happen for it to have actually happened. This is where the argument of the Catholic of the atheist falls apart. 
because they rely on their limited, our, our limited, human limited intellect and limited memory to say, well, if I don't do this, this, and this according to my intellect, it could not happen. Well, hold on a second. The intellect is created. The intellect is created and it's pretty limited. The intellect is actually very limited until it's unlocked with the light of spirituality. The intellect is very limited. It won't be able to understand many things. So just because we don't remember doesn't mean it, doesn't, it didn't take place. Also, do any of us remember life in the womb? Do you remember? Do you remember life in the womb? Is the strongest chance it's for him to remember? And I don't know if he thinks. I don't think even he does. Right? Even though it was like two years ago. So uh, if you don't remember life in the womb, but did it happen? Yeah, it happened. Hundred percent happened for everybody. So again, there is a life that exists. And that doesn't have to coincide with the understanding of human beings. So then what we have to do is we have to trust God when he tells us this happened. Just like our children, if we tell them, yeah, you were born, and there was a time when you were, you were in the womb, and then there was a time when you were born, they're going to have to believe us. It would be very foolish to say, no, you're making all of that up. None of it happened. Prove it. Prove to me that mom exists, as they say, the, the children, the twins are arguing in the womb. Like, I heard about mom. Mom? What do you mean mom? Mom? Who's mom? Like, mom? Mom is the one who, who, who we're inside right now. It's like, I don't believe in mom. And that's like the atheist versus the, the believer. I, but mom is there. It's a real thing. And so the concept of God, when God tells us all these things, the human being is supposed to say, okay, I'm going to first start with believing you. And then I'm going to work on my own journey to uncover what that means. Why? Because everybody would believe at a deep level in, if we all maintained our fitra. What is fitra? Fitra is your primordial innocence, your primordial reality that you were born with. Every human being is born with a deep innocence. As we go through life, we get corrupted. Our, our sins, they start to veil us. We look at things that are inappropriate. We hear things that are inappropriate. We interact in, in a way that, that, that accumulates sins. The heart becomes dark and dark and dark and dark and dark until something happens. When the heart becomes so dark that the fitra is gone, now that heart begins to become rebellious and question things. That in an early stage, if you, if you tell a child about Allah, the child will believe you 100%. There is no way the child has any reason to doubt it. Because their fitra is still intact. Their, their primordial innocence and reality is still intact. They know, okay, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And so they'll just believe it. But the questioning starts to come when the darkness starts to appear in the heart. So the reason why it's important for us to trust when God says something is because we're not in our primordial innocent states anymore. We're just trying to get there. But the path to get there, Allah has laid out in the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ has told us. The trust we have to put in then is that what they've said is correct so that it can help me wake up and get there. Otherwise, we'll just be in this constant loss and this constant limbo stage. This constant limbo stage. So um, uh, the key to unlocking this remembrance, the key to unlocking this stage is fill your heart with light, with nur. Very simple equation. We'll, we'll mention this and then we'll, we'll mention one um, very nice narration in this chapter and then really this chapter is done. It's a very short section in this first one. Um, dhikr, remembrance of Allah, obedience to Allah, serving Allah, serving Allah's creation, doing things that are of goodness to Allah's creation increases your light, increases your nur. The more nur that comes in, the more purified the heart becomes. Sins, looking at things that are inappropriate, watching things that are inappropriate, dressing in an inappropriate way, uh, saying words that are inappropriate, so on and so forth, these bring darkness to the heart. Whether you realize it or not, it doesn't happen in one day. It's gradual, 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 consuming things that are inappropriate, you know, uh, haram food, haram tr drugs, haram drinks, so on, they, they contaminate the heart, contaminate the heart, contaminate the heart, until that heart becomes sealed like a rock, and then nothing can get through to it. Nothing can get through to it. Like the hearts of all these politicians, Biden, Blinken, Netanyahu, all of these shayateen, they're just devils. Why? Because their heart has become so sealed, nothing can change their heart. Nothing. I mean, it's obviously miraculously possible for God to change their heart. But in, a, in the realm of means, 
when you've done so much injustice, so much killing, so much killing of children, so much starvation of innocent children, women, men, and continual injustice, you're the leader of the, of the unjust nations in the modern era, what's going to happen? All of those sins now fall upon your heart. That heart will get darkened. So you and I won't, we don't understand, like, hold on a second, why don't these guys just get it? Because there's no capacity left to get it. The heart has become sealed. Allah says it is their, that, that their, their, their hearts become deaf, dumb, and blind. And their hearts get locks on them, and they become hardened like rocks. It's very difficult to, to talk to a rock, to convince somebody who just, there's no opening that's possible. So you and I have to protect ourselves while we're in this stage where we still have, inshallah, the, just the ability to choose between good deeds and sin before the sins accumulate so much that they darken the heart. Once somebody starts on the path of good, they'll want to do more and more good. It'll just be natural. But that it takes a certain force of, of, of uh, a push that one has to have. We have to really, really push yourself to get there, to resist the initial sins of the, of the nafs. The nafs is the, the animal soul, the nafs of amara. It's... It inclines towards sins, it inclines towards darkness, it inclines towards desires, it inclines towards just laziness and sleeping in all the time and all these sorts of things, which make the human being into a state of a lethargy and into a state of not doing anything. And then when, when they don't do anything, they're likely to do more sin. This is why the human being is supposed to be moving. We're 70 plus percent water, and water remains fresh while it's moving, like in a stream. It remains fresh while it's moving, both spiritually and physically. That's why it's very, very important for the human being. Um, so all of these things will help the human being remember this moment. So there's a well, there's an amazing hadith of um, which is narrated about Musa alayhi salam and his understanding of this ummah. So we'll, we'll we'll talk through most of it and then um, and then we'll end inshallah. So it's narrated that uh, on the authority of Wahab ibn Munabih, that when Musa alayhi salam read the tablets, the tablets, he found in them the merits of the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Who is the nation of Muhammad? We, alhamdulillah, are the nation of the Prophet sallallahu This is the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. And in it, and then he lists many, many, many blessings. So he asked these questions. So Musa alayhi salam, what was his trait that he had? Then, well, what was the title that he was given in the trait that he had? Khalil Allah, he can speak with Allah directly. Musa alayhi salam directly conversed with his Lord. And there was, um, so he asked Allah, he says, Oh Lord, what is this mercy given nation that I see in the tablets? Allah says, It is the nation of Ahmad. So the Prophet, وسلم, his name is Muhammad in this life, but in eternal, in it. After life, his name is Ahmad. He has many, many, many names, over a hundred different names um, for the Prophet uh, it, it is the nation of Ahmad, whose people are content with whatever little provision I give them, and I am content with whatever amount of ibadah and works they are able to do. And I make each one of them enter the garden by their testimony, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is, that's it. The goal is La ilaha illallah, the beginning is La ilaha illallah, the end is La ilaha illallah. When one will realize what we mean by that, through experience. It's not something, it's an intellectual concept. You will realize what la ilaha illallah means. Everything is about Allah. That's the goal. And so there is no Lord who is worthy of worship except Allah, who is worthy of attention except Allah, who is worthy of our focus except Allah. There is no reality that's worthy of that except Allah. But this is something that the human being needs to realize. So they enter the garden. What does shaitan want to do? He wants to take la ilaha illallah away from so at the upper limit of what the devil will try to get to, to someone to do is to disbelieve in La ilaha illallah because he knows that even if the human being is sinning left and right, we're all making mistakes. We're talking now somebody is doing kabair sins, all sorts of sins, left and right, left and right. As long as you have La ilaha illallah, the garden, ultimately you will get to the garden, inshallah. Ultimately everybody we will get to the Jannah because the Prophet وسلم, tells us that he will intercede for this nation and his station on the day of judgment is the highest station and he will be given an intercession. What's intercession? It means somebody who's going to beseech Allah on your behalf because we will have nothing to stand before Allah with. And so he's going to go to Allah and say, Ya Allah, save my ummah, save my ummah. And he reserved du'as 
that Allah said are going to be accepted du'as, He reserved them for the Day of Judgment for you and for me. He said, I'm reserving these du'as for my ummah on the Day of Judgment when I know we're going to need them. And Allah has guaranteed the acceptance of those du'as. And Allah says in the Quran, we will give you until you're happy. And the Prophet is not going to be happy until every member of this ummah enters Jannah. Until every member and his son, he's going to go and pull them out of the fire himself. That's how much the Prophet ﷺ loves you. But shaitan will want you to leave him, leave Allah and leave his messenger, shaitan's goal. So never let, when those whispers of shaitan come, know that they are whispers and you have to do whatever you can to resist them. Even if one is not practicing much at all, that should not, we can't allow that to become into our hearts. If shaitan can't get someone to do that, though, he'll get someone to sin. A lot. If he can't get them someone to sin a lot, he'll get them to sin a little. If he can't get them to sin a little, he'll get them to waste a bunch of time. And so on and so forth until he just wants to prevent you from the next level of good. That's shaitan's goal. So this is, um, then Musa alayhi salam says, I find in the tablets a nation of people who shall be resurrected and assembled on the day of judgment with their faces like full moons. And we live in, you know, urban society where light, you know, there's, there's light pollution, but Otherwise, if you go into an area where there's no light at all and then you see a full moon, it brightens the entire night sky and now you can see everything. So their faces, the faces of this nation will be like full moons, God replied. And so Musa al-Islam says what? Let them be my nation. Let them be my nation. Like Israel, let them be mine. Allah says, they are the nation of Ahmad. I shall gather them on the day of judgment when their foreheads and limbs shall be blazing white from the effects of the wudu that they would make and the, the sajda that they would make. But this is the effect of all the wudu that someone does. It's going to give you light. The day of judgment is going to be dark. But your faces, the faces of this ummah, they will be light for people. There will be disbelievers who will come up to, to the believers, inshallah, on the day of judgment, asking them for a portion of their light. For a portion of their light. Because none of the, there's not going to be like a flashlight with the iPhone. Like that's not, it's going to be light on your faces from sajda, from wudu, from prayer. He then says, O oh Lord, Ya Allah, I find in the tablets a nation whose people, um, whose clothes are on their backs, whose swords are on their shoulders, people of certitude and tawakkul. They glorify you from the top of minarets, from the top of the, the towers that folks make a bat from. They continue to fight for every righteous cause until they even battle against the Bajab. And he says, let them be my nation. And Allah says, they are the nation of Ahmad. So he keeps going. He says, oh Allah, I find in the tablets a nation of people who pray five times a day and night, five hours of the day, for whom the gates of heaven are open and whom mercy descends. He says, let them be my nation. Allah says they are the nation of Ahmad. He continues to list so many different virtues of the nation. It's a, it's a lengthy, uh, lengthy hadith. We'll, we'll go through a few more parts of it. He said, I find in the tablets a nation for whom the entire earth is a place of ibadah and is pure. Let them be my nation. And who for whom that the spoils of war are lawful. And he says they are the nation of Ahmad. So again, Musa alayhi salam, he's a prophet. He continues to ask every virtue, what Allah talk, talked about this nation, this ummah, in the tablets that were given to Musa alayhi salam. The, 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 the tablets were, which were one of the revelations given to Musa alayhi salam, this nation was mentioned in those tablets. He says, O oh Allah, I find in them a nation who fast the month of Ramadan, whom you forgive for everything they've done before, let them be my nation. He said they are the nation of Ahmad. Then he mentions that they do Hajj. And then he mentions that, um, uh, that the amount of forgiveness Allah will grant for them. And then he mentions continually, continually, continually. He says, oh Lord, I find in the tablets with them a nation of people who will be in first place on the day of judgment. There's going to be like rows on the day of judgment. There's people who are going to be in last place. People are going to be in first place. People who are going to have no place. We want to be in the first rows. This is the we should always make that let us be in the first rows with the Prophet the first rows with the, with the Prophet and, the, and his companions. He says, let them, they are the last to be created, but they are the first place in the Day of Judgment. How does that work? He says, let them be nine my nation. He says, no, they are the nation of Ahmad. All of this because we get to be in the nation of the Prophet And he says, I find in the tablets a nation of people. When they intend one good deed, a good deed is written for them. 
even if they don't perform it. And when they do the good deed, they get 10 to 700 times the worth of that good deed. And then the nation who, when they intend to sin, but they don't commit it, nothing happens. But if they do commit the sin, they just get one sin for the for it. This is why the intention of the believer is so important. Many of us feel very, very, have been feeling a state of un- hopelessness to a degree, maybe with what parts of what's going on in, in Palestine. Because literally, even if you wanted to drop everything and go there and help, you couldn't. Couldn't do it. The, the, nobody would let somebody in. They had blocked it off completely. But the intention of the believer is so important because there will be people who will show up on the Day of Judgment and they'll have all of these rewards. The rewards of saving lives, the rewards of protecting children, the rewards of feeding people, the rewards of clothing people. And they'll say, well, I, I, don't, I don't do any of this. Allah says, no, but when that was going on, when that, that, that genocide was taking place in Palestine, you were there weeping and worried and concerned for the ummah and you were making intention after intention, Ya Allah, please, if only I could, I would. And that intention, Allah says, through that intention, I already gave you everything that it is that you could have had. And then if somebody gets the ability to do it, of course, then they would go and do it. But the intention, this is for this nation. This ummah gets these types of things that just a thought of wanting to do something, you get a reward for it. It's so easy to succeed in this life if we just live, if we just appreciate the religion that we've been given. If we just appreciate the religion that we've been given. Um, and, and, and so he continues and continues and continues. So then he says, finally, O oh Lord, I find in the tablets a nation of people who will be resurrected and brought on the Day of Judgment as three groups. One shall enter Jannah without any reckoning, meaning no questions asked. You won't even have to stand before God, this group. Another's jan- uh, reckoning will be easy, and another will be rigorously judged, rigorously questioned by Allah. He says, May let them be my nation. He said, they are the nation of Ahmad. So then he says, Musa Islam says, Ya Allah, you have spread out all this goodness for Ahmad and his nation. Let me be a member of his ummah. This is what Musa Islam says to God. And God says, Oh Moses, I chose you and preferred you over other people with my message and my speech. Take what I've given you and be grateful, be thankful for what I've given you. But this is the, one of the greatest prophets in the history of Allah's creation, Moses. Moses is a very, very, very serious, important prophet, one of the ulil azam, the foremost of the messengers. And he's asking Allah at the end of this to be from, to be from uh, this nation, to be from this ummah. Not just that he wants this ummah to be his ummah, but he says, no, no, fine. I'm a prophet, but I'd rather just be from the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's amazing. This is the honor that's been given to the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the, uh, the, the question really for us is, do we understand the blessings that we're, so, that we're basking in? And do we understand the blessing of the message that we have? And then do we understand the... the uh, I forgot what I was going say, sorry. Um, do we understand the blessing of the message that we have? And do we understand the blessing of being people who have a purpose in life, who have a focus in life? Um, and that in and of itself is huge. And we'll end with this, that the vast majority of people, as we mentioned, they don't, have, they don't know what their purpose is. They don't know why am I here, where am I going? And they certainly don't have the greatest of Allah's creation who's already tied to them. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He is the person who's been concerned for you since before you were born and when you die and on the Day of Judgment. Throughout all of these lives, the concern of the Prophet Muhammad extends and is a means of assisting you and I in our life. And so we have to keep that, um, uh, keep that in mind and we have to remember and unlock this, the, the knowledge of the stages of our life and then remember the purpose that we have and use that as a fuel to help us going on the days when we're down because the life of the human being will be up and down, up and down. But as long as on the days when we're down, we get back up and we remember the focus and remember the purpose, we'll be in a good spot because we already have the blessing of being from the nation of Ahmad and وسلم, and that's going to be a means of immense madad and extra assistance for us. So with that, inshallah, we'll, we'll end if there's any questions. Um, if we do questions, and then we'll, like, we'll, with this class, as we mentioned, 
The next two topics will be about the life of the dunya, um, and then we'll basically be breaking out the rest of the chapters into two classes each until we end right before Ramadan, inshallah, the luck of this life, um, and, 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 um, and then use that as a time to prepare for, uh, for Ramadan. So Ramadan's about two months away, inshallah. So we'll try to keep it short. I would highly recommend if folks want this book. It's called The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad. It's like $12 on Amazon. Highly recommend getting it. We will be going through, again, each chapter. Um, it's very, 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 very good to read. Um, and it's very succinct but, but, and gets to the point on what's important to take away. So with that, are there any uh, questions, either in person or online? Uh, questions? No. Yes. Great, great question. The question is, um, anybody who came from um, before the Prophet ﷺ's time, would they not have a chance to be in that first row? Uh, no, they will still have a chance. So as long as someone followed their Prophet, and they followed their Prophet with... Um, with certainty and with resolve, the prophets themselves are going to be in the first row, right? And so then the people who are with them, their closest of followers will also be in the first row with them. Um, but the numbers of this nation will vast outstrip all of the other numbers. Most of the other prophets, they didn't have many other followers at the, in terms of the level of, of, of uh, followers and the number of followers the prophets also has. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So people who are, uh, speak the last part a little louder, the people who are really devout in their own religion, if they're Jewish or Christian. Yeah, yeah good question. If somebody um, is really devout in their practice, and so do they still have a chance to be part of that um, first row, even if they're not Muslim? And they, they have that remembrance of God. Um, it's yeah. So ultimately, we, we always say with the Allahu Alam, like Allah is the judge of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And we don't have um, we have knowledge of what Allah told us in the Quran, but beyond that, Allah can decide to do and can operate outside of what He has uh, what He did with the rule. So there's like the rule and there's the exception to the rule. The rule is that once this religion has come down, every other religion effectively has now been abrogated. That is the rule. Um, but if somebody practiced, for example, at the time of the Prophet Sassan, they were Unitarian, um, just monotheists, they're Hanif. Before, they, before the Prophet Sassan came down with this message, they were already monotheists. They will, inshallah, get the reward of being from the Hanif of Ibrahim al Islam, from the monotheism of Ibrahim al Islam. The Christians, the Christians aren't really monotheists, right? The Christians worship Jesus as the Son of God, and their aqidah is extremely problematic. So. Um, while the sincerity of something could be uh, valued and appreciated, and ultimately, again, Allah can decide what, what he's going to do with that, um, we don't have that belief that they have the access to these stations if the, this religion has already come down. Um, and then with, with, with Bani Israel, with the Jews, um, Judaism does ha is, a, is a strongly monotheistic religion, and so there are people among the Jews, Allah says in the Quran, that there are some, from, from some of them, there are believers, but the vast majority are not. And so uh, it would depend a lot on if somebody was presented Islam properly and then they rejected it. But just because somebody exists and they never heard of Islam, are they going to be accountable for it or not? The scholars have vast differing opinions on what that accountability would be. Imam Ghazali says they would have to have been presented it in its proper form for them to have been given a chance. Now that's our job. And our weakness, right, if we're living in a country full of non-Muslims and we're never presenting Islam to them, and we're letting um, everybody just kind of do their own thing, it's on, it's on us to present and to propagate the religion of the Prophet Islam. But once he comes down, came down, we don't believe in um, uh, this idea that you can be from any monotheistic religion. You have to follow this religion. But before he came down, Salah um, then yeah, any of the monotheistic religions would have, would have, uh, you know, would have worked. So we want the last thing is we 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 don't use our time too much on where is this person going to go, where is this person not going to go, 
Like that's a lot of Muslims spend time on that. That's really not a good way use of time. Um, where is the Shia going to go? Where is the Sunni going to go? Where are the Wahhabis going to go? Where is this going to go? Where are the Christians? Gonna go? Let God decide that. Focus on yourself and and purify ourselves, and then focus on spreading truth to people, and let Allah take care of the ultimate reckoning. Yeah. Sister Side, any questions? Uh, online, the title of the book is "Lives of Man" by Imam Al Haddad. Lives of Man by Imam Al Haddad. And then there's a question on the Day of Judgment for people who didn't learn Islam. Hopefully, we covered that um, in the last uh, the last answer. Yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, with regards to the questions that are asked in the in the pre-eternal realm, what were those questions? Um, and 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 yeah, essentially, what were those questions? So the only questions in which there's confirmation on, which are in the Quran, uh, is the question of Allah Subhanahu Am I not your Lord? So that confirmation from Allah of uh, of asking when gathering the human beings on this plane and asking, "Am I not your Lord?" and then bearing witness to that. Um, the other, uh, I actually have never, and I can you know follow up with you maybe afterwards. Um, haven't heard any narrations that would describe any other questions that the human being is given any choice in the matter. The other, the human being is not given choice in the other. You have a few prophets who would ask, for example, in one narration, the prophet Adam al Islam saw one of his children. And he really liked his, this, this child. It was Dawood, the Prophet David, Islam, and he said, give him some portion of my life. But Allah just said, I already decided everybody's lifespan. That's not really up to you. So the human being is actually not given any choice. Our belief is that the other and the, the decree is from Allah. On the day of judgment, afterwards, the human being is asked, um, for example, if they had a lot of suffering and a lot of tribulation, um, the human being is dipped into Jannah for just a second, and then they... Asked, are asked, did you have any suffering in this life? And they'll say, I had nothing. I don't remember a single amount of suffering. So that does happen afterwards. But as to the agreed upon questions from the from the Creed Elise of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, um, would be this this questioning that's mentioned in Surah Al Araf in the Quran of Allah asking us about His Lordship. And that would be the limit of the extent. Anything else that took in place, perhaps there's other um, narrations, but they wouldn't be considered mutawatir. Um, so we couldn't, we wouldn't rely on them as kind of dominant um, narrations about the questions. Yeah, yeah, good question. The question is, what are ways to get back to the fitra and that and and kind of back to the original that original state of heart if we feel like we've disconnected? Yeah. So ultimately, the entire journey of the deen is to get is to get back to the fitra. That's that's the purpose. The the summary, the essence of it, is captured in, in what's known as the science of ihsan. Or the science of the soul. Um, so the science of Sufism, the science of spiritual excellence, the science of Tazkiyat al whatever word someone uses um, to describe it, helps someone purify their heart. And there's a there's a three-step process. The first is one empties all the bad traits from their heart. So this could be traits like arrogance, a, um, getting over angry, um, uh, uh, being full of themselves, um, so, and so on and so forth, being cheap, but all the different traits that someone has that are they're mentioned in the books. The Prophet Sallallahu has laid them out, um, and, and one empties them from the heart. Uh, uh, having a, a sharp tongue, yelling at people a lot, verbally abusing people, and so on and so forth. One empties these traits. Similarly, one empties this, uh, egg, uh, removes the sins that they're doing. So you would come up with like a of, I have these sins that I'm doing, these are the big ones, these are the ones I have that are, that are less um, significant. One keeps working on them until they've cleansed them. That's the first step. The second now is what's known as inculcating goodness inside of somebody. So the more nurani actions, luminous actions someone does, the more that, that um, the heart starts to become polished and purified. The heart is like a mirror. Once it's fully, 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 fully polished, it now reflects the light of God. And when it reflects the light of God, all these realities become clear in the heart. So now somebody starts to clean themselves and, and add good deeds. So this would be um, uh, behaving in a righteous manner, having good akhlaq, obviously all of our five uh, pillars of our religion, behaving well with one's parents, respecting our elders, and so on. Um, uh, so th that would be the second. Um, the third then is now somebody starting to take all of the extra time that they have and this is where now someone who's really focused on Ihsan would become um, focused, uh, or would have to apply. So the Prophet said that Ihsan is to worship Allah as though we see him, and even though we don't see him, know that he sees us. So one acts in a daily basis with this understanding that Allah is watching me. 
Allah is aware of what I'm doing. And I have to be conscious in my efforts and in my interactions with people and with the divine, knowing that there is this perpetual muhasaba um, uh, uh, that I have to take myself to account to. So this kind of vigilance that one has to have. If somebody can accomplish that, now their whole day becomes light and upon light. And now their, their heart actually gets surrounded in the inner realm with angels. And those angels assist them in doing more good deeds. And now they become, they go back to the, the fitra. Um, so, but that's really, it's a journey. And so, uh, but, but to study the books of Imam Haddad, Imam Ghazali, uh, they've laid out what this journey is. And so if we can implement them, then inshallah, that, that will be a way of, of, of getting there, inshallah. Yeah. Okay, so with that, anything else? Are there anything online? Where do these classes take place in person? Uh, we are in Oakland, California at Lighthouse Masjid um, at 7 p.m. Pacific time. We'll be doing this weekly, inshallah. Okay, I think that's it. So I know the du'a. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin bil awaleen wa salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin bil akhirin wa salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin bil malayil ala ila yawm al din. Rabbana atina bil dunya hasna tawma bil akhirati hasna tawma kina adhaab al nar. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tubbalina inna ka anta tuwab al rahim. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimin. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Fatah, Ya Mubin. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that you accept Ya Allah from us and that you pardon us and that you forgive us and that you make us people of purpose and people of high himma and that you put barakah and tawfiq in our ability to learn Ya Rabbil Alameen and in our intentions that we have Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that while we are sitting and we, we are we are in a state of peace and we are in a state of enjoyment of our blessings, Ya Allah, we, we continue to feel for our brothers and sisters in Gaza and in the West Bank and in Palestine and all throughout many other parts of the Muslim world and their suffering. Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Rahman, that you pour your Rahmah upon Gaza. Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Hafid, that you pour your special protection. Ya Latif, that you pour your special lutf upon them. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Qawil, Ya Mateen, we ask that you assist them. Ya Allah, we ask that you protect them, that you protect the children and that you protect the infants and you protect the toddlers and you protect all of them, Ya Allah, from this evil aggression. Ya Allah, we ask that you give himma to them. Ya Allah, we ask that you give himma to the parents and that you give them all supper and that you give them all tawakkul and that you help the elderly and you help the, the men and the women and the children and everybody in Gaza, Ya Allah, and in the West Bank who is struggling under this and who is, who is suffering, Ya Allah, who is suffering immensely. We, razaq, we ask that you provide for them, that you give them food, that you give them water, that you give them shelter, that you give them ease, that you give them warmth. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask, Ya Allah, that you assist them, that you give them strength, that you plant their feet firmly. Rabbana afriqalina sabran wa tabit aqdamana wa nsurna lilqawm al-kafirin. Ya Allah, we ask that those who are resisting, Ya Allah, we ask that you give them tawfiq and that you give them the ability to resist against these occupiers and that you defeat your enemies, Ya Allah, and the enemies of creation, Ya Allah, and these Zionist enemies that you remove these devils from the planet, Ya Allah, and that you take them to account with the most intense of your reckoning, Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Aziz, Ya Qawil, Ya Mateen, Ya Allah, throw these that these oppressors and these tyrants, Ya Allah, into the pits of your fire, Ya Allah, and give the Palestinians and those who are suffering the highest of stations of Jannah with the Prophet Sallallahu and that you give them, Ya Allah, we ask that you accept their shahada and that you accept those who have passed away and that those who who are suffering and those who are sick and those who need healing, we ask that you heal them, Ya Shafi, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask that you give us purpose in our life and that you not allow us to wander aimlessly and that you allow us to be focused people, Ya Allah, as we are getting very close to the end days, Ya Allah, and we are in these end days, Ya Allah, and we are in the end of times, Ya Allah, we ask that you make us people who work for the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu and who serve this Ummah in the best of ways, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and who serve you in the best of ways, and who understand what our purpose is, and who understand what our purpose is in this world, and who are beacons of light and beacons of guidance for people, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask that you transform us inwardly and outwardly, and that you transform our families, and that you transform our hearts, and that you transform our society, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to be people of Yaqeen, and people of Tawheed, and people of of, of from the highest stations of Tawheed, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you pardon us and that you forgive us and that you grant us the ability to be forgiven, Ya Allah, for the sake of gathering for you and for the sake of trying to learn for you. And we ask that you forgive anything it is that we intend or that we said that was inappropriate or that was wrong, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you put barakah and tawfiq in everything it is and every intention that we have. We ask you for everything good the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asked for and we ask you protection from everything evil that he has protection from and we ask that you give us a husn al-khatima 
the best of seals in this life and in the next life and that you protect us and our children and our parents and our loved ones, Ya Allah, and our and our family, Ya Allah, and all of those to come of, and make them people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Nabi ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillah rabbil alameen alhamdulillah there's a few more questions that came in so inshallah we'll get to those next week um, inshallah alaykum wa rahmatullah hope everybody is doing well alhamdulillah um, thank you all for taking the time to join on this uh, rainy night. Um, so we're going to continue, inshallah. We just started this series. It's about the journey of the soul um, and trying to understand where we came from so that we can identify where we're going and so that we can realize the purpose of where we're going and what we're meant to be doing. So we're reviewing this text, um, a very, very short text, um, but very powerful by Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad known as the lives of man. And it basically is a guide to the states of the human soul from before one was conceived, so in the pre-eternal realm, um, to the time that one was conceived, to the life in this dunya, the stages of life in this dunya, then to the barzakh, which is the intermediary realm when one passes away, um, and then the uh, uh, day of judgment when one is resurrected, ultimately to eternal life. So he walks through in just enough detail um, what the essential components of each of these lives are and then what the Muslim needs to know and what the Muslim needs to do as we navigate uh, this part of our journey. So um, last time we covered the first life, which is the, the creation, when the human being was originally created until right before they are conceived. And this is the life of uh, the, the, the day in which Allah takes the covenant. So we talked about what does it mean when we took the covenant. Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Araq that he gathered all of the children of Bani Adam and he asked them, um, am I not your Lord? And everybody responded, uh, we, we say yes and we respond and we witness, we bear witness. And so Allah basically then says that you can't deny this at, at a later date because you this event did happen. And then we talked about how all of these darknesses that come over our soul and these veils and these layers that come over the human soul and over the heart fail us from remembering these moments and they fail us from remembering this reality, which is why when we need to remember something, we do thicker, which is remembrance. It gets us away from heedlessness and forgetfulness. And so the more one polishes their heart, the more closer one gets, the more the reality of that event and the reality of bearing witness before our Lord and saying, yes, you are our Lord, and, and that was in a real way, it wasn't some figurative concept, um, that will start to sink into the human being. So that's what we covered last time. Um, so this time, inshallah, we're going to get into the second um, life, which is essentially the life of the dunya, from the time that somebody is uh, in the womb of their mother, um, and then this life has multiple stages. It has that time, then it has the time of childhood, uh, then it has the time of youth, then it has the ages of maturity, and then it has the ages of um, old age, and then there, uh, when someone is on their way out, what, he, what is translated as kind of uh, decrepitude, and then finally when one actually passes. So we're going to split this up into two classes. We'll cover the first three or four of those stages today, inshallah, and then we'll get into the next ones. Um, so he says that this life begins from the time that one is delivered out of the womb, and, um, it, and it ends when one departs this world. Um, and this is this section that we're about to talk about. This is the purpose of human life. This is the purpose of human, uh, of human existence. Um, so the human being has a very, very specific purpose for why they were created. And it is the test in this life, Allah says in the Quran, that we created life and death in order to test which one of you would be uh, best indeed. Uh, that we will be created life and death in order to test which one of you are best indeed. This is the life that is being referred to. So the life that we're in right now. Most of us, we think this is the only life. So we, when we talk about, okay, well, we, we have a life, this is the, the time we're referring to. But he clarifies, no, there was, there's time before this and there's time after this. But this is the evaluation period. So it begins um, that in the realization that whatever we do here, there's consequences. Allah, especially when the age of accountability starts, which we'll talk through in a few minutes, inshallah, Allah starts to take people to account for their actions in this life. Um, there's not a free pass forever. And so the end will either be 
as a result of the investments we make now in the Akhira, the end is either eternal bliss or eternal perpetual torment. Those are the two sides that someone has to choose from. And we actually have a choice in that because whatever we do here will have that result and will have that impact. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, it's Allah's good pleasure and Allah's mercy. But Allah does give us a roadmap for what you need to do to get to Jannah, what you need to do to get to what you need to do um, uh, incorrectly, um, if you, and, and you won't get to Jannah. So, but he starts with this time in the womb. And he just wants to, to mention this um, as, as a way for someone to, uh, it's kind of like a prologue, he says. So this is the prologue to this life, right? Like the, 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 the before one is actually born, they're where? They're in the womb of their mother. But Allah does describe this in detail in the Quran, um, where he says that we created man, we created a human being, from a product of clay, so from clay. And then we placed him as a drop in a safe lodging place. And then we made of that a lump of bones. And then we made of that a lump of bones. And then we covered the bones with flesh and then brought him forth as another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators, the greatest of all creators. So Allah is describing this is before, keep in mind that the Quran is the eternal speech of Allah. But this was revealed in a time where there was no way to understand the development of the embryo and the fetus and everything that takes place inside the womb of the mother. Right? Like there was no way for someone to know all of these specific steps. Allah describes it in a lot of detail. He says, O oh mankind, in another surah, should you be in doubt concerning the resurrection, then know the following, that we created you from dust, then from a drop of seed, then from a cloth, then from a lump of flesh, shapely and shapeless, and then Allah shaped it. And then we make it clear for you, and we cause what we will to remain in the wombs for an appointed time. So Allah is describing this process that's taking place. Usually this would be considered unseen for people, right? So this would have been considered something happening in the unseen realm. Obviously it's in this realm, but it was not something that people would have witnessed to. Allah is describing what that process is, and then there's hadith which describe it in a lot more detail. But this is when the... Um, uh, life of the human being essentially has now started, right? So the, the, when it, when it, there's a portion of time at which the soul is blown in, the spirit is blown in to the uh, embryo. And now the life of that human being started. And now the baby, the interactions that they have are the, the fetus, the interactions that they have, the way that their uh, mother does certain things, um, that impacts them. From a spiritual perspective, it has a deep-rooted impact. So he said it really starts at this point. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in um, another narration that all of you will have had their created existence brought together in their mother's womb as a drop, as a nutfa for 40 days, then as a alaqa, a clot for 40 days, then as a mudfa, as a piece of flesh for the same period of time, after which Allah sends the angel to blow the room, to blow the spirit into the human being. And he says, now this angel is commanded to write. What does this angel write? It writes a few things. First, it writes all the provision that you're going to get in this life. The provision, the risk. It's already been predetermined by Allah in the eternal tablet, the Lohim Mahfub. It's already been predetermined. But now this angel is writing it. This is what this person is going to get in this entire life. It also writes their lifespan. So his or her lifespan is written at this point. So at the point at which the root is blown in, the lifespan of the human being has already been decided. It writes their deeds, and it writes whether they will end up wretched or joyful. And then he, so, so we'll, 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 the hadith continues, so we'll just pause there. The first thing to keep in mind is that Allah already wrote our risk for us. At this point, there's very little to stress about if it's already been decided. As a human being, one of the chief things, as we talked about in the last class, Imam Ghazali, human being worries about his risk. Where's my money going to come from? Where's my job going to come from? How am I going to get income? How am I going to get this? How am I going to get that? Well, Allah already wrote. What are the times of abundance? What are the times of difficulty? What are the times of constriction? What are the times of expansion? What are the times of ease? What are the times of health? Your risk is your money, your income. But it's not just that. It's who you get married to or don't get married to. It's your friends. It's your company. It's, it's, it's your, your company, meaning your, your social circle. All of these things are part of your provision. And these have already been all predetermined. And Allah says that they are tests for you in certain ways. So not everything Allah gives is a, um, uh, 
uh, something that's purely just given without wisdom. Everything has a wisdom to it. The risk can be a blessing and a test in various ways. Abundance can also be a test, just like poverty and, and difficulty and adversity can be a test. He says the lifespan is also already written at this point. So nobody can increase um, or decrease what Allah has already written for them eternally uh, in, 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 in his realm. And then he says, and this is interesting, and this part needs a little clarification. He says, the Prophet says, by the one besides whom there is no God, one of you may do the works of the people of Jannah until they are separated only by an arm's length from the end. And then the, what had been written overtakes them, and they start to do the works of the people of the fire, and they enter it. And he says, and one of you may do the works of the people of the fire until nothing remains between the, between the fire and but an arm's length, uh, between them and the fire but an arm's length, and then what is written overtakes them so that he or she does the works of the people of Jannah and then enters it. There's various ways the ulama interpret this hadith, um, and a few, a few of the different uh, things that are mentioned in the commentaries. One, this should put fear inside the life of every human being, the most righteous, obedient person, and it should give hope to the most sinful person. Right? We all have times where we're steeped in sin, and many of us are doing a lot of things that are wrong and that are inappropriate. And then we have times where hopefully we are being able to be obedient. This should give humility to the people of obedience, not an arrogance of, I'm guaranteed hajjana, and this is all. That, uh, the Muslim never operates like that. That I just have to do X, Y, Z, and for sure I'm being. No, 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 that's not how it works. Allah decides when, if, uh, and how much he's going to give. And it should also give hope to somebody who lives a very might live a very um, a life full of transgression, but then at the end Allah facilitates for them. Like there might be people who don't embrace Islam at all, and then they embrace Islam on their deathbed. Everything is wiped clean, and um, they get to enter into the into uh, they've entered the religion now, and then they pass away and they return to the Lord. The second interpretation that ulama say about this is that one may think that they're doing the actions of the people of Jannah, but actually they've been doing actions of the people of Hellfire the whole time. Why? Because all their actions are not for Allah. And this is, we talked about this at length last time, or in the last class. Their actions might be insincere. Their actions may appear like they are for the sake of people, but rather they are for the sake of Allah, but rather they're for the sake of people. This is why in one hadith that mentions the first to enter and the first to be questioned and be thrown into the fire are the people of, of, of scholarship in Quran. Instead of mentioning all the other criminal activities that are done, people who recited Quran for the sake of people noticing and people who um, learned and, and did good for the sake of people praising them and, and attention, status, and fame, and so on and so forth. They're very dangerous things. So one may think that they were doing actions of good, but they actually the entire time we're doing actions of wrong. So it's like the outward form looked great, but inside was was rotten poison, right? And so it's not going to be pure, the same as something inside that's actually pure. The outward and the inward have to be correct, which is why in Islam, the science of purification exists, which is why it's so important to study that because somebody who doesn't learn how to purify their heart could get into this state. And then he says, somebody may have been doing the actions outwardly that were haram, but inwardly, they were always returning back to their Lord and repenting and, and broken before him and, and had a yearning to fix themselves. But they just kept doing the wrong. But they, Allah, I really want to improve. I really want. So there's different ways in which Allah examines. So we should all have hope when we sin that as long as we are turning back to Allah, and we're not sinning arrogantly. There's a difference between the arrogant sinner who says, I'm not even sinning. This isn't even a sin. This is not even a big deal. And, or What's the big deal? Everybody else is doing it. And the one who says, I'm really messing up right now. Like, I really shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, Allah, I'm really, really ashamed and I feel sorry that I'm doing this, but I can't help it. My nafs has the best of me. I got to work on myself. The two are very different categories. Um, so there's various other interpretations that are given, but those are, those are a few. So he then um, uh, mentioned the lifespan, the deeds, and then again, hold their ultimate end. One, a human being will be facilitated towards good, as Allah, Allah mentions this in the Quran, or they will be prevented from good. And we should always ask that Allah make us 
people who are facilitated towards good. But really, the spiritual journey of the human being begins at the time that they're in the womb, and the actions and the um, that 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 are done in the outside environment will impact the the child that's in the womb. Will impact the child that's in the womb. Um, and then this hadith also gets into other details that one can study to understand why in Islam um, abortion is also a very serious topic because once the root has blown in, has been blown in, um, this is not something that's permissible for us to uh, uh, for us to take on. So it's, it's very common, unfortunately, now um, in in the political realm uh, for people to think that. Uh, these types of things are totally okay and have, there's room for them. There's room for them. It's in various cases, there's room. But the generality in our religion is that life is to be preserved because Allah has created life and it is not permitted out of fear of poverty or for various other reasons um, for one to abort. But that's not what the purpose of the class is, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, so then this is when now with life, the accountability starts to, it's, it's, we're about to get to this really, really important stage. So he says, then you enter into childhood. So this is the, the, the first real stage of this dunya. He said, the human being remains in the womb until Allah wills for them to come forth. When whatever day or hour, moment Allah decided, that's when the human being is going to come, not one day sooner, not one day later. He says, this is the beginning of life in this world, as Allah says in the Quran, and afterward we bring you forth as infants. Then we give you growth so that you may attain your full strength. So he maps out what's going to happen to the human being. And then among you are those who die, others who are brought back to the worst time of life, referring to the age of decrepitude and um, really advanced old age, um, so that after having had knowledge, they know nothing at all. Right? So some people might have lived a very uh, a lot of uh, benefits in their life, but then they get into an age where now they don't remember anything or are afflicted with severe disease or tribulation. And old age is mentioned as that type of uh, tribulation and when one suffers these things. And then Allah says in another surah, one attains full strength. And then that you become old. So Allah talks about, again, the different stages. Why does he talk about the different stages? Because he wants you to now understand, he wants us to understand, there's a purpose to each stage. And the Prophet ﷺ gives context to what the stages are. So the strength that somebody has when they're, uh, the energy that someone has when they're a child, or the memory that they have when they're a child, is not the same as someone when they're much later. And then the strength that someone has in their like 20s and 30s is not the same as the strength or lack of strength someone has in their 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And we always ask Allah preserve us and give us lots of help. But this is the key for understanding the wisdom behind why Allah created different stages of the human being's life. And then what the purpose of each of those stages of life is. Because the natural inclination of the human being is to say, I have plenty of time. I'll do it later. I'll do all of my ibadah later. I'll wait till I'm this age. I missed a bunch of prayers. It doesn't matter. I'll make them up when I'm 70 years old or whatever. If the human being is a procrastinator by its nature. that not likes to do that. But there's a lot of benefit from childhood in someone understanding what their purpose is and someone understanding the, the, the uh, reason why um, Allah has given them that. So he says in this stage, a couple of things happen. He says people move from um, the state of childhood to puberty. And then that's when this state of childhood is done. And then they go into the stage of youth and, and young adulthood, and then to maturity and then to seniority. So these are the different stages we're going to talk through. Um, but first he says there's something happens when, they, when each human being is born. He says when every human being is born, they begin to scream. And this is mentioned in the narration. This is because now they have a Satan, a Satan who actually goes there and literally, in a, in a, in a, in a very real sense, stabs the human being. And they try to harm that human being. He says, everybody was afflicted by this except Jesus, son of Mary, Isa alayhi salam, Isa ibn Maryam, because he was guarded by this because of the prayers of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam's wife, uh, the wife of, or Maryam alayhi salam's mother, the wife of Imran. Um, and so, uh, where she says in the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, that, oh Allah, I seek your protection for her. This is when Maryam is born. She makes this dua. I seek your protection for her and for her offspring from Shaitan, from Satan. And because Allah accepted that dua of the mother of Maryam, Isa was prevented from this, this happening to him. 
Um, and, it, and so I mentioned in the hadith that he at least arrived at that moment, but a protective veil came and, and he, was, he was prevented from this. And that's what happens now. They're, a shaitan is also created to be assigned to a human being when they are born. And they say a, a devil, a jinn, is created to be assigned to a human being when they are born. So that's, that's an important part of our framework to keep in mind that while we have angels with us, there are also shafin that are with the human being, and they study the human being over the course of their life to understand their weaknesses and find how to have against them. So then he says, at the moment when someone is born, a few things that one is supposed to do uh, to, the, to the child. They do the adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. Usually the father um, will do this, the adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. And this is um, the first very real, this is sunnah, is the first real call to um, remind them of Allah, right? So one is literally calling them to prayer. That's the first thing. Or calling, making the call to prayer, um, which is a very, very noble call full of a lot of um, deep remembrances of Allah. The second thing is when somebody passes away, so when we do the janazah prayer, is that anyone, when we do the funeral prayer, has anyone ever seen anyone do an adhan or a kama for the funeral prayer? There's no Adhan and Kama from funeral prayer because that Adhan and Kama was already done when you were born, when you were born. And this, this, it said that the time of your life is like the time between the Adhan and the Kama in reality. So when somebody came here for Isha Salah, the Adhan was made maybe 655, uh, Kama was maybe 702. That time, five, six minutes, is the time of the life of the human being. It was already done. So from that moment, the human being is supposed to realize I'm here for a reason and I'm here for a purpose. And so that that that, that should sink in, even in the mind of the parents, as excited as they are, that I have a responsibility now to make sure that I put in the effort to raise this child to be righteous because one day they will have to go and then uh, the janazah will be prayed over them and the efforts that one put in and the way in which they were raised, um, that's going to ultimately determine Allah's mercy um, where they end up going and if they fulfill the purpose of their of their life. The second thing the Prophet he mentioned that, that every child is born in their fitra. This is known as the primordial disposition, this innocent disposition. Every child is born in the fitra, and it is their parents who make them a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian, or whatever other religion, but these are the ones that are mentioned in the head. What does it mean to be born in the fitra? Your primordial nature has you focused, has us focused on submitting to Allah. Submitting to Allah and the religion of Islam is the religion of submission and the religion of Islam is is is, is uh, uh, being a Muslim means the one who, is, who, who does submit, who has submitted, the one who submits. This is not referring only to the sharia. So there's the Sharia of Islam, which is the law of Islam, and then there's the nature that the human being has been created in, which is in sync even before the formal Sharia of the Prophet came from, there were still people who were created in their fitra. And we know that the Prophets um, and many of the other righteous who came before the Prophet they were inclining towards the fitra, and the fitra, as you believe, has an inclination towards a belief in oneness, in oneness of God. That's the fitting. And anyone now, life after one is born, will cover that up, will change it, will add things to it. But it's very difficult for someone um, to come to other conclusions on their own. Like, so, for example, a, ch a child, once they reach a certain stage, will start to think about how were they created, where were they created from. And it is very much a um, normal inclination for that child to say, I was created from a Lord, from a God, because it's with Allah has deposited in them. That child on their own would never come to the conclusion that I was created from a God who then had a son who then also manifests in a uh, in the Holy Spirit, who but actually all of it's one, and then the Logos is coming into the Holy Spirit through the man but it's really one God, but it's actually three. And then one of them actually died for my sin, so I don't have to take any accountability in life. That conclusion, a rational human being who's in alignment with their fitra would never come to that conclusion on their own. 
would never come to a conclusion on their own. And neither did the, that, that was never the teaching of Isa alayhi salam, but that was obviously changed um, uh, by, by people. Um, in the first uh, 100 to 300 years after um, Isa al passed away. But the fitra, the fitra will remain intact. The fitra will remain intact. And so it can be uncovered, which is why people convert, or as, as folks would say, revert to Islam, because the fitra is still there. The goal of, of, of our life is to help our children remain in their fitra for as long as possible. And for ourselves as adults, because inevitably our fitra will have been messed up or tarnished or ruined or um, veiled in some way, peel it, peel it back, peel it back until it comes back and we start to realign with uh, who we are supposed to be. And then the goal for the rest, for, for our responsibility as Muslims, for as many people in society as possible, is actually not a top-down, let me force people to accept a religion, not a Quran and Fiddin, Allah said there's no compulsion in religion. But rather, how can one help somebody unlock what's already inside of them by portraying to them how beautiful it actually is? So this, the, the Prophet and then the scholars who have inherited from him, what they do is they pull the beauty out of people to help them realize that it's already inside of them. And then as a result, of course, Allah is the guide. He guides them to, um, to Islam. And, and, and so that's really the, the ultimate, one of, our, one of our responsibilities as Muslims is to help people do that. But we first have to, of course, help ourselves. And then, inshallah, that's the way that we can move forward. So this, this concept of fitrah is really, really important. And any innocence, um, or, or any corruption of the innocence is corruption of the fitrah. Fitrah has a very pure quality to it. So then he gets now into, well, what is the job of now one is created? So what happens at this point? He says now they are in the responsibility of their parents, and the parents' job is to protect the fitra. And how do they protect the fitra? Multiple things. He says first is don't let them be exposed to things consistently that will distort their fitra, that will distort this primordial disposition and this innocence. Then number two, give them a love of goodness. So children innately love goodness. They're pure, very pure. Like they love cute animals and they love stuffed animals and they love all the cute things. It's a very normal thing for this which the child loves, right? But a, but 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 a human being, an adult, they don't. They might not have the same, you know, inclination. But I don't care. Especially people who like really, uh, uh, their heart is really covered. Like they won't even be impacted emotionally by certain things. Um, a sign of fitra is also how often one cries. So how often one weeps and is impacted by. By, by deep events, um, it's a sign that they're intact with their fitra versus if their heart is covered and covered and covered, that's a sign that and one doesn't, it's not impacted emotionally, it's, it's a sign that the fitra is not as intact as one needs to work on it. He says then, they also are responsible to encourage them to do good and then discourage them and make them dislike and hate evil. So they should love goodness and love the people of goodness and love the actions of goodness. And they should hate evil, the practice of it, and the actions of the people who are practicing it. The actions of the people who are practicing it and the practice of it. So that's the, the, the second responsibility. The third is uproot the love of dunya, money, fame, all these things from the heart. Don't let the, the child as they're growing up fall in love with these things, with the dunya. And we talked about this again at length in the last class, the uh, Imam Ghazali in the text of Imam Ghazali, that what the dunya will do and how it will ruin the human being. And how loving this dunya and all the glitz and the glamour and the power and the corruption, everything that can happen because of the love of the dunya. So a parent who is following the teachings of the sunnah, and we ask that Allah give us the tawfiq to do that, they're following the teachings of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, they will um, be working on these things. So then, before we get into the age of prayer, and then after that, the age of um, uh, puberty, why is, what does one do then in the society in which we live, where from, you know, age one or two, one is it can be exposed to so much haram and so much, um, so many problematic things. First, one has to, we have to understand what the responsibility is of, 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 of guarding a saint of Allah. When Allah creates children, they're saints. Saints meaning because they're, 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 there's no sins upon them, right? So they're completely pure. 
So now a parent has been given, has been charged with the duty of protecting their innocence and maintaining that as much as possible. So now one now has to act like a shield in a lot of ways to prevent the onslaught that's coming forth their way, especially in Western society when there's no concept of fitra, there's no concept of um, uh, really of God in most places anymore. There's no concept of an afterlife. So then it's like, well, it's free game. Whatever anybody wants to do, they want to do. So, so, so one has to be actively aware of those things. And starting from young ages, we have to make sure we are guarding our children against all the uh, insidious forms of media that exist, against all the problematic television, um, shows, things on YouTube, even like inappropriate commercials. I mean, there's all sorts of filth that enters into the heart and it will immediately corrupt the heart. Immediately corrupt the heart. Like I remember I was, I went to um, someone's house and they had a, a, a Niners game on. And literally as we walked into the house, there in the Niners game, there's like 15 cheerleaders dressed completely inappropriately and in, in this house. And my son is there, a year old. And I'm just like, I can't let him, where is this? I can't let him see this. It's completely hard on for him to see. It's hard on for anybody to see. But you do not want to let a child get exposed to something like that, right? So now I don't think they, they intended on doing that. You know, for them, it was just a, a football game or whatever is on. But one has to be aware. If you're watching television, the commercials, the way people are dressed, the language that people are using, the music that's there, all of those things, that impacts the child's heart. And they will do the actions that they see. And so... In the society we live in, where innocence, they want innocence to get corrupted. There's, that's, that's an intentional part of the agenda that exists in the society on all sides of the aisle for innocence to get corrupted. It's not something that's being hidden anymore, and it's part of a, a, a deeper Dajjalic agenda that's been in existence for some time. One has to be on guard against this stuff and has to be aware that, hold on a second, yes, I'm living in the West, but I can't let the downfalls of Western society and the corruption and the uh, problematic agendas and all sorts of crazy concepts that they're teaching, teaching children at age seven, eight, nine, you can choose your gender, there's multiple genders that exist. All of it is against Islam, all of it. Allah made, makes it very clear, very clear what the Islamic teaching is. Man and female, khalas, no in-betweens. There's no, so all this pronouns, all these different types of things, this is not congruous with the Islamic upbringing. This will corrupt the fitra. And then children from a young age will start to get confused. And when they start to get confused, they will start to behave in a problematic way. And that's not, that's not appropriate. Same thing with the amount of uh, uh, ways in which this society teaches us to disrespect parents. I remember if anyone has ever watched like Family Guy or South Park or all these shows, I mean, it's, it starts even earlier than that. But it's, when I was young, my, we came here from uh, Pakistan, and so my parents barely like understood English. So at one, one point, we were watching like cartoons, and the only cartoon that was on was The Simpsons. And so we were like children. We didn't know what The Simpsons, so we just said, oh, it's a cartoon, let's watch the cartoon. And then my parents, like at some point, started watching it with, like they were watching it for a second, like, wait, what is this? What, this is not, this is not child abroad. I mean, it was absolute inappropriate jokes and, it's, and they do it very, very kind of insidiously. Um, but this was, this was like 20, 25 years ago. Right? This was a while ago. It's, it's gotten much, much, much worse. But the point is, is sometimes you just don't even know. It was like, oh, this is, there wasn't an intentional effort to research what's the Simpsons. It was, it's a cartoon. There's a baby in the show. There, there, it's all probably fine whatever it is, and same thing with a bunch of the other cartoons that were on TV. It wasn't until you get older, you realize, hold on a sec, these, these cartoons have problematic um, thoughts and they have problematic um, agendas behind them. And a lot of people who create them have a lot of corruption. So he says, protect from that young age against all of these impulses with the goal of protecting the fitra. And if we didn't protect ourselves, like you know, all the citizens and everything, we have to now do the work and do that. Okay, hold on, I know there's, Certain things maybe that we were exposed to that maybe we regret, right? And that were haram influences. So now one has to um, uh, undo all of that. And that's what practicing Islam just in and of itself, the Prophet Islam tells us, like bathing in a river multiple times a day. That's what praying, making wudu and praying is. So of course he says, with somebody who does that five times a day, will they not be clean? Of course they'll be clean. So our actions, alhamdulillah, help us from this. But if we get a chance to do it, 
you know, with, with children, with our children, we should do our best to do the utmost to protect them. He says the next is then do not let any, uh, do not let yourselves, your families, but especially your children associate with bad company. So we spoke about it in the last class as well. And you'll see all the books, they're all linked because it's all one teaching at the end of the day, which is the teaching of the Moses on, right? And so it was about bad company, bad friends, bad people to hang out with, and the impact that has. So it says people who are heedless or who are caught up in sinning or caught up in frivolity, that is going to have a negative impact on your family and negative impact on your children. And he says that it's a, in, in one quote, um, that the ruining of children, so of someone usually stems from associating with other people who have let that happen to their to their children or to or or again it could just be to content these days it doesn't have to be with people it could just literally be um, with, 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 with what somebody is consuming but this is very much very important to protect oneself again so if for example you pray and your child sees you pray so now they're getting to the age where they're going to pray right hopefully especially you know, you know once they get to like seven it's really critical that they pray. Um, but even before then, children will do what their parents are doing. They'll start praying early. They'll start just trying to pray. And now you regularly associate or hang out with people who just don't pray at all and like just reject the prayer. And it's not like a valid excuse, like a woman on a cycle or something like that. It's like they're now, and then the children reject the prayer. So now when that happens, what did the child then think? Uh, hold on a second. Why do they? Why don't they? Why aren't they praying? What about what about them? Why is that? And, and it doesn't make sense to them that, oh, well, they have a choice and they're not going to do it. And that doesn't make sense to them because prayer is obligatory, right? It's not like an optional thing. We're not talking here about reciting Quran or, you know, doing something extra. This is an essential thing. So children should be exposed, ideally, to families who are trying to uphold similar values as them, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and ideally, that will then foster an environment where they're learning together and where they're um, uh, understanding the importance of worshiping Allah. He says then that he says once they reach this age of seven, so again, he's literally going from the time of birth until the time of death. So he's going to that this is broken up in Firma Dita, which is why we'll split this up into two or three classes in Um He said they'll reach the age of seven, and at this point, one must get them to start praying and start having discipline for, for when prayer is not done. Because prayer is the first obligation. It's absolutely fundamental. It's the first question one is asked on the Day of Judgment, and it should be taken very seriously. And if so from a young age, a child knows that there's not really an excuse. It's not about only praying two or three prayers. It's not about always missing Fajr, but praying the rest. It's every prayer matters. And they're being told from an early age that every prayer matters. Now what's going to happen is the weight of that thing is going to be taken seriously. But their, their accounting does not begin until puberty. So Allah, it's mentioned in one narration that the pen is withheld from three people. A child until they reach puberty, um, a sleeper until they awake, and a, and a mad person until they recover from their madness, from their insanity. Um, so the, the, there's no, the angels are not writing anything down until the age when a child is puberty. At that age, if somebody does any good act, Right from that age until one in puberty, 12, 14, 15, whatever age ends up being, um, it's recorded as as a good deed for the parents. It's recorded as a good deed for the parents in the scrolls of the parents. Um, and it is hoped that all the good deeds they also do afterwards will also be recorded in the parents' good deed in the parents' scrolls as well as the uh, children's scrolls because the parents hopefully were the ones who helped them um, get there. So he says, then once puberty comes, accountability starts, and they, they reach the stage of being of, of being accountable. And at this point, they already should have been taught the injunctions and the commands of Allah and the prohibition. These things should have already been clear to the children. It's not that you start teaching at that age, because now the accountability has already started. So like, if you teach them at this point that it's haram to, you know, to, um, uh, to curse or whatever else it is and they're like saying bad words and now you teach them that hey don't say bad words at this age that's going to become a problem because the accountability has already started the same thing with any of the other um, uh, good deeds that one is supposed to do or rather faraya that one is supposed to do and then the haram that one is supposed to stay away from so he says at this point God commands two angels 
one on their right, one on their left. These are real angels, it's not figurative, that exist with every human being to record their deeds. The right is recording the good deeds, and the left is recording their sins. And Allah says that, that above you are guardians, this is in the Quran, noble in recording, aware of what you do. And so when the two receivers receive them, seated on the right and on the left, he utters no word, but there is with him an observer ready. And if the human, if the child can learn, and we can learn from whatever age we are able to start learning this, but hopefully children can learn this early on, that somebody is watching you. So if someone starts off with the goal of knowing Allah is always watching me, but to help them realize that, they start with saying, I have two angels watching me and writing everything down. They will act differently. How do we know? Take, start doing an action. And then have somebody come with like a big camera and start recording your action. You'll immediately start to straighten up and not act in that way, right? You see this with, um, uh, with especially when someone is doing something wrong. Start, if we're speeding on the freeway and then we see a cop car, everybody slows down, right? And because you know now somebody's watching, right? Even though before we were still going at the speed, but that we didn't necessarily think anybody was watching. Um, so the human being, I remember even yesterday, I was walking somewhere and there was like a bunch of camera crews everywhere, like ABC7, all sorts of different crews and with their cameras out. And um, uh, I, I li just thought of this example. I was like, you know, this is, I'm trying to like be on my best behavior with a camera that's going to publish it in the news. I don't know which who's there. We're just watching a bunch of people and like on the street. Um, but the... The reminder should be Allah has a recording of your whole of our whole life and it's being recorded. And Allah will start that the accounting of that recording at the time where one gets food. And so then it continues, it continues, and continues until one dies. And the angels, they're writing everything down, recording, recording, recording. And in, in, in when we repent and in Ramadan and in these blessed times, the bad is erased, which is great. Right, which is a really, really big blessing that our religion has. There's not, it's not actually difficult to repent um, in our religion, religion but that, 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 that seriousness and kind of like a, a, an awe of the accountability should be instilled from when somebody is young so that they realize, um, and it shouldn't be taught in a way that's like, this is pretend, you know, it's like a made up thing. It's a very real thing. And the more the parents act like that, the more one will start to realize how serious this is. He says, and then at this point, one starts to remind them, right? Of, um, so they had all this time where they just got to, to, to pray, or sorry, to play, essentially, um, and to just not have any accountability. And then the accountability starts. And so it's the job of the parents to continue reminding them while they're in their care that you're now accountable. You have to do the following, teaching them their religion. That also comes on, on the parents to teach us our religion. And if we didn't learn it, or if we haven't taught it, or um, if we have, we didn't get, get, get a chance to get taught it, we have to do that work ourselves, right? At whatever age we're at, whether it's 25 or 73, whatever age we're at, we have to at some point learn our religion, especially if we didn't learn it. This is all the farda ayin become essential to know. What are the farda ayin? These are the individual obligations, the obligations of knowing um, uh, your, 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 your acts of worship, how to make wudu properly, how to pray properly, how to fast properly, how to pay zakat properly, and then once someone has the ability to go to Hajj, how to go to Hajj, the nuances of when is prayer, how does one pray when traveling, all these sorts of things. Right? Not just otherwise, what happens in the human mind is one just makes things up. It's just like, well, yeah, I'll do it like this, or I'll do it like this because they weren't taught. But if somebody realizes the significance of knowledge from a young age, then that child will prioritize, and, and that family will prioritize knowledge as they continue to grow. And that's of the utmost importance to take knowledge very, very seriously. So he says, keep reminding, keep reminding, even at puberty, um, they still need encouragement and reminding and explanations of all the haram things, the prohibited things, um, and, uh, and, and he mentions the major sins in here. So he says, remind them about the obligations like prayer and fasting, keep them away from the prohibited things like adultery, drinking alcohol, homosexuality, wrongfully consuming other people's money, stealing, uh, usury, interest, um, coercion, deceit, and the list of sins go on. So he, he mentioned a few of the key ones to just make sure. And then whatever in the society you are in, that we are in, whatever sins 
happen to take a, um, precedence in that society, one should make sure their children really understand that those things are sins. Um, because it, uh, different societies are confined for different types of um, sins, and that can literally be even different towns and communities depending on uh, the, the time that they're on this in. So uh, this is um, this is also really, really uh, important. So these obligations one has to learn. Then after this point, one hits the stage of youth. What is the stage of youth? Um, the scholars define these stages slightly differently. Um, but some say that this stage goes up until right after puberty, until one is about 35 or, or 40. So this is a pretty significant um, uh, stage. So Ibn Josie, um, the scholar, he says that childhood ends at roughly 15, and then youth goes from 15 to 35 or 15 to 40. Youth is the main time it, that somebody is ideally getting their not just their foundation, their foundation should happen in late childhood, early youth, but this is the time now for someone to start working and taking life seriously. Why? He says a few things happen in youth, so we'll cover this, um, we'll cover this briefly and then we'll, we'll end, um, so I don't want it to get too late. So, he says, this is a stage where one has energy. So the vast majority of people in this room are in the stage of youth, and and others are still in their heart in the stage of youth. So, uh, and so that the himma that one has, the, the energy and the aspiration is of the utmost importance. Muslims traditionally always taught their children, especially in the early generation, the purpose of their life, and they gave them adult responsibilities when they became adults. Adult wasn't 18, adult was once you became able-bodied and you had maturity mentally over the age of puberty and a little bit after that, it takes a little bit of time, right, to kind of come into that. But there was no intermediary stage of adolescence or just long teenage period where everybody just gets to do whatever they want, all the excuses, disobey, do this, this, and that, and they were just, oh, yeah, they're just teenagers, totally fine. According to which religion is it totally fine? Not ours, right? In our religion... There is a Sayyidina Osama bin Zayd, عن, the Sahaba, he was 18 when he led his first army. He led the army into battle. And while the senior Sahaba were present, but the Prophet وسلم, chose him specifically because of leadership qualities that he had at age 18. Imam al-Haddad, the one who wrote this book, the last book that we did with him, the Book of Assistance, so before the, uh, the uh, Book of Imam Ghazali, he wrote that in his late 20s. He wrote that entire book. And in his teenage years, he would pray 100 rakah of Salat al-Duha in the morning. What is Salat al-Duha? That's an optional prayer that one does from about 7.40 a.m. right now, about 15 minutes after sunrise, until about Dohar. After his long Quran lessons or his other lessons, just 100 rakah in the masjid, and would just go to different masajids and keep praying and praying and praying. This is what they would do. We don't have to be like this, but we need to know who our, who our teachers are from a young age. Are who our um, and, and our children should know the names of these people of, of the righteous. So they have names, of course, of the prophets and then of the Sahaba and who to look up to. So that they're not looking up to like, oh yeah, this guy can shoot like web out of his fingers and like this guy can can you know fly and uh, great, that's all fine. Most of them are white dudes anyways with certain uh, you know Zionist agenda, so that's a whole separate thing. But but the, at the end of the day, they're, they're not our role models. None of them. They're fake characters anyways. Um, but our children in the society we live in, they're taught all sorts of just strange things. They're not really taught how to be um, adults, like and, and kind of and men taught to, being taught how to be men, and women being taught how to be women. Women are usually a little bit ahead of the men, so usually we're falling behind. You know, there's men until they're in their late twenties, early thirties to this day, still playing video games online, chatting with their buddies online, PlayStation, doing things. This is not the job of a man. A man has a job. A man has a dignity. A man has a responsibility in his ummah. This has to be taught. The, the men around the Prophet they knew what it was to be a man. They understood this. So from the time of youth, he says a few things. He says, start to realize that this strength is most suited at this stage for earning your rewards of ibadah, doing good works, and avoiding sins and reprehensible actions. 
And at the same time, you're so strong and passionate that also be very careful for this is the age where most people become inclined towards desires. So that and everybody has a potential cycle that they might go through where at this age, desires are very, very, very strong. And so one might incline a lot towards haram. But one can also channel the same energy that's going towards the haram and actually transform it and turn it into energy that goes, goes towards really using this time wisely in the obedience of God. Really using this time wisely in the obedience of God. So he said, while it is unusual to find a youth established in obedience and neglectful of worldly desires, even Allah mentions, or it's mentioned in Hadith that your Lord wonders at a young one who shows no passions, who doesn't exercise their passions. And another hadith, this is really amazing hadith, that one of those among the seven on the shade of Allah's throne of the Day of Judgment is the young man or young woman who grew up in the service of God. So growing up in the service of God, so he's defining this as 15 to 35. And a significant portion of that time, if they were using that time to obey Allah and to resist the desires of society, because this is the age in which everybody's like, you do anything. I can do this, I can go to a party, I can drink, I can go to a club. I have plenty of time to live. I have plenty. I remember when I was in middle school, middle school or high school, um, you know, there was a friend of mine, and uh, we would talk about that he was Muslim. We were the only two Muslims in the least that I knew. And he was just like, yeah, well, let's just do all of it. We'll do Hajj when we're like 40. And, and, it was like, and it was a very, like, real concept. They're like, yeah, just do hajj and erase all the sins, but, like, let's, everybody else is living it up, right? So why don't – and so that was, like, a very real um, uh, thought that crosses the mind when you're young because the desires are strong. Everybody's in relationships. Everybody is um, – uh, uh, maybe maybe at some point gets caught up in substance, using some substance of some sort. And so one wonders, why not me? But he says, this is what if someone teaches correctly from a young age, and Allah gives them tawfiq, he says, their eternity is set for them just based on how they use their youth. Because it was such a strong time that they, so much could have gone wrong, especially in, in Western society. So many tests and temptations are in front of us growing up. And so if one is protected from these, alhamdulillah. Um, and so Allah says, subhanAllah, in another narration, that, oh, young man or young woman, who has abandoned their passions for my sake, you are to me as are some of my angels. That's how beloved you are to me. You are to me as are some of my angels because you abandon your passions, not because you couldn't physically engage in them. At some point, someone has a desire. They might not even have the energy to act on that desire. No. Because you did it for me and for my sake. So he says, this is the age that one should really, um, uh, from 15 to 35, that one should really take um, seriously and one should seize the opportunities in this age. Really, really find ways to use this time wisely in ibadah, in worship. As one gets older, the himma is just not there. One can't just go the same amount of time without sleeping as much or without eating as much. Um, fasting might become more difficult. A lot of things become more difficult for somebody. But when that himma exists, instead of exerting all of that himma towards something that's fun or recreational or haram, one should say, I'm going to dedicate a portion of that and dedicate it towards my Lord. And um, as the Prophet ﷺ said in one narration, seize the opportunity. Seize five before five. Your youth before you get old. This is the one he starts with. Why didn't he start with the others? Because this is so important. Seize the age when you are young before you get old, and then your health before you fall sick, your, your extra time, your leisure time before you get busy, your wealth before you get poor, and your life before you die. So life, obviously, all-encompassing, one must seize this life before they die. The youth before we get old. So my advice to all of us that if we are blessed at this stage or if we have younger siblings or others that to advise and to remind, uh, Allah says, remind for reminding benefits the believers, right? For that period, I think that's what we need. Remind, because we sometimes have to remember, you know what? I do have a purpose. There is a, there is a reason I'm here. It's not just going to all go away. And then our role model should be people who accomplished a lot in their youth um, spiritually. And then that will help us realize, yeah, they, they can do it. I can hopefully do a portion of that, at least. Um, I can do a portion of that. And then in one narration, the feet of a servant will not move away from 
uh, their place on the day of judgment until they're asked about five things, their life and how they spent it and their youth and what they exhausted their youth in. This is one of the key questions one asks and then their wealth and the five things we listed out. How did they acquire it? What did they do with it? One of the key questions one is asked that we'll have to answer God for if we have to face reckoning on the day of judgment is what did we do in our youth? What did we do when we were young? How did we spend that time? And it's totally okay, and then we'll end with this, it's totally okay to spend a portion of our time relaxing, hanging out with friends, playing sports, doing recreational things, you know, working out, all these things, totally fine. But what we want to avoid is getting into a phase where our kind of fun exceeds our seriousness, or our seriousness is, is at maybe 5% of the time, and everything else is just about fulfilling some thing that makes us, um, you know, outwardly, it's, it's really, really exciting. That's what we want to So for some people, it might be that one is struggling to not do haram at this age. That's the most important thing to stay away from. And one, it's much better to just be engaged in recreational, like, um, things than it is to be engaged in anything that's haram or impermissible. But for somebody who's taking the spiritual path seriously, that now it becomes, okay, how, how do I use my leisure time, as the Prophet said, to do ibadah, or to do worship, or to do learn some knowledge, like 20 minutes a day, an hour a day, whatever time someone can do, 15 minutes a week, right? To learn some Quran, to memorize some, some Quran, to serve our parents, to serve our elders, whatever that good one can do, bring good into our life. And if at young ages we can start to create ways in which we encourage each other to good, like one of my friends, he had this, um, uh, he, he would always, he would one day, sometimes he would just call me and he'd be like, hey, you want to go feed, uh, uh, feed the less fortunate? Or let's just go pick up a bunch of pizzas and feed the less fortunate. And usually people when they call, they're like, hey, you want to go watch a movie? You want to go? And so, okay, now like a couple of friends would get together. They would still get to kick it. They would still get to like eat food and hang out. But in that time, they were praying together and they were feeding people who were less fortunate together. That's like an example of a way in which one is using their energy and their youth, um, uh, that, that, that intention that he had, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a way to use that time wisely, right? Um, and so these are examples in which uh, one can try to spend, um, spend their, their, their time. He says, youth is the time when acquiring knowledge, merit, and ideally attaining to positions in the religion and, and um, are, are possible. So... Um, uh, this is this is and and and, 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 a, and, a, and, and a poet says in one poet if one does not prevail in the nights of their youth when they're young then they shall never prevail even if they live, live long because it's most of your life other than youth isn't that the most critical part of your life so take what you can from it and don't neglect it neglect it not um, and they the righteous predecessors used to advise those when they see young people they said use your youth before you become like us old people and too weak to perform any acts of goodness, right? And um, that, that at some point, a regret might sink in. Um, that, you know what, I could have done so much more, why didn't I do it? We don't want to be in that stage. We want to be in the stage where we say, you know what, alhamdulillah, yes, I could have done more, but I did do my best. That's what we should teach ourselves, our children, and anyone in this stage, that there's a purpose and there's a time, and this is the key time, this age, and this age has a uh, time limit and it expires. And as Imam Ghazali says in one of his books, that your time is your capital. Every minute or second that goes away is time you'll never get back, ever. You can't buy that back. Someone can give you a billion dollar investment um, or a billion dollars in his hand to you and you can never say, you know what, I'm gonna buy back the last one hour of my life. Impossible. So using time wisely, investing in it, investing it to then reap rewards for the Akira is of the utmost importance. And um, it's specifically, we should try to make sure we do it in this stage. And the stages leading up before youth should help lay the foundations for using the time wisely after. So with that, we'll end. Um, and then uh, next time, we'll get into the stage of maturity, advanced age, which is called seniority, which is 50 to 70. Um, so maturity is about 35 to 50, and then 50 to 70. And then after that, um, it's uh, uh, one is when passing into the stage of decrepitude, and then uh, one passes away. So this is like the general structure. Anybody can pass away at any time, obviously, um, as as was mentioned in the beginning. So with that, if there's any questions, we'll do a few questions. 
Yeah. Yes, the five for five. So it is, um, good question. It is, seize the opportunity to make use of five things before five things. Your youth before you grow old. Your health before you fall sick or lose your health. Um, your free time or leisure time before you become busy and occupied. That's the third. The fourth, your wealth before you grow poor. And fifth, your life before you die. These are the capital um, that the human being has in this life. Yes? Um, like using your life before you die? That part? It's a good question. Um, so I think the first four are actually kind of like commentaries on the final one. Basically, so it's like your youth before your old age, your health, because your life essentially is your time and your health and your um, your your money, your income, and then overall your um, ability, right? And those are those are the constitutions essentially of your life. But you can think about that in a in a, in a deeper way as well, where um, one uses the ultimate purpose of their life wisely. So it's not just that okay, I'm going to use like the day-to-day -day wisely, but like I'm marching towards a direction and I know what that direction is and I know that I'm moving towards a direction where I'm going to meet Allah. So I'm making intentions regularly even if I can't do the action. I'm hoping and planting the seeds even though I don't see the fruit being, um, you know, the, the, the ultimately coming to fruition and so on. So that's the, the kind of sense I get. You know? sorry, sorry, something that preserves... Right, yeah, something that preserves your 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 your, um, your humility and fosters in the traits that Allah wants us to get in this life um, to ultimately present ourselves before Him. So once someone dies, it's done. There's no deeds left. I mean, there's a few deeds. Your Sadiq Ajariya and then your children can donate certain deeds in your favor. But for the most part, your deeds are done. So the Prophet والسلام, was constantly reminding us and is constantly reminding us, use the entire life that you have because that's it, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, and then after that, it's eternity. So every minute had a major impact in the next life if, if one used it or didn't use it. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, sister. Uh, what, can, what is that? Good question. Um, to what extent can du'a change your provisions or what's written for you? So there's various hadith which talk about the impact of du'a, and then what is meant by um, uh, what's written, and then the different stages of something that is actually written. The mo the thing that we should operate under is that du'a can change things. Um, there's one narration which mentions um, that du'a can change your other. At a very different level, though, and this is a plane we can't understand, Allah already knew that you were going to make that du'a, and he enabled you and inspired you to make the dua. And so at a higher plane, in a higher dimension, because Allah is eternal and doesn't operate in past, present, or future, it's all present for Allah, um, it was already given to you. But the way that we should think about it is that, um, uh, that our dua can have an impact. And then beyond that, everything will just lead to like philosophical confusions because the human being, the human uh, intellect can't interpret these different realms, the realm of the Jabarut and the Malakut and so on and so forth. It'll just lead. So, so, so the, the, the khulasa is, the summary is that um, we, something is written, we make dua for things that, and we're, if we're inspired to make those duas, then we hope that those duas, inshallah, will be accepted and will always result in some form of good for us. But it gets very nuanced. That question is like the question that the greatest thinkers of the religion have grappled with and have written lengthy, lengthy books about. Um, yeah. yeah, Homer.
Mommy, Daddy. Yeah. So the question is, um, the, the question is about, you know, how, how do we think about what we expose our children to and how you protect them without um, keeping them in a, in a, in a, you know, space bubble the whole time, um, which, you know, sometimes I try uh, with that. Uh, I can't find one that works, and uh, yeah, if you have one, let me know. Um, and then, and then, at what point do we like start exposing them to things to kind of expose their, you know, build their immune system? Um, so, what what has been taught in our uh, understanding is one has to do their best, but one cannot rely only on their efforts. So that's the first principle here, meaning you have to rely on Allah at the end of the day. And if one is not coupling their protect, their um, attempts at protecting their children from haram with du'a regularly in tahajjud, breaking themselves before their Lord in the deep parts of the night, weeping before Allah, Ya Allah, protect my children, Ya Allah, protect my children, then one can expect that one is essentially relying on their efforts, right? If, if, and it doesn't have to be at that time specifically, but that's the time that we are taught in our religion where the the, um, the abid, the worshiper, is, is having their intimate moments with their Lord begging their Lord for whatever deep things are on their mind. And so this should obviously be one of them, um, given how important it is. So that's the first thing. Reliance is ultimately on Allah. Um, because you could do all the things, and it's, it's up to God what direction he takes somebody in. That being said, one does take all the precautions, and um, it should be done so in a wise manner where you don't normalize things just because the society you live in has normalized them. So it's almost like sometimes we might water something down and say, well, yeah, no, it's fine. Everybody's doing it, so I have to socialize them. No, 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 hold on a sec. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it okay. And this could be something as small as, I mean, it's not small, but for example, if our children go to public school and they learn history written by these occupying Zionist-minded people, incorrect history, history that overemphasizes one group of people and everybody else is just thrown under the bus, at least what we were taught in school, um, now you're going to teach your children something. And then as Muslims, you don't learn anything prideful about your history, even though while the dark ages were happening for the Europeans and for the Kofar, the enlightenment was happening for the Muslims. And so they don't teach you these things. So from that, even that agenda has an intention behind it. I would argue it's essential for Muslims to protect for, against that agenda, but everybody would have their own kind of approach to doing it. But the fundamentals of not exposing them to haram, there's five. There's what you see, what you listen to, what you say, what you eat, um, uh, and then what you basically let into your into your heart, thoughts that you let into your heart, the frameworks, the philosophies that you're exposed to. One has to do their utmost to do whatever they can to protect them from the, the most difficult of haram. Even if that you might consider it over sheltering, I would. Um, our teachers have mentioned that in the society we live in, because it's been watered down so much, the the bar has become really really low. So it's highly unlikely that one is going to um, uh, to kind of go over over the top, right? But it depends on your own himma and your own intentions for your children, right? So um, if you go into like a grocery store and they have you know some random song playing, like, and you're like, I can't let my child listen to the song, so I'm going to leave the grocery store. There's like a nursery rhyme playing. You're like, my the instruments are hurrah. I mean, then that's a, that, that. I don't prescribe to that. I would think that's a little much. But if somebody wants to, that's their prerogative, right, to do that. But if like somebody is like you know, playing highly inappropriate music in front of your children and they're just listening to it and being exposed to it, we know that has a spiritual reality to it. And one might want to avoid maybe going to like a concert where that, that is taking place. Right? So you, everybody is going to have their bar and um, going to expose it. So it, the intellect must be guarded. The heart must be guarded. The eyes must be guarded. The ears must be guarded. And the people who we hang out with and do they talk about gossip? Do they talk about that? Do they backbite? Do they do we backbite? Like all the things we do as parents that our children are exposed to. Sometimes it's it's, it's on us that we have to start with always, and then kind of talk about what else they're exposed to. Um, media is arguably the biggest door to shade. It is the biggest uh, satanic influence. It is so to do so effectively would mean to shut off majority of media access. That's that's what the view of these I prescribe to. Um, so I would not recommend having a television in your house um, and, and not letting at least like a, like a limitless um, watching of these types of things. Highly, highly, highly regulated uh, intentions of what's being consumed. But that might be not something that uh, you know, everybody would, would do, but the, uh, up to everybody individually. Um, but just being mindful of what haram influences can come through these types of things. The last question about 
when do we start exposing their immunity? You never throw them out there to expose their immunity to the haram. What we're taught is you explain to them, like you get to a certain point and now a child might start having feelings for the opposite gender. You don't just say, hey, go experience it. It's instead you say, hey, you're at this point now. Let's talk about what does that actually mean. And so knowledge in our religion always, always, always start. It starts everything. And knowledge is, in our religion is amazing. Because the Prophet Sallallahu talked about every, there was no, no topic that was too uncomfortable in the hadith. Everything, intimacy, all of these things are all spoken about, right? Like it's not something that is, that we're shy from, we're, especially when it comes to protecting someone's religion. So um, uh, one would teach them through knowledge and through examples of what not to do. And still, I think, protect from people who might expose, um, you know, be, 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 be exposed to that. But um, all of everything I just stated is purely theoretical because I only have a child who's very small. So to the parents in the room who have much older children, is there, is there advice you would add to that? Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Always the dua, the adab is and ya Allah do what's best for me. And because I don't know what's best, you were the most knowledgeable. Yeah. But all the advice about, you know, kids like exposure and stuff is, it's already been mentioned like, you know, like the parents being alive with your own surroundings. This is what your kids are going to be exposed to. So, you know, so basically, when you're married, your parents' friends are married. When they lose our dad, those other thoughts, they're going to think, okay, these feelings are okay, but it's in your boundaries of marriage, it's in the institution of marriage. You know, so it's like, it's not already has like the, the blueprint, and now you, you can put everything in this each department, you know, where it goes, and they'll see where it all fits. So, and then it's really no shelter in the beginning. But once your kid asks you about something, they go forward and put you down. Just so we as the parents or family members or siblings 
start to add and stir the pot and add ingredients mm -hmm. based on culture, based on our Akita or like our interpretations of the Quran and something, right? Then we start adding to the soup. But um, in terms of like exposure, right? You can only do so much. Reliance on a lot is, is first and foremost. Daddy! Like, me, personally, I'm, I'm a reaper. So, like, my family, they're, they're not a stretch. Um, because of that, right, I'm looking towards the future, right? Inshallah, whether it's whatever Allah has made my children or no children. How do I. Circumvent or circumnavigate relationships ties and then protecting my child. And what if protecting my child comes at the cost of maintaining the relationships with the people? Or if you're going through the Muslim right people with maybe improper Akita. Right. How do you play? Compensate. Is that is that a question? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so the question is, what as is, if we are engaging with um, family members who are non-Muslims, um, or maybe a Muslim but they're not practicing, or maybe have an incorrect understanding of things, what's the balance between maintaining the family ties but then not allowing our children or ourselves to be impacted by that? Um, so there's one always begins with the spiritual elements, and then one goes into the practical elements. So Allah mentions in the Quran um, that the, when you recite the Quran, Allah puts a hijab between you and between those who do not believe. What does that mean? That the recitation of the Quran in and of itself and doing certain uh, uh, types of adhkar in the morning and in the evening and then reciting certain surahs will automatically allow for a shield in the spiritual realm to protect one. This shield has multiple advantages. It has the advantages of, um, uh, of protecting the heart against the sins and protecting the mind against problematic ideologies, improper aqidah, or just atheistic philosophies, and so on and so forth. So, at minimum, um, one does the three quls, uh, so the falak surah nas, three times in the morning, three times in the evening, the ayat of kursi, and then there's various other supplications. Um, many of you have that book or the app, Fortress of the Muslim, right? That it has them all in there of the du'as one should do in the morning and the evening. Those must, those should be taken more seriously than any physical medicine we take. If we have a pain and we take Tylenol, before we ask Allah for that pain, we're, to be relieved of the pain, we haven't realized really um, the, 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 who is the one who's going to relieve pain. Similarly, when it comes to these things, the spiritual precautions one starts with. That's the first. The second is, um, with that understanding in mind, one always keeps a balanced approach to engaging with um, family and with people who might have kind of an improper understanding. So until they've done something wrong, one does not assume that they will do something wrong, right? So if um, we go over to someone's house and nothing wrong has happened, but then our child tells us, hey, I saw them do this or do this or do whatever else it is that was like, you know, maybe uh, uh, they said something that was inappropriate or um, some, someone might have drank alcohol in front of them, but you didn't know that they were going to do that. Now one knows, okay, hold on a second. Um, if I knew before they would for sure do that, I should not take them to that environment. But if it happens like where you had no understanding that that haram was going to take place, um, you now explain, okay, that's not something we do, right? This is something that is not from our religion. And one walks through the, um, uh, the, the, the wisdoms in our religion um, behind why that's not appropriate and why it's actually a better lifestyle than one lives if someone stays away from those haram things. Um, now when one interacts with those people, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. I can do it in environments where that's not going to take place. So if everybody is going um, uh, to a dinner where for sure there's gonna be a lot of drinking, there's gonna be a lot of these things, perhaps I don't take my children to that dinner, but I just go to say salam and to, or to say hello, or whatever else it is with my non-Muslim family. Um, or one says, you know what, I'm just gonna stay away from it. I'm gonna invite them to my house. And I'm going to invite them to my house a lot. And when they invite them to my house, they say, hey, no alcohol in my house. None of this. But you, we're going to eat, we're going to have barbecue, we're going to, we're going to do all the different things. Um, you know, but we're not going to engage in those types of things. One can meet up at um, you know, a picnic or something. So one finds creative ideas. I know one of many of our teachers, actually, many of our shu, their families are non-Muslims. Or they converted to Islam eventually after like decades. They still would go to the family reunions. They still would go to the different things, but they would just very wisely navigate 
what was being done and would just remove themselves from certain situations when that situation got to a kind of bad instance. When it comes to the Muslim family members, um, uh, one has to be careful that improper aqidah usually very rarely is discussed in um, like a social setting, for example. So, for, so if somebody believes that doesn't prescribe to the school of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, let's just say that even if they're Shia, it's highly unlikely one is going to get into that discussion in like a family dinner. I would not think it's wise to say I'm never going to see that person because their aqidah, they prescribe to this school of thought and I prescribe to this school of thought. That would be in the realm of where Allah says, Wala and do not, do, do not um, create sectarianism and sectarian differences. This is something that the Muslims have, we really struggle with as a community, but alhamdulillah, that at least now we are uniting against Zionism and we're as Muslims, Sunnis, Shias, Sufis, Wahhabis, everybody is uniting, right? But, but otherwise there was a lot of this, you're this, I'm this, so we can't hang out. Um, and, and, and lastly, one tries to show our family the good in people instead of finding the one or two things that they do. Every one of us is imperfect and every one of us is going to sin, but it doesn't mean that we stop interacting socially. We always try to say, you know what? Yeah, maybe that person didn't pray at the gathering and it's not ideal. I'm not never going to go to their house because they didn't pray. Um, but instead, we're going to talk about, you know, they did. They fed us a really good meal. They spent a lot of time cooking for us. Then feeding people, as mentioned in the Quran, is a virtue. So one tries to show the positives of that um, instead, especially when these are sparing interactions and not like day-to-day -day interactions. And the day-to-day -day interactions, I would uh, advise us being a lot more careful about who is exposed to. But like once every three months, six months, the random uncle that, you know, maybe no one is, is the closest to, um, that that uncle might say a thing, few things and you just kind of remove yourself and say, hey, I'm going to go check on the pie or something and just like get out, even if there's no pie, just get out of the situation. So um, we're at time and we're getting, it's getting pretty late. So um, I think we're going to conclude if there's any questions online, we'll take one question online and then we'll um, go to them. So. So this course, uh, the class is 7 p.m. Pacific time. Um, we're in California, uh, Oakland, California. It's live uh, streamed every week, but 7.15 is it actually starts. Um, Oakland, California, Lighthouse Mosque. The name of the book, for those who are asking, is The Lives of Man by Imam Al-Haddad. That's what we're talking through, and we just started the text. What was the name? Uh, the name of the book, uh, The Lives of Man. The Lives of Man, yeah, short book. Highly recommend get on Amazon for like twelve dollars. By uh, Imam Al Haddad, H A D D A D. So if we didn't get to the questions, we'll get to them next time. Apologies um, uh, for that. And these questions, these uh, will be posted for those who are asking. Um, it will be posted on YouTube. Um, uh, the live, there's also a live stream on the, uh, MCC East Bay YouTube in case anyone. Um, so we're live streaming to MCC YouTube. So for those asking, um, with some community center East Bay YouTube channel, inshallah it'll be posted like you know next couple days. We'll go ahead and make the last one. I'm not even coming back here, but I mean, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil awwalin wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil akhirin wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil malala la yom din. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة ومكنا ذاب النار ربنا أخذ لنا صبرا وثبت قدامنا وانصرنا للقوم الكافرين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا وحاب يا تواب يا قوي يا حسين يا حفيد يا حفيد يا حفيد يا رحم الرحيمين يا رحم المساكين يا رب we ask you يا الله you are the most merciful you are the one who protects you are the one who gives strength يا الله that you that you bestow your mercy and your protection يا رب العالمين and your assistance upon our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine يا رب العالمين يا الله that you stop the oppression and the corruption and the genocide and all of the things that are taking place there. Ya Rabbi, we ask, Ya Allah, on behalf of all of those who cannot ask, on behalf of all of those who are struggling, who don't have food, that you feed them, who don't have water, that you give them water to drink, who don't have clothing, that you clothe them, who don't have families, that you take care of them. Ya Rabbi, we ask that you put them under your special protection, your special inaya and your special wilaya. Ya Rabbi, Alameen, we ask that you take care of, of the Muslimin. We ask that you give faraj to the Muslims in Gaza, to the Muslims in Palestine, Ya Allah, we ask that you give them the best of faraj, the best of relief, the best of mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you give 
relief to this ummah and that you give victory to this ummah and that you give them victory over these kuffar, ya Allah. We ask that you make their feet firm and that you give them patience and that you give them tawakkul in you and that you give them the highest and highest and highest of rewards in the highest stations of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, for all of the difficulty and adversity and tribulation and sacrifice that they are making. We ask that you accept all of those who have passed as shuhada and that you give them the highest stations of shahada and that you give them the best of lives in the next life, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you that you help those, Ya Rabbil Alameen, who are struggling, Ya Allah. You say that you do not turn away the dua of the oppressed, and there are so many who are oppressed who are turning to you, Ya Allah. We are weak before you as an ummah. We have nobody to turn to, no country, nobody, no ruler, but we have you, Ya Rabbil and you are all we need. We turn to you, Ya Allah. As an ummah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, on behalf of our Muslims, Ya Rabbil Alameen, on behalf of this ummah, we ask you, Ya Allah, that you send your special, special, special assistance and protection and strength and madad and, and, and special, special, special rahmah and mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to the children, to the men, and to the women, and to the elderly, and to all of those in Philistine who are suffering, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and to the Muslims all around the world who are suffering. We ask that you give relief to this ummah. We ask that you allow us, Ya Allah, in the blessings that we are that we are soaking up and in the time that we have and in all the health and all the wealth and the protection and the comforts that we have that you let us take advantage of these moments and that you let us seek knowledge and that you let us worship you properly and that you let us focus on you and that you do not allow our time to be wasted and that you do not allow us to be people of distraction and people who waste our lives away we ask that you allow us to use our lives wisely and to use our lives in the best of ways and to use our lives in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam we ask you for everything good the prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam asked for we ask that you give us protection for everything evil that he sought protection from sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam wa sallam wa alhamdulillah wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullah wa alayhi wa sallam so we're going to continue on inshallah we are talking about this new series that we started around the second um, class about it, which is the journey, the soul's journey from the pre-eternal life, uh, from the time before we were even conceived, up through the t uh, all the different stages of the life of the human being until we meet Allah and until one is destined for either the Jannah or Jahannam. And so we are speaking about the second stage, so we're going to continue talking about that today, which is really the most critical one to be aware of, which is the life that we're in right now. So we spoke about the stage of, uh, from the time that, from the time where we meet Allah in the realm of, uh, where Allah asks us to bear witness uh, about His creating us, and uh, when Allah asks every single creation, all of Bani Adam, am I not your Lord? And everybody says, Alu bala shahidna. Yes, you are our Lord, and we bear witness to that. And it's important to keep reminding ourselves of this because the human being goes on a journey where we forget, where this is lodged, the reality of this meeting with our Lord is lodged deep inside of us. There's different layers to your inner realm, to our inner realm. There is the qalb, the heart, and there is the ruh, the spirit, there is the sin, the secret, there is the sin, a sin, the secret of the secret. Lodged deep inside of the human being is this deep recollection that Allah is our Lord and what we are created to do and the purpose that we have. But as we go throughout our life, especially in this dunya, we get covered, we get layered. All sorts of veils cover us and we have to work on uncovering these veils to unlock that reality this fitra, this primordial state which exists in order to start to move in the right direction again. The stage in which you do that, that is the dunya, that is the, the life that we are in right now, which is um, the time again that from when you are born until the time that you and I die. This is the stage of accountability as well. So uh, that's what we'll be focusing on, inshallah. Um, and we've already spoken about a few of these stages. We'll recap what we discussed with regards to the stage of youth since um, that's the, the, the stage in which mo someone has the most energy, and then we'll get through the rest, inshallah, today. So just to recap, youth is from the time that somebody, um, roughly about 14, 15, uh, from the time when someone hits puberty, their accountability begins, until the time where they're about 35 to 40, according to different scholars. So that is known as the stage of youth. It is the stage in which one has the most amount of energy that they can devote to either haram or to obeying Allah. And most people devote their energy to disobeying Allah. And this stage is what he's saying because uh, the, the idea is, well, it can change later. I'll, I'll work on myself later and so on. 
But this is the age where if somebody devotes their life to Allah and devotes their youth to Allah, they will be set moving forward, inshallah. They will be set moving forward based on a hadith where the Prophet wasallam tells us that your Lord wonders at somebody who's young who shows no passions. And another hadith, which the one of those who are under the promise the shade of Allah's throne on the day of judgment is the person who worshipped Allah in their youth. So that's the, in this stage um, that many are in right now. So um, that being said, we spoke about what we should avoid in our youth. There are two or three things, a summary um, of where he said we should focus on. The first is to protect ourselves and getting them in a mindset of protecting ourselves from all forms of haram, from all forms of things that are impermissible. This is easier said than done. One has to be aware of their inclinations based on the stage that they're at. When someone is 15 to 25, they have different desires and different hormones that are being activated than when they get into their 30s, let's say. So one has to know which desires trigger me as an individual based on my temperament, based on my upbringing, based on what I've seen growing up, and so on and so forth. And then one must guard themselves against the, these desires. And the entire spiritual path is based on protecting oneself against the main appetites that the human being has. This includes the desire, the sexual desire, which is very, very strong in the, in the phase of youth, as is the desire for fame and power and money and, 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 and so on and so forth. These, these are all desires that human being has, which can either help you or it can ruin you. One of the, if somebody channels them in the right direction, um, it can be good, but if somebody obeys the desire instead of obeying Allah, it will be that energy rather, not the desire. Um, if someone uses that energy to obey Allah, then that's going to be set them up for success. If someone uses that energy to disobey Allah and to cave into their desire, then they will be setting themselves up um, for a very, very difficult stage. Um, he says, the second thing you and I can do is learn to manage our time. Because youth is very much a stage in which we think we have plenty of time. I have my whole life ahead of me. I have plenty of time. I can make all my mistakes right now and just change later. And so the one who understands that their time is the only thing they've been given, and that if they don't use their time wisely in this stage, it's highly unlikely that they will have the foundations, it's possible, that they will have the foundations to use their time wisely as they get into later stages. And for the one who's traveling the spiritual path, they understand the deep value of time. It's not meant to be wasted, it's not meant to, um, uh, it's only meant to be taken advantage of because it is how we invest in our next life. And the third is to acquire knowledge during this time and start to practice it. It becomes harder and harder and harder to acquire knowledge as one grows older. And it's still very, 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 very critical that one continues on the path of acquiring knowledge as we get older. But when one is young and they're free and they don't have the same level of family responsibilities and they don't have all these different things and, and the stress of work has yet to necessarily become as burdensome, they are learning. And most of us, we spend our youth learning yeah, secular knowledge, which is not a problem. But what, he's mean, what he means here is use the time to acquire spiritual and sacred knowledge. And so if we're still in that phase of our life, then we need to use our time wisely. And the key moment for the, he doesn't mention this here, but it's mentioned in other texts, the key time for the ummah that's blessed, that if someone who takes advantage of it will have gained the most amount of good in their life, inshallah, is the time from Fajr to the early morning. That is the time. This ummah has been blessed in that time. And so the person who recognizes from a young age the importance of going to sleep early, waking up early, staying awake after Fajr, no, no, no matter how difficult that is, using that time to study and to do dhikr and, to, and to, 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 to work on things that will be ways of drawing them near to Allah, they will notice immense barakah in their life. So that's something practical that we can take away, especially in these winter months, which we're still in, where the nights are very long, there's plenty of time to sleep. It's not like you have to wake up at 4 o'clock for budget. Budget's coming in at 6 a.m., 5.55 a.m., roughly. It's, it's very, very doable for someone to sleep, to sleep a good amount of time, start their day, pray the hajjud, start their day at budget, get their coffee in, and just start moving, learning, doing bigger, whatever they need to do before their work day starts or their school day starts, rather than, than, than just a very, very quick budget, go back to sleep, wake up. Two minutes before we're supposed to be somewhere, quickly get ready, and like that, 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 that way of living will either keep somebody productive and 
moving in the right direction or keep somebody um, lazy and, and, and moving in the wrong direction. And that's not to say yet for someone who in their youth will say, I don't need to wake up with Fajr because I have plenty of time to do so later. That's also a trick of shaitan. He says, oh, you can do this later right now. Sleep. Gotta sleep. No, 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 no. That the, the, the youth is the time to get the ibadah down because it becomes much harder to have the energy when someone gets um, older to take the ibadah as seriously. Take the ibadah as seriously. So these are the three. And then the fourth, which is um, important to add in the context that we live in, one must be mindful of the common practices of the age that they live in that can spoil their youth. So every age is different. Every age, meaning every epoch, every um, time, century that somebody lives in, every era rather, that someone lives in will have different desires, will have different ways of pulling somebody in one direction or another direction. The time, the society, the culture that one lives in, one has to be aware. Okay, what are the downfalls of the society that I live in and what is it calling me to that negates my responsibility to Allah? And how do I actively counteract that? So, I mean, the, the Imam was saying this on Friday, right? Like in the time we live in, there is an active uh, uh, focus on trying to, to, to confuse people about their manhood, as an example for the men. They're trying to confuse people about their manhood, about trying to confuse people about what their role and their responsibility actually is in the society that they live in based on what Allah wants from them. So if somebody's aware of that, they will need to make sure that in the stage they're in, especially in their youth, where they're most susceptible, you usually can't change people's minds when they're 55, 60. If you can, let me know what tricks you're using. Uh, but usually it's pretty difficult. You're usually able to get through to people most when they're younger and they're still, and that's also a beauty in why young people are so hopeful and so in, in, in terms of their, their desire to change the world and in the desire to actually make an impact. If someone, as they get more advanced in age, they might start to think, oh, this, I've been seeing this for decades, not going to change. When we're younger, someone has this himma, this hope, but also that means the mind is susceptible to go in different directions, different philosophies, ideologies, and understandings can influence somebody in one direction or another. And so we have to be on guard against that. This is where knowledge will serve as a force field, as a shield against improper ideologies, improper understanding uh, of, of things coming in. So seeking knowledge and then being mindful of what practices are going to mess me up. So in the time of Ibrahim, salam, for example, or in the time the surah, the surah, uh, surah al-Kaf, the surah of the cave, everybody was, was worshipping idols at their stages of their life, especially when they were... Um, uh, uh, well, well, at all stages really of their life, idol worship was a big, big component of it. Meaning literally would create a physical idol, they would have their temple, they would go to it, they would worship the idol, they would ask it for things and so on. And so from a young age to their older ages, one had to guard themselves against this sin, this sin of shirk and this sin of thinking that an inanimate object can somehow have divine powers and abilities. In the time that we live in, that's, I mean, I don't see that happening, really, at least not here in America. Very, 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 I don't think I've ever met someone who's like made an idol out of stone, put it in front of them and started bowing down to the idol. And they would do what they worship here, a lot of people, they worship science. They worship um, different scientific theories, meaning like they, they, an atheistic understanding of the world, right? A lot of people just automatically will believe the theory of evolution without ever challenging the, the core uh, fundamentals of it. So these things, they become sattiya, they become their religion, basically. So that's what they're, but that worship is not outward. It's not visible yet till you talk to them, till you see, till you see what they're teaching in schools and so on. So one must be aware in their youth, in this stage of 15 to 35, of what are the things that could get in my mind, the mind of my children, and I have to counteract them. Same thing with different practices of sin. Different societies throughout different eras have different um, sins that they struggle with. Some uh, societies, there is more of an inclination to doing certain types of drugs or drinking or partying. Others, there is um, finan the financial sins are the big ones, right? Taking out interest bearing loans and so on and so on. The different, different people, literally depending on the people who we hang out with, how we grew up, they will be impacted by different sins in their youth. And one has to be aware of what those sins are, right? And, 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 and the sin of luxury, for example, over excessive exuberant spending on things, it will, it will not afflict somebody who has very little money. 
their sin might be a different type of sin than their fruit. So one has to know, okay, based on where I've been placed in the circumstances I'm in in my life, what sins are most prevalent around me that I need to uh, uh, guard myself against so I don't corrupt my youth. Um, so this is the key, and, and uh, the essence of it, uh, or the, the final part of it, is just to not let ourselves get in a state of justification of where we'll change our lives later. The more one can have role models of people who, from a young age, were very living straight, straight, upright lives, the easier it will be to say, you know what, that's totally possible. Instead of somebody saying, hmm, that's not possible, again, I'll do it when I'm way, way, way older. It, 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 it is possible. Some of the most resilient people, and they'll like, give our brothers and sisters in Palestine complete, complete, complete confidence and belief and victory. Some of the most resilient people right now, in terms of their struggle and their resistance against this uh, Zionist occupation are people in their youth who are young, who are standing up for the Ummah, who are standing up for Islam, and who are, who are exemplifying immense amount of patience and fortitude. So it is possible at a young age. It doesn't have to, to be somebody who's much more advanced. So youth, that's the key. The second is this age of maturity. So now he says, okay, somebody gets past this stage and they get into the stage of maturity. He says, this sees... Um, where someone will, 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 on their youth, they're on their way up, this is the peak. The peak, meaning the peak of what? Of wisdom and of intelligence. So Ibn al-Jawzi, he says that this stage begins at 35 and ends around 50, in the 50s, in the early 50s. So he says here what happens is that one will start to attain if Allah wishes good for them. And again, the precursor to this is Allah gives it to somebody, and of course, if Allah gave them the ability to practice what they needed to practice in their youth, Allah will give them immense wisdom. And now in this stage, ideally, repentance and returning to God constantly dominate the quality of this person. That they're, they really want to return to Allah. They know that they have to, and they try to focus as much as possible on constantly turning back to Allah every time they make a mistake, every time they make an error, a slip, they turn back to their Lord. Because that wisdom has become clear. As Allah says in the Quran, and when uh, he attained his prime, we gave him wisdom and strength, and, du- and, and thus do we reward the good. And then uh, in another dua, I believe this is referring to, um, I'm so sorry, but this might be referring to Sayyidina Ismail, um, the son of Ibrahim, but of not her censure. And until when he attained full strength and reached 40 years, he said, my Lord, inspire me to give thanks for that which you have favored me and my parents and to do good works that are pleasing to you and be gracious to me in the matter of the, the, the of my children, of my seed, of, of those in my loins. Truly, I have turned to you repentant and truly I am of those who are from the Muslims, from those who have submitted. So here, Allah is showing, okay, at, there's a certain age where who gives the wisdom and the strength? It's God. God decides, I will just bestow you now with wisdom and with strength, with a certain type of, um, of, of, of unlocking and understanding. We all know when we've been around people who are wise, right? Like there's just some, some, some grounding quality about them that the words that they say, the way in which they approach the advice that they give us is just very wise. And they're not going to, to hasten to do things. I was just on the phone with a brother today who's probably in this, uh, uh, I think he's yeah, he in the stage of his life. And I was like, we gotta get this thing done and, and we should get it, you should just do it tonight. And he was just like, I don't, I don't think, of, I need some time to just think about it. I'm gonna think about it over the weekend. I'm gonna take my time. And early next week, I'm gonna, it was like a difficult conversation we had to have with someone else. Early next week, I'm gonna have a conversation. Like had, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's totally, totally the more mature thing to do. Do not listen to my advice, I'm extremely hasty. Not like your your approach, but just the way in which you said it was wise, and the the approach in and of itself, deliberation is almost always better. There's very few instances, unless there's like some abuse or something crazy going on, that where a deliberate where being deliberate and calm about things is not good. Usually, it's very good to do, right? But that wisdom it will start to show in this stage, and so it was in this stage where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received his prophethood formally. It was at the age of forty. So 40 is a big turning point in the life of the Muslim, a big turning point. It is what, it doesn't cut your life in half, but it kind of is the point at which you've 
where our phase of accountability from the time where we started being accountable began until the time when we might pass away. So say from 15 until 65, which is the average age of this ummah, according to the Prophet Islam, which is right around the middle of that. Right? So this is the age in which he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, achieved a, uh, he got his revelation, he, the revelation formally began. Of course, he had been prepared for prophethood well before this, as Allah had been preparing him, but this is where the formal mantle um, was, was given, the prophetic mission was given. And so he says, at this point, it starts to become clear the direction in, um, uh, the direction in where, where someone's life is headed. So if someone's life is headed towards good, it will start to become pretty clear towards this age. And if someone's life is not headed towards good, which means they can still change, it doesn't mean that seal the fate is sealed, but it will also start to show what are the priorities that people have? What are the things that, um, that they talk the most about, that they think the most about? What are the ways in which we live our life and how do we exemplify the prophetic qualities that we should be exemplifying at this age? It should be a serious age. If somebody has lived through Islam and hits the age of 40 and hasn't really woken up to the, real, the reality of life, that's a problem. That's a real problem. Meaning like still caught up in the same sins, making, you know, all sorts of, of jokes all the time, inappropriate jokes, not actually taking life seriously, just all the things that, again, in our society that might actually end up happening or being overly concerned about cosmetics and overly concerned about looks and all sorts of things. And, and they're at the age of 40, it's a problem because age of 40 signifies seriousness. It signifies maturity and it's ajib that Allah doesn't talk about, he doesn't say we gave them outward qualities. He says we gave them wisdom and strength. Now, strength can be strength from a physical perspective, but we can also understand strength from the perspective of Iman and the spiritual perspective at this age, at this turning point. So what we seek in our relationship with Allah as we go through these stages of life is these qualities of, um, of knowledge, which are the, are the most important. And then wisdom is really how you apply that knowledge. So again, when we're younger, we might learn something and we might just want to do it in the way we think it needs to be done. But as we get older, if we've been learning, hopefully, then we'll start to have the flavor of wisdom to it. Actually, this is not really the right thing to say, even though the book says to say it. You probably shouldn't say it. Why? Because it's not the right time to say it to that person. And it might not be done in the right tone, and it might not be done in the right method. And that's wisdom. It's knowing how to apply something in a way that aligns with the sunnah, not just in a way that looks like the sunnah, it, the inner reality of it is in accordance with the sunnah. And so one starts to gain these uh, traits. It's actually why book knowledge without having teachers and without um, seeing these things in practice can actually be dangerous for, 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 for us uh, because one just sees a bunch of black and white rules when there's a lot of gray area uh, in terms of how those rules are applied, especially in the context of that we live in. So he says that... Um, this is a time where, again, the direction starts to become very, very clear. Uh, Imam Shafi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he says that when he reached 40, he began to walk with staff and like the, 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 uh, the tall staff, stick type of, uh, and, and he said when he was questioned about it, he used to say, it's to remind myself that I'm a traveler. That I'm just a traveler. Because we are just travelers in this world. We're not supposed to be here for a long period of time. And usually someone will use that, right? It's like the old version of a hiking stick and someone is using it to remind to, And the staffs were used for many, many, many reasons. There's a lot of utility to them. But to remind myself that I am a traveler. And um, then one of the great uh, scholars, uh, Ibn Munabek, he said that I have read somewhere that each morning a herald announces from the fourth heaven. So caller announces from the, um, from the fourth heaven that, oh, people of 40, you are a crop whose harvest is near. As you are a crop whose harvest is near. So you should be fit you're, you're, you're that, that, that everything you've been working towards, the harvest is very close. He said, oh, people of 50, questioning them. What have you sent ahead of you? Have you sent anything ahead of you? What have you sent ahead of you? And what have you kept back? What deeds have you sent forth and what have you kept back? Oh, people of 60, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. And then reminding them that, um, uh, that if, if creatures have this 
burden of being we are created, right? Like once you're created, now the responsibility comes. Just that, so he's reminding them that once you're created, the creatures who are created, they know why they were created, and the hour is getting very close to you, so beware. The hour is what? The day of judgment is not when the end of the world comes. The day of judgment for me and for you is when we die. That's the, that's the, actually the small hour it's mentioned in the narration. That is the, 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 the small kiyama. Meaning, because the full day of kiyama, for us, our deeds have essentially stopped. There's very few things. There are things we can do as other Gajarya, but there are not that many. Our prayers, our fasts, our zakat, everything we're held accountable to has stopped. So that's when the, the time comes. And he's saying that at these stages, the, the reality has to sink in. The key for us in the time we live in is not to just be doing the same thing in every stage of life. Because nobody in their right mind would just live the same life in their dunya and be doing the same thing that they were doing at age like 17 or 18. And then at age 31, they're doing that. And at age 45, they're doing that. Even with regards to most people, with regards to their careers or their jobs, they would be this highly dissatisfied if they had a position when they were at age 25 and they have the same position at age 45. Some people would be content with it. But others, most people is, who are, who are in, in, in certain fields would be highly dissatisfied with it. What am I even doing? How come I'm not getting promoted? How come I'm not getting a raise? Why am I? And, 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 and it wouldn't, but for spirituality and for maturity, we have, we usually most, uh, most people in our society, we don't have the same standard. We might be the same level of spiritually mature, uh, spiritual maturity in our 20s as we are in our 40s. And that goes back to prioritization. So if we are still the same thing what we were doing when we were younger, always socializing, always hanging out, it always needs to be about just finding something to do to fill my time so that I don't have to actually remember the real, and we're still doing that when we're in our 40s, and we're still doing that when we're in our 50s, and we're just filling the time. It's a problem. Wake up call has to happen. And then it's even worse if somebody is committing the major sins and they haven't changed. Someone is still um, uh, drinking and smoking and so on, and they were still doing it when they were young, and they do it as they get older. That's even worse, at least for the person who's young. Well, there's no excuse in the Sharia. There's kind of like an understanding, of, okay, maybe at some point they'll stop. But if someone is in their more advanced ages, they've hit this age of, senior, of, of maturity, and it's happening, that's a problem. If we have not hit this stage yet, we need to start praying to Allah that He uses us in the best way possible because we only get one chance in this planet during this day. That's what our goal should be. The Prophet, nobody has had more barakah in their life. He was only given prophethood for 23 years formally. And look at how much impact he had and how many billions of people are going to be under his banner on the Day of Judgment. Other prophets had over 900 years of calling, and they're still in Allah's rank, the highest of ranks, but outward, to, uh, outward results may have not been necessarily the same. The Prophet ﷺ shows us that this ummah has a lot of blessing if they use the blessing wisely, if they use their blessing because we're all linked to the Prophet ﷺ, and so we all have the chance to use the, 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 the special gifts that have been given to him in his ummah properly. The best way to do this also as we get into age is link to people who are linked to him. The ones who are linked to him the most are the Ahlul Bayt Rasulullah. The ones who are his direct descendants, of which there are many around right now. Um, Imam Abdullah bin Abi Haddad, the text we're reading, he was one of his, of his descendants. And he also, the, the land where he's from, the land of Hadramaut in Tarim Yemen, uh, that, or uh, where Tarim Yemen is, is full, it's all scholars of Ahlul Bayt. And so there's there 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 are people who are many 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 places many places around the world but they're still there including in America. But when one links to them and says, "How am I going to have a lot of love for these these people? And how am I going to have a lot of understanding of what their akhlaq is if they're implementing Islam? Of course, not not just if they have the title but don't implement Islam." Now one starts to have a understanding and a deep spiritual. There's an inward understanding just like there's an outward understanding. And so linking to people who sat with someone, 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 all the way to the, who sat with the Tabi'in, who sat with the Sahaba, who sat with the Prophet ﷺ himself, that's not going to be the same as somebody who's never done that. It's just, it's not possible because the prophetic inheritance is being passed down by one group of people. And so that's one thing we can do to try to awaken up this inner, um, uh, clear this veil we have that blocks our inner reality. 
the next one we go to is so so he says this is this is now the age of maturity. Uh, and then we get to seniority or advanced age, he calls it. So this is from 50 to 70. At this point, most people, they may not ever reach a stage past this because the average of this ummah is from 60 to 70. The Prophet, alayhi salatu islam, he passed according to most generations when he was 63 years of age. So, the, the, and he said that this is going to be the average lifespan of that ummah. So he says at this point, many times physically, signs of weakness start to show. And the strength that was there, that had peaked, starts to recede. Outwardly. It doesn't mean inwardly someone doesn't have strong iman and strength. Many of the people that that are doing the most amount of ibadah are in this age group, usually. But it is, you do get tired more easily, um, right? And it, it, and it is not the same level of himma that somebody might have had, aspiration or energy someone had when they were younger. And he said that the Prophet, alayhi salatu islam, he said in one narration that, um, uh, what's this in Muhammad? That Uh, we'll find the hadith in a second, inshallah. Uh, but the, the ayah in the Quran where Allah says, Did we not grant you a life long enough for the one to reflect, for him who reflects to reflect therein? And then the warner and the warner came to you. He said, This verse applies to people who are in this age. That, okay, now the life was long. There's no excuse at this age to say, I didn't have enough time. At 50 to 70, there is no excuse at this point. I didn't have enough time. I didn't get enough chances. There was not, he says that life was long enough to start the reflection and, um, and, and, and to, to, to let it, uh, and, and, and to let it really sink in. And in one narration of this hadith, that God has left no excuse for one who he allows to reach 60. There's just no, no, God will not accept or just, or, or in this case, that there are no excuses that can be presented before Allah. Again, there are different ages where we can present different excuses. But for someone who's been given this much time, for sure, there were times in that 60 years of life where somebody could have used their time maybe differently to do things that were important to rectify their life. This is especially important for those uh, of us who may have missed prayers when we were younger. And as we get older, we, that weight of missing those prayers becomes very serious. As we mentioned in previous um, classes, missed prayers, according to the dominant opinion in the majority of Madahid, have to be made up. Going to Hajj, and making sincere tawbah does not clear the debt one owes to Allah for missed salat. We're not talking about someone who converted to Islam. Someone who was born Muslim at the time that they were puberty, at the time that they were hit puberty, they were Muslim, until whenever they start praying again properly, and they miss prayers, they, they, those prayers one is accountable for. There's a common misconception in the time that we live in, that one, once they start taking Islam seriously, that's the only time that they're accountable for things. Missed prayers and missed zakat and missed fast are not excused in our religion. There, there is no, so now if somebody says, well, I have I know, 10 years of missed prayers. 10 years is a lot, but it's totally possible. I know people have gotten 15 years of missed prayers done gradually. Over 15, over future years, they've gotten 15 past years done just by doing one extra set a day. But one can't just say at this point, I don't have enough energy. I can't make up my missed prayers. One has to have worked hard to say, you know what, if I owed Miss Zakat, if I owed Miss Fast, if I owed Miss Prayers, I took them seriously when the, the himma was there, or I'm going to start taking them seriously at, at this stage because um, time is, uh, is, is starting to wrap up for this group of people. And he says it's interesting because the lifespans of the Muslims are the shortest to have ever been. In earlier nations, there were people who lived near or in excess of 1,000 years, and some have said that those people who lived to 1,000 years, that they didn't even hit puberty until they're 80 years old. 80 years old is when their puberty would start. And then after that, they had 920 years of accountability. That's, that's the, 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 the uh, age. We know that Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, called his people for 900 to 950 years. He would be making, he was making da'wah to them. That's how patient he was. And they didn't even listen. Arrogance in front of him. They didn't listen, and that's when Allah, that's when he finally, after that time, he prayed to Allah, okay, Allah, yeah, Allah, this is going to change. Take care of the situation, and then, you know, obviously in a very intense way, the great flood came. So, he said that it was said that one of the um, sons of Adam, alayhi salam, um, or perhaps in future generations, died at age 200, and people felt sorry uh, 
for them having such a brief life at the age of 200 years. And so this, this is, this, this, this is um, totally a interesting phase that we've been given where for this ummah, it's a very short period. So how do we make up for it? This is why he mentions at this stage, we were given Layl Til Qadr. Layl Til Qadr and many of the other Baraka secrets in our religion, uh, uh, secrets meaning um, blessings that we've been given that kind of are unlock significant amount more spiritual blessing in our life. They've been given to this ummah. So Layl Til Qadr, Khairim and Alfi Shahr. It is better than 83 years of Ibadah. So if somebody gets just like 10 of these in, right, that's 830 years of Ibadah. And, and all it takes is that they have to be in Ibadah for a good portion of that night. There's many other ways this Ummah has been given um, blessings, right? That our intentions are just making the intention results in a good deed. Following through that with that intention can result in 100 or 700 good deeds or multiplied by many, many, many times over. Um, and so... And the same thing we were mentioning with the secret of the time that we've been given, where it comes in a narration that my, the morning time, the early morning time is blessed for my ummah. So now already he's saying you'll be able to get a lot done in this time compared to, um, uh, and, and it will unlock barakah for someone that maybe was, you used to take somebody 10 years to unlock in a previous generation. Someone might be able to get it in a week or five or five months, right? Allah is, 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 distributes according to the lifespan that he has given. And so there's still, there's still um, risk to distribute. And so Allah can give somebody immense what's called tawfiq, divine assistance in their time, but they have to know to use this time wisely. So he goes on this, this explanation of, um, of this, these days of barakah and these nights of barakah, which is given what this, this, this ummah has been, um, uh, has been, the blessing that this ummah has been given. And so he says at this age, now what happens? is it's all about reverting to God. The dominant state must be constantly turning to Allah, not focusing on this dunya much at all, focusing on gathering provisions for the life to come, utmost in obedience, kind of letting go of all the things of the dunya that we're still attached to. So if we're, still, if we're in our 60s or 70s even, even which he's going to say in the next stage, and we're still worried about the stock market and what our 401k looks like, and da, 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 it doesn't even matter. None of that stuff is going to matter because we might die tomorrow. Right? And, and like those types of things, anybody could die tomorrow, but specifically someone in this age group, the messenger, sallallahu already said that this is the average life of my ummah, so that a wake-up call should come in. Same thing if we're trying to start new businesses and new companies and make new investments and all the things that be very normal for us to do at our age. In, the, in this country, the senator of this state was literally trying to be in the Senate, even though it was very obvious that, that there was almost no life left until like 85 or 80, I'm not sure exactly what age, just, just passed away, 88, just, just every staffer is assisting, and then you're literally on this, you will be on the floor of this corrupt government, the institute that, that you're standing up for, on the floor of the Senate until you're about to die. That's not how the Muslim dies. The Muslim does not, is not grasping for power until that age. That's not going to happen. That's not the, the key. And in other instances, people in, our, in, in, in the nation, uh, who are people in our country, maybe who are not Muslim, or people who are Muslim, in their 70s, 80s, lawsuits with every other person, fighting all sorts of people. I mean, look at Trump. He is like 80 years old, and everybody has sued him already. Every other state has sued him. Every other company has sued him. I mean, just constantly, and that's the goal. But you can trick yourself only so much by dyeing your hair and putting injections in your face and whatnot, whatever these people do, to think, think that you're still young. But it, it's going to catch up. It's going to catch up. And so the Muslim, they understand, okay, I'm at that phase. And that's why, why learning the texts and learning these things is so important. Because then, you know what? The time hit. I got to change now. I can't. If I'm devoting 20 hours more than I need to to work, and I should probably devote some percentage of that to, to ibadah, I should probably consider doing that. And now, if I don't regularly pray my five prayers, I gotta change. If I don't regularly pray the Hajj and I'm not doing it at this age, I gotta change. If I'm not reciting Quran regularly, I gotta change. If I'm not giving more in charity or serving, whatever things that somebody will do, their, their, their decisions for the good deeds that they decide to do beyond the fara'id, one starts to take it seriously. And Allah even sent them signs. What are the biggest signs? He says is white hair. When the hair becomes white, that's the first sign that, okay, you're on your way out. Things are going to change. And then when it becomes fully white, 
that is the biggest sign. He says, when the hair becomes fully white, that um, uh, as it as it comes in one narration, white hair brings with it the suspicion that one's time has come, and it is the banisher of hope. Hope, in this case, not meaning like hope in Allah, but that there's not that much more time left. One should stop thinking, I'll change later. Well, how many more signs are needed? Same thing when the wrinkles start to appear. It becomes very, very clear when the bodily functions start changing. So this is the stage at which all of these things start to happen, where all of these things start to happen. Um, and, and, and he says, do not let Allah burn the light of your white hair, because light, the white hair can signify a nur. Like a, like, a, like, a, like a luminosity with the fire of your sins. Don't let that light be extinguished because of the fire of the sins that we are committing. And so, at this age, again, that sign should not be. Um, uh, we, we should be. We should be very, very, very attuned um, to this. And at one in one narration, Allah says, "By my eminence and majesty, and the need of my creatures for me, I would be too ashamed to torment my ser- my." Um, uh, 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 servants, my men servants and women servants, delineating both, whose hair has turned white in Islam. And then the Prophet wept and they said, what makes you weep? And he said, I weep because of those before whom Allah is ashamed and who do not feel ashamed before him. That Allah is saying himself, I would be too ashamed to torment them if their hair turned white in Islam. And he said that I am weeping because there are people who Allah is who is Allah is, is is ashamed in front of, but they're not ashamed in front of their Lord. Obviously, ultimately, Allah is, is not is not ashamed in the way we would think about it literally. But there's this is for for teaching us, right? And so again, that the Allah is showing the sign when one is young, the strength is there, the energy is there. As one gets older, things change, physical appearance starts changing. So what about that in the society we live in, where everybody wants to hide all of that? There's no rec- no appreciation or recognition for the fact that you're not supposed to look the same at 55 as you did at 35. It's not going to happen. In Jannah, it will happen. Everybody's, the average age will be like 33 or so, but according to some narrations, but it's not, not, in this life, it's not going to happen. So for the people who are in this category, to be aware of the society that we live in, that it's trying to make us, just like it made us forget about the importance of seriousness at, when we were young, it makes us forget about the importance of seriousness when we're older. And it's, this is especially, especially, especially the case for, for, for women in our society where the types of stuff that gets sold is constantly focused on appearance. And this did, did all sorts of different ways to spend our money to make ourselves appear younger. But what if you're not supposed to appear younger? According to what we're learning, you're supposed to embrace the fact that I'm getting older. And, and that's supposed to remind us. So if my, ha- my hair was, was whitening, and then I dye my hair every, like, how often it used to be dyed, once, once or so. And, and now I just look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm not even thinking, I'm so young. Hold on a second, that's a lie. It's not true. You're not actually that young. You're actually, your hair is whitening. And it's supposed to be a reminder, but I'm covering up the reminder. If my skin is supposed to start getting wrinkly and I'm starting to get bags under my eyes and so on, and I just go and I put all sorts of serums and potions and all these other things that are being sold to me and then injections and Botox and fill it all up with so now I'm gonna think, yeah, yeah, I'm still young, but you're not. It's fake. It's all not real. The reality is actually underneath it. And so by not embracing the reality of things, the or- organic way in which we, which we were created, and by putting so on so many things on us that will um, uh, fake us or trick us into thinking this is not actually real, we do ourselves a disservice. Because we continue to try to do the same, um, uh, the same, the, the same things with our with our uh, bodies that we did when we were younger, but it wasn't supposed to be the same. Had it needed, was it? If it was supposed to be the same, Allah would have never allowed for aging to happen. It just wouldn't be the case because Allah doesn't need us to to age. Actually, it could just be if someone always looks like they're you know thirty three, always and just like look or always looks like they're twenty five. And then they never age, and then they just they get to 75 or 68, and they pass away. It could just be a lot of created like that. It's why? Because there's a reminder of the stages of life. There's a reminder of the stages of life. So as, as Muslims, we should be the first to counteract all of this stuff that's like trying to trick us into thinking that, um, uh, that life is not progressing, and that's trying to make us um, freeze in time, just like, I could just be young again. 
it's free no, no just embrace it we're not going to be young again just be old just be old and be young hearted but it's totally okay but not to to try and let the trick of shaitan get to us so he says the white hair is a huge reminder it's surprising actually how much time he devotes just to hadith about white hair and how much of a reminder that is as a reminder for men it is impermissible to to to, to dye your hair black except for jihad and when your one is in jihad. So this is actually something common one sees often is men dyeing their hair. The only permissibility that's possible is someone who dyes white hair with like a red coloring, like a mandy or a saffron, um, but, but black is prohibited um, for one to, to, to dye their hair. And one cannot deceive people about their, about their age. Um, so he just gives that as a reminder actually at the end. So then, and I think we'll have just enough time inshallah for this, one gets uh, one gets to the age of Decrep, he calls it decrepitude. Just the word itself is like, that's, that's the word, decrepitude. So now he says this is from 70 onward. Everything begins to weaken. And Allah says this himself in the Quran, Allah is he who created you out of weakness and then appointed after weakness strength, then after strength appointed weakness and gray hair. And he creates what he will, he is the knower, the able. So Weakness, one goes from when you're an infant, a baby, you're completely, completely reliant on your parents. Weak. And then a, this period of strength sets in. And the strength has an up and up, and then it has one losing the strength. Right? And then one starts to get to the stage where he says weakness starts to kick in again. And gray hair starts to come. And then Allah says in the Quran, that among you there is he who, who is brought back to the arda lil umur. The translation is the worst time of life. So that after knowledge, he knows nothing. Maybe, maybe commenting on memory loss or the inability to think or understand, right? All sorts of diseases that start to come to somebody as they get older. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is how Allah has created us. But just, it's like a sign that when somebody was young, nothing, we were babies, we didn't maybe know anything, our intellects, we weren't understanding things, right? And then as somebody gets into this late stage of life now, um, dementia can kick in and all sorts of other diseases. They're just called diseases of old age. There's no medical cure for them, right? And um, Alzheimer's can kick in and, and these types of things. So he says these are known as senility and the loss of one's mental faculties. And these start to kick in. And so there's even a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks Allah, oh Allah, ask for your protection from being brought back to the worst time of life. Or from, from based on this ayah, uh, we would assume. And then another from the evil of senility. Um, and, and so the, there's a physical tribulation that comes at this stage. And actually this is, there's a dua, maybe uh, I hear some of our elders reading, maybe when they're like in their 50s and 60s, they say, oh Allah, take me while I'm, uh, while I'm walking. And, or take me what, what before I'm like deeply reliant on people. Only make me reliant on you, right? Because usually it's very difficult for the human being um, if, if any, if we've ever had to, to see or take care, take care of our grandparents or parents when they're really elderly, it's difficult for them to, they need help using the restroom. It's difficult. They don't want to ask for that, but they need the help. So of course one has to help, but it's not something that one wants to seek help for, right? It's, it's a difficult stage, help getting up, help walking, help going up the stairs and so on. It's a very difficult stage of someone's life. So he says, this is the stage at which many people have already passed on from the world, according to the hadith from 60 to 70, before they even reach this stage. But some will reach this stage. And then they have a diff difficult degree of, of um, suffering. And according to one narration, the Prophet said, few of my nation, is there, he was asked, what is the age, the average age of your nation? He said, 60 to 70. Their, their deaths on average will be between this age. And he said, what about those over 70, Ya Rasulullah? He said, few of my nation will reach that age. And then, and then he said, may Allah have mercy on those who are over 70, and then may God have mercy on those who are over 80. And just giving, making dua for them, because again, this difficult stage um, starts to come in. So there's, there's further commentary that's given, um, but for the, the, the um, khulasa, the summary of it is that one really needs to take advantage of the strength before they get to this stage. Why is it important that if someone here is 30 or 40 or 50, whatever age someone is at, um, that they understand what happens when we get to this point and we study it because sometimes it's right in front of us and it doesn't make any impact. Like 
our grandparents might be right in front of us, and we're like, yeah, but they're great grandpa, it's my grandma, and dada, it's my cousin, I don't know, I'm going to leave this data. I had plenty of years ago. So right in front of us, we don't really see ourselves in that. We don't really, and especially in the society we live in, where maybe we're not living in homes, the multi-generational homes like traditionally they used to live in. So we only see people our age. What was the last time someone like called up somebody who was 60 years older than them and was like, hey, you want to have dinner? I go hang out. It's usually we're usually hanging out with the same social circle, with the same group of people. So it's highly unlikely that one is 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 going to um, be aware of these things. I just want to let there's somebody, and it was I, I, I felt this was a very virtuous quality. Someone I know who's in their like late 20s, and um, someone else I know recently started a nursing home. So she was asking, she was like, hey, can, I, I know a few people who want to like volunteer in the nursing home and just like visit the, the elderly. And I was like, yeah, I mean, the people there are like, like 101, like hospice care on their way out. They're like, yeah, we just want to visit them. And it was like this person, she had grown up with her grandparents always at home uh, and living with them. And then also saw her grandparents pass away at their house um, like, like, in, their late, in their late 80s, I believe, uh, 70s and 80s. And so I was talking to my wife after, and she was like, yeah, no, it's, it's clearly a quality that she misses that. She misses actually being around their grandparents and misses being, um, and just, just, just the, the, there's, there's some type of, of feeling that someone gets an attachment almost, that, um, that they, they want to go and spend time maybe to remind themselves of their, of their grandparents or for other reasons. But the reason, one of the reasons why I felt that was, that was like such a noble thing to do it's because just visiting somebody who's a lot older will remind somebody, you know what, I'm going to be at this stage at, in life right now, so I better be careful about what I do when I'm younger and how I behave when I'm younger. There's many, many people who wrote books in, throughout history at this age of life, deeply regretful books. Usually, um, uh, the ones, the books who got published, we usually like lead, like male leaders, tyrants, some of them, and they would write about how ashamed they were about how arrogant they used to be when they were young and now how weak they are and how they just wish they could go back and treat people nicely. And just the remorse that one that one might have because they're spending a lot of time in bed and a lot of time or, or in, maybe sometimes some folks are immobile. So the reason why it's important for us to reflect on this stage is because we will either die or we'll get to the stage. Those are the two options. Either we die before, in which case we got to live our life straight, or we'll get to the stage where we don't have that many opportunities and we got to live our life straight. So the path points to one thing, live our life straight from, from as soon as possible. That's like where the, the, the mind has to get to that point and the heart has to get to that point of realization. And um, a uh, long life, though, in obedience of Allah. So someone reaching this stage and still obeying Allah is desired in our religion. So the best among you are those whose lives are long and whose works are good according to Allah. Or they get ample amount of time to do ibadah, ample amount of time to turn to Allah, to do more, to do more work, and so on. And work meaning amal, good deeds, um, uh, and 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 so on. So as as one narration says, and let none of you wish for death, for either you are doing good, and thus you'll start to see increases, or you're doing wrong right now, and you'll have more time uh, to make. Uh, Amends with Allah to fix your relationship with Him. So don't don't wish for for a short life or or for things just because things are difficult. Yeah, Allah, I don't want to live anymore. No, we should never make that dua. We should always ask Allah, Allah, allow me to live as long as it's good for me. And when it's not good for me, then take me away. But the usual dua we see our teachers make is this dua: oh, Allah bless us with long life in your ibadah, long life in your ibadah, um, where we where we are able to understand the purposes of each of these stages, um, and. And so he goes on to various uh, things that happen then until one finally reaches the point of death. And so uh, we'll probably cover that next time. We want to try to get to it today, but for the sake of time, it's a little bit lengthy and there's, it's a pretty critical stage of, of life to understand is when someone actually is about to leave this world. It's one of the, the most momentous um, uh, events for us to grasp. So we'll want to spend probably the whole class or part of it on it, inshallah. Uh, but just briefly, we'll finish this up. He mentions that many people who lived lives of immense barakah never reached these later stages. So Imam Shafi, which is the one, the great Imam, the one who founded the Shafi Madhab, he died at the age of 54. He said Imam Ghazali, the proof of Islam, Hujjah that Islam Imam Ghazali, he died at 55. And then he mentions many others um, uh, who, who died amongst the great women and men uh, leaders of this ummah, 
and spiritual pillars of this ummah who died in their 40s or 50s or 60s. It, not necessarily that it doesn't necessitate that for one to live a uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Omar also passed away between 60 and 70, radiallahu But So it doesn't necessitate that somebody lives uh, a, a significantly long period of life for them to be able to accomplish a lot. He says the key is barakah. The barakah in the time that they have and how they use that time will be the key to unlocking how much they're able to accomplish um, with, the, with the time that they have been given. So he says this last period, decrepitude, usually is on its way according According to most scenarios, they end, someone ends with a fatal illness then. Their life starts to wound, be wound up with some type of illness and then with death. But death can happen without illness. Allah does not need an ex- excuse for death to take place. But most of the time, this is what happens. And so, so someone gets into this advanced old age. So to know this and to know that, okay, death is at every door. Either I'm going to reach this age and I will die with some disease or I'm going to reach this age and my time is going to come and Allah will take me. Or I think I have plenty of time left and the next thing you know, tomorrow, God forbid, someone just passes. It's, he said, every door leads to death and leads to the meaning of Allah. So if that's guaranteed, then make use of our life, of our time, of our moments, of our days, of our conversations, of our interactions and as much as possible and use them in the right way. Don't let a day go by where we feel doubtful Am I committing sin? Like, if we know something's wrong, i got to leave that wrong. That's it. Tomorrow I'm leaving it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Because I know I'm going to die the next day I could die. And if you make the intention today to leave a wrong, if we make the intention today, Ya Allah, I don't want to do this thing again. And tomorrow we do die, and we never left the wrong in the first place, we'll be, it will be as though we did leave the wrong. Because the intention is what matters. So one, we have to use these moments, hopefully as, as means of really reflecting, what am I doing that God would not be happy with when I do that? And how am I going to change that? And then, inshallah, we set out on that path to change. Uh, so with that, uh, if there's any questions, we'll go ahead and, um, and do them. And I know folks ask online, what book is this? This is Lives of Man by Imam Abdullah uh, Al-Haddad, The Lives of Man. It's a short book, um, but packed with a lot of good uh, content. Yes? Yeah. You want me to do that one first? Yeah, yeah, really good, good, uh, great question. So the question is, if we missed our salah, um, do we have to try to remember the salah, or is doing the nafila and the sunnah prayers enough to make up for that? Um, so uh, you do have to try to quantify and measure how much was missed to the best estimate possible. So what someone does is um, someone calculates, okay, I know that I was responsible legally to start praying at age 15. I might have prayed from 15 to 18 most of my prayers, maybe 95% of my prayers, maybe there's a few I didn't pray. But I know for a fact from like age 18 to 28, I was in Jailia. I was not praying, I was messing around, what everyone was doing. Maybe they weren't taking their life. Or they say, you know what? I miss Fajr every day. I know it. I never woke up. I miss Thor because I was at school and I didn't want to pray, whatever else. So now one would say, okay, for 10 years I have to calculate, let's say someone missed Fajr and Thor, two prayers, Fajr and Thor, for those entire 10 years. And you estimate and you do a little bit more than what you think, because usually it could be a little bit more. And then you can you literally can create a spreadsheet if you would like. I, I, I know a resource, I can send it to you, the spreadsheet, you can just track it. And then you say, okay, now I have to just slowly start making it up. And now you have to make the intention for that prayer, not the day that you missed it, like January 14, 2008. No, you just have to say, I'm making up a fajr from the past. And I'm making a qada of fajr, and then you get it, you pray fajr. And you can do it fairly quickly. It doesn't have to be long prayers. You can do the short surahs. It can be quick, but one then would quantify and, and start to make those up. And if it's all of them, then it's all of them. It's all five. Um, if one doesn't remember whether I was praying or not, uh, you take the general understanding of probably was not praying. Usually one would remember if you were doing most of our prayers or at least some of them. And then the sunnah and the nafila prayers, um, they make up for deficiency in the fard prayer, not the fard prayer itself. This is actually a very common question um, that folks have. Is Does the sunnah and nafila replace the entire prayer? 
So if I'm praying and the reward for the prayer is this much that I could get, 100%, the vast majority of us are like thinking about something and the next thing, and I have to do this tomorrow and I have to do this for work and I have to, what am I going to eat for lunch and blah, 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 whatever thoughts shit we have in our head that shaitan might whisper into our mind right when we start salah. So we actually might only achieve 30 or 40% of the reward. The sunnah prayer now helps you get a little bit more and then you do the next sunnah and it just gives you the maximum reward for the prayer. So it makes up for deficiencies or um, mistakes that are not like critical mistakes that someone makes. So if someone makes a big mistake, that's not excused. One has to make up the prayer. Um, but like small mistakes one makes in the prayer and one day they make up for that. So that's why we must do the sunnah and when those mistakes don't exist, it's just a bunch of extra reward, extra reward, extra reward. But the five prayers do have to be made up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. The question is about white hair and someone might get it a lot earlier. So um, what he's speaking to here is like the commonality, the general rule. There could be specific instances, like I know somebody who their hair was fully white at age like 26, fully, right? And uh, a, a, a brother. And I mean, it just, I think it ran in the family. It was just genetic. There was, it, there was a face was fully youthful, right? But the hair was fully white. Um, and, and so there's a difference between, let's say, when it's genetic and when it's the commonality. What he's referring to is the commonality. When it comes to someone genetically being predisposed to someone and then, like, what do they do about that, um, that would be someone, you would ask, like, a specific question in that age, let's say, to a scholar who would say, okay, it's permissible for someone to do this because they got it a lot earlier. But in general, the white hair, it, it is a sign of nur. And one of the hadith do mention that don't let the light of your white hair be extinguished by the fire of your sins. So it's not that it's a, it's a bad sign. What it's supposed to be a reminder of is that I'm, I'm not at that early youth stage anymore. Things are changing and I'm advancing. And so most of us will gradually, get, most human beings will gradually get white hair. Some in their 20s and then in their 30s and then it really starts to pick up and then in their 40s and then at some point it's full white. And then what he's referring to is when it becomes full white, really, really, really take it seriously. So yeah, does that answer? Do one here. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the question is, let's say last Ramadan, if someone missed fasting for a valid legal reason, like travel or something, or sickness, and now Ramadan is about to come, you know, on the lower end Rajab, so in two months until it's Ramadan, you're saying does someone have to make up before the next Ramadan? Yeah, that's Yeah, so you are obliged actually religiously to make it up as soon as you have the ability to make it up. So it's not even that necessarily waiting till the next Ramadan. Like you gotta try to make it up shawal. Like it's like not really, there's not that much time given. But um, if someone regularly misses that and regularly misses that, all you have to do religiously, and I, um, uh, if anyone has a more detailed answer, otherwise um, or I'll look into it. Uh, one has to do religiously is you have to keep track of it, of the fast that I owe. And then at some point you have to make those fasts up, right? So it's similar with a missed prayer. Or one technically has to make up the missed prayer as soon as they can, but maybe they'll wait 20 years and they'll never do it, right? And then we might do it a lot later. So then one might reach the stage where they have a lot of fast to make up. But the reason why that's not recommended is because it gets, it's really difficult to make up a lot of fasts, right? Like it's hard. You cannot fast sunnah or nafila fast if you have far the fast to make up. So if somebody has a fast of Ramadan to make up, you cannot fast Muharram or Ashura or um, uh, the fast of Shawal with the intention only of doing the Nafila fast. The intention first has to be 
that I'm making the part fast up, and then some of the scholars permit a secondary intention that I'm doing this 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 uh, this for the sake of the the, day, the noble day that one is fasting on, and hope maybe Allah will give the reward inshallah. But um, if you didn't, let's say someone didn't make it up between Ramadans and they had the ample time, um, that would be usually one should make toba for the fact that they fell short in that. Uh, that one would ask Allah for forgiveness that they would that they fell short in having 330 days of the year and one did not even consider making up those fasts. Uh, it could be different for a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman who might have missed the whole Ramadan. And now you're talking 30 fasts to make up versus somebody who was sick or traveling for two or three days. And talk. So, so the, the scenarios will kind of vary uh, depending on the, the circumstances. Uh, did you have follow-up to that or separate those from? Yeah, go ahead. So, I know one of the things is that if you don't make it up by the following Shaban, you mean? Yeah, Shaban. Yeah, Shaban. Yeah. Yeah. So one should one should do their utmost within within their ability to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. You want me to answer that one first? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, you have five prayers to make up. Um, is it preferred over Taraweeh? According to two of the Madahib, it is preferred over Taraweeh. And in fact, according to one of them, it's obligatory. You cannot pray any Sunnah prayer if you still owe a part prayer. According to other Madahib, like the Hanafi school, um, you should go to as much of the Taraweeh as you can and then use the rest in makeup. And then other madahib may permit you to make an intention during taraweeh, if you're doing turaqat, turaqat, to use that for makeup fajr, for, for fajr make. So there's a difference between the, the schools. Um, I generally, what I've been taught and try to prescribe to is to take the makeups more seriously than the sunnah prayers. And so if, let's say you can come for taraweeh, maybe you come for eight, and then you go home and you do 12 makeups, right? And so now you're still doing 20 prayers at night or how many ever someone wants to do even more than 20. The Malikis used to pray 36 traditionally, so one might do 40 extra prayers, whatever else it is, but they're, they're using the time. Others, they pray their farth prayer, and they just get straight to the makeups and all of that. They don't use any time for anything else. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the, the question is about dual intentions for fasts, such as the fast, the 10 days of Dokicha. Um, so because those are not obligatory fasts, different madahib had different opinions on whether a dual intention is permitted. Some said, no, nope, you can only make the intention for the singular sunnah nafil fast that it is, and that's it. Others said, no, you can make both intentions, and the primary intention is for the fard prayer, or for the fard fast that you missed, and then you make the secondary intention that I'm doing it during these virtuous days with the hope that Allah will give me the reward of, of, uh, of these virtuous days. But what you would not do is delay the makeup to those days just so that you could get the extra reward. What you would do is try to make it up sooner. And if you weren't able to find the himma, but now everybody in your house is waking up for support, and you're like, okay, now I got to do it. Now you, you know, um, would kind of make that dual intention. So it is permitted. This is where, alhamdulillah, there's multiple madahib in Islam, and different scholars have differing interpretations um, that allow for you. Yeah. Uh, so which one is it that said you cannot? 
uh, that you can double up. Um, I believe both the Shafi and the Maliki spoke from it doubling up, and the Hanafis are usually not as uh, okay with it. Yeah. Uh, the city of Ismail, is that the Shafi school usually permits the dual attentions, from my understanding, in both the prayer and the fast? Okay, from the left, yeah. We can follow up on that. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so the Hanafis say that you can, that um, uh, the first, the prayer is the prayer, the intention of the Imam is the only intention that you can have, so that's what Hanafi school says, and they say that you actually would do tarawih and you have to find time to do your makeups. They would, they would not say that one is prioritized um, immediately over the other, but, they, but the makeups will have a significant responsibility. The Shafi school, from my understanding, and I have not studied Shafi fit in detail, but from the few opinions that we've gotten, that you can make the dual intention, according to one of the opinions, in the prayer for the makeup, for Fajr, let's say, for Taraweeh, and um, that you need to prioritize missed prayers over makeup prayers. I believe the Malik is cool. While it doesn't permit the dual intention, it does basically say you have to do the makeups before anything else. Um, but even within the schools, there's many opinions that came about, so I'll allow him to so we can check on that for sure. So, yeah. Any other questions? Brothers? I think sister, sister side. Uh, yeah, Omar, go ahead. No, no. So if you pray the Qada that day, let's say somebody misses Fajr and wakes up at 8.30 a.m. and they pray Fajr, but you did your qada then. There's not, there's not like a makeup calculation that has to do. Same thing if somebody misses the they make it up that day or that week. If you don't have to do any calculus. What we're referring to is like 10 years ago, I missed a bunch of prayers. Now I got to calculate the five seconds. Yeah. Uh, question is How do you reconcile medical innovation that is aiming to curb many of the natural processes? Uh, senescence, I believe you mean uh, kind of old age. I'm not talking about Botox fillers to hide our healing appearances. If someone, if you could qualify what you mean by that, um, by what innovation you're referring to, like that, that, that can curb the natural processes of old age, that would be helpful. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of too many of them. Yeah. So, and, and then there's a question. In general, there's a few questions about um, appearances and what's permissible and what's not. The, the general understanding that we should have as Muslims is we should really, really, really not try to change our appearance. There's actually an ayah in the Quran where Allah talks about how it's shaitan who inspires them to change themselves from, their, from the perspective of their appearance. You are the way Allah created you. We take care of ourselves. We maintain ourselves. We look dignified to the best degree possible. We try to, you know, there's, there's, we have to groom ourselves and so on. From that perspective, one has to make sure they do that. But physical alteration of the human body and the human experience, especially with the intention, that's like, like any unrighteous intention. So intention of, of, of just doing it so one can appear beautiful for longer for the sake of people usually, right, as an example, or, or for any other reason. One should be extremely careful to do that because you're now getting into a gray area where you are actually trying to tell God that you naturally are allowing for something to happen and I'm going to find a way to stop that thing from happening. Um, and this, this, this does not apply to one taking care of themselves, drinking a lot of water, uh, and making sure they get enough sleep. We're talking about physical alteration, uh, alteration plastic surgery, Botox, all these sorts of things. So since there's a few questions on that, we'll just say kind of comprehensively, um, we should keep that in mind. What if, when we, there's a question, when we struggle with our faith, what is the best reminder to bring us back from experience? Um, it's a good question. So the first thing that when we struggle with our faith, we should have a habit 
of opening up the Quran as quickly as possible because the Quran is the word direct, the message directly from Allah actually to every one of us individually. It's not a message that's just revealed and meant to be only um, uh, kind of accessed from different periods of time. It's sent to us individually. So we should open it up and say, what is Allah trying to tell me? And that in and of itself, will, will, there will be a message in the ayah that you read for you specifically that will be for the exact faith challenge that you are going through. Tried and tested. I'm sure many people in this room and we are facing that. We open it up and Allah is telling us something. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that one should immediately try to um, sit and either pray if they're able to pray or make dua, whatever they're able to do to say, Ya Allah, I'm struggling right now. I just want to talk to you. So open up that door of communication. Ultimately, the goal of faith is so that you can have a conversation with your reward regularly. That's one of the key points of faith. You believe in him, you interact with him, and you see him in all your interactions. And so in that, when one starts to have that conversation, it automatically, um, the huzn, the, the heaviness, and the struggle one is feeling, it might start to calm down a little bit because now you are letting your Lord in. He's already always been there and he's aware of what's going on, but you are allowing for him to come. So those two things um, that, that you know, we would recommend. And then the follow-up uh, medical innovations that curb diseases of old age, such as Alzheimer's or a drug that could prolong the life of individual cells, which is in research currently. Yeah, so the second one, uh, I'm, I, I don't know, you would want to ask like a mufti who's qualified and who understands um, the specific bioethics spiritually around that. Uh, the first one, if you're trying to curb diseases, there's nothing wrong for the most part with that, right? So you, uh, the senility that kicks in, and now one is taking a medicine of some sort that is going to help somebody not have all the memory loss, khair, as long as there's nothing haram in the medicine that's going to hurt you in another way, Allah knows best, and I would again check with the mufti on this, um, you would usually would be fine with most of those medicines. Where it starts to get tricky is artificial things that one does solely not to change your intellectual capacity, but to change your um, uh, physical physical appearance uh, and, 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 and those types of things. So that's at least from what we've understood, but Allah knows best. Hopefully that helps. Um, there's another question. When relatives trouble us, what do we have to do? Yeah, so Allah, so first thing you have to remember, Allah said, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْتُكُمْ بَعْدَ فِتْنَةً Will you not be patient? We have created some of you as a test for others. Will you not be patient? That's the ayah all of us should remember when we are interacting with relatives because the nature of family is it was going to trouble you. I don't know if I've ever met anybody who's never had any problem with a family member. If you're going to have a problem with a family member, be that somebody who's Muslim or non-Muslim, practicing, not practicing, the family, the, the, the issue will come up. You remember that. The second is you remember the Prophet ﷺ struggled the most with his relatives. They gave him the hardest time. His uncles persecuted him, persecuted him. They had major issues with him and they gave him the most amount of difficulty. You have a few routes. One is you internally try to exemplify as much sabr, patience, and ihsan in your approach to them. So try to try to be patient and, 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 and not overly um, responsive in a bad way with what they say. If the trouble is getting so difficult, it's bearing on you, or it's getting to the point of like verbally problematic, you try to have a strict conversation with them where you draw a barrier, you draw a line, you say, you can't speak to me like that, that's not respectful. We really need to make sure we have proper communication and we, we, we kind of fix this. And then you're not obliged to see people who create a lot of problems for you all the time. And you, can just, you just have to maintain enough of a relationship that you're not cutting them off but not one in which you're imposing a, a lot of difficulty for you. But if it's like once every couple of months you're seeing them and they're creating problems, that's part of patience. Life is going to have to, we're going to have to be patient with each other. And the Prophet said in one, I believe it's a hadith in one, in one narration, that it's more virtuous to be with the people and have to deal with the ups and downs of interacting with people than it is to just seclude oneself and, you know, kind of go kick it in a, in, in the mountain or something somewhere and, and not be, um, but the people used to do that. They live a life of seclusion and it's not, nothing wrong with that, but it's better to be with the people and to interact with them and to go through the ups and downs of, um, of difficulty. And the follow-up, uh, what if the person is violent? I mean, yeah, that's a whole different story, right? And at that point, if someone starts to get abusive or violent, um, this, is, this is more, I would take this to the appropriate um, uh, kind of solution or center that can offer assistance, but 
because uh, these days, you know, calling the police is probably not the right move since they usually are less helpful than, than more. But you would need to find someone to intervene in that instance. There's no place for violence and abuse in our religion, bar none. So you can't allow for that to happen. If it's like a older cousin or something who's pushing you and violent a lot more, and, and it's not necessarily like a domestic abuse situation, you want to make sure you're bringing that up to someone elder in the gathering and saying, hey, look, like this is really hurting me or like creating a lot of problems for us. Um, we need to do something about it. So the key is that one has to not tolerate the injustice when it's not like just small personality issues. When physical problems get involved or there is emotional abuse or anything of the sort, one has to take the precautions either directly with people involved there or with some other you know, external parties to assist and to remove that um, or to confront the person properly with others to back you up and to say, this is wrong what you're doing and you need, you need to stop, right? Um, because sometimes people think they're just, if they're like roughhousing, they think they're just joking, but it's actually might seriously be hurting somebody or just inappropriate for them to be doing. Yeah. Okay, I think that's, uh, yes, go ahead. Great question. The question was around, um, we mentioned the importance of learning and learning with the teacher versus just reading on our own. Um, and, and, and so what's the balance uh, basically around that and how do we go around, uh, how do we go about finding someone to, to help us with this? The key is the connection, not the physical amount of time that you spend with them. So what we mean here, there's various types of teachers that have been laid out in our, in our religion. Um, we should try to have somebody who can give us a sense of what books should we read as we're trying to progress along the path. That's sufficient. And then you have, if you can ideally ask them a question every now and then about the book, uh, and if they've studied it with the teacher or they've studied it you know, sufficiently, then that would be very good in the time we live in. Traditionally, that would be difficult to accept. People would like, no, you got to go and sit and learn with somebody who has this nod and has chain. And, 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 but we're just living in a time where that might be difficult. One could also say that you would re review the book online with like an online class or the class on YouTube that was taught, which, which there's thousands of them on the law online now, um, where at least you see there's a curriculum that was followed and there's questions and answers that were asked that you could you know, help, help you process um, whatever questions might come up. Uh, if somebody can do that, then reading on your own with kind of like a guided reading would be very good. If not, then at least the bare minimum, everyone still has to read on their own. They're far the main, they're basics. It's usually when you get into a little bit more intermediate or advanced topics where reading might confuse somebody if they don't have someone to ask questions to. The second is um, that, and the person, by the way, who you ask questions to doesn't have to be physically there. Uh, so uh, uh, people have teachers that are international. They have like WhatsApp them questions now and you ask, answer the question and they have a Zoom call with them and it's, it's sufficient, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be like, someone sits with them. Second question on how does one go about finding a teacher, right? And um, the key is one makes a strong intention to Allah, Ya Allah, I want to learn. Please give me the ability to, 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 to learn with someone and to access somebody. And they say that literally Allah will bring someone to your doorstep, according to them there. Like it will be, su Allah will bring someone in your life when you make that intention sincerely. And that person will be a means of assistance. And I know many people who that's happened to. And they had no idea that it was like right there. The person next to them, they might have grown up around that person and the person they never knew until they made that intention. And now some interaction happened between them and that person that made it clear, oh, this person is a person of immense knowledge and connection. And then they started guiding them and sitting with them and helping them. We're in the Bay Area, alhamdulillah, there's ample amounts of people like this. Many people who are people of knowledge, who are people of learning, who've sat with some great shu, sat with the likes of Imam Zaid and others, the, many of the faculty at Zaytuna have immense knowledge. And you don't necessarily sit with them, but you sit with somebody who sat with them, who's taught, who's, and you just, you just need kind of an older brother, older sister type of figure to help along the path. But that intention, once someone makes it, it will be clear for the rare people. It's even been mentioned in some of the books, they make a sincere intention, they beg Allah, they beg Allah, they beg Allah, and then, um, you know, they, that somebody might have a, a dream or something like that, which would, might indicate to somebody, this is who you should go to to learn. But the key is one starts with the intention. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies, it's getting late. Uh, oh, there's another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before that prayer, do you think the intention of the 
want to have and still get the scene of this thing we can make up. If you make the intention to make to make a prayer and you sleep through it, uh, Fajr, you still get the sin of missing the prayer. Uh, it depends how sincerely you follow through on your intention. So, like, if you know that you sleep, like you snooze a lot, and you set like two alarms, it's usually not excusable. If you set like twelve alarms and you did your Siri, your iPhone alarm, you told Alexa to set an alarm, and then you did this alarm, you did all the alarms, and you told your your wife to wake you up, or you called your brother and you like make sure to wake me up with budget, you did whatever you could sincerely for the sake of Allah, and you slept on time, not sleeping at like 3 a.m. and expecting to wake up at 6, right? You really, and now you miss it? Okay, you hope that inshallah it's excused. But usually there's very little, there are few excuses. There are excuses for someone who sleeps, um, who just literally, like, sincerely sleeps through something with, and they try their best, right? And they don't even remember when they wake up that they snooze all the time. But then there's, the excuse is not the same for somebody who wakes up they are very aware that they're awake, they press news, and then the next thing you know, it's 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 eight o'clock and they slept through. So um, this is what's called Siddha Tawajjo, truthfulness in our aspiration, in our direction of what we're trying to do comes in. How truthful is someone in that intention? And if somebody does all of the prerequisites and they feel remorse when they wake up, like, Astaghfirullah, ya Allah, I really, really am trying so hard to keep doing this, please help me. Then you, we hope, inshallah, that there is that that forgiveness that's granted. Um, but if it just becomes a pattern, it's happening every day. We're not really trying too hard. We're just kind of hoping that it'll work out. Uh, then one's intention was not as sincere as the the other case. If that makes sense. So yeah, yes. Uh, hard to a little hard to hear. Did you? Yeah, no, the, the comment was if one starts to do um, usually any type of exercise, specifically cardio, and then drinking ample amounts of water actually also um, will help somebody uh, just get the right amount of sleep that they need. And it's usually easier for them to, to wake up in the morning. And, and as well as du'as that one needs to read before they sleep, make sure not to see any sins at all right before bed. Like if we're scrolling on Instagram right before, everybody will have problematic things come up in their Instagram feed. Put it away. Don't let look at that before bed. All the things you can do to protect your spiritual state so you sleep in like a saintly state and a protected state so that you can be woken up, right? Some people are woken up, right? They, they, they won't even set the alarm and they could be wake up. Um, and so so you want to try to do that for yourself. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So if there's anyone else online, we'll try to get to it next week. Um because it's getting a little bit late. Alhamdulillah, so we'll end with a, with a dua. Oh, uh, I will be traveling next week, uh, so we will not have class, uh, inshallah. So the following week, we will do our absolute best to resume. Um, like 95% sure we'll be good to resume the following week. Uh, if, 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 uh, but just look out for a message in the long time. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> benefiting from security and from ease and from comfort and from the ability to to sit and, and be in a state of security. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, our brothers and sisters continue to suffer immensely. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we're in suffering. Ya Allah, and many people are ignoring them, but we know that you are not ignoring them. We ask, Ya Allah, that you give assistance and that you give madad and that you give protection and that you give swift relief and swift aid to our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you assist the children, we ask that you assist the parents, we ask that you assist the, the, the elderly, we ask that you assist the men, and that you assist the women, and that you assist all of those people, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in the region, Ya Allah, there are many who are continuing to be and serve you, and we're providing medical treatment, we're providing journalistic coverage, and we're doing all sorts of things while they're in, under immense, immense, immense adversity, and while they're being targeted, their lives are being targeted, we turn to you, Ya Allah, 
Ya Allah, this is the Ummah of your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Allah, you love him and you love this Ummah, Ya Allah, we ask Ya Allah that you give relief to them, Ya Allah, that you give relief to these people, that you accept them and that you give them tawakul and that you give them patience, Ya Allah, there are those, Ya Allah, who are who are suffering in the cold and who don't have water to drink and who don't have food to eat and who don't have a place to live properly, Ya Allah, who are living in tents, who are suffering immensely, Ya Allah, we ask that you clothe them and that you feed them and that you give them warmth and that you give them comfort and that you give them tawakkul and that you give them patience, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you help this ummah, Ya Allah, through this immense adversity and give relief to this ummah and that you give assistance to this ummah and that you give them supper and that you give them immense high stations for this difficulty, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you accept all of those who have passed away as the highest stations of shaheed, that you accept them as shahada, that you give them the highest ranks of martyrdom, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Qawiyya, Ya Rabbil We ask that those who are trying to serve you in your cause and who are resisting this oppression, Ya Allah, that you make their feet firm, Rabbil Alameen, Ya Sabran, Wa Thabbil Al-Qadam, Ya Rasulullah, Al Qawm Al Kafirin, make their feet firm, make their hearts firm, and give them victory over the disbelievers, Ya Allah, give them Muslims victory over the Kuffar, Ya Allah, give them Muslims victory over the Shayateen, Ya Allah, give them Muslims victory over these Shayateen and over these evil people who are trying to oppress and who continue to oppress, and all of those who assist in the oppression, who assist in the evil, and who assist in the atrocities, we ask that you take them to account in the best of ways, Ya Qabil, Ya Mateen, Ya Qahar, we ask Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you hold these people to account in this life and in the deepest, in the deepest ways in the next life, Ya Allah, we ask that you wrap this Ummah with your mercy, Ya Allah, we ask that you give us the ability while we are in safety and security and soaking and swimming and basking and blessings that you allow us to take our lives seriously and that you allow us to work towards you and that you allow us to serve you properly and that you allow us to be people of shukr and people of iman and people of dhikr and people of ifqan, ya Rabbil Alameen, and let us do whatever it is that you want us to do to serve you. We ask that you protect us and our children and our family and our loved ones and our parents and that you grant them the highest of stations of Jannah and that you allow for us and our generations to come to be protected from the difficulties of the end of times and protected from the kufr of the times we are living in and the end of times, ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you protect us from the fitan and the fitna of the Masih of Dajjal and the fitan of the end of times, and we ask that you allow us to be connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to you always, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you give us a deep connection to you, Ya Allah. We ask you for everything good the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks for, and we ask you for protection for everything evil that he has protection from, and any difficulty or disease or worry that anyone is going through, we ask that you remove it, and that you cure it, and that you give ease, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to us and to the Muslimin. Alhamdulillah, So yeah, no class next week. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam. Mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbi Shahi Sadri wa Sali Amri. Wa ahli al-Muqtata min al-Sani yaqtaw qawli. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, hope everybody is doing well. Uh, so tonight is a is a special night. It is the 27th of Rajab, the latest al-Isra wa al-Mi'raj. Alhamdulillah, one of the best things that we can be doing on this night is gathering together as believers, learning the deen of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was a night in which strong parts of the deen were given to him uh, and then they were passed down. And so we'll discuss that inshallah, but we'll continue on in our discussion of the soul's eternal journey um, and we have reached the third section so this is the section once somebody finishes out and culminates their life in this dunya in this world which is the purpose for the human creation they will then transition into another realm into another world and this transition is literally the main thing that the human being has hopefully been working for and preparing for their entire life. And if not, then uh, it, it should become the main thing that we are working for and that we are preparing for. And this is the moment at which we die, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his Quran that Kullu nafsin al maut, every soul shall taste death and will taste death and is tasting death because every day that goes by is a day that we actually don't get back in our life. It is that day, that part of our life, we have already died, essentially. And we are moving closer and closer to a death that we don't know when it exists. Vikr al mot remembering death is one of the most virtuous ways to clean the heart, 
to clean the qalb. And it is one of the most virtuous ways to get close to Allah. Allah mentions death often in the Quran. It's very, very frequent, the mentioning of death. And the Prophet wasallam told us to frequently mention death in our gatherings and to frequently mention death in our life. Why? Because it helps the believer anchor themselves and realize that yes, I'm here in this world, but I'm here for a purpose. It is one of the many lives that I'm going to live. And the purpose of this life is to prepare for that moment in which I will leave this world and which I will, inshallah, meet Allah. I will leave this world in which I will meet our Lord. Uh, our, our Lord. And so we'll t- he's going to talk in this section about the different things that happen when somebody actually passes away and the questions that we are asked in the grave. Now, And while most of these things are fairly... Um, straightforward. We've probably learned about them before. Maybe we might know some of the basics. These are supposed to not be concepts that just sit in the brain. They're supposed to be deep spiritual realities that penetrate the hearts. And when the reality penetrates the heart, it should change the way in which we live our life. It should change the way in which we live our uh, our life. We don't want this these concepts to simply be... Um, no, no, no. Don't, that's strong. hot heater. No, no. Uh, that these are concepts that should actively result in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in it with an impact on our life. So he says that at some point, every believer is going to die and there is the moment of death. And he actually doesn't expand upon the moment of death in too much detail um, in this specific uh, uh, text, but he gets into what happens right after the believer passes away. Other scholars um, Imam Ghazali has a whole book that's written entirely on every single thing that's going to happen when you die. And just so you can prepare yourself for it. And what is going to happen, the things that the believer will see or will not see, the way in which they will experience things, the, the feeling that happens when the soul is leaving the body, all these different feelings that happen. Because when one dies, they enter into an entirely different realm where they are very much present and awake. Everybody around us at this moment starts to think that we're gone. But we actually have just woken up at this point. So as Sayyidina Ali, uh, Karamallahu Waj, radiallahu anhu, he says that every, people are asleep and when they die, they wake up. The vast majority of people. So he says, wake up before those moments. Let your nafs start to die before the day in which everything, the sensory realm will start to disappear. This is something now we can actually practice and implement. And we should practice and implement because these concepts they're not meant to be things we just learn in like a, in a Sunday school fashion, just memorize them, and they don't make any impact. We should start to reflect on these moments. How will I be when I die? So we live our life through this dunya. For some, it will be 30 years, 40 years. Some, it will be 70 years, 80 years. For others, it might be much, 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 uh, uh, a few, many fewer years than that, maybe 10 years, 12 years. But everybody has a lifespan that's been written for them on the day that they were, that, 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 that Allah created them and on the day that they are born. Then they now start to go through life and they live that lifespan. So we don't know when that day is going to come. We don't know when that, but when that day does come, the preparation is going to be very, very important. And so the first thing that one can do is actually start to meditate and reflect on what will I be? What state will I be in when I die? What state will I be in when I die? What, what hal will I have when I pass away? And what will be the experience that I will be experiencing? You kind of try to imagine this experience, right? So, so one can actually do a form of, of tafakkur, reflection, meditation, where they start to think, okay, I'm going to be in some place, whether it will be with people, whether it will be sudden, whether it will be in a hospital, whether it will be while I was sick. And then I will start to experience the different feelings that come with death. Every believer will see the angel of death. We'll see, everybody will see the angel of death. The believers will see the angel of death, ideally, inshallah, if their life was righteous in a pure form and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more beautiful form. The people of either disbelief, kufr, or sinfulness will see a very scary situation start at the moment in which death begins. And, there, and that is the first bad sign for them of a ruined life in the hereafter. That what they see when they are, and they start to get into a state of trepidation and worry and anxiety. And at this point, no, nobody can help them. Because this is at the point where only Allah knows what's happening and when he's going to take the soul. He mentions this in Surah Al-Waqiyah. 
that as the soul gets closer and closer, who will actually be there? Only God will be there. And so your relationship with God now becomes of utmost importance. If somebody had a pure relationship with God, Allah will inshallah choose to bless them with a husn al-khatima, a good ending, a good seal. And then Allah will hopefully be with them when they pass away. And hopefully their loved ones that are with them will be reminding them of goodness and reminding them of saying the shahada and so on. But it could also be a su al khatima, an evil ending, where they, 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 they outwardly, it may look basic, but inwardly, they're having a very difficult time. You might just see them passing away in a hospital, but they're unable to do any form of dhikr. They're unable to have a good, beautiful ending. And that's, that's, that's the moment that the believer's life is preparing for. So what happens now? There's, there's no, this is not an intellectual game at this point. There's no intellectual uh, uh, component to this. I think we can probably turn that one off. Do, I think it's fine. I think we can turn that one off. Yeah. Unless, is it helpful for you guys? It's fine. Yeah, we can turn it off. It's like a weird echo. Thank you. Um, so uh, what happens now is somebody will die according to the way they lived. There's no cheat codes. There's nothing one can just memorize and say, okay, now I'm going to find a way around this. The way in which one lived is the way in which they would die. If they lived a life of goodness and of righteousness, then we hope, and if Allah accepted it, we hope that it leads to a, a time, a death of goodness and righteousness. And if they lived the opposite of that, Allah can always change it, but it's, 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 it's much more likely that it's a su al khatima, that it is a bad ending. So the reflection here, one should always think, okay, how are my days passing? How are my days passing? And am I living a life such that if I were to die tonight, or if I were to die tomorrow, or if I were to die in my sleep, I would be content with the day that I had lived before this. I would be, because there will not be some um, specific moment at which it's going to be announced to us that now prepare yourselves and get ready. No, it's going to be that it comes. And it's mentioned many a time, and Imam Ghazali mentions this in his, in his text on death, that there were people who lived lavish lives and lives of luxury and the kings of this world and so on and so forth. And at some point, he mentions in, in a situation in which they have these like very, very gated homes, like a, kind of like a gated mansion type of situation. And so all of a sudden, somebody blows open the gates, blows open the gates. And the guards who are there say, who are you? Stop, get out of here. And he says, and he's just, and literally the guards have no impact on, on the one who's coming through the gate. So they can't, the guards are unable to stop them at the gate. Then there are more guards at the door that are unable to stop this one from, uh, from coming. They're unable to stop this one from coming. So they go, they go to the house and he enters into the house and he, and he just completely walks past the guards. And then he enters into the home. And he points to the to the corrupt king, to the corrupt ruler, and he says, "You, I've come for you." And I'm, and and now he knows the one, the king knows that this is the angel of death. The angel of death has come, and there's no. And he says, "Give me some time. Just, I got some situations to take care of. I have some people to fix some things with. I have to take care of this. I, I want to live righteously." And he says, "No, no time. You had your time. You had your whole life. You were given this." And he lists off all the blessings that he was given. And he lists off more and more things. And he says, and you didn't use it wisely. Now, it's, it's just doom, doom for you. That's it. And now I've come to see it. And he, then he seizes his soul and the entire family around him is, is witnessing this. It's a, a, a unveiling has happened and they're able to see what most people are not able to see are witnessing this. And his soul is taken. And yeah, all of the life of, of luxury and, 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 and corruption and everything that people live, they enjoy the Hayat dunya he just he goes back there. If, the, if, the, if uh, they, they enjoy the Hayat of Dunya, but Dada? it's not looking too good Daddy? after that. Um, and so they, they, this is the feeling that Dada. somebody can have. And so one should one should Dada. practice Dada. this moment. One should practice Dada. this moment, right? And um, uh, really reflect. Okay, how am I going to be? In these in these days, if this happens to me, for the believer, it could be a it's a very very different experience. It's a very different experience, and for the prophet sallam, permission was sought. If the angel of death doesn't is is not as high rank as the prophet sallam. Permission was sought. Is it okay for me to take? Is it okay if I do this now? Because he's the greatest of Allah's creation. 
for the rest of us, permission is not going to be sought. The angel will come and will do what they are, what he is supposed to do. But we hope that he will greet us. And he goes, and Imam Ghazali also mentioned the angel of death, checks on people multiple times a day or multiple times a week. And this might seem, how can one do this with billions of people? The angels don't operate inside of the realm of calculation, just like we believe in unseen AI LLM models that can calculate that have insanely powerful computational capabilities. The angels that Allah has created have far more significant computational capabilities and abilities that Allah has given them. So they're checking on people. And so he's observing how, what kind of life are you living? But ultimately, Allah will give the command, take this person's soul in this location at this time, and the angel of death will be present. Not a minute before, not a minute after, is it possible for the soul to leave the body than what Allah has written for somebody. So this is a moment to prepare for. So so the, the second takeaway is to imagine what happens when the angel when the angel does this. And then you start to imagine now what happens when uh, the person goes from this moment of being of passing away to what happens now. Their body is washed. Their body is washed. And so the believer feels the effects of the whistle. The believer feels it. It's all happening. It may seem like the mayit, the one who has passed away, is not feeling anything. They're feeling ev every, their sensory, their, their senses are amplified, in fact, according to some narration. So they feel a lot of things. They understand what's going on. They, they know if someone's treating them roughly or not. And so we, we, they just transition into a different realm, into a different realm. Just like in this realm, the angels, they can see us, but we can't see them. In that realm, the dead... They know what's going on with the living, but the living don't know what's going on with the dead, with the exception of the prophets that Allah opens the door of this to them and the prophets are able to see some of them, what's going on, and the inheritors of the prophets, what's going on with the dead. And, 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 and um, so one now starts to, to, to be washed and one must prepare themselves for these moments. And then the funeral. So he goes into, into a little bit of detail in, in terms of what is the process by which the believer should have their funeral done and how should one prepare for this moment in their life? How should one prepare for this moment in their life where um, ideally they have a good ending and a righteous funeral, meaning righteous people attend, many people pray over them, and inshallah it's a means of forgiveness for them. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave many incentives for believers to attend the funerals, to attend the funerals. So he said that uh, much uh, anyone who escorts the janazah of a Muslim until he prays for him or her shall receive one measure of reward, and, and each measure is the size of Mount Uhud. Mount Uhud is huge. If anyone has ever been to Medina Manawara, it's this huge, mighty, majestic, rock-like mountain. It's not like a dirt mountain. It's rock-like. It's huge. And so it's, that's one measure of reward that they receive for attending the janazah. And if they remain until they're buried, they receive two measures of reward, he says in this narration. Um, and it is also said in one narration that whoever escorts the funeral of their fellow Muslim, Allah orders the angels to escort their funeral prayer and pray over them when they die. So one way one can prepare for death in these moments is make it a, a uh, habit. Okay, you know what? Once a month, or once every three months, I'm going to escort, I'm going to make the time to go to a janazah. And I'm going to just, it's, if it's, especially if I can on a weekend or something, if people are busy with work during, and you don't need to actually know the people. There's people who are passing away in masajid all the time. 31st masjid right here down the street, 10 blocks away. They have a whistle area. They pray janazah like every two, three days is a janazah after the heart that's being prayed. And so then the people just eat, whether they know them or not, they escort them to the, to the graveyard. And what does it do? Number one, it gives us the virtues of these deeds. But number two, it gives us the, uh, number two, it gives somebody the reflection of death because they'll say, you know, this is going to happen to me. And it's important when one looks at the body and the mayyids who's passed away, they're wrapped in, we, 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 we are wrapped in white shroud when we die that one realizes themselves in that place. Not, we don't, we don't um, kind of divorce the reality and just, oh yeah, I'm here. I just got to go through the motions. When we're present in front of the dead and going in, the, a sign of our heart being alive 
is that we understand the reality of what's happening. This person is about to go and be buried in a cover and a grave, and then they're about to meet Allah. That's the reality of what's happening. Their soul was just taken from the angel of death. So that's not a time of jokes, of laughing, of catching up with our friends, and so on and so forth. Janazas, especially when someone is able to see the body, should be a time of immense seriousness and weightiness. And ideally, where one is, where one is weeping, snacks. Sorry, my wife is out of town, and he is very attached right now. So, my, if he runs around, I just ask them for a little bit of help and keep him entertained. Um, so one should have a weightiness to this. It's not a time of lightness, right? Hang, gang, hang, getting food with people, hanging out at gathering. These are times of, of lightness. But funerals, janazas, they're times of heaviness. One should really, it should really hit us. What's happening? What's taking place here? And if we make it a habit to attend them, again, it doesn't have to be every day or every week. Although if somebody wanted to, they could attend janazas all the time because there's so many people. But one should make it a habit, especially the men. It is a fard kifaya of the community, a communal obligation that the janazah takes place. Communal obligation, as, as we've learned, is if somebody, if a few people in the community do it, everybody is lifted of the obligation. But if nobody in the community does it, then everybody carries the weight of the sin. It's different than the individual obligations like the prayers. Um, so one should try to make the intention to fulfill that obligation every now and then for the, for the sake of those who are, pa are passing away. And then he says that the uh, spirits, when they pass away, they endure. So the physical bodies, they may not endure. Some physical bodies decay, others do not decay. As Allah says in the Quran, that do not think that those who have been slain in the way of Allah are dead. Nay, they are alive with their Lord being provided for. And in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said their spirits will be inside green birds who freely move in the garden and retire into lanterns attached to the throne. So the, whatever the spiritual realities of what the Prophet ﷺ just said in the hadith, that we, it's, 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 the, the, the realities are very difficult for us to understand. But the fact that the, those who have passed in the cause of Allah or those who are very close to Allah among the Siddiqeen or especially among the Nibi'een, they don't pass the way a normal person passes and they don't live a life in the grave than the way a normal person in their life lives a grave. They live a very, very different type of life and a different type of experience. And this is what we hope and pray, inshallah, inshallah is happening to our, uh, the martyrs in Philistine that may Allah accept their shahada and their martyrdom that, they're, that they have not they're not living a life anymore the way of they were living in, in this world of difficulty and of civil strife and of turmoil. But rather now they've been freed and they're with their Lord in a, and he is providing for them in the most special of ways. Okay, this is Quran. This is Quran. This, even if one does not look at the narration of the hadith, this is in the Quran. And so it has also been related in another narration that the souls of the believers, I, I assume this means some believers, will be inside white birds which feed on the fruits of the garden. So um, uh, there's various ways in which the souls can roam in the realms, in the unseen realms, beyond just the physical ways. Right now, we are in our physical realm. Our soul is in, is, is in our physical body, but it is, it's not going to be the case when somebody passes away. So he says, the dead person receives, perceives and is aware of those who wash, shroud, and bury them. And it has been said that his spirit is held by an angel who stands near him and walks with it in his funeral so that he hears everything that's said about him. Everything that one says about the one who has passed away, the, the dead can hear, according to this narration. Now, that means that one should <laughs> ideally say good things about those who have passed away. If we have bad things to say, <coughs> we avoid saying bad things in general, but especially at the time when someone has passed away, we only remember the good traits about that person, about that believer. Um, if they're a believer, if they're amongst one of these, uh, you know, oppressors or something like that, then they're doomed anyways. And you know, it's 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 not the same requirements um, that one would only say, uh, you know, what's what's positive. Um, so then he says, now what happens? He says, when he's laid in the grave, he goes into the grave, and he will be. There will be one time in your life. That's it one time you die, that you'll be laid in the grave. And this is the moment, again, that we've been hopefully preparing for. 
all the ibadah and the a'mal and the attempts to draw near to Allah or our intentions to try to draw near to Allah really start to come to fruition in this moment when one passes away and they are laid in their grave. And so once he says one does it by saying Bismillah ala millati Rasulillah in the name of Allah according to the way, according to the religion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One lays the dead into the grave. And then those who are present throw dirt into the grave um, from the verses in the Quran, woman that from it did we create you? Uh, to it shall we uh, uh, shall we return you? You shall return to it, and from it we shall bring you forth another time. These are the three that one says when they are pouring dirt into the grave. This is um, uh, something one should always do for those who have passed away. And then, of course, they fill the rest of the grave. Now, for the for those of us who have not passed into the intermediary realm, obviously we're here. One reflects on these moments. When you're at a grave, at a funeral, the whole point of the funeral is to think about what am I going to do when I'm there? In addition to praying for the deceased and letting it impact you, what am I going to do? When I'm in that state, what is going to happen to me? Will I be ready? Will I be at least somewhat ready? Or will I just be in a very difficult situation? And one should be at ease with dying. This is among the hallmark traits of the righteous, is they're completely at ease with dying. No fear of death. Alhamdulillah, it's the day that I meet my Lord, is what they say. They're, 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 they're going to join with their, and with their beloved. The, the Sayyidina Bilal, an, the famous Sahaba, Sahabi, he was, that on the day that he was, uh, as, as it was very clear that he was going to pass in that day or the next, he was happy, and he said something along the lines of that, on this day I'm going to meet Muhammad and his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to meet them, those who have passed before him, like Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, and whoever, and, and now, and now I'm, I'm finally going to go meet them. He was so excited. He was so excited. And of course his family was, was, was not as excited, and, and they were not in that, in that same state necessarily that he was in. But he was, he knew that I will finally get to meet the Prophet ﷺ now, and so their yearning was strong. The one whose heart is pure, the way to know, one of the other ways to know if the heart is pure is how much yearning do you have for Rasulullah and how much yearning do you have for Allah. One should have a, 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 enough of a relationship and should focus on developing a relationship with the Prophet ﷺ that one yearns to be with him and yearns to meet him and yearns to stand before him and kiss his blessed hands and yearns to give salam and yearns for the prophetic embrace and yearns for these things. One should yearn for this. People would, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and others would, would cry all night long, all night long, doing what? What was their, and what was their crying for? Just for the prophet. Just for the, this yearning, missing him so much, missing him, missing him. This is one of the best types of, of, of ways to increase your connection to Allah is to increase your connection to the Prophet because he is Habib Allah and he is the door by which we go through Allah. We would not know Allah had it not been for the Prophet and had the Prophet not told us about him. So when this love of the Prophet will serve one well when they pass away and it will increase your yearning for the days in which you will meet. Then now what happens? He says one should recite some Quran while uh, possible at the grave and make dua for the deceased. So make the offer forgiveness and for, for that this person has an easy time in the grave and an easy time in transitioning. And then, and uh, different narrations mention different things. It's good to recite Surah Yasin for the one who has passed away. It's good to recite Surah Mulk. Uh, it's good to recite Ikhlas, had 11 times or any number of times. As much Quran as one can do. Uh, one should one should recite and one should have no doubt about the fact that if one is doing it with a sincere intention that inshallah it will reach them and be of benefit um, then now the person who has passed away the question is asked to them who is your lord what is your deen and who is your prophet and now this question the answer does not come from your mind again the same thing <laughs> Uh -huh. 
And the, so the, the answer does not come from one's uh, mind at this point. So you won't be able to say, okay, well, I believe this, so Allah is my Lord. No, whoever one worshipped in this life, was it if it was money, if it was status, if it was fame, if it was prestige, if it was other people, that's what their response will be. If it was some celebrity, whoever you gave, we gave precedence to over Allah, meaning the time came when Allah's hukam was for something. And we didn't do that hukam. We said we did something else. We said, you know what? It's more important that I do this thing, which was for some other intention. If one does that continuously and has not repented, then one should be, we should be fearful that that is what we are going to say as our Lord. And then what is your theme? Islam is the answer. We know this, the way of submission. It's not, these questions are intellectually basic questions, but what is the reality of our state? The reality of our state, whatever way we follow, whosever methodology we follow, that's what we're going to say. Whatever methodology we, so if we gave precedence to the religion of Islam, then inshallah, inshallah, we ask Allah give all of us tawfiq in this and divine assistance, that we will say Islam. And then finally, who is your prophet? Again, the, whoever one looked up to the most, we all say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. How many of us really look up to the Prophet? So how many of us really um, that follow his sunnah in every way as much as we can in the best of our ability and yearn for it and don't minimize it? One of the most dangerous things that one can do that, will, that could ruin these moments is they minimize the sunnah. They make it, why are you still doing stuff like that? Such a weird way of doing things, right? Like that's a very, very, or they laugh at the sunnah. No, 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 no. One should never laugh at any sunnah action or minimize any sunnah action. Even if we don't do that action, someone else is doing the action. Alhamdulillah, they're doing the sunnah. One should not minimize it. Um, so the heart speaks now. The, the, the realities speak. Again, this world is flipped. The barzakh. The intermediary realm. It's not a world of, of what outward senses. It's a world of the inward realm. So whatever the reality of your situation is, that's what's going to come out of, of our situation. And we're going to say what we need to say. And this is what matters now. It doesn't matter what people think of you in this world. It doesn't matter how successful one was outwardly or not in this world. It doesn't matter how much money somebody made. It doesn't matter how much is in someone's bank account or their investment account, or their 401k, or their stocks, or this thing, or that thing. doesn't matter how much prestige somebody gained, or what level of, uh, of, of attention people give them. None of it matters. The only thing that matters, really, at the end of the day, did we get these questions right? And everything we do in life will play into whether we got these questions right. But this is the test that we should be preparing for, more than any other test or any other exam. You know, like when we're young, we do, um, we prepare for exams in school, if we, or if we're in college or, or graduate school, whatever, we prepare for exams, right? Ron prepares for their exams. And then when they, as they get older, sometimes they might be interviewing for a job or have to learn a new skill. They might have to prepare for an interview and they might have to prepare for a, a coding test or something else like that. There's preparation at different stages of life that's going on. The ultimate preparation is this, this is the ultimate test, whether somebody passes it or not. That's the big question that we want to be asking for ourselves. Um, and the, the main thing that's happened in our time is the seriousness of this has, has kind of disappeared. The seriousness of these moments, of these days, of, of the reality of what's going to happen in this time, it, it's not as present as it needs to be. And so the believers, how frequently do we mention death in our gap. It's, you don't go to a social gathering where someone is talking about death. The gatherings of the prophets and the Sahaba, they would talk about death. They would talk about it. It was like a very clear part. What would it be? Okay, how are you going to, are you going to be able to answer for that, what you just did or what you just didn't do or what you just ate or what you just said when you died? This is the way the believers, they're constantly reminding each other. Remind for reminding benefits the believers. So in our life right now, let's not live a life of regret where we regret the time that we spent just letting time pass and never thinking about the serious, the weighty things. It doesn't mean one has to be doom and gloom all the time, but there's a seriousness to life that, the, that, that really, really, really one has to wake up to and, contem and, and 
contemplating and reflecting on these things is what will bring about the seriousness. So then he says that the one who Allah allows to swerve in these questions will be confused and hesitating. And just like in this world, they have been doubtful, hesitating, confused, torturous, neglectful of Allah's commands and prone to violate his prohibitions. Meaning they didn't do what Allah said to do and they didn't stay away from what Allah told them to stay away from. He said, they will say, I don't know. I don't know. And they will start to get into a state of panic. At this point, nobody can help them. Khalas, it's done. Nobody can help them. He says, now at this point, in some narrations, the, 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 the striking will begin. Meaning their torture in the grave will start and the grave will tighten around them and be filled with church torture. For some, eternally until the day of judgment. And for others, according to how much Allah wants to punish them. We're talking, this could be thousands of years for some people. Thousands, tens of thousands of years before they're resurrected and it gets even worse. All for what? For 60, 70 years of a life that we could have lived, we could have lived with righteousness. So this is what one has to reflect on and really seriously think, I'm going to be in a place six feet down under all by myself. If one can visit a graveyard by themselves or with somebody else, and look into an open grave and just look, okay, how deep is it? Okay, how narrow is it? And that's it. Who's in there with us? Nothing. Only our deeds. Nobody is allowed to carry anything in with them. And that's it. Only the amal and, and their Lord will be present with them. And for the, for the one who, who's in this state that he just mentioned, the grave constricts further until in some narrations, the ribs go like this and they keep going like this and this and this and this. And the, and the intensity of the punishment continues. And for others who are in the felicitous state, he says the firm believer, the mu'min, who, will be, who was established in faith during their life will be given glad tidings by the angels. Their grave will become spacious, filled with light and delight, and their good works will surround them. So this is where you're fasting, the prayers, charity, recitation of the Quran, remembrance of Allah, good character, treating other people kindly, treating our parents well, all the different traits that one is supposed to be doing in, in terms of the rights of Allah and the rights of the people, they will come to protect. So now the punishment's about to come. Quran comes and it says, no, you can't touch him. You can't touch her. Not, not. Why? Because she recited Quran. She recited me, would stay up late to recite me, would fight their sleep in Ramadan to recite me, and now I'm going to protect them. His fast will come, and the fast will say, you cannot touch this person. Why? Because they fasted for Allah's sake, and now I am their fast, and they, 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 these are personified. They, they're, they're present, and they protect one. And all of the other ibadah comes and starts to protect one. So it's a very obvious situation. What should we do? How should we prepare? But the nafs doesn't want us to prepare in this life. So the, the more one can defeat their nafs and... This is why everything we've been talking about with regards to dhikr and remember and purifying the heart and remembering the moments in our life, remembering uh, remembering Allah and remembering the meeting with Allah becomes so important because one will feel a type of dread in this life where they're like, if I don't prepare for this, something's going to happen. And they'll wake up from their sleep. And others, if they stay asleep, they will never feel that dread, like that worry and anxiety of, I better prepare. I mean, and, and once that anxiety starts to kick in, it should be a, a, a activating force to make somebody um, prepare. As one hadith, the Prophet said, I've never seen anything more terrifying than the grave. The Prophet has seen a lot, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, I've never seen something more terrifying than the grave. And one time Sayyidina Uthman, radiallahu anhu, he came near a grave and he wept so much that his entire beard became wet. And um, uh, it's because he said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, the grave is the first of the hereafter stages of the stages of the Akhirah. If one is saved from it, then what comes next is easier. But if one is not saved from it, then what comes next is even harder. It's already hard enough with what we just read. And this is not, he barely described it. If we have time, maybe next time, or if we can get through the rest of the, the, the sessions, we'll get into what Imam Ghazali says detail about the grave, every step of what's going to happen, 
the types of punishments that are possible. It gets, there's a lot of detail that's written in our tradition about the grave. We're, we're very fortunate to know what goes on in the Akhira. Many people do not have not been given this access to this unseen realm and knowledge that the Prophet gave us access to. So then it is said, why does the torment of the grave happen? It is because of three things mainly. All sins can bring punishment, but the Prophet is summarizing. He says, because first people used to, we used to talk bad about other people. That's the first. Is slander and backbiting. The second is calumny. What's calumny? Calumny, it's tailbearing, meaning. Did you hear what happened to this person? Did you hear what she said? Did you hear what they said? Did you hear, oh, that person, they talked, they said this thing bad about you. Are you still going to hang out with them? Why would you hang out with them? It's spreading the bad that other people say about you to other people. Just, just the worst types of gossip. This is one of the main sources. Imagine every sin the Prophet could have listed. He says the main sources of punishment for the grave are these. Because why people take them lightly. Other sins, we might do a sin and it might really hit us. But we talk bad about people. And may Allah forgive us all the time. All the time. All sorts of, 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 of things that we say. So we have to take ourselves to account. The tongue, this is what's going to get us in trouble. The main thing is going to get us in trouble is this tongue. Just... Say the Bakr used to like hold the tongue and sometimes be seen walking around filled, filled with his mouth filled with rocks. Imagine somebody walked around now with his mouth full of rocks. What would we think of them? This is the greatest of Allah's creation after the prophets. Is Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq And he said, the tongue is what gets me in trouble. This tongue is what gets me in trouble. Trying to prevent. The tongue is what gets me in trouble. Just trying to keep it quiet. Trying to keep the tongue quiet. Not, not overdoing it. So... One should be very careful. What am I saying? Am I saying an examine? Okay, I'm about to say some, someone just brought up somebody who I don't like. I know that there's like a 98% chance that I say something bad. So I better just leave the room or change the topic or pull out my phone and bring something else up and change it up before I let myself get into more trouble because this is about to get bad. Because and, and so this is the first two things. The third thing is one not caring them, care, uh, uh, one not taking care of themselves when after they use the restroom and the uh, najasa of the restroom gets on them. This is one of the main things. Is one one narration. One who does not guard themselves against being soiled um, with with najasa, with urine, with other things. They will have the carelessness by which they did that, and then they would go out and pray and do other things will have an impact on them in terms of the punishment in the grave. So the believer is pure and is clean and does their best to clean themselves. Does their best to clean themselves. This is why for, for this total side topic, but for men, it's not permitted for, to, to stand up and urinate. Sorry to get very specific, but this is one of the main things why, where this happened. This hadith is applied. One, can, one must make sure that they are properly urinating and such that they are kept clean and that they clean everything. For, for all believers must keep themselves clean. Must keep them, and we're not saying that, that, that it's completely haram in all circumstances, but the scholars have essentially said that this hadith would, 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 would be, uh, uh, one would be acting against it in that situation, unless it, they were like, you know, desperate. Um, and so the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he would frequently make dua from the grave's torment. And he urged others to include in their supplications in their du'as, uh, protection from the grave. So we always make du'a for the dunya. Ya Allah, I want this. Ya Allah, I want that. Ya Allah, I want... The vast majority of the du'as of the human being are for this life. The vast majority of the du'as of the righteous are for the next life. We have to figure out how are we going to slowly increase the number of du'as that we make for the next life. We don't just want to do like a super quick, and I'm saying this to myself first and foremost, Ya Allah, make it easy for me in the Akhirah. Okay, and can I have this car and this job and this and this? And we can ask him for all of it. There's nothing wrong with asking him for as many things as possible in his dunya. But at least one minute, two minutes of the dua, once a day, should be for the Akhirah. Maybe if not once a day, once a week. Ya Allah, make my uh, death easy for me. Because then the reality will sink in. If, if it's not just a, a, a thing that's going to happen one day. So, and again, I'm saying this to myself first and foremost because I'm thinking about duas that I make. And they're far from making du'as to, for the Akhirah. So we should all try to make it a habit, um, at least on Fridays, a virtuous day, sit down after Salat al-Jummah or some other time of the day and just try to make a significant portion of our du'a for the Akhirah. 
and ask Allah over and over again. Allah is too generous for us to be asking 20, 30, 40, 50 years of our life and praying not to give. And the main du'as that we should make, we should start with on virtuous nights and on um, virtuous moments like Hajj and other moments is du'as for the Akhirah. And then, of course, anything we want in this dunya, ample time to, inshallah, make those, those du'as as well. So that's a very quick summary of what happens, and then we'll just go up and we'll do one other section, and then we'll end, inshallah, um, for good questions, and then pray, Isha. Um, so then he says, okay, what's going to happen? He said that one thing can benefit you once you pass away, and that's the du'as and some of the actions of the people who are still here. So if your children or your family members or your loved ones or your friends pray to Allah for forgiveness for you, Allah can forgive you and me while we are in the grave, even if we had done so much wrong. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said in one narration that were it not for the living, the dead would have been doomed. Why? Because according to the commentary, the prayers and requests for forgiveness and for mercy that they receive. Alhamdulillah, that the Muslims, there's some Muslims, they make dua all the time for all the Muslims. Allahumma kfili mu'minina wal mu'minat, Allahiyahum wal amwat. That, oh Allah, forgive the believing men and women, those who are alive and those who have passed away. So there are people in the Ummah, Alhamdulillah, they're always praying for the believers who have passed. And, but we should make it a habit, at least our grandparents, our parents, if they've passed, daily, if not weekly, pray for them, Ya Allah, have forgive, forgive my parents, even if they're alive or if they've passed. Forgive those who have passed away in Iman before me. They need the du'as, the most desperate thing that they, that they could ask for is the du'as, or the most, the most essential thing, rather, that they could ask for. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, in one narration, um, for somebody to uh, give on behalf of someone who has passed away. So someone asked him, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah asked him, my mother's soul departed suddenly, and had she been able to speak, she would have given charity. Would it bring her benefit if I did so on her behalf? And he said, yes. So he dug a well, the Sa'ad, on behalf of his mother and said, this is for my mother. So this is what's called sadaqa jariya. One does a, you, you make a masjid in someone's behalf. You dig, dig a well, you give donation on their behalf. You give sadaqa on their behalf once they've passed away. We should do this and instill this in our siblings, parents, uh, or rather uh, children, people who may be alive after we pass away. May not, but they may be. And to Sadiq Ajariya is essential. Give on my behalf. Please, please give charity regularly. Remember me. Visit my grave frequently. This should be a habit that we should do with our children. And hopefully they will do with us when we have, um, when we have passed away. Uh, then another narration says that, Ya Rasulullah, my parents have died. Is there anything left by, me which, by, by, by which, um, with which I may be doing good to them? I can do good to them. He said, yes, there are four things. Praying, asking forgiveness for them, carrying out their promises, and being good to their friends and their family. Those are ways that you can benefit them. So praying for sure on their behalf and asking forgiveness, but also doing the virtue that they taught you in this life. Anytime somebody does a virtue, whoever taught them the virtue gets the reward for it. It's amazing. This is why if we can teach children the Quran, and the prayer, ooh, that's, and hopefully that person has a long life in obedience, that is a huge key. Some of the scholars towards their later stages of life, that's all they would want to do. They would just teach children the Fatiha. Why? Fatiha, how many times a day does someone say it? 17, at minimum if they pray five times a day, let alone if they pray Sunnah and Nawafil. And then they're always saying it, always doing it, and then the Quran. And so if someone teaches one how to recite the Quran and teaches one how to pray, Alhamdulillah. Don't let anyone ever take that deed away from you. Do not let the Sunday school teach your kids how to pray. Make sure we are the ones to do that. Not let the Sunday school teach our kids how to recite. At minimum, that's the stuff that we want to get the reward for. Hopefully, the Sunday school can add some stuff and, teach, and they can get some reward too. But for, for, for anybody who we can teach Quran to, any, especially amongst those who are young, we should do. And, and other good deeds as well. So he says that that um, recite Quran and send it as a reward for them. There's ikhtilaf in the ummah about whether this reaches the dead or not. According to some narrations, even though there's weakness in them, it does. And what the scholar said is when it comes to difference of opinion on Allah's mercy, whether Allah is going to be merciful enough for it to benefit them or not, 
side on the side of Allah's mercy. So if anyone says, oh, why are you reciting Yasin for this person? It's not going to benefit them anyways. You could just say, okay, how about instead I scroll on Instagram and waste my time like everybody else. Like, what do you want me to do? No, recite Yasin for the dead. Like in the time we live in, any good, even if the hadith is extremely weak, but it's been narrated that it's good to do. And it's from the amal, not from aqidah or fiqh, meaning it doesn't impact your core belief or your fiqh. It's like an extra good deed we should 100% do. In the time we live in, too many people discourage others from doing good. Even the night tonight, 27th of Rajab, Isra Miraj. Is it, is, do, do some people have a difference of opinion on this night? Maybe like five people. Yes, they do. Is it worth listening to those people? Sure, yeah, let's just watch a soccer game tonight instead of worshiping Allah. That's like, this is the type of logic that people use. Say, no, 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 don't worship Allah. Instead, just live, just, just keep, just be, play really, really careful. Instead, just live the dunya life. And don't do anything extra. No, instead, one, what does scholars say? If there's a chance that the virtue will increase one, one goes for the virtue, whether it's a little bit or a lot. Because we err on the side of Allah's mercy always, especially in the time that we live in. So he says, recite Quran and often try to send it for them. If we can do this for our parents, grandparents, others, ikhlas, he says, 11 times a day or 11 times frequently, he said, this is one good thing to do. Send them the, the reward of the of Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul of Allah Wahad, um, and, and other, uh, other, uh, other forms of Qur'an. If one can do a portion of the Qur'an and regularly say, you know what, I'm going to do this portion weekly, and I'm going to send it to all of those as a gift. What is the intention one makes is, Ya Allah, send this as a gift and as a reward to my grandma or to my grandfather or to all of them. And then, inshallah, according to one narration, it's presented to them as a light, as like a nur, as a gift coming from this person living in this location or this person, the son of this person, and then, or the daughter of this person, and then it's presented to them. These are very, very noble and virtuous things that one can do. Um, and we should teach our children to do this so that they can do it for us and nobody, people don't forget about us. The last thing we want to do is be forgotten about in this manner. So... That's the essence of what we want to cover for right now. We want to do a little bit more, but for the sake of time, we'll just briefly talk about the virtues of, of Isra and Miraj, and then we'll end. Inshallah. So tonight is the 27th of Rajab. 27th of Rajab is related to Isra and Miraj, according to most narrations. This is the night in which the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, when it was a very, 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 very virtuous night. Most of them say, the scholars, that this was the best night of his life. The best night of his life. Why? What happened on this night? There are many takeaways. A few first takeaway. The year before this night, before this, this event happened, was a very difficult year for the Prophet. His uncle, Abu Talib, passed away. His uncle was protecting him and was like a father to him. This is the father of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abu Talib. This is, so this is the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu very close to him. So his uncle passes away. Already he's lost. His, he'd already lost his father before he was born. Then he lost his blessed mother. Then he loses his grandfather, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. And then he, now he loses his uncle. And others in his family had also passed. And then also who passes away in the same year? His wife. His, the first and the, 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 the great Sayyidah Khadija Al-Kubra radiallahu anha. And she passed away and she supported him when no one supported him. She was there for him when revelation was first given to him. She embraced him. She, 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 she provided for him. She helped him. She supported him. She encouraged him. She passes away in this year as well. And so now he's left. All the people who had supported him, they're gone. The people who had loved him, they're gone. But Allah remains with him. Allah who loves him the most and also gives him the, all of his support, he remains. And then what else happens in this year before this event? The, the, the moment, the event of Ta'if happens where the Prophet Sallallahu goes to Ta'if to do, to do what? To do da'wah, to invite them to Islam so that all these very difficult situations don't happen when one passes away. And they reject him vehemently, really intensely reject him. They throw stones at him. They push him out of the city until his blessed feet were bleeding. In some narrations, for a kilometer or two, a mile roughly, uh, 
where they just kept chasing him out. All for what? For calling Allah, calling them to Allah. Very difficult situation. And so he faced, and there was a lot of squeezing that happened in this year. It was known as the year of prison, of difficulty and, and distress and, and anxiety, or not anxiety, grief. And then it was in this time, Allah chooses to bless him with Isra and Miraj. So the first lesson in this is Allah will squeeze us a lot before the biggest opening. A lot before the biggest opening. And, and it's not easy squeezing for everybody. But the opening does come, and when it comes, it's great. It's, it's, it's a great opening. And we, we ask Allah give a huge fat to the people of Palestine, a huge opening, because the, what they're being going through is just, it's un, un, we can't even comprehend it in terms of the level of difficulty that they're going through. But inshallah, with it is a huge opening that's coming, and we should not doubt that for a second. Uh, what happens? He goes from Masjid al-Haram. Jibreel al-Islam shows up with the Burak and tells him to ride. To ride this Burak, which is like this flying, majestic, white horse. And he goes from Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa to where? To Jerusalem, to the farthest mosque. And he leads all of the prophets in prayer in this Masjid. Masjid al-Aqsa, may Allah free it from these occupiers. That it is, the, it is very significant for the Muslims. And it plays a very significant role on this night. And it should be a night in which we pray abundantly for Palestine. And then he goes from there to Jannah. To heaven so the first thing and he ascends to heaven and he has various events we don't have time to get into all the details but i would advise um if if, if, if folks can to read in the sirah about the events that took place amazing things happened on this night he went to every level of heaven and met different prophets and it was a way of teaching the prophet ﷺ and also teaching us as an ummah what's going to take place the second thing that happened that's huge on this night is he goes and he directly, he goes to a point, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam is his tour guide and showing him around heaven. Okay. And he goes to a point where Jibreel alayhi salam says, I can't go past this point. If I go, I'll just burn. There's too much light. I can't go. This is only for you. This station is yours. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, the greatest of Allah's creation. And he goes and now he enters in to the divine presence to meet Allah directly. Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When you read that in the prayer, this is what you are reading. This is what we are reading. This is what uh, the greeting of Allah to the Prophet. Assalamu What does he do in this time? He is with Allah. All he is with his Lord. He could just, just be with his Lord. Assalamu alayna ala ibadillah salihin. And peace be upon us and the righteous. Allah's servants. He remembers the Ummah in his most difficult times. He remembers this Ummah. He always cares for the Ummah. The Prophet's concern for the Ummah, we can't even begin to understand his concern. His concern is so vast for this Ummah. And he remembers this Ummah in the Divine Presence. And what does Allah give him? Anytime you go to the house of a very, very generous host, you will leave with a gift. What about the Lord of the heavens and the earth who calls you into his direct presence? And the gift of the salah is given now, the formal ritual prayer. It's given as 50 until he goes down. He goes down now to the next heaven, to the seventh heaven. And, and, and um, uh, or I don't know if it was on the seventh or the fourth where Musa al -Islam met him. Musa al -Islam tells him there's no way they're going to do 50. They can't do 50. 50 prayers too much. You're praying all the time. Every 10 minutes would be a prayer. He says, okay, he goes back up. And this happens multiple times. It's reduced by 5, 45, 40, 35, until finally, after so many times of going and meeting Allah, until finally it's five prayers. And then he says, Musa alayhi salam says, they still won't be able to do five. And he just says, the Prophet says, I, I'm too shy to go. I'm not going to ask for anything else. It is. Allah says, you do five, you get the reward of 50. Five with the reward of 50. The main lesson we take away is the salah, this gift that was given is one of the only things that was given directly to the Prophet ﷺ with no intermediary. And Jibreel Islam did not give him the Salah like he did the Quran. The Salah was given directly to the Prophet for us. To do what? So it's our form of this night journey of ascension. If somebody prays their Salah, it's the means of relief for him or her. And it's a means of their getting close to Allah and reliving this. And the Salah has a, you literally relive this moment in the Salah. It's amazing. What took place and 
third, the third, third key thing to remember is there was a lot of du'as the Prophet ﷺ learned on this night and the Prophet ﷺ taught about this night in terms of protection and, and du'as that we should do to avoid um, uh, the, 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 the uh, things that he saw and he witnessed in terms of the punishments that take place in the unseen. But the key is that we use this time to make du'a for ourselves and for relief for the ummah and to rec renew our prayer. If we've been weak with our prayer, if we've been slackening in our prayer, renew the prayer. This is a night in which one should strive to pray Qiyam, strive to pray Tahajjud. Uh, it's very good to do so. There's no specific ibadah one needs to do or has to do or that's been narrated, except that it's a good night for du'a. And it's a good night to contemplate how much love and concern the Prophet ﷺ has for us. And it's a very, very, very special night for Jerusalem and for Masjid al-Aqsa. It is when the Masjid al-Aqsa was honored with the presence of the greatest of Allah's creation. Before it, many prophets had prayed in it and had prayed in the Temple Mount in that general area. Now the Sayyid of all the Mursaleen came and he was the one who was told to lead. He was the one pushed towards the front because he is the greatest of Allah's prophets. And this is the greatest of Allah's ummahs, of Allah's communities, inshallah. And we hope and we pray for Faraj and for relief for this ummah in all the places, especially in Gaza and in Palestine and the West Bank. And that Allah free the Masjid al-Aqsa from these occupiers. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. If we have a few minutes for questions, we can do questions and then we'll pray Isha. Inshallah. Yes. Yeah, good question. So for the deceased, right, for who has passed, <clears throat> the question is du'as that we can make. Um, three or four du'as that we should regularly make. First, that Allah forgives them of all their sins. That Allah encompasses them in his mercy completely. Um, the next, that Allah makes their grave a garden from the garden of paradise. That he makes their grave enlightened and a garden from the gardens of Jannah. And that he makes their grave fast and makes their moments in the grave easy for them. The next is a dua that Allah makes it easy for them on the day of judgment and that he allows them to enter Jannah in without any hisab. So basically all the events that will now take place and we'll talk about them in the next few classes, inshallah, um, that will take place after one dies, one makes dua for those things. In terms of specific surahs, at minimum, he mentions the virtues of doing it three times, 11 times, we should do so. Um, what we've seen is our teachers do, they'll do the Fatiha and they'll send it to the to the deceased. That's very common. And then Ikhlas. And then for those who we really can, Yasin is very good to do. So some of them, they do Yasin daily one time for all of those in their family who have passed away. Um, if you can't do so daily, weekly, monthly, um, uh, but, but there's no specific surah. So you could just recite Quran frequently and send it as well. Yes. So you mentioned the Quran. Yeah, good. You mentioned that the main the main Jesus people of the Hindus are the great are standing from the Yeah. Yep. According to one narration, yeah. Yeah. So um the East still have a even if you're a kind of and if you want to point to us when you can open from Question is mention it was mentioned the sins that um, <clears throat> that take place when uh, or rather the punishment that takes place due to certain sins when one is in the grave um, and so does it happen if we repent and uh, how do we pure, perfect our repentance basically but <clears throat> anything we repent from is erased inshallah so <clears throat> if we repented we don't worry too much that in, inshallah as long as Allah accepts our repentance and we fulfill the conditions of repentance which we spoke about in the last class which are sincerity and asking making the intention to never do that sin again um, and then uh, uh, making the intention to never do that sin again with a firm with a very 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 um, firm resolve and feeling remorse guilt in their heart then you assume the repentance is accepted and in these situations that's what uh, uh, the assumption should be and then one should strive to not do it again. With regards to talking bad about people, if one caused a lot of fitna, um, one should go and do good deeds in their name. Because the best is to go and say, I said such and such about you, I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me? But that's not going to go over well in the time we live in. Those of you aren't going to handle that well. So what you do is you, um, 
you uh, give them, give, do some good deed in their name that, Ya Allah, I sought forgiveness for this and I'm trying to do good in their name and then you speak good about them as much as possible to make up for the bad. But repentance, assume that it's erased. Yeah. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Good question. Question, uh, women going to the graveyard, Janaza, is there a basis for that? Um, uh, there's some basis for it if the practices that someone does are um, really problematic. But if they're not, then many of the scholars have permitted it. So you have differing opinions on this. Uh, much of it has become culture now. So in certain cultural uh, practices, um, it's become this huge thing, which is overemphasized, like, no, 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 women can't go, women can't go, it's not okay. It's, it's part of the, a lot of people just like to kind of control women, um, but it's not to be taken out of context. So there's a few things to keep in mind of context. First is if a woman goes and she, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, some women would do something called wailing, which is this really intense cry where somebody doesn't accept what's happened and they kind of are screaming like, why did this happen? Why, why, why? And that's not permitted in Islam. So once someone dies, we're not allowed to ask Allah, why did it happen? We say, Ya Allah, I'm really, really, it's really tough on me, but you're not questioning why did this happen to me? And especially not out loud. Like there's one thing if the whispers happen internally. So in a situation where that's going to likely be the case, one would, um, one would not, one would not uh, uh, encourage that. And so this used to ha happen at the time. And so men would usually be the ones who are accompanying janazas. And then what would happen in the time is the women would usually go afterwards and they would visit the graves. It's totally, per totally permitted for women to visit the graves. Anybody who doubts that um, doesn't know their theme. It's completely permitted, encouraged. Say the Fatima radiallahu anha would often go to visit her uncle or the uncle of the Prophet Sayyidina say the Hamza radiallahu an. It's mentioned that women would go to Baqi and visit Baqi um, and Janatul Baqi, which is the graveyard in Medina Manowara. And so that's, that's very much encouraged to do. The second reason they avoided it is because in societies where there's segregation, now there's mixing that goes on. Um, and so if we're, this is where you apply your own, you know, not your own, but you apply criteria, right? If we're not in a society where that is the case anymore and women are standing in one area, and men are standing in another area. Everyone is doing everything with modesty and with, with respect and with dignity. And one is carrying themselves properly, both the men and the women. And inshallah, there should not be a problem, a problem with this. Um, and, and so those are some of the reasons why. There's not like a for sure yes or no. It's not that black and white. Uh, I would, I would, I've generally seen our teachers recommend that women do go to the graveyard. And it doesn't have to be for the janazah. Janazah, at minimum, the men need to go to fulfill the obligation. But definitely to go to the grave, visit, make du'a, contemplate death, um, think about the fact that they will actually be there at some point is, is completely in line with the sunnah of the ummahat al mu'minin of the mothers of the believers. Yeah. Hopefully that helps a bit. And then if, if more details needed, we can expand next time on kind of why some of these things may exist in our religion. Yeah, there was a question. Could you be a little louder? Sorry. Yeah. Um, the last part was, can you send them a, yeah, 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 more than, so you can make an intention that I'm going to read Yasin for my grandma, my grandfather, my other grandmother, my other grandfather, my cousin, my aunt, I'm just thinking of some of the people I know who passed away in my life, and then you just keep going, one Yasin for all of them, or Separately, I'm going to do Surah Ikhlas for each of them separately. So Surah Ikhlas takes like 10 seconds to read, 30 seconds, right? So Yasin takes like 10 minutes. So it just, you can, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, inshallah. Yes. Oh, one more time. Oh, no, it, it doesn't matter. I was mentioning the example of Surah Ikhlas as uh, you would do that because it's just really short. Um, all, the benefit of ikhlas is that it's a khatam of Qur'an 
33% of the Quran, one third of the Quran reciting class once. So you send three of them to somebody and it's the whole Quran, inshallah. So we should do so because it's easy. We should try to do so frequently for those who have passed away. Um, but we can do a general intention and just recite Surah Ikhlas three times for all those who have passed away. And then when we have time, we do more, inshallah. But we should have kind of a bare minimum that we don't leave. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. One more question. Let's see, online. What book are you referring to? Imam Ghazali's book, uh, Kitab, the book on the remembrance of, uh, of, of death and the Akhirah. Um, it's the book 40 of the Ahiyah al -Madin. It's been translated by uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, Timothy Winter. Um, and you can get it online. It's a very, very good book. How do we teach our hearts to speak the right answer when we are in the Qabr? Purely based on the life that you live. If you live a life of righteousness and you pray your five prayers, you will, inshallah, be in a good in a good state. Um, and pray your five prayers. All the vert things we're supposed to do with regards to the fara'id in our religion and the virtuous deeds uh, will be in a good state, inshallah. And if, if we disobey Allah's commands and what he has told us to stay away from, then that's where we're going to struggle. So our deen already is preparing us but the extra work that has to be done is extra adhkar and extra remember, remembrances to purify the heart, to purify the heart. Yeah, one should, um, is visiting the grave after Maghrib not recommended. The Prophet ﷺ would go uh, at nighttime to the graves. So that's what we have learned from the Sunnah. Um, would, not, would, 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 would not advise um, one go alone uh, necessarily in the time we live in, be not because it's not the sunnah, but just because of the things that could be happening um, there in terms of the unseen realm. But but the Prophet would go sometimes every night and to the grave and reflect. Yes? When you visit the grave, where do we stand? Um, so we'll talk about this, inshallah, next time, where he talks about the, 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 the etiquettes of visiting the grave. But ideally, you stand um, in front of the grave, like right at the foot, and then you give your salam, and the person can hear your salam, you assume they can hear your salam, and that's where you would make the dua, and you would make, you know, recite Quran. Um, so you should stand facing them. You can also stand at their head or sit down close to their head. Um, but most of the what we've learned is that people are kind of sitting down or standing where their feet are, and that, and and that's where they're um, present. But it really depends on if there's room there or not. It's like a small constricted space. You go where you'll be comfortable because they they can hear you when you give your salam. And then if you, it's com more comfortable to sit somewhere else because there's more more room, you can do that as well. Yeah. But next time, inshallah, he's going to hopefully we'll have time to get into the etiquettes. Uh, the live is witchy today. Oh, sorry about that. It's um. The internet has some issues. Okay, we'll end with the dua and then um, pray salat al Isha. Uh, so, moving forward, the class will start at 7, inshallah. Isha will be after the class because the masjid Isha time has changed now, inshallah. So, just a note. Um, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا فتح يا مبين يا أرحم الراحمين we ask ya Allah that you on this blessed night on this noble night of relief ya Allah that you give faraj to the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم that you give faraj and relief to the people of Gaza and to the people of Palestine and that you give faraj and relief to all of those who are suffering and that you give water to those who are thirsty and food to those who are hungry and warmth to those who are cold and ease to those who are in difficulty Ya Rabbil Alameen amongst the people of Palestine Ya Allah and all over the Muslim world Ya Allah we ask that you give comprehensive relief and ease to them and that you console the hearts of those who have lost their family members and their children and those who have lost others in this difficult situation in this genocide that's taking place we ask that you stop this situation ya allah we ask that you end this situation that you give relief to the muslims that you give victory to the muslims that you give victory to the muslims ya rabbil admi we ask that you give victory to the muslims over the kuffar rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabbit aqdamana wa nusurna ala alqawm alkafirin we ask that you give comprehensive ease and relief to this ummah ya allah we ask that you give openings to this ummah we ask that you free masjid al-aqsa we ask that you 
free Masjid Al-Aqsa. We ask that you free this noble Masjid in which your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed and led the Prophets in prayer, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask, Ya Allah, that you look down upon this Ummah and that you pardon us for the wrongs that we have done and for the wrongs that we are continuing to do and that you do not allow our wrongs to be means of suffering for this Ummah. We ask that you give victory to the Muslims all over the Muslim world, that you stop the oppression, the oppression of the Zionists, the oppression of the Americans and of the British and of all these different people who are oppressing and who are bombing and who are delighting in their destroying of the Muslims, Ya Allah. We ask that you take care of these kuffar and that you completely take care of them in the way that you know best, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you, Ya Allah, you are our Lord and you are the one we can turn to for help and we turn to nobody else for help but you. We ask that you give us afia in our life and that you give us well-being and that you give us firmness in our religion and that you give us an uprightness in our religion to give us the ability to stand firmly upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and to give us the ability to practice this religion properly and give protection to us and to our loved ones and to our family members and to our children and that you give forgiveness to all of those who have passed away before us who are in Islam and that you protect the deen of all of those who will come after us. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you give barakah in our lives and that you remove our sicknesses and our problems and our worries and our anxieties and that you allow us to prepare in the best way for the moment when we will pass away and that you allow us to die upon La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We ask that you give us an ease in the moment when we die and that you give all of us and our parents and our loved ones and our family members and our siblings and our loved ones who will come after us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, a husn al khatima, the best of endings, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we ask that you do this for all of those who are struggling in your way and who are fighting in your way and that you accept them all. As shuhada wa sallallahu wa sallam, mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So we have made it to the section, inshallah, where we're going to talk about what happens when somebody is in the barzakh and in the intermediary realm. So this is after somebody has now passed away and what is going to take place and then what happens between then and uh, the moment where we stand for Judgment Day, for Yom al uh, This, These are very, very, very important parts of our creed, parts of our aqidah, which we should know, which we should understand, and which we should experientially try to, uh, or which we should understand in a more experiential, spiritual way versus just a um, rational and logical way because these types of things are going to be very significant. Allah wants us to reflect on these moments before we actually experience these moments. So what we had just finished off last time, we had spoken about what takes place in the grave and the human being will enter into the grave. We will have questions in the grave. We will experience a life, an entire life will play out, an entire lifetime. For some, it will be longer than others. Um, depending on uh, how much duration takes place between the time we pass away and between Yom al Qiyamah. For, for some people, they've had 10,000, 20,000 years in their grave and their cover, and others, it could be a lot less than that. So at some point, everybody will experience either a beautiful life in the grave, which is a sign, inshallah, of Jannah to come, of heaven to come or a very, very, very difficult life in the grave, which is a sign of the fire. And we ask Allah for uh, uh, for safety and refuge um, and, and for protection from that. And then at some point what happens is Allah commands one of the archangels to blow the trumpet. And this is mentioned in the Quran, the first blast which takes place. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, that the horn is blown and all those who are in the heavens and the earth will fall down in a swoon. So everyone will essentially pass away at this point or become unconscious, save him who Allah wills. Um, so this is the first blast which takes place. And uh, every human being will at this point pass. Every human being. So if, if somebody is not already in the grave, there will be a small percentage of people, of course, who will still be on the earth at this point, and the blast will take place and then everybody will essentially um, uh, transition into this realm. And this is the first phase now. At this point, we are about to enter into the life of Yom al Qiyamah. We have another period now where another blast will take place, as Allah says in the Quran, then it is blown in, this, in the next, uh, right there in, in the same ayah, then it is blown another time, and there they stand awaiting. And according to Imam Haddad, between the two blasts are 40 years. So human, human beings will be, everybody will pass away and enter into this intermediary realm. 
until the second blast takes place. And now everybody is actually resurrected. This is the trumpet where everybody is resurrected. Um, so the first thing for us to reflect on here is that these are very, very, very serious, momentous um, uh, uh, events that are going to take place. It's not a light um, you know, alarm or something that's going to go off. They mention in some, I believe Mama Ghazali mentions this, that the distance between the, the two um, lips of the archangel who's going to blow the trumpet and the trumpet itself is vaster than, than the earth itself, vaster than the heavens and the earth. So we're talking about something very, very, very significant in terms of its size, in terms of its magnitude, in terms of all of Allah's creation being affected and jolted and in such a scared state when this takes place that everybody is going to pass and then everybody is going to be awakened again. And this is where people are either awakened in a state of goodness or in a state of anxiety and worry. And now begins the day of judgment. Now begins the hour, the, 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 the day of judgment. Uh, or, or the, the, the yomal, yomal qiyamah. So then what he mentions is he mentions what will take place in the moments before the actual first trumpet is blown. So we have different phases of end of times that are important for the Muslim for, for us as Muslims to know. You have the signs of the general end of times. The first sign of the end of times is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the final messenger. And he said, between me and the, 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 I believe, between me and the hour is the hadith is like this. So already the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is indicating to us that it's very, very, very close. Between then, many, 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 many signs have been listed out. Dozens of signs have been listed out of what is going to take place in the latter days. So those are signs which are important. He doesn't get into all of them here because that's not really what his focus is. Then there's the signs of what happens before the hour. The hour is the end, the actual end of time, when this trumpet blast is blown. At this point, time as we know it collapses. This concept of time, space, everything goes. It's now just Allah and whoever the select that Allah has left out with his archangels or whoever is referring to in his ayah where Allah says, save him who Allah wills is, is protected from his blast. Everybody else is, is impacted. So that moment, um, it's important for us to know, okay, what are the signs of the general end of times? And then what are the specific signs which lead to the hour, which lead to the hour? So you have a phase of time where we know that as you get closer to the end, Immorality will spread, corruption will spread, we'll have very, very corrupt rulers and leaders, there will be a lot of fahsha, of, 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 of lewdness, um, we know that the economic system will become uh, problematic as well. These are many signs that are listed out. Then we know that at some point the Mahdi salam emerges, and then we know that, that the, 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 the Jal comes. It's at this point now that the main events really start to take place, which will signal the coming of the hour of Yawm al qiyamah Isa alayhi salam eventually emerges, and it's important for the believers to understand this, to know this. Um, and then we have now a, a various hadith which indicate what happens after this. So he says that um, uh, after the emergence of Isa alayhi salam, you will then have the emergence of uh, who will kill the Dajjal. And then he says there will be a period of years people will live during which there will be no enmity between people. And then there will be a wind that Allah sends from the direction of Syria. And anyone who has any faith or goodness in them will die. And then the people who will remain. So now we're getting into the last phase of humanity. The people who will remain at the end end will be the worst of people moving like as, delicate, uh, as delicately as birds wearing the skins of beasts, recognizing no good, disapproving of no evil. And shaitan will, will basically command them to obey his call, command them to worship idols, and, um, and, and, and commit uh, fahsha and lewdness. And it will be on these people that the, horn, that the horn will be blown. So at the ultimate end, you have a period of difficulty, of general immorality in society, and then you actually have a period of righteousness again. The Mahdi coming and Isa al-Islam coming are going to be a period where they're righteous rulers, ruling the earth according to um, the law of Islam, and according to a very, very, in a very just way. And then, after this whole phase, is when there's going to be immense, immense, immense immorality. And one hadith, um, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, 
uh, Allahumma sayyid Muhammad, that the hour will not come as long as anyone still says Allah. As long as someone still says Allah, the hour will not come. So you're talking the hour, the final blast comes at the moment again when there's no iman, no faith, or people to say Allah or la ilaha illallah. And then he said evil people will remain living like donkeys in chaotic depravity. And it is upon them that the hour shall come. So comparing people to donkeys is a very serious thing, especially in uh, uh, with the Arabs because they were an agrarian society. Um, and so they were very, very, the animals were very present in front of them. And it was very, the donkey is not um, uh, seen as an animal. That's, that's, that's a very uh, highly ranked animal. It's, it's a diss really to compare someone to. So these are the type of people that they are. They're just animalistic, carnal desires. And then in Hadith Qudsi, meaning it's a narration from Allah, Allah will grasp, or, or, or this narration from Prophet Islam, Allah will grasp the earth and fold up the heavens and then on, in, in his right hand, figuratively speaking, and say, I am the king. Where are the kings of the earth? Where are the tyrants? Where are the arrogant? So you will now have a very intense, jalali, majestic, these, these moments will be very difficult. The last juz of the Quran and surah, uh, uh, the 29th juz and the 30th juz, they, a lot of those surahs talk about what's going to take place on the Day of Judgment. So it's very important for believers to have a connection to those surahs, to reflect on the meaning of those surahs, and, and to try to understand the intensity. There's surahs that mention the sky splitting asunder, like literally the entire sky will crack in half, and the heavens will start to split. And all the whole firmament, everything Allah has created will start to, it's not, it's not, we see it as though it's in place in perfect order. But as soon as the command comes from Allah, everything will go into chaos. Everything will go into chaos. And it is upon this. So this is the type of moment that we are, we are entering when the day of judgment comes. What keeps us firm on the day of judgment and preventing ourselves from being in internal disarray is our faith and is the way we lived our life. That's what keeps us firm. There's no outward preparation one can do. There's no money. There's no bank accounts. There's no politics. There's no rulers. There's nothing. There's no organization, nothing that's going to help anybody. But if they were people of virtue and people of righteousness and people of goodness and people of nur, the day of judgment will be facilitated, inshallah, for the believers. Even we met, it's, it's, I don't know if we mentioned it here or, or, or if um, it was just mentioned when we were reading this, but uh, the believers will have a light on their faces and the day of judgment will be dark and they will be guiding people. They could be guiding people. People will ask them to guide them. But the believers will have a light on their face from their wudu. Um, actually, I believe narration is people will ask them for their light and they won't share the light because these will be the hypocrites and the disbelievers that, were at, that are asking. So everything we do in this life, it starts playing out at the time of death. It has an impact. Like the way we live this life does have an impact on this life. But for a lot of people, they won't see the impact in this life. This is why the rulers, the, the corrupt, they get away with so much. They have no idea what's in store for them no clue what's in store for them for all the corruption and the killing and the violence and the injustice that they that they reign on, on on earth because allah says now he will see and allah will be angry on this day where are the rulers where are the kings where are the tyrants because allah is the true king and allah does not let people outwardly always understand his kingship if they're not trying to understand his king but on the day of judgment his lordship and his rule will become very, very, very clear. So it's a day we're supposed to fear that day. It's not supposed to be a, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things where even the prophets, they fear this day. It's a very, 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 very serious day um, and, and, and face. So it's good to know the signs that come and leading up to it. So he mentions, you will not see the hour. This is, again, the blowing of the trumpet until the following things happen. The sun rising from the west. There's going to be a big smoke at some point on the earth. The Dajjal, there's going to be a beast that emerges from the earth. There's going to be three sinkings into the ground. I don't know if this means earthquakes or I think the earth will split open and these sinkings will happen in the east, in the west, and in the Arabian Peninsula. And the appearance of Isa, alayhi salam, and Yajuj and Majuj, and the last of them will be a fire coming out of the Yemen. And so these are big signs that happen right before, again, the trumpet is blown. The trumpet is blown. But only Allah knows when the hour is going to happen. 
So we know as believers through the Prophet and through what's been passed, the signs of the hour. But when the Prophet was asked by Jibreel when is Yom, when is the hour? He said, the one asking knows no more than the one being asked. The closest of Allah's associates, uh, as, 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 like angels, I mean, um, they're, even they don't know. The messengers, Allah's Habib Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, doesn't know when the exact moment of the Day of Judgment is going to be. Only Allah knows, as he says in the Quran, knowledge of it is with my Lord. He alone will manifest it in its time. And indeed, with him is the knowledge of the hour in a different ayah. But we have to know the signs and, and what's going to happen. So phases, it's a phase of general moral depravity, general corruption on the earth. That's the phase we're in right now. Um, immense immorality, immense, um, it's mentioned in other hadith, the amount of promiscuity that will take place. All of these types of things are showing that we are headed towards the end. Towards the, we are in the latter days. And then there's signs that have already started to appear. Example in the hadith, which, which he doesn't mention here, but um, <clears throat> where the Bedouin will compete in building tall buildings that will literally touch the sky, right? These skyscrapers in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, and other places, all people were Bedouin, and now they, they got, you know, they stumbled upon oil, and now they're competing to build these huge, tall buildings. And when one country builds one that's taller, the next one starts its next one, so they can be taller, and it can just be this. So these are signs that will happen. But those aren't the major signs. The major signs are the ones that are listed out. And, and so after the coming of Isa, alayhi salam, and, and the killing of the Dajjal and the coming of Yajuj and Majuj, then there's this final period of immense immorality and no faith left. Meaning nobody at that point, they say in one narration here, that Islam will wear out, this is according to the Prophet Islam, in a way that a garment becomes worn out until no one will know what fasting, prayer, pilgrimage, or charity might be. The book of God will one night be taken up on Allah. So that not one verse of the Quran will remain on earth, some group of people will remain in which old men and women will say, we remember that our parents used to say la ilaha illallah, so we say it too. So again, one of the key components of holding down iman on this earth is what? Is knowledge. The knowledge of these things, once it goes, it's a big problem. It's one of the main things that we can do as believers is spend our time learning and implementing. And it's already happened as an ummah. We've lost knowledge. We've kind of just not given importance to it anymore, but we're just talking about sacred knowledge, knowledge of Islam, um, really prioritizing it. So these are, these are things that are important for us to do to prevent the impact of the end of times in hitting us or our family, inshallah. So then, now he gets into the next se se section, which is actual judgment day, which is actually the, the day. So at this point, everybody is resurrected. So he says the fourth life, this is the fourth life. So we finished the third life, which is the barzakh and the, the first trumpet blast. He says, the fourth life now extends from the time when a person leaves their grave for the resurrection <clears throat> until, a mo until the moment when mankind enters either the garden or the fire. So this is the first, the fourth life for the human being. Um, oftentimes we think about Yom al Qiyamah as a day. It's not a day. It's a whole life in and of itself. As Allah says in the Quran, 50,000 years, it can be up to 50,000 years in length. For others, it will be a lot shorter. And for some, it could be as short as two rakahs, but it is an entire life. It's an entire phase. One is resurrected and one is rebuilt, re-originated again. So one will die and they will be in their grave entirely. And they will be the, the, we will decompose, our bodies decompose. But just like Allah originated the creation the first time, kun fayakun, he will, we will all come back to life again. We will all be re-originated again. This is for the people of the, of, at, the, at the time um, when this was being revealed, it was a little bit harder for them to understand. For us now, you know, with stem cells and these types of things, it's very uh, easy to see how you can like recreate as long as you have the origin, right? For Allah, he doesn't even need the origin. He is the originator. He's al-fatir. Um, but this is how it's going to take place. So then there's a various ayahs that he mentions here. Um, well, Allah will command the archangel Israfil. This is the one. So there's various archangels. Jibreel alayhi salam is one of them. Israfil alayhi salam is one of them. Mikael alayhi salam is one of them. Um, and so you have different archangels that have these big assignments that Allah has given them. Major assignments. And this is his assignment. He's waiting for this moment to blow the trumpet. And he says, and the horn is blown, and lo, from their graves they will hasten to their Lord. Then it is blown another time, and there they stand awaiting. 
So this is the moment where all of us, we will wake up from the grave. And then this is when everybody who didn't think that life was, life was done. They thought life is done after they die. Or maybe just life in the grave is it. This is where the anxiety really starts to kick in. Those who disbelieve, they claim that they will not be raised again, Allah says. Say, no, by my Lord, you will be raised again and you will be informed of what you did, everything that you did. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's going to be a, a day where somebody realizes this and it's very difficult for them to, to, to think, I'm about to be held to account. Because in the grave, that counting is not the type of accounting that's about to take place now. This is the day of accounting. One of the names of it is the day where debts fall due, Yom ad Maliki Yom ad as we read in the Fatiha, the day where the debts fall due. Everything, not a single iota is left out if Allah keeps it on the record. And if Allah chooses to erase and to pardon, then it's pardoned. But everybody has their chance on this day to get what it is that they deserve in form of justice or hopefully for the believers and for the, this ummah then in the form of Allah's mercy. So he gets into various ayahs of, um, for those who question the resurrection, says, have they not seen how Allah originates creation and then reproduces it? For God, that is easy. And say to them, walk the land and see how he originated creation. Then how God brings forth the later growth. Meaning, you think about this in terms of plants and vegetation. There's these cycles, right? It, like, it, it dries out. And then it comes back and then it, and the human being very similar, right? It's not hard for just like Allah can do that with, with plants and with fruits and so on and so forth. It's very easy, very easy for him to do that um, with, with us. Uh, indeed, Allah is able to do all things. And then, and then he mentions, um, again, there's various ayahs. We're just picking out a few of them. Um, that Allah gave, gives us an example. Right, and he says, "Who will revive bones which have rotted away?" Say, "He will revive them who first originated them, and he has knowledge of every creation." So, just like the one who first created us, he's going to be the one who revives us. So, in this day, it's a literal, physical. We believe in a physical resurrection, not in a figurative, spiritual resurrection, incarnation. Any no, no, no. It's a real, physical experience that happens. Physical experience that happens. Um, so now this is where things become again focused on one's faith and their yaqeen according to one's strength and their ma'rifah of their lord their knowledge of their lord and their yaqeen of their lord um, and their acts in this life and their relationship with Allah that will determine how things go for them on this day that will determine or on this phase of life this whole life we should not just say this day really this this um phase of life. So this is a long narration, but it's important to cover. So the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah will level the earth. Okay. So the narration says in the Quran, the verse says on the day when the earth shall be changed to other than the earth and the heavens, they will come forth from before God, the one, the invincible. He will level it and spread it just as a leather rug is spread. So you will see neither crookedness nor curvature. He will then drive the people to one in one cry, and they will be in the changed earth, in this new understanding of earth, whatever the create, the, this is. In the same state that they had been in, in the way before, those who were inside it will be inside of it, and those who are on its surface will be on its surface. Then God will send up, down upon you from beneath the throne water called al-hayawan, the life, and it shall rain for 40 days. And then the narration continues. Okay, so this is him getting it. And then he will give command to the bodies, which will grow just as plants and vegetables grow until your bodies are as fully formed as they've been. So now this narration is getting into more details on how exactly the, the, the resurrection will take place, meaning it not necessarily sudden, but it takes a, um, uh, a, a, theory, a, a phase of time. And then Allah goes command by command. Let the bearers of the throne return to life. And this will happen, meaning the, the angels who carry the throne. Let Jibreel, Mikael, Israfil come back to life. They come back to life. And then Israfil, uh, the archangel, alayhi salam, he is the one who then blows this, this, this horn, this trumpet. After which Allah will call the spirits which will be brought to him, and the Muslims will be glowing with light, the others dark. The others dark. 
And then Israfil blows the horn and the spirits fly out like bees, filling the space between the heavens and the earth. In which Allah then says, let each spirit return to its body. By my might and majesty, let each spirit return to its body. So the believers, the spirits are not in the same place as the body necessarily, right? So now the spirits are returning into the bodies. Then he gets into a lot of detail. The spirits will repair to their bodies, enter through the nostrils, and will spread inside of the body. Again, just as venom spread inside, spreads inside someone who is bitten. Then the earth shall split, split apart from around you, and I shall be the first to whom it will do so, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And he says, you will emerge as young people of 33. So this is the, 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 the age at which one is, uh, is at, right? 33 is this, this prime age as mentioned in various narrations. Um, this one mentions the language on that day will be Syriac, uh, and then he talks about them hurrying to their Lord. So not every single detail is something that we'll um, get into in this hadith. It's an excellent, comprehensive, and religious, like all hadith are, uh, but very, very good for us to just understand these, these specific details. So I don't think it's, usually, it's that difficult, like we're mentioning, to believe the concept of resurrection and the concept of coming back even though we rotted away. For the people of the past, it was a very difficult concept to understand. So there was a lot of time in metaphors and in um, analogies and in detailed explanations of what takes place and how that's going to happen. For the believers, the key thing to spend time on is to understand how intense and mighty uh, this day will actually be. So we won't go into everything, but for those who have the book, the text, and for those online, we're reading the text, um, The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad. I would highly recommend reading this section in detail. For the sake of time, we can't go line by line. Um, but Allah mentions this in the, uh, in, in the uh, mostly in the 30th shows, but in various parts of the Quran, where he talks about the uh, intense events that are going to take place, that are going to take place. So he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day when we will cause the mountains to move, you shall see the earth emerging, and we assemble them and leave not one of them until they are before their Lord in ranks, in rows. You have come to us just as we created you at first, but you thought that we would set no time, no appointment for you. So the many, 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 many human beings do not believe that anything is going to happen to them after they die. And so Allah is now going to challenge them on that day. You thought nothing was going to happen. You thought you could just get away with it. You didn't get away with any of it. Now the appointment starts. Now the key spiritual thing to reflect on here, the feeling we need to reflect on is how on earth are we going to be able to stand before God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all seven heavens, who's vast and, and, and who's, who, who will be upset on that day when we are when we sin so much because every sin we commit will be expo exposed on that day and we will be questioned about everything allah will ask you were there at this place when you were 23 years old at 5 17 p.m why did you do that you were there at this place it was 6 a.m it was fajr time why did you miss the prayer you were there at this place prioritizing this thing this money over this you took out this financial instrument, which was haram, when you didn't need to do so. Why did you do that? Did you not trust that I would provide for you? I gave you this much time and this many, um, uh, uh, this much life. Why did you spend your life the way that you did? I gave you the blessing of wealth and I gave you the blessing of security, the, two, the, the blessing of food and security, the two essential blessings. Allah says in the Quran, worship uh, uh, had, uh, uh, that Allah says, worship the Lord of this house in Surah Quraysh, who who, who who satiated you from your hunger and gave you the blessing of protection and security. So he's going to ask us, I did all of this, and yet you still didn't, didn't listen and you still didn't worship. And so these are going to be the, the questions that are asked on Yom Al-Qiyamah. These are going to be various, various, various types of questions. Some narrations mention the beginning, these are the, we're just giving examples here. Um, they mentioned the types of, uh, of questions that are going to be asked. The types of questions that are going to be asked. Um, so the, on Wednesdays, we're praying at 8. So if you guys want to do a Jamaat right now, Bismillah, go ahead. So we'll, we'll pray around 8. Um, 
And then the every human being will be questioned according to how much we repented or didn't repent. What do we mean by that? Meaning there will be parts of our life where we're not questioned about, but we did do something wrong. And we're, and, and we're going to wonder, hold on a second. I, I thought I did something wrong on that day. You didn't bring it up. Allah says, no, you repented for that. So repentance in this life functions as the eraser. It erases all the things. It's like taking the, Allah will show us a whole movie of our life. And it's like the director's cut where you cut certain things out of the clip and you edit it. And that's it. That's what repentance does. It cuts out the sins and the bad. Uh, and of course, for those who did certain things before they became Muslim, all of that, inshallah, is wiped away. Um, and, and so we are now entering upon, we're in the month of Shaban, we have about a month left before the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is this month of purification and of repentance. And these are the types of things that should drive us anytime we're feeling lazy, anytime we're feeling like we don't want to do the things we're supposed to do, really focus on, on worshiping our Lord. Um, in one narration, a man dies or a person dies in accordance with the way that they had lived and is resurrected in accordance with what they had with, with, with what he had died on, what they had died in. So some people will be resurrected in the way that they died. We, so imagine a very, very, diff, uh, uh, not a noble death, an ignoble death. Imagine that, right? If someone, um, we don't want to be in that state, right? Now, these days, there's people, like a year or two ago, there was this um, concert that took place. I forgot where. This happens all the time in concerts, but literally all these people died in a mosh pit at a concert. I mean, and while listening to like immensely haram music and participating in a lot of haram type of activities around them. That's no way that that's not a dignified way to die. We ask Allah for protection. We don't want to be doing things. We never want to enter into a state that we die in an ignoble, in a, in a noble way, right? That should be one way thing to protect us. If the fear of God is not going to protect us from the sin, we don't want to die in a way that, that, um, uh, the fear of death, rather, and the fear of the resurrection should protect us. We always should ask Allah for husn al-Khatima. Often people die on college campuses. Um, uh, uh, I, know, I know people who passed away. Literally, they, they, they were found intoxicated and pa uh, passed away through alcohol poisoning just on, a, on the floor of a, of a fraternity house, just after a long, long night of partying. That's no way to die. That's not a noble place. But if we don't live in a noble way, it's... If we're exposing ourselves to those types of things, right? Uh, or, 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 or we let ourselves go into so slip-ups. If we live through the slip-up, we can repent. But what if we don't live through the slip-up? That's the key. A lot of people, when we're young especially, and you talked about this when you're young, controlling your passions are very hard when we're young. But there's no guarantee that somebody is going to live righteously after because they might not even have life afterwards. And so... We want to make sure, again, that we live in an upright way so that we can pass in an upright way. Another narration, he mentions, mankind shall be resurrected barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised, everybody on one plane. And Aisha says, uh, anha, Ya Rasulullah, oh shame, Ya Rasulullah. Everyone looking at each other? Because that's the natural thing that comes to their mind. Men and women all in one place in this, in this situation. He says the situation will be way too desperate for them to be worried about that. Like, that's not even going to cross anyone's mind. None of those types of things are going to cross anyone's mind because of how desperate human beings are going to be on Yom al -Qiyamah. These are the types of things, again, we need to reflect on. It's not just like something we should think about rationally. We really sit with and how am I going to be able to do? And then there will be people with sweat at various levels of sweat, how much they're sweating. Some people to their ankles, to their knees, to their navel, to their neck and others that are drowning in their own sweat because of how scared they are of what's about to take place. And also because the sun is very, very, very close on the day of judgment, which is why we want to be under Allah's the shade of Allah's throne on this day, inshallah. Then he says, people shall be gathered more hungry than they've ever been, more thirsty than they've ever been, uh, unclothed and more naked than they've ever been, and more exhausted than they've ever been. But those who had given food for the sake of Allah will be fed by Allah. Those who had given drink, water for the sake of Allah, this says drink, but assuming water for the sake of Allah, will be given to drink by Allah. Those who had given clothes for the sake of Allah will be clothed by Allah. 
and those who had acted for Allah's sake will be protected by him. Emphasizing the Prophet وسلم, gave, uh, gives us various narrations, <coughs> reasons why we should take care of the poor, why we should take care of, of, of those who are uh, living in destitute conditions, of those who are unclothed, of those who are hungry. It's among one of the most virtuous types of good deeds. But it will all come back. All of it's going to be paid back in various ways. And Allah is too generous for you and me to do something that's good, one good, and for him to just give us one good in return. That's just not how it works. What is the reward for excellence except excellence? His excellence in response to our attempt at excellence is not even close. So his, what, what the good that Allah gives is very, very, very different. So we want to uh, take a portion of each of these things and put them into practice. Okay, if we don't feed people often, there's a lot of hungry people around here. We don't have to even, we don't have to go as far out as like the Muslim world or donating online. That's very critical to do as well. But we just go make it a habit. Once a month, I'm going to buy a bunch of pizzas and go and feed the homeless. Right? Um, and, and we should do so in groups and be careful. Um, sisters, I would not advise in Oakland area necessarily if you're not uh, to do that as much. And, and brothers, I would be careful because it's not as safe here as, it, as, as because of drug use and so on and so forth. But if we can find an area like a shel homeless shelter or like a, a soup kitchen or something, these are very good things to do. This is believers used to live their life. Like if people were hungry, they would have a hard time going to sleep. It was like, that's how serious we, people used to take this. And then we should give a lot of money in, in uh, overseas or wherever we can to uh, help people who are hungry. The, the, the current, the dollar goes very far overseas. Like you could feed with like $2. You could feed somebody a whole meal, two meals sometimes. So, you know, a hundred bucks, that's 50 meals to somebody, right? Um, and so we really, really, uh, these, are, these are ways to build our spiritual bank account. Um, and anytime we spend on ourselves and we buy an expensive meal, you know, sometimes um, we might spend a lot on food. We should make sure that, that, that in that same phase of time, we go and we spend on people um, less, even if it's a lot less money, but just go and spend and feed people, right? Because it's hard to be spending fifty, hundred dollars on on food for like two, three people, and I'll, so many people are hungry. Right? And so these are ways to protect ourselves, not just in this life from tribulation, but also in the next life. He then says that there's there's other things that I mentioned here. But we're gonna we're gonna um, just kind of shorten it. He says people will see their deeds appearing before them. Good deeds will comfort them and accompany them. Wicked ones will reproach them and make them feel desolate. And they will, may even climb on their backs and force them to carry the deeds. As Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, they bear their burdens upon their backs. Evil is that which they bear. And in another ayah, they will surely bear their own loads and other loads besides their own. And they will be questioned on Yom al Qiyamah concerning that which they had invented. So everybody has recording angels. Everybody. These angels are recording everything we do. Allah doesn't need any angel to record what we do, but this Allah's intizam on this planet, on this earth, and this life is to do things through means. Not, and that's usually how things are done. So the, the angels are the means. The angels are um, writing down every good and every bad. All of those now are going to be shown to the human beings on the day of judgment. So he says, evil deeds committed in this world for people who will die, who died unrepentant, will become manifest upon them. So usurers, those who took interest or who charged interest, for instance, will see their stomachs grow so large that as they walk, they are constantly overbalanced by their weight and they stumble over. This is on the Yom Al Kiyama. We're not talking yet about the, the, what what happens in, in in the next life. Adulterers, those who committed adultery, will see their privates swell so large that they will have to drag them along on the ground. Alcohol drinkers will come to the gathering with their cups, their, their cups in their hands, their drinks in their hands. Liars, backbiters, slanderers will see their tongues lengthen until they reach their tests and their chests. Those who withheld their zakat will have their money made manifest in the shape of large snakes coiled around them. The arrogant will be brought forth in the form of small ants. The arrogant people, the tyrants, they'll just be like little ants on the day of judgment. And they will be walked on um, by, by, by people. 
and so it shall continue. Allah says in the Quran, the guilty will be known by their marks and it will be, they will be seized by the forelocks and their feet. So there's a lot of things that take place um, on, and, on Yom al Qiyamah. We will try to get through a bit more of it, but this, this section is just starting to give a glimpse of what happens to somebody with the sins that we do. Every sin in the spiritual realm has a magnified opposite reaction, right? We say like every action has an equal and opposite reaction according to um, uh, the, the laws of, of, I think that's Newtonian physics, right? According to laws of physics. In, in, in the spiritual realm, every action we do here has a much more amplified reaction in the next life, especially when it comes and to the good will have prominence, right? All the, for example, doing some, doing wudu consistently brings about an immense nur, but doing and praying and so on has a lot of good. But, but for example, missing zakat, right? Having their money made manifest in the shape of large snakes that are coiled around them, right? Assuming they're constricting them. These are the types of things that take place on Yom al -Qiyama. And this is before the resurrect, the, the hisab hasn't even started yet. We haven't even started questioning Ask, being asked questions by God. This is just from the time we get resurrected, if we were in this state and we were doing these types of things, this is what's going to happen. So what's interesting here is so many of these sins are also are sins of character as well. They're not only sins of actions. They're sins of actions and they're sins of character. So drinking um, and, the, and adultery and these types of things, taking usury, taking interest. Um, off this, our time and our, the time we live in, this is, stuff is spread out everywhere. We have to guard ourselves against believers and guard our families and our children from this. But also their sins of character, right? Arrogant doesn't only mean tyrants. It doesn't only mean the Bidens and the Netanyahus and all these evil people in the world. No, it also means the person who's arrogant with their own family, who's arrogant with their with their spouse, who's arrogant with their friends. And these, the arrogant can mean anything, really. Um, so akhlaq and character, who's arrogant towards other Muslims, right? Akhlaq and character are really, really, really important ways because the light of good character very quickly uh, reduces and mitigates the darkness of the bad that um, one might have done. So then the narrations uh, continue. So Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what of the saying on the day when the horn is to be blown and you shall come in hosts? And assuming like groups. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Mu'ad, you have asked about a formidable thing. And then he, Sallallahu wept abundantly. And then he said, Ten different kinds of people of my nation will be gathered in groups distinct from the groupings of the Muslims. Their forms will have been changed. Some of them will have the forms of monkeys. Others the form of pigs. Others will be upside down their legs upwards being dragged on their faces. Some will be blind, hesitant. Others will be deaf and dumb with lacking in reason. Others will be chewing their tongues, which will hang on their tests, and their saliva will be pus so that they disgust the other people in the gathering. Some will have their hands and feet cut off. Some will be crucified on tree trunks of fire. Some will be fouler than putrid cadavers, the smell, the stench. Some will wear robes flowing of tar. As for those who resemble monkeys, they are the slanderers. The slander, we talked about slander last time, is one of the main reasons of punishment in the grave. Talking bad about people and spreading lies about people. Slander specifically is when you not just say something bad, but you say something bad that's not even true. And then backbiting is when it's, when it's true, which is essentially just as bad. Those who will have the forms of pigs are the people of ill-gotten, illicit, unlawfully taxed, or you could say stolen type of money, illicit wealth, haram money. Those whose heads and faces are beneath them, their heads and their faces are beneath them, are those who consume usury. Usury is mentioned a lot in the narrations about the Day of Judgment and about um, Yom al qiyamah and also in the Quran. It's probably, I would argue, the most, the biggest sin, major sin that's the most ignored in the time that we live in. And the one that we have to be very serious about watch usury is interest. It's the small interest and it's the big interest. 
We have to be on guard against it. And we mention this frequently because it's very, very, very critical. Every type of interest-bearing loan, car loans, it, it, it's not far to drive a nice car. We don't need a loan to take out. We can do it other ways. Student loans, it's not far. This is so critical. People think it's far to go to university. There's not a single pillar of Islam which says it's far to go to university and take out a loan in order to do so. Right? The vast majority of the world right now Billions of people are living, going, having gone to university without ever taking out any interest or any loan. Because in many other countries, it, you don't need that. But we're choosing to live in this country, and then we're choosing to do something haram. We could, Allah says, to travel the earth and do whatever is, we need to do to, to worship him. Right? So it's, these are not excuses that we're allowed. And if we've done it, we have to make repentance. Same thing with um, personal loans, with business loans, with credit card loans with high APR on our credit cards and that we don't pay off all these things that the consumeristic lifestyle that the America, the, the capitalistic country has built itself on. We have to take it ourselves into account because there's serious repercussions that haven't even talked about what's going to happen in, 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 uh, uh, in the final afterlife. He said the blind then are those who rule uh, with tyranny. The deaf and dumb are those who are proud of their actions. Proud of their, we're assuming here this means religious actions, but it could mean other things as well. Those who chew their tongues are the ulama and the judges whose conduct differed from their words. The people, these, so these are Muslims. He's talking here about, he said, O Mu'ad, these are dis, gathered in groups distinct from the groupings of the Muslims. So either they're, they're not necessarily Muslims, they could be um, uh, anyone who could be in this category according to this wording. The, uh, but in this group, obviously, the ulama and the judges, right? He said, those whose hands and feet are cut off are those who injured their neighbors, hurt their neighbors. Those whose cru who were crucified on trunks of fire are those who frequently denounced people to the authorities. Don't know exactly what that one means. Um, those who are fouler than putrid cadavers are those who enjoyed passions and pleasures, but withheld Allah's due in their wealth. So what was we were supposed to pay in our zakat and our charity, didn't people, we didn't do it, but we enjoyed the money that we had. At zakat and dodging the zakat is serious. It's not a joke. 2.5% of our standing wealth yearly, when it comes due, is due. And we can't dodge it. We, we can't live our life in, in, in the way we do and then, and then you know, ignore these types of things. And those who wear these robes of tar are the arrogant, the boastful, and the conceited. So this is one of the longer narrations, but there's others um, uh, that, 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 that also uh, talk about. So he says then that there is a standing place where people will be assembled. So there's this huge plain where the Prophet said, mankind will be gathered on a single plain, and each will hear the summoner. And the, the eyesight will be penetrating. It will be very serious in terms of the events that they're saying, that they're seeing. Um, and then there is going to be a standing place where the jinn, human beings, and the, the shayateen, and the cattle, and the wild beasts, and the predators are all assembled, are all in one place. And it will be very, very, very crowded. And there will be turmoil and difficulty, and the sun will draw near until it is one mile above their head, one mile. So the sun right now, I don't know how many millions or hundred millions of miles it, the way it is, but it's just, if it were one mile, two miles, three miles closer, life could not exist on this planet. If it were a few miles farther, everybody would freeze. That's how perfect it is, the sun's distance from the planet Earth. This will be one mile from the resurrection, from the plane of resurrection. So if someone is not under the shade of God's throne, imagine the intensity and the heat and the sweat that we will feel on that day. And again, all the key to all of this is righteousness. All of it, all good lies in taqwa and a relate, good relationship with Allah. And, and akhlaq, good akhlaq with people. So all of these things can be protected from him. He says people will be afflicted then by such great hardship such heat and thirst, intense heat and thirst that only Allah knows of. They will perspire, meaning sweat, until their sweat penetrates the depths of the earth to a depth of 70 arm lengths. 70 
arm length is, is a, usually an expression that's used to mean like a significant amount. It could be a lot more than just 70 um, arm lengths, but that's how deep it will, the sweat will penetrate into the earth. And he says the sun will come near on the day of judgment. People will sweat. There will be those who would reach to their heels, to the middle of their legs, to their knees, to their thighs, to their waists, and to their mouths. And then here he raised his hand to his mouth, and some will be completely covered. He put his head over it. So it's very, 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 very intense. It's not a, um, it's, in these, these matters, Imam Ghazali, he mentions in his book on, uh, Yom al Qiyamah and death. He says that the vast majority of human beings don't believe really in the day of judgment. He said they don't really believe in it. He said if they really believe in among the Muslims, he's talking about the Muslims, if they really believed in it, he said there's no way we would live our lives the way we live our lives. He's like the reality of the day of judgment of what's going to happen has yet to penetrate the hearts of the vast majority of us. So what we have to do is reflect, reflect reflect. We talked about this in one of the other, other texts, the importance of tafakkur, sitting, thinking, contemplating, visualizing, really internalizing what is going to happen to me and how am I going to be able to do this. And then what's going to happen usually when someone does that is they start to tremble and they start to weep for Allah because they realize I can't do it without Allah. And then we realize how in need we are of Allah and our, our abject servitude before him that we need him in every moment and if we need him in every moment in this life, surely we will need him in every moment in this in the day of judgment. And then we realize we can't do it on our own. We turn to Allah, and now one starts to live a life where, where the reality of, 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 or we start to hopefully experience the reality of slavehood and servitude to Allah. Um, but the reflection is very, very, very critical. So we'll mention one more, and then we'll end. Um, inshallah, he says, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he gives a lot of, Ways out on this day. One of them, he says, one will be under the shade of their charity on Yom Al-Qiyama. The shade of their charity. So give, we should give while we can. While we have the money, while we have the ability, give. Because these are types of things that will protect us. And another, and well, this is the, 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 a very important hadith. We'll cover this in the Quran. Seven kinds of people will be shaded by Allah on, on the shade of his throne. When no shade will exist except Allah's. The first is a just leader, a just ruler. The second, a young person who grew up in the worship of Allah. The third, someone whose heart was attached to the masjid. The fourth, two people who have love for each other for the sake of Allah, who came together in this and separated in this. The next, someone who when they were seduced in this narration, a man who, when a woman of rank and beauty attempted to seduce him, said, I fear Allah. I fear Allah. This is what happened in the story of Yusuf, alayhi salam. Um, and of course, you know, you would assume this happens in the, the inverse way as well, that anyone who guarded their chastity when they could have given in, right? When it was very easy to give in, but they guarded their chastity. The next, someone who concealed their charities, they gave so much charity, they concealed it such that their left hand did not know what the right hand spent. Obviously, that doesn't mean literally the left hand may or may not actually have knowledge, but it means just giving and giving and giving and not telling other people about it, just being really humble about the charity that we give, right? And, um, and then another one, the one who remembered Allah when alone and whose eyes overflowed with tears, whose eyes overflowed with tears. So these are among the seven, um, I believe in there, 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 there are various ways in which we can seek Allah's protection against us. But this hadith, which is a famous hadith, this is the type of thing we want to be in every single category here. We don't want to take any chances. No chances. We've got to be people who, the last one, we regularly weep before Allah. We spend time with Allah alone, weeping before him. Communal worship is critical. In Ramadan, we also want to make sure we have time just for alone worship, especially in the last 10 nights. And in the, the sunnah in the last 10 nights is to withdraw from creation. So we spend a little time with the people, with the group, and do the, whatever we can at Jama'at, and then go by ourselves, be with Allah alone, weeping before him. It's easier to become emotional in our connection, usually when we're alone, if we're able to. Kind of giving a lot of charity, sadaqah. This is, practically speaking, it's very easy. Go on a web, go on Islamic Relief, put your credit card information in, and just recurring payments. 
hundred dollars a month, fifty dollars a month, ten dollars a month, whatever we're able to afford. Let it go. Just you, so you don't even have to think about it. But it's just being done, right? Like just like we subscribe to things, we have a charity subscription which is going. And the more we can, every time we get an increase in income, hopefully our charity should increase. Inshallah. Every time, even if we don't get an increase, we should give. We should keep giving an increase and in, in more. But these types of things are easy for us to do, practically speaking, right? Um, another one. Uh, we don't necessarily want to be in a category where we're faced with with having to um, uh, choose the hadith about someone who someone of rank and beauty comes to try to seduce them. So maybe that's not one we seek. Um, and the next one, the one whose heart is attached to the masjid. That's what does that mean? It means between the prayers, between the jumma, someone is excited to go back to the masjid. A sign of iman and belief. People we like being in the masjid. A sign of hypocrisy, we can't wait to get out. And when is this thing going to be done? When is Jumma going to be done? When is the Khatib going to be done? I got to go. Not like we have to go to work, that's different. But like, just like, I just want to get out of here. I just like, I want, I'd rather go and, you know, go to the mall or something like that, right? The, 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 this being attached to the masjid is a very noble thing. Um, and the one that hopefully we can all do, because we talked about youth, and youth is really in that age before 35 or 40, growing up in the worship of Allah. Trying to do worship while we're still able, like, while we have choices to not do it. Because everybody, as they get older, as we talked about, you're compelled. Really, it's not the, the choice is not the same. When 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 it's younger, there's so many more passions and options that are available. And a just leader could be a leader who, if everybody is leading someone or another, right? This could be a, you, someone is leading a team at work. This could be a, if you are a leader in your family, if you are a mother, if you are a father, you are a leader in your family. If you have younger siblings, you're a leader of those various ways. If someone is in an organization and they're leading, so on and so forth, right? So there's various doors by which we enter from. We want to be like the people who don't leave any um, uh, uh, door open or closed, rather. Don't leave any door closed. Every door we want open. We want to go through all of them as much as possible. And, and um, he mentions then, whoever reprieves someone who is insolvent or agrees to reduce their debt will be shaded by Allah's throne. So there's other narrations which mention the shade of Allah's throne, meaning somebody owes you debt, and you say, you know what, I'm going to reduce the debt, or it's 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 forgiven. Um, it's forgiven. Alhamdulillah. So with that, if there's any questions, um, we'll do the questions now, inshallah, and then we'll pray. And then next time, we hope, inshallah, we can finish. I think we should be able to finish this section on the Day of Judgment. Let's see. Uh, Inshallah, we'll finish this section, and then the following class we'll do the uh, Jannah and Jahannam, and then those are the lives of, of man, of the human being. The question: If you take out a loan, so you take the, in, the interest-bearing instrument, even though you can pay it off. Um, that would be haram. Yeah, so any intro, any time anyone, to, so even if you can't pay it off, interest has nothing to do with whether one can pay it off or not. The instrument in and of itself is something that invites the wrath of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, this is Quran, Allah and his messenger wage war on the one who takes interest. They don't say that about alcohol, or about adultery, about um, murder. I mean, there's so many other big sins which have big punishments, but in who wage war because the economic system. One of the first things the Prophet ﷺ did in Mecca is he fixed the unjust economic system, which interest was a big part of the unjust economic system. So uh, there's various ways in which one can go about building credit. As an example, I mean, this is not a class on on that, um, but let's just say you could take out a credit card. And as long as you're making the payments every month, you're never charged interest on the credit card. So credit card in and of itself is not impermissible if someone is making the payments such that they will never be charged interest because the interest only happens when you exceed the credit limit. If it's like 5K limit and you exceed it and you don't pay off the balance, the interest comes. But the instrument which bears the interest in and of itself, so the auto loan, if they say, hey, there's 6% APR, 5% APR, and we take anything more than zero percent APR, that in and of itself puts us in the category of haram. And now we have to do whatever we can to pay off that loan, right? Um, the only workaround would be that if, 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 from a financial point of view, if somebody were to go and buy a car and they were to say, put in the contract 
the amount that into my principal that and make sure that it's zero percent APR, and then you pay off the amount, and you can do it over a phase period of time. Contractually, that would be valid in the Sharia, but in form and in in, in uh, taking out the, the instrument in and of itself, like in, in this scenario, would not be permissible. Um, and it's not really a view; it's also not a viewpoint thing. Like we want to make sure, in, with regards to these topics, this is black and white, halal haram. Right? There's not really gray areas in, in when it's Quran. Uh, gray areas come when it's like a situation of desperation. Uh, and then there's very there's like gray areas that can come. Yeah. Yes. Like a bank. Um. Or was there another example of was it? Were you referring to a bank or another example? Yeah. Good question. Um. So the question was, what would, what, in terms of working for a company in which, let's say, interest is the primary means of, 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 uh, of revenue, or um, that's like what the role. So if you're in the role of actually collecting that, like that is your role, you are the loan officer, you are something else, that's not a permissible job according to the vast majority of ulama. There's difference of opinion. I go by the opinion that one should avoid it entirely, just like the institution in and of itself we should avoid it. That's like the dominant opinion that I've always learned is that working for companies in which that is the primary means of revenue, we should avoid it because there's ample opportunities out there. I have seen opinions in which if you are not the one who's actually doing the core work of that, um, there's some room for, for, you know, for like a ruksa, like permissibility, but um, it doesn't really like, I don't think it holds that much strength because there's still so much risk in it mixing with the income. Uh, but you know, the, it, it would depend on like a case by case kind of basis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Life insurance is haram. Life insurance is haram. Okay. Categorically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Life insurance. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, uh, provision of what happens when you die is Allah's responsibility. The first spiritual concept is you don't place your trust in anything except Allah. So you don't say that I'm going to take out a $500,000 policy so that my children, when I die, even though I didn't do anything to earn that policy, what you're doing is you're saying, I put in, you might have put in $1,000. People do this, they game the system, then they like, you know, fake things and all these types of things. But they might put in $1,000 and all of a sudden, $500,000 appears, right? And they put their trust in that policy and not in Allah. That as a concept is haram, coupled with the fact that you turned a little bit of money without any like real, there's no investment in that. There's no uh, shared, um, uh, like the way a stock would work where you have, you share in the up and in the down. Uh, and then you would all of a sudden, that policy would turn into, into a bunch of money. Insurance in general, in the Sharia is a very like um, debated subject, but we live in a country we live in. You have to take out certain policies like car insurance and these other types of things. But there's a lot of debate amongst the fuqaha and majority of them leaning towards like you should just avoid all of these. But you can't in certain circumstances, right? Um, uh, but the life insurance is not mandatory by, at all. So we should avoid life insurance policies, avoid accepting payout from life insurance policies and, and so on. Yeah. Like auto insurance or, you know, home insurance or something like that. Yeah. No, I don't think it's, e it's, it's not at that black and white to say that it's for sure. Huh? Yeah, you would want to, you would want to like check in, in that situation. I would recommend um, checking with a faqi, a scholar of fiqh who studied uh, the jurisprudential principles that relate very specific because this stuff is deep. It's like not simple. You go really, really, really deep. There's a lot of principles that relate to it. Um, because that it's not as like black and white. Um, if you're selling life insurance policies and that's your main job, that would be avoidable. Right. But there's there are other areas where there's probably room. So I would actually, you'd want to check. Um, and maybe we can talk after I can try to think of somebody you refer before, if you have deeper questions to refer you to who's like studied in this, cause I'm not studied in, in finance, uh, jurisprudential, you know, rulings. Yeah. Uh, sister side, anything? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, same topic. I'm more confident in the right? 
Um, and then if you have, let's say you have a chase, most of our cases like big companies, you can just put your money in there and then you have to check your account. I think you can actually call these banks and give you some sort of interest on that. Um, is, so is it permissible to have, like, did it tell you, like, oh, you can get some interest? Is it okay to just have that account be like, how much this money in that? Like, was it interesting? Or should you use, like, close to the bank account entirely and like, find, like, alternative options? Yeah, the question the question is about bank accounts and the interest that's collected and um, earned. So first, uh, you avoid the accounts which have high APYs. So there's no there's like so you, your checking accounts they give no money at all in checking accounts, right? So you unless you have like five million dollars, twenty million dollars, I mean, they're not giving anything on uh, you know the vast majority of us in, in terms of what we keep in the checking account, right? Um, maybe your situation is different. Alhamdulillah, Allah bless you. But anyhow, so so that is. The, let's say it's it's like two cents or two dollars at the end of the year. What you do with that, if 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 you did get that, you actually just give it away. You donate that amount. Um, so it's it wouldn't be something that you would actually keep. Uh, and you just take that amount. The intention is this is the amount that I've earned. But intentionally opening like a savings account, which allows you to make a lot of money on the APY because it's locked there for a period of time. That would be, again, an impermissible instrument. There would be no need to do that, right? If you have your money, though, in a savings account, that just has, like, again, a very, very, very minor percentage. You just have it in there, delineate your account, take out that money. And it tells you at the end of the year, this is the amount that you got. It's usually very negligible, and you just make sure to give it away. Yeah, make that intention. Yeah. Oh, I'm just delaying something that I'm still buying. I'm not going to say I'm still right Yeah. Yeah. That giving the money. Um, if we have that type of money, the little bits that we get, you give it to any charity. It's not a. You don't have to give it to like the worst charity in the world. Um, it's. It's. You know. It, and definitely don't give it to non-Muslim charity uh, or some Zionist or something like that. Um, we want to just give it to. Uh, any you know any charity is generally fine. Just like give that money away. It doesn't need to be like destroyed or something like that, right? But it's wealth that we do not want to keep. We're saying, Ya Allah, I, this is not money that I want to actually um, keep, and I am you know bound by the circumstances that I'm in. There's varying degrees. I'm sure there's a lot more depth to this topic. Um, for the sake of time, we probably won't get into all the nuances of it. Maybe some of the but maybe some some of the scholars said other things and to give it to other places or to get rid of it entirely. I'm not sure if this is just the minimal amount that I've learned about it is um, yeah, in line with kind of what you're saying, just kind of give it, give it away. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, um, questions online. I have a question. Salam. How about DoorDash? If it's haram food that we bring, <clears throat> that's a really good question. So if you're, if, I'm assuming the question is if you're delivering the haram food, right? Um, yeah, if you're outright delivering like alcohol, um, that would be a problem. Uh, if you're delivering like a burger that's not halal, that's not necessarily the same. So it's a little bit tricky. If you could send me a DM, I can do a little more research and give me some more details on that. Um, so I'm wondering how can we attach ourselves to the masjid and knowledge if they're not available to us? Good question. So the intention is what matters here. So let's say we live in a community where we don't have a masjid. 
we make a strong intention, Ya Allah, if there were a masjid, I would love to be there. And one day I would love to be a, uh, the person who helps build a masjid in this area or in this community, right? So that's the intention that we want to try and, um, and make. With regards to knowledge, Alhamdulillah, in the time we live in, there's ample ways to learn knowledge, even if it's not locally available. So online, a lot of ways. I would highly recommend um, for the one asking the question or for anyone else, seekersguidance.org is a, is a platform which has um, like authentic Islamic knowledge just taught for free in all the key sciences of Islam, or some, most of the key sciences of Islam. So in Aqidah, in Fiqh, in Tazkiyah, in Tasawwuf. In, 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 um, in Arabic, if you'd like. And so there's various different types of knowledge that are taught. You can get the free classes, learn them. There's like sometimes they have 20 different um, se uh, sessions. It's like there's a curriculum. You follow along. You can listen to the recording, take it live. So there's actually ample ways to do it. But the key is if you learn online to do so with reliable scholars. And um, YouTube is good, but be careful of like uh, uh, information on YouTube that's... that's um, that could be off versus like an authenticated website that's a little bit more real. Um, just want to clarify if you have a credit card, it's paid off before you fall into interest, it's okay to have, yeah. If we have a credit card and we're not letting the interest ever touch the actual payment, we are okay, right? Because all you're doing is you're borrowing money for a period of time, you're paying that money when it's due and it's 0% is charged. What you avoid is ever being late uh, and getting into the insane APRs that they have. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll do a few more questions. What if we work in a bakery that have haram products? Will that job be haram? Uh, no, you're, did that, you, you would assume that the risk that you're getting would be from the halal products, the permissible products, um, especially if you're talking about like minor ingredients that there's a difference of opinion on. Like, you know, um, so you usually would be fine there. But if but if you're working at like a like a liquor bakery or something, I don't know if there's a thing. But like a lot of people, they put alcohol in their in their baked goods. If that's where you're working, yeah, I would avoid that, right? Like you're making all your money from people who are drinking uh, or or, think, or if you're working at like a cannabis bakery, that would be haram. Um, okay, are there major signs before the forty days of fog? Um, we didn't mention the 40 days of fog in today's class. The uh, major signs that you and I want to make sure that we know of are first, the coming of the Dajjal, the sun rising on the west, Jesus, son of Mary, descending. These major blasts or that earth-shaking events that take place, um, the beast that comes, and Yajuj and Majuj. Those are the ones that we want to make sure that we know of based on this, that, on this hadith. Uh, uh, oh, the name of the website is Seeker's Guidance. Seeker, like Seeker, S E E K E R S, guidance.org. Yes, question. So, credit card codes, the fact that credit card companies, they go in and credit to me, of course, just know that. So, yeah, the question is about credit card points. So credit card points are based on, um, uh, there's no interest in credit card points. They're based on interchange fees and the interchange fees. So Visa charges like 2.6% interchange fee. Amex charges like a 3.2% interchange fee to merchants to allow for that service to happen. And what they're saying is, hey, instead of using the cash, when you use the credit card, we'll get the interchange fee and we'll give you a portion, like 1% of the interchange fee or half of the interchange fee or whatever else it is, uh, because you used our service. So the way I've always understood it, and um, there, could, there could be varying difference of opinion on this, Allah knows best. Obviously, with all of these things, I would recommend checking with the Mufti. Um, and credit card points are not usurious and credit card points are not, there's nothing predatory about them. There's no predatory practices that are happening in order the interchange fee is based on um, like an interchange financial network that's been set up internationally. Um, and then there's there's ways in which you're using their payment rails and they're benefiting and then they're passing off that some of that benefit to you. Yeah. Okay, I think we have just one more question. 
how to become less materialistic, so less interested in dunya. Um, yeah, it's an entire, it's a, it's a lengthy topic. Uh, there's three things one needs to do. First one, we need to know that Allah puts no worth towards materialism. Allah does not put um, uh, worth towards uh, materialism and towards wealth and money and fame and luxury and these types of materialistic things. So if Allah doesn't put worth towards them, we want to work on detaching these things from our heart. The second thing is when one starts to give more and more money then they um, uh, and start to spend less, let's say, on themselves and more on other people, it's a way of ridding their heart of this materialism, of this love of materialism. The third way is that one reflects on the ahira and sees it as closer to them than the dunya that we live in. So if one does that and sees the reality of the ahira as closer, the materialism will all disappear. All the uh, things that, that we get for the sake of the dunya will all just disappear at one point and will, they will go away. But the deeds, what are called the baqiyat, salihat, and the good deeds that we do, they're everlasting. Um, so if I buy a bunch of things and I have a bunch of nice cars and coats and bags and, you know, luxury things, even all that are even permissible, but they're just materialistic, consumeristic, it's all going to go away. I die and it's all going to end up in a junkyard one day. The Lamborghini, the Bugatti, the Louis Vuitton, it's all going to end up in the same junkyard at some point or like similar junkyards. Didn't do anything for me, right? Had I been less attached to that and maybe use that money in a little bit more of a better way, it would have been better for me. And so reflecting on, on what your wealth is supposed to be for will also be helpful. Inshallah. So with that, we want to be mindful of time. We have to try so we'll continue um, uh, next time. Uh, clarify, buying car loan with bank loan is not permissible. Yeah, it is not permissible to buy a car with a bank loan. Not permissible. It's interest, bank loan, unless you get what's called a 0% APR loan, which some, uh, uh, in this interest rate environment, you're probably not going to get it, but in other, in, in, er, in other environments, Auto, lender, uh, auto uh, agencies and dealerships would offer 0%. So if it's 0.0%, you're not paying any interest. You're good to go. But if it's anything more than that, then, then you are. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Allahumma salli wa salli wa baraka la Sayyidina Muhammad fil awaleen wa salli wa salli wa baraka la Sayyidina Muhammad fil akhireen wa salli wa salli wa baraka la Sayyidina Muhammad fil malil alayhi la yawm al-deen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa fil akhirati hasnatan wa kina adhaab anna rabbana afrighalina sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala qawm al-kafirin la ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-dhalimin ya Allah ya Rahman ya Rahim ya Kareem ya Rabbi al-Alameen we ask you ya Allah ya Allah that you pardon our sins that you forgive us that you pour your mercy your rahma your shifa your lutf your gentleness your kindness your protection upon our brothers and sisters in Gaza, specifically in Rafah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you protect our brothers and sisters in Philistine, that you protect our brothers and sisters, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you protect them against this onslaught, against this genocide, that you stop these things that are happening to them, Ya Allah, that you provide for those who are sick and who are hungry and who are thirsty and who are in fear and who are in trepidation and who are in worry and who are in despair, and that you help them and that you give them patience and that you give them ease and that you give them a way out, Ya Allah. We ask that you allow us to do whatever it we can, Ya Allah, through our du'as and through our gatherings and through whatever else we can do, Ya Allah, to help our brothers and sisters in Philistine, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and to make du'a for them and to not forget about what they're going through and to live our lives in a way where we are grateful for all of the blessings that you have given us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that we live our life, Ya Allah, that in a way we're serving you and serving this ummah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask that you help the Muslims defeat the kuffar and that you plant their feet firmly and that you give them victory, Rabbana Afrika Lina Sabran. We ask that you help the Muslims in tribulation and in worry and in sickness and who have been affected by immense adversity all throughout the Muslim world. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask that you help them. Ya Allah, that you send your aid to them and that you allow for us as an ummah to be rectified and to be and, and to be rectified in the best of states and that you allow our akhira to be far, far, far greater than our dunya, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you reward all of those, Ya Allah, who have passed away in martyrdom and that you give them martyrdom and that you give them shahada and that you give them the best and best, 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 best million times over multiplied rewards, Ya Allah, that we cannot even fathom that you give them for their patience, especially for those who have lost their parents or their children or they're suffering, or they've lost their limbs, or they've lost their eyesight, or they've lost their ability, or they have no food, or they have nothing, but they have you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you reward them for their taqwa, and that you reward them for their righteousness, and that you allow for their for, for us to all learn from their hilm and from their resoluteness, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you 
help us implement this knowledge and that you allow us to realize the reality of the day of judgment and that you allow us to live a life in which we properly fear you, in which we properly worship you. We ask that you give us afia and well-being and that you remove our problems and our adversities and that you allow us to be people of shukr and people of dhikr in the best of way. We ask that you allow us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam and that you make us firm upon his sunnah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam wa sallam alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Rabbil Sahih Sadri wa salli amri wa sallim wa sallim wa sallim wa sallim wa sallim wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah khair for your patience. To the brothers, thank you for the help. The masjid had a cleaning done, I think, over the weekend, so everything was moved. So, alhamdulillah. Great, so we're going to continue on, inshallah, and um, we're going to continue today talking about what, what takes place in terms of the events on Yom Al-Qiyamah, and then relate that to how do we best prepare in this dunya, in the life that we live in right now, for what's going to take place on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So we've discussed a fair portion of these events, and we'll continue on, uh, inshallah to get to the rest of the uh, of the details. Where we were at was what are the the moments where the human being will now start to stand before Allah. Actually, no, we were at the point where the Day of Judgment, people are waiting on the Day of Judgment, and they're waiting for the Day of Judgment to start. The Yom Al-Qiyamah is not an event where all of a sudden the human being is resurrected, and then we just, the the actual questioning begins. There is a period of time between the resurrection of the human being and the, of, of mankind and of the beginning of resurrection, where of the beginning of the questioning, where there will be a long waiting period. And it will be a waiting period that will really, really, really test people because of how difficult it is on that day, because of how much heat there will be on that day, because of how thirsty people will be, how hungry people will be. It will not be easy at all. And so when this happens, people, they start to go to the different prophets. And there's a very famous hadith here where they start to, the hardship becomes so overwhelming, they start to debate, who do we go to to get help? Because Allah is not beginning this day. He's not beginning the questioning. And people will say, we just want the questioning to start, regardless of the outcome we want it to start. And so they'll start and they say, decide to go to the prophets. They start with Adam alayhi salam. And they go to Adam alayhi salam and he's, he basically says, this is not my, my, I'm not in any position to besiege God on this day. He turns them to Nuh alayhi salam, who says the same thing essentially. And um, there's a longer hadith here which narrates all the details, but for the sake of brevity, we'll just get to the, the, the essence of it. Nuh alayhi salam sends them to Ibrahim alayhi salam, who also says, this is not my position who then refers them to Musa, to Moses, the prophet Moses, peace be upon him. They go to prophet after prophet, to the prophet after prophet. They go to prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And then he says, not my position. And then he sends them to Jesus. He says, go to Isa, alayhi salam. He go, they go to the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And he says, this is the station of Ahmad. Go to Ahmad. The prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his name, he has many names. One of his names is Ahmad in the next life, um, and, and then what he's referred to. They go to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, I am the one for this. This is my station. I am the one for this. I am the one for this. And then the Prophet وسلم, he asks Allah permission, and then he bows down to Allah. And he says a hamd, and he makes a dua. He says a praise and a dua that no one has ever made before, this type of dua and this type of praise to Allah. And he then asks Allah to begin this day. And this is where now his intercession, this is one of the first times where his intercession, he is now interceding for all of humanity. This concept of inter intercession is really important to understand in our relationship with our Lord. It's in this life, there's a direct relationship for the most part with Allah. But in the next life, as one goes into the Day of Judgment, it's going to be very difficult to directly approach Allah. You have to have somebody to help you because of, all, because of how many sins we will be carrying and how difficult 
things will be. And so all of humanity knows this. So they go to the prophets because the prophets are obviously closest to Allah. And the, no, none of the prophets take on this task except for the Prophet ﷺ. This is to show, this one of the lessons from this is to show everyone the maqam, the station of the Prophet ﷺ. He has the maqam al Mahmud, the praiseworthy station. Nobody can touch that station. Nobody. There's no, and he has the greatest of stations because he is the greatest of Allah's creation. And so he starts now, this intercession is what begins the day of judgment. And so it begins the day of judgment. And so there's various hadith which mention this uh, maqam al mahmud and it's also mentioned in the Quran where Allah says that your, it may be that your Lord will raise you to a praiseworthy station, to this maqam al mahmud so there's varying degrees then of intercession that take place on Yom al um, which we'll talk about, uh, which we'll talk about um, shortly. And so in one hadith, it's mentioned that Muslim children, those who die before puberty, that they will be permitted to give their parents a, uh, a water to drink or give their parents drink. And they will move through the crowd searching for their parents one at a time and thirst will be utmost. So this is an, an example of the type of ways in which while one is squeezed immensely in this life through one of the hardest tests ever imaginable to lose a child and, and to lose a child who's very, 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 very young, that parent and the child get see that benefit. This is just the beginning of seeing that benefit in the next life. This is one example of the beginning of seeing that benefit in the next life. So. Um, uh, they will that water will be reserved for their parents. People will, might ask them for it, and they say, "No, this is for just my parents. This is reserved for my parents until they um, give it to them." We ask that Allah, all of the children of Gaza who have passed away, and, and, and Allah make uh, give them this maqam and increase their maqam and their station in the next life, and give their parents immense, immense, immense reward for the this this difficult tribulation that they have had to this horror really that they've had to bear. So then it will get to a point where people will become extremely distressed and terrified. And they said distressed will increase to a point where e the disbelievers will say, Ya Allah, just let the, this, let's make this happen even if I have to go to the fire. That's how intense it, it will be. That's how intense it will be. Um, that people will feel so much fear on the day of judgment that they would rather go to the fire than bear the actual situation that's going on at the day of judgment now keep in mind this is all happening physically and spiritually as we discussed before this is not some some something that only happens in the realm of the souls this is actually a physical uh, difficulty that the human being has to bear the more one prepares in this life, the more one sacrifices for the sake of Allah in this life, the more righteous one is in this life, the more good that one does in this life, the more one exemplifies uh, good traits of character in this life, the more all of those things then represent them and help them on Yom al Qiyamah. But what will help you the most, which we'll get to, is your relationship with the Prophet is how close and how much one loves the Prophet The more one loves him and the more one tried to follow his sunnah, the closer one will be to him and he is the refuge on Yom Al-Qiyamah. There's no, nobody can doubt that. Even if people have um, uh, doubts about the Prophet maqam for some reason in this life, there's no doubting on the next life because Allah will make that maqam very, very, very clear. So then, finally, Allah will issue the command to the angels who carry the arsh, the th tremendous throne. And they will bring this immense throne, the throne of the Rahman, to this standing place. And the garden will be brought, and Jahannam and the fire will be brought. On one side is the garden, on the right side, and on the left side is the uh, is the is, is is the hellfire. And then mankind will be brought before Allah to be judged. Some will be have no judgment at all. They'll just immediately pass. These are the um, the foremost people, as Surah Waqiyah mentions, different groups of people, the foremost, the Sabiqun, they don't even have to go through any judgment. We should always ask Allah to admit us into Jannah without judgment, because just going through judgment in and of itself, being asked those questions, many of the ulama say that is a punishment in and of itself, because you have to stand before Allah and give accounting for what you did. So there are people amongst this ummah and previous ummahs, 
and previous nations who don't have to face that. This is, again, one of the incentives to try to devote one's life entirely in every which way possible to God. That's what the Sabiqun are. They're the foremost. They're the ones in first place. The people who are running, the, who are really trying. Like it's, they're, not, they're never satisfied with the fara'id. For, for them, doing the fara'id only is considered um, uh, like that they've fallen short significantly. For them, it's all about doing as much as possible extra, serving people, uh, taking care of people, taking care of the needs of people, and then and then doing as much extra ibadah that they can, and and, and and so on and so forth. This is the these are the hallmark traits of the sabbatun. And it's easier, some of them say, in the time we live in, to attain these stations than it used to be in the um, earlier generations. Why? Because in the past there were many people competing for these spots. You know, like if you have a really really competitive. Um, uh, job, let's say, as an example, or like a competitive college admission cycle. And there's a bunch of people competing for the same 15 slots that are going to be given or 500 slots that are going to be given. If you have fewer people competing for those slots, it's going to be easier for those who are trying to get those slots. In the time that it, that it used to be, there were so many people striving and striving and striving to get closer to Allah that it was... There was only a certain number of these stations that were distributed, that were going to be distributed to people. Now, there's not that many people. Very few people amongst humanity, amongst the majority of human, humanity, and, and amongst the Muslims, are like going the extra mile to do a lot, right? And so this should give us hope that if we make this intention, uh, try to open that door, I think it's locked. If we make this intention, that inshallah Allah will can make us from amongst these people, and if he doesn't make us from amongst these people, at least he makes us from amongst those who love people um, that are in this category. This is why it's so important to love the, the people who are close to, to God. Some then will be called gently to account. Their hisab will be gentle. Uh, others, it will be very harsh. And then anyone who for, for, for whom it is harsh, they will be, um, uh, it's, they're gonna be subject to punishment. And then this is when the books are given. So already the people will know when if the if the book is given to them in their right hand, that's a sign of felicity. And if the book is given in their left hand, then that's a sign of, 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 of doom. And so we always should also pray to Allah that if we have to face this reckoning, that Allah gives us the book in our right hand. How does one get the book in their right hand? The more good that's in the book, the higher likelihood is, like in this case, the right exemplifies the Ashab al Yameen, as Allah says in Surah Waqiyah, exemplifies the people of the right hand. These are the people of goodness, of good deeds, and so on and so forth. And then the people of the left hand, the Ashab al Shiman, they are the people of, 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 of evil. The peop this could be kufr or hypocrisy, luxury, and so on and so forth. And, and Allah describes these people in detail in the Quran the Ashab al Shiman and the Ashab al Yameen. It's all of the answers, the day of judgment is an examination. All of the answers to this test, we've already been given every single answer. It's all there. There's a huge book, a cheat code. All the answers are there. It's really not difficult to memorize them. What's difficult is to implement them. But the one who tries in this life, they'll have a very easy examination, right? It's like if somebody... Um, you know, back in, in, in the days of, uh, if, in university, if it's a final exam, and you haven't done anything all semester, and just kind of getting by, cramming for the tests and the quizzes, and just like barely getting by, and now the final exam comes, and people might spend a week, two weeks, trying to cram as much as possible, cram as much information as possible, and then barely getting by in the exam, trying to figure, figure things out, usually, you know, um, uh, at risk of failing, the class or failing the exam, or maybe they get by, but then all that information is forgotten. All that information is um, forgotten. But in uh, it's very different compared to the person who the entire semester was on top of the material, was studying, was understanding, was learning, was showing up to class, was sitting in the first row, right, and was was absorbing and versus sitting in the last row and just on the phone and like you know surfing the internet and just barely listening let alone not even showing up to class. It's a big difference between the level of knowledge and understanding that that person will have. And usually that person, when final season comes, 
they'll they'll study. It'll be a review though. It'll be like the concepts are already solidified. And then the final exam will usually be a lot easier for that person. All of these are metaphors for the day, for the for the major final exam that the believer has to go through. There's not really like a cramming type approach that we can take in our life. One has to live a life of goodness. Of course, one could live a, 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 a bad life and be guided later in their life and repent, and inshallah, Allah will erase things. But the vast majority of people have to strive to live a life of goodness. And when a life of goodness is lived, these difficult situations are facilitated. And, and the day of judgment, uh, Yom al Qiyamah, life in the grave, these difficult situations are facilitated. And Allah will question the messengers at this point. He says, then we shall question those to whom our message will, was sent, and we shall question the messengers. With knowledge shall we speak to them, and never were we absent. And, and then Allah says that that will be on the day when some faces will be whitened and others will be darkened. As for those whose faces have been darkened, it will be said to them, did you disbelieve after your, you, you claimed faith? Then taste the punishment for, for having disbelieved. And as for those whose faces have been whitened and with nur, with light, this is referring to light and darkness, not like a color necessarily, um, they will dwell in the mercy of Allah forever. This is, this is these ayahs of Quran. <clears throat> nur and darkness are concepts that we can very much internalize in this life. The more good one does, the more nur they have. And you will meet, if you meet people, especially the people who are have devoted their lives to Allah, like the, the righteous scholars and the, the saints and so on. And so they, you will see a luminosity on their faces. They're literally be well lit. Their smile will make you forget all of your problems. And this is just one small micro iota of what the Prophet ﷺ was like, that his nur was so overwhelming. His light was so overwhelming. He could come into a room that was dark, and at nighttime, and they could they, they they could find a needle that they used to sew with in that room because he would light the room up. That's how bright his face was. And sometimes they would be looking at the full moon, and it's not like the full moon in these urban environments that we're in. If you're in like a nature environment or an environment where there's no light pollution, the full moon can light up the whole night. They were looking at the full moon, and then the, the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the full moon and the face of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the full moon. And the face of the Prophet ﷺ. and it was said that that his his face was more beautiful, usually you know more luminous meaning than 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 the full moon itself. So this is what light is. Light is transmitted through following the sunnah. That's how light is transmitted. Internally, one follows the sunnah. Externally, one follows the sunnah. And 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 the commandments that that Allah has laid out is obviously in, encapsulated in this. One will increase their light. The more one does acts of ibadah and goodness and khair and akhlaq in this life, the higher light they will have in this life. The more light that they will have in this life, the more goodness they will attract to themselves. Allah says in the Quran, nurun ala nur, light upon light. Until on the day of judgment, it will be time of it will be a time of light. There will be people of light, and they will not be people of darkness. And so then what will happen is the, the questioning will begin. Uh, or the, the, the questioning will, will continue. And people will be brought to this place. They will be brought and summoned before Allah. Every person will be called, again, unless uh, the assumption is, unless they were in this group of people who are given permission without crossing, without um, having to, uh, to be asked questions. And they will be brought, we will be brought before Allah. And Allah will ask us whatever questions He wills. But among the first questions that we are asked about is the salah, is the prayer. If the question of the prayer is not answered correctly, it's kind of like a we're in a really difficult spot with the rest of the questions. This is why the prayer as Muslims can never be taken lightly. Sometimes in the time we live in, we might have a type of mindset of, well, I don't really pray that much, but like I do a bunch of other good things. Those other good things do not matter for the most part, if the prayer is not valid. The prayer is the difference, according to one hadith, between the Muslims and the other nations, between the Christians and the Jews. Muslims, the Muslims compared to the Christians and the Jews. The, the prayer defines the, the, the Muslim. According to Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, one of the group, four Imam Mujtahid Imams, one, a person who misses one prayer is out of Islam. 
that's his opinion. The other imam didn't, didn't say this opinion, but that but his opinion was very strict. The prayer is the differentiating factor between faith and kufr. So the prayer is one of the first things we are asked about. So all of these things, again, the, the answers are given to us for what we have to do. If we're behind on our prayers, if we take our prayers lightly, if we take our prayers seriously in certain circumstances, but lightly in other circumstances, like maybe we pray normal when we're like at home, it's all good, but when we're traveling, we just say, it's fine, I'll just do this later, right? Whatever, we have to get to a point where we take our prayers seriously every moment, every day of our life. There's not there because that day could be the last day that we live. And we want to have, we want to, the last day that we live, we don't want it to be a day where we miss Salat al Fajr because we were, because we, we, we just slept or, or stayed up so late at night and we slept through our alarm. That's not how we want to meet Allah. We want to meet Allah having at minimum prayed our prayers for that day, for however long, you know, of that day we, we, were, we were to live. Right? And so, but that only happens if our prayers are consistent throughout our life, right? And or throughout our weeks and our days and then eventually inshallah throughout our life. Another question then when we'll be asked, it's mentioned that they, the man, the feet of a, of a man or a woman will not move from this standing place until they're questioned about four things. <clears throat> their youth and how they spent it, their life and how they used it, their wealth and how they earned it and how they spent it. So, <clears throat> The wealth has an earning and a spending component. We we talked in the last um, a couple of classes a couple of classes ago. We spoke about the importance of using our youth wisely, right? The time before thirty five or forty, really using that in the obedience of Allah, because that's a very specific question. But we will be asked about our time, because our time is the biggest gift that Allah has given us, and the one who uses their time wisely they will have the best gifts on the Day of Judgment and the best gifts, in, in, inshallah, in, 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 in the afterlife. And the one who uses their time poorly, as Allah talks about in the Quran, we will face a lot of regret. What will people say who, um, uh, that, who did not use their time wisely? We, it, it's said in the Quran, they will say, no, no, give me one more chance. I just want to go back and fix a few things. I want to go back and just press a reset button on my life. I just, I'm, I'm going to live it one more time. God says, no, that's it. You had your time. So there is, no, unlike in this life, where we actually have a lot of chances for reset. Somebody like really screwed up in life, they can turn to Allah and repent. We can go to Hajj. We can make Umrah. There's a lot of things that we can do. We can give out a lot in charity that will get rid of our bad deeds. We can feed people. We can take care. All of these things are removing our sins. But in the next life, there's no reset button. So what we need to do is press reset now while we can. And there's many times throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the month and throughout the year that we get a reset chance as Muslims. The so Ramadan is one of the peak times. I mean, inshallah, in three weeks or so, we'll be in Ramadan. And may Allah bless this remainder of the month of Sha'ban, allow us to reach Ramadan. Ramadan is one of those chances. It's a reset button. Same thing with other acts of ibadah. The, the, the Jummah to Jummah washes away the sins of the week. Prayer to prayer washes away the sins between the prayers and so on and so forth. So reset before um, the time is gone. And then what happens is that one doesn't answer these questions with their hand, with their mouth in terms of where like rationally or logically one is speaking. One answers these questions with their limbs. The limbs speak out. So Allah says on that day, their tongues, their hands, and their feet will testify against them as to what they used to do. And this day we will seal up their mouths and their hands will speak to us and their feet will bear witness as to what they used to earn. And then they will say to their skins, why do you testify against us? Saying to their body, why are you testifying against us? And they will say, Allah has given us speech. Allah has now given us the ability to, to speak. Uh, and so the limbs of the human being, it's actually a really important concept to understand the time we live in. Our body doesn't belong to us. It does not belong to us. Our body, our body parts, our eyes, our ears, our tongue, our nose, our nerves, our hands, our fingers, our fingernails, our, our palms, our elbows, every part of our body belongs to Allah. It does, and on the day of judgment, it's now personified and it's shown. How so? Because 
unlike like right now, I can control my hand and say, okay, pick this up or don't pick this up. But in the day of judgment, I won't be able to control the hand. The day on the day of judgment, the hand will speak and say, no, he did this, 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 and and I will have no chance to speak up with my rational mind or with my with what I'm controlling. If the tongue speaks, the tongue will speak, saying, "All oh, here's all the things that were said using me, but not something that one can control. Why is that so important? Because we have to see that these are gifts, and the gifts are supposed to be used in the service of Allah and in the obedience of Allah, not in disobedience. This kind of concept of, 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 of it's all your choice, and it's all, which is a very, very, very Western uh, idea, and I think most people, hopefully for the most part, have realized that like almost every part of Western ideology is hypocritical and problematic and dajjalic and satanic. I mean, like the vast majority of it, maybe, maybe a handful of things that if we have not seen it exposed in the last couple of months, um, we, we, we probably need to wake up a little bit and just like really, really, really pay attention. But though this concept that we are in control, it's my choice, it's my body, all of these things, not true. It's not true. It's not our body or our choice to go and say, I'm going to change the orientation that Allah gave me or change my, 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 my body and do surgery, which will change the, the, the way in which Allah made me, right? Like not like we're not talking about life-saving surgery. We're talking about these optional types of things. That's not our choice. These are, these are now sins that one will have to pay accountability for. Same thing when Allah commands us, okay, dress in a certain way. It's not up to me to say, well, I have free will and choice. I can't say use that to justify by saying, well, no, it's my body. It's, it's a factually incorrect statement. It's not. It's Allah's body. Allah gave it to us. It's on loan. And when it goes back, it's going to tell Allah, yeah, this, 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 this. He did this. He put this in me. She did this. He wore this. She wore this. And so on and so forth. And these are, these are, these are, we should fear these things. These, should, these are not a joke. Right? And in Western society, they've made it seem like, and Muslims traditionally used to take this stuff pretty seriously, right? Like the, 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 what, everything from what went into the body to what was worn to the way one carried themselves, these things were taken seriously because we realized that this is an amana, a trust from Allah. Now that's, that's gone for the most part, right? That, that, uh, especially when it comes to, 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 to modesty and clothing and, and so on and so forth, these types of concepts have gone and now they're going into very, very, very strange areas. But it's all going to be corrected. And Allah will ask us in accordance with the way He wants to do things. And He says in the Quran, He will not be asked about what He does, but you will be asked about what you do. He doesn't have to answer any. Nobody is going to question God on the day of judgment. God's going to question us though on the day of judgment because He created us and everything we have belongs to Him. And this is why... Um, it's part of just this good manners with our Lord, let alone everything else, to try and do whatever we can with what we've been given for him, for his sake. Same with wealth. But wealth comes to us, but Allah will ask us, how did you get it? Did you steal it from somebody? Did you get it from a Quran source? And then how did you spend it? Did you, did you, did you spend it uh, entirely on things that were haram, or on things that were halal, or on things that were questionable, or on luxury? Did you spend it on other people? Did you give? And so all these things are going to be questioned. We can't think that we will get away with earning incorrect wealth, spending it on the wrong things, not using our limbs in the right way that Allah wanted us to do it, not spending our life in the right way, not praying, like getting all of these different things, not doing them, and then we just get a free pass. That's not how it works. That's called empty, vain hope in our religion. There's versus the hope that we want to have is, is an optimistic hope, meaning we do everything we can. We know we're going to fall short. None of us will say, yeah, 100% I'm doing everything Allah wants me to do. But then we say, okay, Allah, I tried my best and I'm putting my, my trust in you and my hope in you. This is the type of hope that one wants um, in, in, in our life. Then even the earth will testify against us or for us for what we did on different spots on the earth. So if we committed a certain good deed, then inshallah, this 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 spot on you know Forty uh, Second Street and MLK will testify for us. Oh, they were here on this day. They they we, they they praised Salat Isha in this masjid on this day. 
or they pray Salatul Maghrib or Salatul Jummah or so on and so forth. But if we committed a sin in a certain place, now that part of the earth will speak up and say, yeah, yeah, they, this, this haram action was done. on, And because the earth doesn't like it when haram is done, because the earth is in obedience to Allah, the actual earth itself. So it doesn't, it doesn't appreciate when sin is brought into, uh, or it's done on the, on the face of the earth. But of course, people will commit sin on earth. So the, the, the testification will now, will happen against them, or for them. And so, um, as Allah says on the Quran, in Surah the Zilzalaha, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about this, and he says, do you know what the news is? It will testify against each of God's slaves, man or woman, and relate what they have done, and it will say, he did such and such thing on such and such day, or she did such and such thing on such and such day, right? So this is the, um, Allah will inspire the earth to speak. This is why the scholars, they say, if you and I have committed a sin in a certain part of earth, like in a certain, let's say that we made a lot of mistakes when we were in college. Now, and, and we, we made, we did certain wrong there and we repent. Then to go back to those areas and do good deeds in those specific locations. So the earth of that spot remembers us for good and not for being people who did evil, not for being people who did haram, not for being people and so on and so forth. So, the, so there is, there's intentions one can make. And it could be a small thing like going there and just literally doing, reciting an ayah of Quran or doing a little bit of dhikr or giving some charity, like just small intentions, but just so that that spot doesn't testify against us. Instead, it testifies for us and, 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 and the right. So all of these things will start to will start to take place. And in one narration, Allah will draw the believing slave nearer and nearer to him until he covers and he shelters him, and then he will ask him about his sins. And this person will um, keep confessing about the sins and saying, "Yeah, I did that. I did that." Until he just fears that he's done. And then Allah will say, I concealed them for you in the dunya, and I forgive you for them today. And I forgive you for them today. These are the types of, so Allah's mercy will also very much be exemplified on this day. But note how it says for the believing slave, right? Because we're going to make mistakes. We hope that Allah counts us amongst those who are people of belief. We're going to make mistakes. But if we test, we, we, we tell Allah, Ya Allah, I'm sorry. Allah gives us chance after chance after chance. And so we want to be amongst these people who Allah forgives. And Allah's forg Allah can forgive anybody on the Day of Judgment. It's not that it's, it's, it, it, there's no rule that he has to go by. We have to go by his rules. He doesn't have any rules that he has to go by. And then it said the prolonged difficult situation is made tough. It's made easier, though, for the believers. It's difficult for others, but easier for the believer, such that for some it may be shortened for as long as it takes to perform two rakah or between the Dohar and Asr prayer. So for some, the 50,000 years, for some, for the, for, for, for the people of, of pure evil and the Kofar, and for others, it could be like Duraka, or between Dohar and Asr with two, three hours. And, and so this is the type of way in which everybody will experience the Day of Judgment according to their Taqwa and according to their belief. This is why that matters so much. As, as they said in the Quran, the only thing that matters, uh, neither wealth nor children, nothing will take matter on that day, illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim, except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart, with a sound uh, qalb. And then one of the most difficult times, he says, for the human beings will be when Allah orders the fire to be brought, Jahannam to be brought. It will be led by 70,000 uh, halters, like a type of stand that they will be carrying. Each of those will be held by 70,000 angels. That's, somebody does the math, right? That's, that's we're talking in the billions of angels that will be present carrying the, uh, carrying Jahannam, that will be carrying Jahannam. And when it comes near to the human beings, they will hear, it will be alive. The hellfire is not a, um, Hellfire is very much alive. So they will hear the breathing of the fire, the roars of the fire, and all sorts of terrifying and hideous noises. And the humanity will fall at this point, fall to its knees, just completely scared out of their mind. Even the prophets will become fearful and the innocent will be afraid, such that many of the noble messengers will say, Ya Rabb, nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. 
myself, myself. Because when this, this tremendous nar comes out, it's going to be like something we've never been, never seen before, ever. And so this is the type of thing that in the Quran, Allah talks about people who they spend their time weeping before Allah, asking for protection from the fire, because it's real. Because it's very, very, very real. And so we should try to imagine this moment and force it to get us to a point where we start weeping before Allah. And then hopefully do this regularly. It should not just be done, you know, one time in our life. It should be something we're continuously being scared of this because the one who seeks a type of refuge in Allah in this life regularly, inshallah, will be in his refuge in the next life. And the only one who will not be concerned about himself on that day. There's only one. That's it. And this is the Prophet The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, while everybody else, including the other prophets, is saying, myself, myself. Our moms will be saying, nafsi, nafsi. Moms usually are the ones who never, they always prioritize their children over themselves. They will be saying, nafsi, nafsi. Our fathers, nafsi, nafsi. Our siblings, na it's myself. Nobody is going to care about anyone else. The Prophet ﷺ is going to be saying, Ummati, Ummati, my nation, my nation. Ummati, Ummati, and in one narration, he will advance towards the fire and drive it back from mankind. And it, it has to obey him. It has to obey him. Everything is under all the angels. They understand the maqam of the Prophet ﷺ. Every angel. They know, all know this is Allah's Habib. This, his name is on the throne of Allah. Is on the arsh. So whatever he tells the angels, they listen. And the angels are obviously, these are, these are the, 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 they're serving their Lord by carrying this fire. So this is the station of the Prophet ﷺ and why it's so important to understand his maqam in this life. And to, we'll never understand his maqam, but to try to get closer to him in this, in this life. And then what happens? The reckoning begins. The reckoning is recorded and every creature is given its due, even animals. Even animals. So animals will get their retribution from one another. Like one, it's mentioned in a narration, a goat, the hornless goat will attract, will exact its retribution from the horned goat. So the animals will go back and forth getting this. And until the animals, Allah will tell them, um, uh, become dust. The animals will just go at this point. They'll just go. But then the disbeliever will say, as is, this is in the Quran, the disbeliever will say, would that I were dust. What if I, if I could just be like these animals or they just had to do the retribution and now it's gone, but that's not going to happen for the disbeliever. This should, this should also, we should keep this in mind when we see the type of uh, unadulterated evil that's taking place right now in Palestine and this genocide that's taking place and the way that the American government and the way that the Western governments um, are supporting it. Allah doesn't let people get away with things. That we, sh we should not at all be worried about it. Maybe for a few months, maybe for a few years in this life, that's it. Allah will seize people and his anger will be so intense against these kuffar that we can't even imagine the type of punishment they're going to go through. We cannot even begin to imagine. There are people who Allah has sealed them and he, and they're, being, they're meant to be in the fire, abadan, eternally. Just like there's people who Allah loves and he wants them in Jannah eternally. And so this is what, what, what will, will take place. So all of us, one, one uh, thing that we can do very practically in terms of reflection is to reflect on how we would face the questioning. When Allah asks us about a certain thing, they say, take yourselves to account before you're taken to account. So we just sit in our, in our, in our, in our let's say in our bedroom or, or at home or wherever, and we just say, okay, everything I did today. If Allah asks me about the thing, what am I going to say? If Allah asks me about this, what am I going to say? And alhamdulillah, if we have people in our life who point out the mistakes that we've made, who point out the haram that we've said or the risky things that we've said, and, um, uh, and friends, and this is, a, this is especially the role of, of our spouses. We need to get comfortable in a gentle way with, with, with right, calling uh, that, that pointing, calling each other to goodness, saying, you know what, you, what you said, that probably crossed into backbiting. Like when you say it, 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 right? So sometimes we might be talking about somebody, right? This just happened to me recently. 
talking about a specific situation, trying to like resolve a, a problem that was going on. But that my wife told me after, she's like, you know, you said a, something that was probably a notch beyond what you needed to say to resolve that situation. That was probably backbiting. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming. I completely agree with that, right? That, that I definitely didn't need to say that one thing, um, but I didn't hold the tongue. Right? And so we have, to, we have to ask ourselves and then you, you replay it in your head. You say, you know what? Okay, yeah, that what I said was probably fine. Yeah, okay, but that, no, no, no. I shouldn't have said that one thing about this person, right? Because um, in an attempt to resolve a certain situation, you just are supposed to mention the bare minimum amount of information that we need nothing beyond that right between between let's say two people you're trying to resolve something or whatever it is or discussing something but now when you know that we can make we can we can ask allah's forgiveness and hold ourselves to account right and so sometimes we will get loose with our tongue we'll get loose with our actions and we'll be really we might be good in one area but we might be terrible in another area we need people to help remove these sins this is why the believers we should all love critical feedback. We should love it. We should embrace it. We should want it. We should yearn for it. If we don't like when people give us feedback, some we're just, our nafs has taken us over. That's the reality of it. Why? Because Imam Ghazali, he says that if somebody, if you had a snake tied around you, like a, like a viper coming up around you or a rattlesnake and it's about to coil you and someone comes and like removes that snake or tells you, get that, you have a snake around you and you're like, don't give me, don't tell me anything. I know what I'm doing. What are you, who are you? I can figure it out myself. And then by that time, the snake has killed you or ruined you. That's what he says. He says, bad traits and bad deeds are like, are like scorpions or snakes or these types of, 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 of venomous animals that will harm you. He says, the person who removes that harm from you, even if sometimes it's not the best way that they did it, or if they um, tell you about it, you should be immensely grateful to them. Not like, well, who, what, usually our response is, well, you have 15 other here's a list of all the things you've done wrong instead of, you know what? Yeah, you're totally right. That I, 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 I'm making that mistake. I do say, I do do that. Or like, they'll say, Hey, you're, you're really cheap. You never, you never spend money on that. Like, yeah. You know what? You take a hard look at us. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to work on that because Allah hates, Allah does not like the frugal, the, the miser rather not frugal, but, but, but the, the one who's very, very stingy with their wealth. Right. But if the first time some, anytime someone gives us that feedback, we just can't handle it. We just immediately start to throw disses back at them or, or throw disses at them. That's a problem. And it's going to hurt us on the day of judgment because they, we could, Allah, Allah might even say, you know what, that person, I sent them to tell you something. Don't see it as coming from that person. See it as coming from Allah who's opening up our faults to us. And, and he said, you didn't listen to them. The Sahaba, they would appreciate this. Sayyidina Omar, radiallahu anhu, he would ask the other companions, Tell me, and, and then he would list out, like, what did I do wrong here? What did I do wrong here? What, I, what did I do wrong here? He, they were so worried about themselves. This is, these are the greatest people to ever walk the face of the earth after the prophets. Sayyidina Hudayfa bin Yaman was given knowledge of who the, hip, the, the hypocrites were. Hazrat Omar radiallahu an would beg him, command him, tell him, make him be like, I, am I on the list? I think I'm on the list. You've got to tell me if I'm on the list. This is... Amir al-Mu'minin, Sayyidina Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is buried like steps from the Prophet right next to him, or right next to next to him after Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. But he was worried about this. So they would, they would ask themselves and they would, they would reprimand each other with wisdom. But sometimes gentleness is not the only way. Gentleness is the preferred method. But if it takes a little bit of, to get someone in, to get someone to understand something, right? A little bit of firmness. Sometimes we need that. And uh, and we should usually not be the people applying that firmness. But if someone does it with us, we've all had our times where our parents might have been firm with us, but we needed to learn that lesson. So we should feel grateful when people help us. Re they reveal our faults to us so we can work on them in this life. Because otherwise, we have to work on them. We have to answer to Allah about them on the Day of Judgment. And when we don't, we don't want to have to do that. We don't want to be in that situation. So then he says the next thing that will happen, one will cross the balance, uh, or not cross the balance, one will cross the bridge. So there will be a balance, a mizan, that's resurrected, or uh, that's erected. And Allah says, we set a just balance for the Yom al Qiyamah, that no soul is wronged in anything, even the weight, though it be the weight of a mustard grain, we bring it forth, 
and sufficient are we as reckoners. And he says the weighing on that day, the weighing that day is true. As for those whose scales are heavy, they are the triumphant. As for those whose scales are light, they are those who have lost their souls because of the wrong they used to do. Because of the wrong that, that they used to do. So this mizan, it weighs. And every atom of good that we've done will help tip it in the right side. And everything that we've done that's wrong will tip it on the wrong side. But um, if we've repented from the wrong, there won't be things, inshallah, on the left side or on one side. And if we've done a lot of good, things will start to tip over. But this is where, so, so he says, good and evil deeds are weighed. Those people whose good acts outweigh the bad ones, they're the ones who win, the victors on that day. And the fortunate, while those who, the evil ones, they have lost and failed eternally. So it says that there will be a, people, a group of people who may be in between. And this is mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, that they'll stand between the garden and the fire because they will literally be complete, um, uh, complete um, equality between, between the two. So what's risky in this situation now when if we do, let's say we do good, we're doing good, we're doing good deeds. There are people who get to steal our good deeds from us. The first group is people who we wrong. We spoke bad about. We stole something from. We owe them debts, whatever it is. They just get to take and they take and they take. And so anybody who we've wronged, all of the good that we've done, they have a chance of taking from. If we run out of the good, they now get to give us their evil. So they say, okay, you have no more good left, take my sins. So we could literally spend 70 years doing good deeds and also spend like 20 years talking bad about people. Like we just have a terrible loose tongue. Always, all of those, all of that good is at risk. It's one of the most dangerous sins possible. And same thing with oppress, uh, 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 we we're talking here not about the major oppression. The major oppression has a very different type of accounting. Just even minorly wronging somebody. Right? You just, you know, you know what? I, I did wrong in that situation. Like I should have done something differently. They get to take us to account. So this, there's this, this, this back and forth that takes place on that day. So for the sake of our own good deeds, that's what they say when you backbite somebody, like you must actually, do you like them? Usually not. No, if I'm talking bad about them, I don't like them. Okay, so if you don't like them, why are you giving them your good deeds? It, usually you want to reserve your good deeds. If you have to give them to anybody, you'll give them to the people you love. Not somebody who we don't like. So they say, oh, again, back to the tongue, hold the tongue. The tongue is the source of all evil, or the source of most evil, rather. And then what happens is the, the sirat, the bridge, comes out. And this will be thrown across the fire, and the human beings will have to cross this sirat, the have to cross the bridge. For it will be, uh, it is said in one narration that it's sharper than a sword, narrow, na uh, more narrow than a hair. And that one, again, crosses it with their deeds. The deeds, the amal, they come out again. Sharper than a sword, thinner than a hair. That's, that means there's no walking across that, right? One has to have some other means of getting across that. This is where the deeds come in. Those whose faith was more perfect and who were quicker to obedience, they will be light and they will cross as swiftly as lightning. Lightning doesn't, didn't take any time at the speed of light, essentially. Others will be like the wind, others like birds, others like the best of horses, others like riders, others like strong men burdened by their deeds, others will go on their hands and their knees, and then they will start to tumble and the fire will be trying to grab them. There will be the fire will be trying to grab people, and then people will tumble and the fire will, will take them. And they will be scorched and they'll fall in to the fire. And they'll fall in to the fire. This is the intensity on the day of judgment. Now imagine this is this is a this is not a small scene we're talking about. That as vast as the earth itself, as vast as the universe itself. We're talking about significant scenes here. It's not a small bridge. It's not a it's not it's it's very significant. It's not mentioned in this narration, but another narration, one won't be know when the end of it is. It just keeps going and going and going. <clears throat> then there will be one who will be on the other side. And this will be the Prophet. 
He will be the first to cross amongst the messengers and he will be on the other side saying, oh Allah sallim, sallim, oh Allah save them, save them. He will be making dua for Allah to save people from the fire. And this will be a means of assisting. So people from this ummah, if we are if we are falling, if we're struggling, and then the dua of the Prophet comes in and it just takes us there. It just gets us to the other side. This is the type, again, the role of the Prophet والسلام, cannot be minimized. The day of judgment is his, it, it is the day to understand who he actually is, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. There is no safety if one does not have this, of course, their relationship with Allah, but for this ummah, the safety goes through the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is given the safety from beginning the day of judgment to serving as the advocate for this ummah, to helping all of humanity even beyond this ummah. And then after this point, the believers will reach the Houd, the lake, the, the river, the, the lake of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they will drink from it. And, and some will drink directly from his hands and others will drink in other ways, and they will their, their thirst will entirely go away. And its water will be whiter than milk, more fragrant than musk, and sweeter than honey. And it will have channels bringing water from the river of Kothar, which is the, the river of, that's given to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, that's length and breadth will be the journey of a whole month. That's how significant we're talking here. Allah says, Sayyidina Muhammad. Um, and, and, and so whoever drinks one of these, uh, the, these sips, they will never have thirst again. Um, and so the ulama, they've differed whether this will be before the bridge, before the sirat or after, but he's saying here um, that it, it's, it's possible it could be either. Uh, and, and so this is again, the type of gifts that are given to the believers. Because at this point, if one is given this, inshallah, they are safe, right? And then we finally get to a point and then we'll, we'll I think, finish this section and end. Um, where the shafa'a is permitted, the intercession is permitted. Intercession meaning people helping other people who couldn't help themselves. So the first is given to the Prophet ﷺ. He's given the shafa'at the shifa al-kubra. We make this dua after the adhan. We ask Allah, Allahumma rabba hadha ta'wa ta'ima salatin qa'ima hadihi Sayyidina Muhammad al-wasila ta that to make, to give him the wasila, right? To give him the shifa. Um, so, this is the first shifa that's given. And then it's given to others as well. The other prophets have an intercession. The Siddiqeen have an intercession. The true saints, the ulama, the righteous, and other believers, each according to their rank with Allah. So there, it's mentioned in one narration that there will be a man from this ummah who will intercede for a significant number of people, a number as large as the amount of flocks of, uh, of, a, of a specific tribe um, so we're talking here, I think this is in like the hundreds of thousands or millions that will be able to enter if their intercession is accepted, they will be accepted, inshallah, into Jannah because of the intercession of these people. And others will be able to intercede for just one or two people and others for nobody. So the first to be inter to give an intercession is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, I am the first to intercede in one narration and the first to be permitted intercession. And he will keep interceding multiple times. It's not one time. So it will be to begin the day of judgment and so on and so forth. And he said, I shall continue to intercede until I am granted the release of people who had already been designated for Jahannam. So that's who he's worried about. The Prophet Islam on this day, he's worried about his ummah who is going, is determined to go to the fire. Who's, and so the, 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 the big sinners, the big sinners, and his intercession is going to be the means of saving um, that, that saving us. And he says, I will continue to intercede until it will be said to him, you have, you have left no trace for your Lord's wrath in your nation. Meaning there's nobody left for the punishment of Allah in this ummah. Among some of the intercessions will be somebody in this ummah who already will have entered the fire and then they will be taken out of it. Already entered in and then taken out, right? And so um, uh, uh, until at some point, at some point he asks Allah, will you permit me to intercede for anyone who ever said la ilaha illallah one time? Just ever said it, la ilaha illallah. Allah says, 
to do that is not for you, but by my izza, by my might, I shall not let those who believe me believed in me one day in their life be like those who did never believed in me at all. And and so the 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 the, the assumption is then that they are removed. But this could be after a long period of time. Right? So we want to be amongst the people in the first, first, first category. That's what we should always make dua for, right? To be in the first, in first place, as close to the Prophet as possible. And there will be people amongst the Ummah who are helping him. It's, some, it's mentioned that his family is helping him at the Kothar, at his lake, is helping him at the Hod. And so there will be people who are close to him, who are helping him. We want to be, if we, Allah gives us the ability to serve him in this life, we ask that Allah give us the ability in this life and the next life to serve the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So the, uh, it continues until finally one gets to a point where um, it becomes clear to all of humanity that not a single injustice goes unnoticed by Allah. This is the day of judgment, the day of justice, the day where debts fall due, the day where wrongs are, 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 are corrected. And so in one hadith, um, uh, it's mentioned, injustice is said to be of three kinds. One that is never forgiven by Allah, which is shirk. One that is never overlooked by Allah, people's injustice to each other. Uh, and one that could be overlooked by Allah, a person's injustice to themselves, meaning what's between them and their lords. When we sin, we're actually wronging ourselves. We're oppressing ourselves. That's a type of, uh, of, of injustice that we do to ourselves. But if I wrong someone else, Allah, can't, Allah doesn't overlook that until that situation is rectified. And then if somebody commits shirk, that's not overlooked either. So there's significant times now where injustices are rectified and this, this question um, uh, is asked. And one, in one narration, Prophet asked, do you know who the bankrupt are in this ummah? They said, the bankrupt people, according to us, are th they don't have any money, no, no property, no money. They're, they're, right? And he said, no, the bankrupt of my ummah are those who come on Yom Al-Qiyamah, having prayed, having fasted, having given zakat. But then they insulted this one. They slandered that one. They hurt this one. They beat this one up. They took this one's wealth. He said, one person will take from their good deeds here, one person will take from their good deeds here until all of their good deeds are exhausted, until then they start giving them some of their sins, and then they'll be thrown into the fire. This is the category for the believers, which should be one of extreme trepidation, because we all hope that our deeds are being accepted if we're doing ibadah. But there's one thing between being accepted, and there's another thing between actually being a means of admitting us into, um, uh, into, into Jannah. Uh, and so... This is, this is important to, to keep in mind. We're, we won't go over this section in too much detail, but just given what, the times that we're living in, one should never have any doubt that Allah will, will hold people to account. It's just not, it's, 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 Allah is too great and Allah is too just of a Lord and, and also too generous of a Lord to not take people to account, especially for the oppression that they've done. Our focus should be on helping people as much as we can in this life and on turning to Allah in dua as much as we can. But to not get overly worried, you know, there's this, 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 this world court, they call it, the International Court of Justice, which, which is kind of run by the Zionists, like, most likely, right? N none of these courts actually have any jurisdiction to do anything because people don't have to listen to them. Allah doesn't work like that. There's no, in the ultimate divine court of justice, there's nobody who can say, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. Yeah, I'm going to ignore this law. Yeah, I'm going to ignore this rule. Nobody can say that. Then they can't even stand before God for a second denying what's, what's about to happen. Because the judgment in and of itself, that just when, when someone is being brought to justice, when the trial begins before Allah, already their punishment has started. It's already going to be in such Brutal, difficult circumstances. Not to mention the thousands of years before in the grave where there could have been punishment happening. Not to mention the resurrection itself. Not to mention the intense heat on the day of judgment and sweat and thirst and pain that one could be in. And then this, this, this begins. All the criminals, 
all will stand before Allah. Their trial will be before Allah. So what, if, if they evade, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying this mainly just because sometimes, I don't know about everybody else, but I look at everything that's going on and you kind of are like, what is happening? How are these people getting away with this thing after this thing? After, and is there going to ever be a time where there's ever any accountability? And then you have to remember that the ultimate accountability will always happen. And it will be with our Lord. We need to focus when it comes to our own selves that we are, inshallah, in a good state. And then when it comes to our fellow brothers and sisters and our fellow believers, that we do whatever we can to help them, inshallah, in this life. But to not doubt for a second that all of the difficulties and the adversities and the suffering that's going on will be, will be a means of immense recompense for the believers on the Day of Judgment. And every second, millisecond of, diff, of, 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 of wrong or evil someone is going to do is going to be a means of immense punishment for them on the Day of Judgment. We ask Allah for salamat and afia. And uh, so with that, um, we'll end if there's any questions. The last thing we'll mention actually. In our religion, there's no concept of like a free pass where you know, we have this in, in the Christianity, this idea that you can do whatever you want. Jesus died for your sins. It's very important to learn what happens on the day of judgment. So we understand that accountability is real, right? Because most of the um, thought that exists now in, in, in communities, even who are religious, but not Muslim, there's kind of this element of, of evading accountability. and We don't have that. So Alhamdulillah that we've been given the details to understand that. <laughs> With that, if there's any questions, um, uh, there's one online. I am a revert Muslim. My parents are devout Christians. How can I find peace? They are unfortunately not encouraging of my Islam. They are still strong in their faith. Alhamdulillah. Um, so there's a couple of things that we've been advised uh, to do. Uh, in, in this specific situation. First of all, know that you are in the ranks of many of the Sahab, uh, companions of the Prophet Sallam who converted to Islam, or reverted to Islam, and their family was not Muslim. So the first thing that you spend your time, as much time as you can, is making du'a for them. It might take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I know people who've been who are Muslim for 40 years, 50 years, and then like their parents took their shahada on their deathbed, right, when they were 90 something. Um, even though their entire life they did not accept the, 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 or they did not embrace the religion. So keep making dua for them because ultimately what matters is the eternal life. The second thing is to know that their encouragement or discouragement of your Islam is not, um, it, 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 what, when it affects you psychologically to know that Allah is giving you an immense reward for every minute of striving that you're doing, but your ultimate validation that you're seeking is from Allah. Because growing up, we grow up seeking validation from our parents. But the minute our parents are actually doing something wrong, let's say they accept their, their principles or their aqidah or their belief is wrong, and we are on the right side, we now no longer just kind of look for that type of validation. And so to know you are on the haq, you are on the truth without a doubt. And you have to do whatever you can, thirdly, to, with good akhlaq, good character, to show them that you are the best child that you can be and Islam is making you like that and so this could be in the form of um, the way you treat them the way you take care of them the way you take care of the, the home when you're there the way you get them gifts and so on and so forth such that they see I know many people who there they transformed so much when they became Muslim that their whole family started wondering like what happened to them and when they realized there was the Islam it got them interested in learning about um, in learning about their about the deen yeah. So, uh, louder, I can't hear you.
Yeah, good question. The question is, why does Allah test those he loves more? And why do they go through more tribulation than others? Is that the essence of it? Yeah, okay. Um, so the first thing, this is actually a core part of our belief to understand how God's metaphysical laws work um, that are not actually in alignment with how our relationship with other human beings work. So what we want to prevent ourselves from doing is first we have to kind of unlearn our understanding of, uh, not, not necessarily unlearn it, but not apply our understanding of love in this dunya to how Allah's understanding of love works in eternity. The two are very, 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 very different. Um, so that's the first. The second is then start to understand what metaphysical laws and principles is Allah applying. One of them is this, this exact one that you mentioned, that Allah, that the Prophet said in one narration, that uh, the prophets are tested the most. And then those closest to them and then those closest to them. And whoever Allah loves, when Allah loves a believer, he afflicts them. He afflicts them. He sends tribulation upon tribulation, upon sickness, upon financial difficulty. The reason is mentioned in the Quran because Allah created life and death as a test. The whole point of this dunya is to be a test. If we're living in comfort and in ease and in goodness, that's a blessing from Allah. It's also a test in some certain ways though. Because the Sahaba would be more worried about their life when they had ease going on than when they had difficulty. Ease could also very much be a sign that Allah doesn't love somebody. It doesn't have to be a sign, but it could very much be a sign. But tribulation, especially to the believers, is a sign of, uh, for the most part, of Allah's love. Why does it work like that? First, because the, the, the whole point of this life is to be a test. So Allah says, um, uh, in, in the Quran, He says, that do they think that they can say that we believe and then they will not be put to the test? As not, he said, nope. We will test them surely just like we tested those who came before them to see which one of them is true in faith. The concept here is that it's very easy to believe when everything is good. Yeah, it's all good. Come to the masjid, eat the giant iftars, the big iftar parties go to other people's houses, you know, exchange gifts, have tea, be like, alhamdulillah, all this stuff. Right? It's all, it's all, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but it could very much be lip service. But the minute the tribulation comes, where is that person's iman? The Prophet said in one narration, or it might be from Sayyidina Ali, that patience is to faith like the head is to the body. The body, if it doesn't have a head, is functionless. Like the, it will not be able to function because the brain is here, the capacity for thinking, as well as the majority of the senses are in the head. Patience cannot be examined until difficulty comes. So that's the second concept. The third is when Allah wants to raise someone in degrees in the next life, he will test them and test them because their deeds are not measuring up, but their patience in the test will measure, will, will be a means of, re, of, of, of giving them that, um, that delta between where Allah wants them to be and where they actually are. Uh, so, if someone keeps in mind this idea of eternity, it becomes a lot easier to understand the tests in this life. But we have to unlearn, number one, the Western Christian, Judeo-centric, Christian-centric prosperity gospel, which has been taught in this society, which is if you're a good person, good things happen. If you're a bad person, bad things happen. Not, that's not how God works. If you're a good person, difficulty can ha will happen. It's mentioned in the Quran. And if you're a bad person, a lot of things can happen, but Allah will actually many times give them immense good and riches and wealth and luxury in this life. And then the whole eternity, they're doomed and they're, they're incomplete. That, 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 and that, um, like Fir'aun, for example, as, as, as an example. Uh, so that's one the way one, one unlearns that. And the second thing is to understand that everything we do for a few days, a few months, like somebody has immense tribulation that lasts for a period of time in this life, it could be the means of setting up their entire akhirah in the next life. They couldn't have done, they could not have achieved that without that difficulty, right? So usually you'll notice ibadah in our, in, in our religion has a difficulty with it. Fasting, not easy, requires patience. Why did Allah want us to fast? Why don't we just, why didn't he just say just eat and drink all the time, right? And just like, and because he does say you can eat and drink and enjoy, but he says, no, there's going to be period. I'm going to see how patient are you, right? Why do we have to pray five times a day? instead of like one time a week, like many other religions just kind of do. 
Because Allah wants to see, are you going to actually put it? It's not easy to pray that many times a day, let alone if one is doing the extra prayers. So our religion is about work and it's about tests and it's about patience and it's about steadfastness. It's about endurance. It's about um, seeing really what you're made of is kind of the end of it. It's like, see, Allah wants to see, what are you made of? Because I made you of a specific type. I want to see, are you actually going to exemplify that type? So hopefully that helps a little bit. And we, we always just keep reminding ourselves of this because this is very easy to understand conceptually, but very hard to understand metaphysically. So we just keep reminding ourselves until it really sinks in. Yeah, yeah did you have a question? Sorry, it's just hard to hear because the heater's on, yeah. Uh, regarding f Fajr? Yes. <laughs> Traditionally, um, uh, many of the Muslims would, would actually, some would pray immediately. The Hanafis in their masajid, they would actually delay a little bit till like about 6.15, 6.20. So more people could come out and be awake and participate in the congregation. Um, but you, what's virtuous is to pray earlier. You avoid, try, if we don't, if, if we can, we try not to pray in the last like five, three to four minutes, especially not the last like 10 seconds. But if we have to, we do it, right? If we just were late, we missed our, we slept through our alarm, but we're, we're still on time, we're still good. But you have until that minute that the sun rises, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Shahir. Good question. The question first is about, about um, sins we've done, which we forgot about. There's a few ways to do this. First, the dua to make is actually literally the dua, Ya Allah, forgive me for the sins I, that I know of and that I don't know of, that I remember and that I don't remember. But for all the sins I've ever done that you know, of, there's not a um, specific like Arabic formula one has to use. You could just do it in English, right? So that's a perfect dua to make. Ya Allah, just forgive me for anything I've done. You do that frequently. Second thing is the more istighfar one makes, like if you're just saying astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, sometimes you might not be saying astaghfirullah for a specific sin you did. You're just doing a general istighfar for whatever you've done. And so you make the intention, Ya Allah, anything I've done today, tomorrow, or, or, or yesterday, uh, uh, a year ago, throughout my life, I'm just asking you for forgiveness from this. The third is when one goes to hajj or does a major uh, toba, repentance, you don't have to remember everything. The assumption is it's all wiped clean. Or when one gives birth for the mothers, when they, in addition to the Hajj, when one gives birth, they emerge just like the newborn baby. Everything is wiped clean um, uh, for 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 the mother when uh, when birth is given. So that's 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 an that's an example of 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 um, the general forgiveness. There's another hadith which mentions. Anyone who says, um, subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al -adeem, I believe it's 70 or 100 times, like at nighttime, you know, right before bed or something. Their sins will be forgiven, even if they're as vast as the foam of the sea. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of foam in the sea and a lot of sins that are forgiven just for saying that. So those are formulas one can use to try and get the forgiveness. Uh, the second question was about those who, the ch whose children have passed away before puberty. Will it be permitted, um, or will they be uh, the same same situation for them, uh, uh, for non-Muslims as it is for Muslims? 
According to the text here, it says it has come down to us that Muslim children who die before puberty will be permitted to give their parents um, to drink. The text doesn't say uh, non-Muslims, so I, I, I'll go. We'll go with what the text says, but Allah knows best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you be praying at that time? Let's say our students wake up and add to some, like if it's late or something, right? Um, the sun has been like something that's close to me. Um, I've heard some is like something happens and you can't pray right at that time. Like rapid something, like rapid right now. Yeah. So according to um, most of the madahib, what you do if you wake up, like let's same thing today. Let's say it's 651 is the sunrise and you wake up at 651, okay? And they're like, I gotta still make wudu, I missed it. Now you have to wait 15 minutes. It's usually 12 minutes sufficient, 15 according to some of the ulama, for the sun to be done rising. This is this is the shuruq period in which it's generally speaking not permitted to pray um, because this is when the people who used to worship the sun, they would pray. So you wait 15 minutes, you would wait until about 7.05 and then you would pray your qada fajr, right? And then you would pray your um, there are some some of the schools um, are shorter time than that, uh, but usually it's about twelve to, to to fifteen minutes, and then that's when you would pray. So you the the the, the best thing one would do in that instance, let's say that that actually happened to somebody, you'd stay in that spot, ideally make wudu, get ready, and then ask Allah to forgive us for delaying and for missing the fajr, and then you'd pray the qada of the Fajr, and I would recommend one also prays an extra two rakah of for asking Allah for forgiveness um, as well, that, that we miss the the, the um, actual time in which the prayer is due, because now we have incurred a sin for having the do, doing the delay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, also, I've also heard that like, after you pray the Fajr, you can't pray until after the set, yeah. according to the Madahib, yeah. Yeah. yeah, according to most of the Madahib, there's a, there is an exception in, in, in um, one or two opinions, but the sunnah is prayed before the fard, with rare exception if somebody consistently prays their sunnah and then one, it's like they're coming to the masjid, let's say the masjid prayer is 6.15 and you wake up at like 6 and by the time you make wudu, etc., you get to the masjid at 6.15, you can pray your sunnah at home or at the masjid. In rare exception, can you do it afterwards? One definitely cannot make it a habit of doing so afterwards. But if someone is praying at home, there would really be no reason to pray the sunnah afterwards. Um, one always needs to pray the sunnah before. Um, and if you miss the time of the sunnah, like if, again, 647, you've got to just pray your fard, uh, then you miss the, the sunnah. Yeah. The sunnah of fajr, according to one narration, is better than the dunya and everything in it. It's a big, it's a very important sunnah to pray. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Great question. So, um, someone converts to Islam and their children, and the question is at what point would they either have to take shahada or would they just be considered Muslim, right? Good question. Hey, do you mind if I ask how old are they? Or like how old were they when you converted? Oh, oh okay, got it. Oh, mashallah. Um, so... Are they are they after like 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 twenties teens? Okay, got it. So um, for the daughter who's younger, for the eight year old, let's say somebody who has is, is still a ways off from like the full age of discernment in Islam. The discernment comes at puberty. Um, they could essentially be raised Muslim, right? Because they have yet to hit that age of discernment. All you need to be considered to, uh, when you're raising uh, uh, a Muslim and you have not hit puberty, is are you raised according to the laws of Islam? So are you taught the importance of prayer? 
are you taught to believe in Allah first and foremost? Are you taught to believe in the Messenger of Allah? Right. So you accept that once they like conceptually accept that, and then the and then are they taught the importance of the prayer? Even if they don't pray, but they're taught the importance of it and the zakat and the fasting and the pillars of Islam, as well as the belief in the books, the belief in the the Quran, the belief in the books that came before the Quran, the belief in the Yom Al Qiyamah and the Day of Judgment. Um, what we would call the articles of faith, the tenets of faith. As long as they're taught those things, they are effectively um, Muslim. If someone has hit the age of discernment, right, which could come at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, usually in that range, now they have to accept that kind of like willingly on their own. And once they do, whether their parents teach them, they're like, yeah, this makes sense to me. It would be best if they actually took the shahada, right? They entered into Islam formally and said the testimony of faith. Um, with with a understanding of course of like what they are what they are saying but for the one who's younger they're just kind of growing up into it yeah. does that make sense yeah. and we can follow up anytime if you like okay i think that's uh those are all the questions online i believe at yeah, the time of this class is 7 p.m pacific time uh wednesday and um oh how do you know if something is a test or punishment Uh, you'll never know for sure. The key is your response. Um, so nobody for sure knows when, when, if I'm going through a sickness, is Allah upset at me? Or is this because he's elevating me in degrees? Or why, why, why is, quote unquote, why is this happening, right? Um, the way in which you respond is the key to unlocking the pleasure of Allah or the displeasure of Allah. So if you respond with anger and with being upset at Allah for that test, even if it was or wasn't a punishment, you're now about to get, we could get punished because of our response. If you respond with sabr, with patience or with submission, that's a sign of Allah's love because Allah says, Allah yuhib basabirin, Allah loves the people of patience and Allah is with the people of patience. So it's a sign of reward. And it's usually hopefully a sign that of, of goodness um, uh, in, in, in that action. Um, so we got that test. But it was a, Allah wanted us to respond in a certain way. We did respond in that way. And so now, inshallah, we are uh, given the reward for that. But you'll never kind of exactly know why certain things are happening. Right. With that, um, we're well over time. So apologies. We had to start late today because of the speakers. Um, one thing, quick thing. Saturday night, we're in the uh, month of Sha'ban. Saturday night is known as the Laylat and Nisfa Sha'ban, the 15th of Sha'ban. Um, according to uh, too many narrations to ignore, it's one of the most virtuous nights in um, our deen. Uh, it's a night of immense forgiveness. It's a night where du'a is accepted. It's a night where one should turn to Allah asking for relief for themselves, for this ummah, um, and, and seek Allah's forgiveness. Uh, there's a little bit of difference of opinion about the about the night and the validity of it, but the vast majority of scholars um, were on the, the of the opinion that it is a virtuous night and one should do ibadah. So if one can, one should try to Pray extra uh, and wake up Salat al-Tahajjud. And then there's also virtue in fasting on that next day, on Sunday, um, inshallah. So just wanted to mention that. So we'll end with the du'a. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim. Mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Nuri kasari. Wa manadhi kaljari. Wa ilma'ini wa dhikuli atwari. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Ya nur. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna tamwa kal akhirati hasna tamwa kina adab al-nar. ربنا أفرغ لنا صبرا وثبت قدامنا ونصرنا للقوم الكافرين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا فتح يا مبين يا الله we ask that you give an opening to our brothers and sisters in Palestine that you give them شفاء that you give them healing that you provide for them يا رزاق that you provide for them that you give them food to eat يا الله that you give them water to drink that you give them shelter that you give all of those suffering in Palestine and in Gaza and in Rafah and in all of the places, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in the Muslim world, that you give them immense relief and faraj and that you take care of them and that you give them victory and that you give them assistance and that you give them the highest of stations in Jannat al-Firdaus al-A'la with the Prophet sallallahu for everything that they are enduring and that you accept those who have passed away as martyrs, Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you for comprehensive goodness and afia for this 
Ummah for the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We ask that you give Faraj and relief and victory and assistance and goodness and rectification in all ways inwardly and outwardly to this entire Ummah and that you allow us to live up to the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and live up to his teachings Ya Rabbil Alameen We ask you that you rectify our life that you prepare us for the Day of Judgment Yawm Al-Qiyamah in the best of ways and that you allow us to implement everything it is that we are learning and that you allow us Ya Rabbil Alameen to be in the foremost of the rows on the Day of Judgment in first place Place, Ya Rabbil Alameen with the Prophets and with the Saints and with the Noble Ones Fi Khair Wal Lutf Wal Afiyah and we ask that you remove our tribulations and our and, and our difficulties and that you bless our life with Afiyah and with ease and with well-being and with shukr and with hamd and with expansion Ya Rabbil Alameen we ask you for everything good the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for and we ask you for protection for everything he asked protection from us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Rabbi Shahi Sadri wa yisalli amri Wa ahlul uqtatan min lasani Yaqa wa qawli Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Nuri kasari wa madadi kaljari Wa jama'ini wa fukuli atwari Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ya nur Alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, everybody's doing well. Um, so we are in our final two sections of this book. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's been very, very fast. I think this is the sixth or seventh uh, class that we're doing on the text, and we'll be done, inshallah, next week, um, if Allah gives us the ability in, in life, and uh, to wrap up before the month of <clears throat> Ramadan. So what Imam al-Haddad, the author of this text, we're looking into the text of the lives of man, which is really the journey of the soul, the journey of the human soul from the time before we were born uh, all the way to the time that we die, then to the time that we face the questioning from Allah on the day of judgment, to the time that we end up in our eternal life. So he's broken this up into multiple stages of life that the human being goes through. The human being experiences many stages of life. It's not just one stage of life. We are now getting to the section where uh, today we'll cover the final, final, final stage of life, which is the eternal stage. It's the goal of everything we've hopefully been working towards in this life. Before we do that, we'll finish up on the section on Yom Al-Qiyamah, which is the day of judgment. A, as we discussed last time, it is a day which is <clears throat> can be made easy for the one who Allah chooses to make it easy for. But for the vast majority of humanity, it's a very, very, very difficult Life. It's not really a day. It's a life. It's it can be up to fifty thousand years. It can be thousands and thousands of years long. And that's not um, for for in ancient times, people would live up until they were a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. So it's it, it's it, it's really the modern human being um, in the last phase of humanity where lifespans have become shortened. Um, and so it's very conceivable for somebody's life to be thousands of years long, especially if you juxtapose it with the people of ancient times. So we don't want to have that type of situation on the Day of Judgment with a difficult day. We want it to be easy, swift, and easy entry into Jannah. So we discussed a few of the things that we can do, um, and we'll continue to discuss more, um, and then we'll get into the next section. So the first is the Prophet ﷺ says, for oh, the one who relieves a, uh, a Muslim's distress, a stressful situation for a Muslim in this world, Allah will grant them relief from one of the distresses of the Day of Judgment. So the Day of Judgment has many, many, many stressful moments and stressful situations from the heat to the thirst, to the stress, to the tension, to the anxiety, to the worry, all of these different types of things, to the nakedness that the human being is in, to the completely raw, decrepit, worried state that the, the humanity is in. One of those distresses is, re is, is relieved by doing what? By relieving the stress of a Muslim in this life. So this is why the people of Allah, they are always looking after, how can I help this person? How can I help this person? How can I take care of the need of this person? And they, they, when people bring needs to them, they immediately try to solve those needs. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's this, this idea of being in the service of, of, of the ummah and of humanity at large. This is a core part of our religion to be in service of other people, to take care of other people, to help other people, to take care of our community and, our, and of our society. And it's unfortunately something that um, the masses as Muslims, we've many of us, we've forgotten this. So 
this is um, one of the ways to get relief. And then he says, whoever shields a Muslim will be shielded by Allah in this world and in the hereafter. Um, and we have other narrations which mention veiling the faults of a believer and Allah will veil your faults. So if you get into a situation where you see something wrong about somebody, don't expose that wrong about, about them to someone else. Don't go to your friend and be like, yeah, that person, like, yeah, he's, he's super lazy. Like I kicked it with him the other day, doesn't do anything, like doesn't just lazy, right? Or like sleeps all day, like, whatever wrong we see. No, 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 no. Not only is that backbiting, but it's revealing the faults about somebody, which now, okay, Allah says, okay, it's totally fair game now for me to reveal your faults versus the one who veils the faults of others. Allah says, you're not going to be more generous than me. You veil their faults, I'll veil your faults. I'll veil more faults because Allah is <clears throat> Al-Kareem, the most generous. So this is one way actually for us to really see our, um, our spiritual experience in this world is to really think about it with regards to what Allah will do with us. What we do to others, that's what's going to be done to us in that life, many, many ways. Right? So there, there's mentioning the one who... You, the, the one who is merciful in this life, Allah will be merciful to them. The one who forgives often, don't. If, if we want Allah to forgive us, we have to be people who forgive other people. We can't always hold on to everything someone else does to us and be, be the person who says, no, I'm never going to let it go and never forgive you. And then say, yeah, Allah, forgive me for my wrongs. That doesn't really work. Check out. Because why would, that, why would, why would Allah do something that, that, that we ourselves are holding ourselves to such a low standard, right? So we have to, Keep those those type in mind. So this is a very helpful concept. So relieving the need of the believer, the stress of the believer. There's another narration which mentions the reward for the person who re who relieves the need of a Muslim. It's more um, ajr, more reward for them to take care of the need of a, of their brother or sister than to spend multiple months in itikaf in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, in my masjid, meaning, <clears throat> what's itikaf? Itikaf is done in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Uh, usually it's a spiritual seclusion where you're getting a lot of reward for just being secluded and focusing entirely on Allah, right? There's very, very minimal interactions and the Prophet ﷺ would do this in, in Ramadan in the last 10 nights. He said, two months of itikaf in my masjid, it's, you get more reward for taking care of the need of a believer than to do that. So now imagine, what about the need of our parents? and of our siblings and so on and so forth. Like if our parents say, hey, I need your help. And we're like, no, no, I'm too busy. I gotta do something. Well, think about the, the, the right that our parents have and then the right that the, the reward that we would get for doing that. Let alone if our, this could be as simple as someone says, hey, I need a ride to the airport. Uh, and before we say, yeah, take Uber, you know, and pay $95 to take Uber. Uh, before we say that, just, you know, yeah, sure, I'll help you out. I'll take care of your need, like no problem. And, 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 and go out of our way adjust our schedule if it's possible, right? Not, not, not taking on undue hardship, but to adjust our schedule to take care of the need. If someone is stressed out, they need, they need to talk to you. They, they call you or they text you and say, hey, can you talk for a few minutes? I just need someone to talk to. Trying to say, hey, yeah, like, let, let me call you in 20 minutes. Let me call you in a few hours. Let me call you tonight. Let me find some time out of my schedule, my day to make time for your need. Because Islam is a religion of taking, of, of serving others, not of serving the nafs. That's not our religion. The Western society is a society and their ethos is all about the self. Individualistic society, individualistic, even the concept of the selfie, they invented it but just to be about yourselves, right? At least the uh, traditional pictures were like 10, 15 people in the picture. And now it's just you and your face and that's it. And it's all about the nafs. It's all about the self. This is not the way of the religion. The, re the religion is the way of how do I help other people? How do I take care of other people? How do I serve other people? And so this is an incentive that Allah is giving. Whoever takes care of the distress or relieves the distress of a Muslim, Allah will, re will relieve their distress on the day of judgment. What if, so then what of the people who are constantly looking and finding ways to take care of other, other people, right? And, and, and so on. That, that, that inshallah, that those people will be the, um, amongst those who are, uh, their distress is regularly relieved. Then um, there's various other, uh, other hadith here, but we'll, we'll continue on to just a few of them. Where Allah will ask the believers, the Prophet says that I will tell you the first thing that Allah will say to the believers on the day of judgment. <clears throat> and the first thing they will say to him. And they responded, please do, Ya Rasulullah. He said, he will ask the believers, were you eager to meet me? And they will say, yes, yes. 
O Lord. And he will say, why? And they will say, we hoped for your mercy, forgiveness, and good pleasure. And he will then say, I shall make my mercy certain to be given to you because you were eager to meet me and you had this hope in me and I'm not going to let you down with your hope. So a lot of our interactions with Allah, we can't measure them purely by what we our actions. A lot of them have to go with what's, what's called our aspiration, meaning what we would ideally hope for and want because our actions will never measure up. We'll always fall short. But if we say, Ya Allah, I'm trying. I did like a little bit, but I know you're generous. So you you make up the rest and give me all the reward. It, Allah will do it, inshallah. Why? Because he says, the in, the Prophet said, the intention of the believer is greater than the action of the believer. And so the, the, and the and all the intentions you make right now, you get the reward for them just by making the intention. And then when you do the good deed, you get 10 times the reward. Versus if you intend to do a sin, you get no bad deeds for intending to do a sin as long as you don't, we don't do the sin. So this is what's called the ibadah of the heart. Meaning you have the ibadah of the limbs, which is I'm going to pray to rakat. Very important. Then you have the worship of the heart, which is what do you think of Allah? How do you approach Allah? When Allah does something to you, how do you think of and respond to it? Just at the heart level. Because half of our worship is just happening in the unseen in our own minds, right? Like something bad happens to us, we might be really frazzled internally, but before we let out, you know, a curse word or, or flipping out about it, we might be able to contain ourselves internally. And that's the ibadah of the heart. It's called sabr, patience. Patience, you can't really see if someone's being patient. It's not that easy to see, but their heart will have it. Similarly, the heart can have hopes and it can have good, a good opinion of Allah, which is to say, Ya Allah, uh, I only think well of you. I know you're only going to do good for me and for this ummah. And when we say good, we don't mean good in one life because this life is one of how many lives that we've been talking about? It's one of at least five lives. So the, the believer's worldview is expansive beyond the life of the dunya. This will unlock major openings in our understanding of why certain things happen in the world and, and, and why certain things happen in our life. Because our, we're taught eternity and the akhirah are kept in mind in our worldview. But for the disbeliever, it's all about this dunya. It's all about what happens in this world. So we can't understand, or uh, it's not possible for someone like that to understand why certain things happen. Um, and and, and uh, tribulation, I think there was a question last time about why do people have tribulation? Why do we have difficulty? Because the only way to achieve ranks in the next life, one of the only ways to achieve those ranks is the patience that's exemplified during difficulty. If one doesn't get an opportunity to exemplify that patience, they can't achieve that rank. If you never get a chance to get the test and get a grade on the test, you can never get the, the, the score and the, the, the um, accomplishment that comes with that, right? So there, the test happens and then the response happens. So this is part of the <clears throat> interaction of the believer in this in this life. So for us, what we have to do based on these narrations is we do our best to act and then we have a lot of hope in Allah. And your hope is strengthened in the private dialogues that one has with their Lord, the du'as that one makes, the conversations that one has when you're just alone with Allah and saying, Ya Allah, please just take it easy on me. Be merciful to me. I make a lot of mistakes. That's always a better way to approach Allah with humility than to be like, Ya Allah, I'm doing everything. I'm so great. I'm so amazing. Look at how much I do. But why are you doing this to me? A lot of people, they subtly do this. They have a, Ya Allah, I did this, 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 and this. So then why didn't I get this? Oh, that's not, that's not how we approach Allah. We approach Allah with humility. Ya Allah, I tried, but even my trying falls short because I'm so, my mind is everywhere. My thoughts are everywhere. I don't do things in the, the most, most perfect way that you would want me to. But please have mercy on me and have, 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 have uh, um, uh, uh, that relieve me and, uh, in the next life and in this life of difficulty. Allah responds well to that. This is because this is how the slave is supposed to approach the Lord. We are slaves of Allah. Whether we understand that spiritually or not, that's what we are at the end of the day. We want to really achieve the reality of that. Um, and, and, and this is why actually the sinner, 
who feels the wrong, the serious remorse and, and, and weight of the sin that they did, and they approach Allah with that remorse in mind, is nearer than the, the, the person of ibadah and worship who is highly arrogant before their Lord and also arrogant before the sinner, saying, look at you, you did this, astaghfirullah, and just all sorts of just a very, a very, very arrogant approach to Islam. And then they just, they think that in their heart, I'm worthy of such and such things spiritually. No, 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 you're not, we're not worthy of anything. Allah didn't have to give us anything if he didn't want to. And there's no, nobody deserves anything. Otherwise, it, it, the, the world and the tribulations that happen in the world don't make sense why this person is tried and why we're not tried. This is all in Allah's divine plan. So we never approach Allah with arrogance. Ever. And we never approach believers with arrogance. And if we ever fall into that, we should say sorry to them and we should apologize before our Lord. This is one of the main, um, uh, one of the main uh, things that happens in, in our communities many times is people approach each other with arrogance and then they push people away from Islam. Um, and, and, and our religion is one that's supposed to welcome people regardless of the sins that that person has done, like the method, which is the methodology of the Prophet something. So then we have another hadith which mentions that the people, somebody amongst the people of the fire, of, the, of Jahannam. So now at this point, the day of judgment is where the decision is made to, it's revealed to us, where, where, which, which way are we going? Are we going in to heaven or are we, are we and we seek refuge from Allah or are we going to Jahannam? This is the, 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 the it's, 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 the decision is, is shown to us. One of the things that will happen is somebody amongst the people of the fire who, will, who had been living the most enjoyable, luxurious life in this world will be brought on the day of judgment. And he will dip one finger into the fire. One finger, not a body, not a limb. One finger. And he will then be asked, oh, son of Adam, have you ever seen any goodness at all or any pleasure ever come to you? And he will reply, no. By Allah, no. And so this is now also an important concept for us to, to, to keep in mind because many, many people in the times of the Ummah, the Ummah as Muslims right now, we are, we, are, we are not on top like we used to be in the time of the Ottoman Empire and in the time of uh, generally the Islamic, the Islamic empires, which had a substantial portion of control and power in the world. Right now the Ummah, from that perspective outwardly, is struggling. So the question often comes, well, this person does so much wrong and they do this haram and this haram and this haram, but they have like, you know, they have a Lamborghini and a Mercedes and they live in this giant house. Everything is easy for them. You know, they have a private jet, they fly first class, whatever it is. Like there's this concept of life and, and they're famous and they have this, but like they're always doing that. So how does that work? Meanwhile, you know, this person over here is like, they're praying and they're doing ibadah and they're worshiping and they can barely hold a job. They keep getting let go or laid off and fired or whatever else it is. So how does that add up? This hadith explains that because the dunya doesn't matter to Allah. He says that they will have lived what the most, the word he used here is the most luxuriously. So this means all the luxury bags and the luxury watches and the luxury clothing and all this stuff that everybody's after is just is all this outward luxury is not to be sought because otherwise it wouldn't be put in a hadith with a negative connotation. That in and of itself shows that those types of things should be d disregarded in our life. And if we find ourselves having a love of luxurious things, we should seek to, 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 to get away from that, right? Having a few nice things, there's no problem. But having a taste for extreme luxury when the majority of the world is in extreme poverty is a problem, right? And so the, uh, uh, this, 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 this person will dip one finger in and said, I never experienced any good. Meanwhile, in another narration, oh, son of Adam. So, so now somebody who had the, uh, among the people of the garden, among the people of Jannah, who was the most miserable, had the most amount of difficulty, adversity, struggle in this world, will be brought and will dip one finger into Jannah. One finger, not even their whole body. They don't even get, to, that's like, they're not even seeing it yet. If they were to see it, that would be their face. We're talking one finger. 
and he will be asked, O son of Adam, have you ever seen any misery at all or any hardship? Has any hardship ever befallen you? And he will answer, no, by Allah. I have never been through any misery at all and I've never experienced any hardship. Like everything will be, it'll, some type of, some type of spiritual experience will overtake that person that will be so deeply healing and therapeutic that every difficulty that they ever went through, it's just as though they never went through it. And now for them, it's guaranteed eternal peace and bliss. And for the other, it's guaranteed eternal damnation and cursing. What, so, so, so what's the trade-off? Now this person, what kind of difficulty might they have gone through? We're talking like severe. This is the person who went through the most amount of poverty and difficulty and adversity. Not, not, not some. We're not talking about like, you know, they, there was somebody was sick for two weeks and like had a, had a serious cough and had to get admitted to the hospital and that was the difficulty. No, we're talking about like this is the type of stuff that our brothers and sisters right now are going through in Gaza. We're talking extreme difficulty, famine, hunger, thirst, grief loss of life, that, that loss of limbs, just, 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 I mean, genocide that's taking place as, as an example for us to make sense of this. Not that we don't do something outwardly or we don't, we don't condemn the actions of these Western powers that are doing wrong. That's, that's, that is in its place because we have to act outwardly in this world with whatever ability we have and, and uh, to, to, to make change. But to try to understand metaphysically the type of Gifts that are given to people who are tested the most. And it's not going to make sense if we only have a human lens to it. You have to put on a divine lens. And we won't be able to put on a divine lens because we are not divine. So you have to try to understand these things through our limited capacity, but trusting that the divine, the Lord, knows what he's doing. And when he says something, it's going to happen the way that he says it. And it will be a way of, of, of our... Um, uh, of, of, of the, for the believers trying to process any adversity that one goes through and then especially trying to process when there's severe, severe, severe adversity um, and, and uh, that, that our ummah is going through. We, of course, continue to ask Allah for faraj and for relief for the ummah and for the people of Gaza. And so the uh, hadith continue. And there's various hadith about, and I would recommend if you have the book, if you don't have the book, I would recommend getting it. It's like very, very, very short, 60, 70 pages, um, but packed with meaning. And so there's a lot of hadith in the book is The Lives of Man by Imam al-Haddad. You can get it online, Amazon. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very solid text. But we're not gonna go through every single hadith. There's a few hopeful ones though that are very good to mention. So one, the Prophet said, the people of Jannah, will have 120 rows, or it says here parts, but I've heard other translation mentioned rows. So 120 of all the people of Jannah, 120 rows, okay? Um, so you can assume obviously like millions or hundreds of millions of people in each row. We're, we're talking significant amounts of people, right? And then it says 80 of those parts or rows will be from his ummah, from my nation and 40 from other nations, from all the other nations, ancient times, all the ancient prophets, everything from the time of Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam to all of the other prophets to the time that we're in right now. He said 80 from this nation and 40 from other nations and 40 um, uh, from other nations. And, and um, Lastly, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, I shall be the first of men to come out when they are resurrected. We mentioned this last time. He's the first to be resurrected. I will be the leader of mankind when they arrive. I will be their orator as they listen. I will be their intercessor, their, their advocate, their intercessor, the one who's advocating on behalf of mankind to Allah because we'll be too scared to approach Allah ourselves. But the greatest of Allah's creation, Allah has given him this maqam. He said, I will be the giver of glad tidings when they despair, meaning he's comforting people when the despair kicks in. And he says, the flag of praise of Hamd on that day will be in my hand. And I am the dearest of the children of Adam to my Lord, the dearest of Bani Adam to my Lord. And 1,000 servants will move around me like hidden pearls or scattered pearls. It's just a very small glimpse into understanding who he is 
in on the day of judgment. We haven't even tried. We we can't even understand who he is in this life, let alone in the next life. It's a small understanding of the maqam, the sayyid, the master of Allah's creation, the greatest of Allah's creation. And he's and when he says this, it's just for learning, for people to learn and understand so that they can establish a connection to the Prophet ﷺ because the more love somebody has for him, the closer that they will be to him. And it's our honor as Muslims is we're from his ummah. This is our honor. This is the greatest ummah and this is our honor and this is what we want to invite people to and call people to. We don't seek honor and elevation in anything else. Nothing else should give us honor. Not our position, not our status, not how much money we make, not how many you know uh, followers someone has, not how much uh, uh, that, not how much praise somebody gets, um, not all of these different things. When you're in school, everyone is like going after the popular kids. I want to be like the popular kids. I want to do this and do this and do this. And then in 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 in, in university, that there's a certain um, draw to 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 people who are usually that that seed in haram, right? In drinking and in smoking and so on and so forth. And they seek honor in these things. But these things in reality, they debase one. They debase one. And there might be somebody who doesn't have that many friends, who's not doing, you know, they're, they're outwardly not as successful and so on and so forth. But they've sought honor in following the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they are, the, they are the greatest of people in the sight of Allah if Allah accepts them. Because this is what we seek honor in, is his tradition. In his tradition, what was his tradition? His, it was... He would sit with the poor. If he had a choice between a bunch of wealthy people gathering and the poor people were talking like sh uh, sh uh, uh, battered clothing, ripped clothing, not necessarily smelling the most pleasant, right? Like that's what we're talking about. He would go and choose to sit with them and eat with them and sit like a humble servant before his Lord. He's the greatest of Allah's creation. So our, our honor is not in all the stuff that the society we live in makes us seek honor in. It's not what it's about. Our honor is in following his teaching and in his sunnah, in his sunnah. So we, we, so this now would, um, you know, the, the Yom Al-Qiyamah at some point will end. And the decision is made then that where is somebody going to go for eternity? Where is someone going to go for all of eternity? So he says the fifth life, which is the life of Jah Jahannam or Jannah fire of the garden. He says it extends from the time that one enters either the fire or the garden, and then it never ends. That's it. Eternal, limitless, forever. This is what then the final life is. He says this is the longest of all lives. Of course, it's unlimited. The best and the most pleasant and joyous for the people of the garden. And it is the worst, hardest, and most hateful and wretched and full of suffering for the people of the fire. This is the trade-off we have to make. We have, if we, if, if, you know, yet usually, especially if we grew up as Muslims, it's always heard like, we don't do this because it's gonna take you to hell. Do this because it's gonna take you to heaven. Okay, that's a very good framework to have. What's important as we get older is to contemplate on the realities of what that means. It's not a transactional thing. This is serious stuff, right? Like what does it mean to be from the people of, 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 of hell and what does it mean to, to end up there even if it's for two days let alone what does it mean to be in in heaven forever and what tr what sacrifices are we willing to make because it requires sacrifice in order to get there right what trade-offs are we willing to make in order to, to get to the destination that we want the choice is in our hands because we're still in life number three we haven't gotten to life number four Actually, no, we're at life number three is the life of uh, uh, the Barzakh. So we're still in life number two. We got three more ahead of us, right? The, the Barzakh, the intermediary realm, which is when we die, the day of judgment, which is the fourth life, and then this eternal life. But all of the decisions of what happens are, are all the choices are made now. So questions we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing now to actually become uh, hopefully righteous people and act in, in, a, in a pattern of righteousness. So now he's going to mention, he says, we're going to start with mentioning the fire and the people uh, of the fire. And he says, eat every believer, even believers of taqwa will come to it. They'll see it before entering the garden. And there's a substantial amount of verses in the Quran about, um, 
about the fire, but we'll just, he mentions a few of them. We're going to mention even just select a few for the sake of time. First is Allah Ta'ala says, there is not one of you that shall not come to it. This is a fixed ordinance of your Lord. And then we shall rescue those who had taqwa and leave the unjust therein crouching. So taqwa is a shield, a protective shield that will save somebody. They will come to it. And Allah says, because of the taqwa, we rescue you. The ta taqwa, what is taqwa? It's consciousness of Allah, a, a, a consciousness where we are mindful of him in all of our moments, not just in, you know, in 10% of our day, in all of our moments. The person who has achieved complete uh, mindfulness of their Lord, they've achieved this station of taqwa. They, they're very aware of everything. He's watching them and now they act in the right way. Don't do this because Allah is watching me. And to do this because he's not watching me. The one who doesn't have that mindfulness but still stays away from those things, they would not have achieved perfect taqwa, but they're still being careful, right? Um, some people might just do things because their parents are going to get mad at them. Okay, that's fine, but the ultimate realization intention has to be because Allah is going to um, uh, be, be upset. Um, and, 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 you know, we might upset someone else as well. He says, then Allah Ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, O you who believe, save yourselves and your families. Ward off yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. Mankind, men and women and stones. Over which are set angels, severe and strong, who do not disobey Allah and what he commands them, and they only do what he is commanding them to do. So the, 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 and he's going to get into the different levels of the fire and the different levels of heat that the fire has to offer. But Allah gives us these general warnings. Okay, save yourselves before it's too late. How do you save yourself? Obey him in this life and don't disobey him in this life. The formula is fairly straightforward. Believe in him, obey him, don't disobey him, be a good person. And you kind of essentially wrapped it, you know, the, 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 the formula. But to do that takes work. And um, then, then the verses, they have some intense ones as well. Allah says that, no, he will be flung into the shatterer. And what might convey to you what the shatterer is? It is the kindled fire of Allah, which leaps up over the hearts and it closes in on them. And it is closed in on them in outstretched columns. So Allah describes a type of fire that's surrounding someone. This isn't a dormant fire. It's an active fire which increases and then it's alive. So as we mentioned last time, the fire is roaring on the day of judgment and it actually has a life to it. And it's doing things to the person in terms of the type of suffering that they will endure because of the sins that they did. And the degree of the sin will, will, will the most minor experience in hell is the worst experience someone could have. But there's even worst experiences and more intense experiences based on the sins that someone did um, in, in this life. And so Allah Ta'ala describes different fires for disbelievers and different fires for the, for, the, for the hypocrites and so on. He says, we have prepared for the disbeliever a fire whose tent encloses them. And where they ask for help, they will be helped with water that's like molten lead, which will burn their faces, which burns faces. It will be ev evil is the drink and ill is the resting place. So when somebody now in, from the people of Kufr is asking Allah for help, and so the thirst will become so immense and the burning will become so immense, they'll be given something. And that will then, it's mentioned in some verses, it will burn their entire insides and then it will burn their intestines. And then and, and it will be so boiling hot and intense and they'll, that's all they'll have to, to drink. There's not going to be any other choice there will be nothing that's that's quenched uh, that they that they can be quenched by and Allah himself calls the, the drink evil and then he says and those who disbelieve our signs we shall expose them to the fire and as often as their skins are consumed as soon as their skin is consumed we shall exchange them for fresh skins that then the torment is tasted again so it's ne it's like a never ending type of punishment as soon as one's skin burns, there's like different degrees of skin and layers of skin that someone has. And you assume the fire penetrates and penetrates and penetrates and the burning is intensely felt. And then one thinks that the burning is done 
then then a new skin, a fresh skin is given and the suffering begins again and the burning begins again. This is the Allah says this is the reward, right? Or the 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 for what they used to do. This is the reward for what they used to do. This is the payment for payback for what they used to do. And then those who disbelieve, Allah Ta'ala says, theirs is the fire of Jahannam. They are neither done with and die, nor is its torment lightened for them. So one of the most difficult parts of hell is that one has to accept that this is never going to end. It's always going on. There's no more death. Death will finish at some point. Death will disappear as a concept, which will, there's a verse will, or a hadith, I think, that we'll mention shortly. It's, there, there's, it's either eternal in one life or one has a suffering for a significant period of time and gets out, which we'll mention, or it's eternal bliss. That's it. But there's no concept that someone is just going to die and this is going to end. But for the disbelievers, their fate is sealed, basically, for the people of Kufr. There is no refuge at this point anymore. Um, and, and, and this is here. It's important to understand who is the Kafir. The disbeliever is not the person who is... Um, it's the person who is presented Islam in its authentic form and is presented the way of truth in its authentic form and just rejects it. This is one of the categories of the kuffar, of the kuffar. It is also um, the arrogant people who are um, constantly trying to harm the Muslims, right? Constantly trying to harm the Muslims. And the, 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 the arrogance is, is due to their distaste and their dislike of the people of Islam. So he says they will cry for help at this point, saying, Ya Allah, release us and we will fix ourselves. We'll do right. Not what we used to do. And Allah says, Allah will say, did we not grant you a life long enough for, for the one who reflected to reflect? And a warner also came to you. Didn't we? We gave you your chance. It's over now. There is no more chance. So people will ask Allah. We don't want to be amongst the people who ever ask Allah, Ya Allah, give me one more shot. Because we had our shot. This is This was it. And... Allah will show people before he takes them to task signs to bring them closer. He says he will send a warner to them to, to change and to rectify. And then it's their decision on what they do. It's their decision on um, uh, the type of life that we, that, we choose to, that we choose to live. And so regret is useless in the next life. And remorse is useless in the next life. But in this life, regret and remorse are one of the most powerful tools that we have. Allah loves the people who are remorseful. When we make a when we make a mistake and we're remorseful before Allah, Allah says in the Quran, Allah your tawabin. Allah loves the people who turn back to Him, and the first process of turning back to Him is remorse, feeling remorse. But in this life, it can change somebody. In the next life, it's too late because it's now the test is over, and now it's the results of the test. So one will see what they're experiencing and say, Yeah, well, everybody is going to believe in God now. Because God has revealed himself to you and God has revealed the, the intensity of what's about to happen. But did you believe in him when it was hard, when it was when he was when you couldn't experience it? When we didn't fully know, but we had to take it's 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 a faith in the unseen, the people who believe in the ghaib, the people who believe in the unseen, that's the concept because we can't see hellfire and heaven. We can read the descriptions. We can meditate on them. We can reflect on them. And for some people, their reflection and their meditation will become so intense that they might get like some small, 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 small iota percentage of an understanding of what it could be like. But that's it. We won't get, we won't get more than that. And so we have to basically trust, which we do. We trust the Lord who revealed it. And we trust the messenger who gave it to us. Because he's Sadiq Al-Amin, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most truthful and trustworthy and so then Allah says, the criminals are in Jahannam's torment unceasingly. It is not lightened for them, and in it they despair. And we wrong them not, but it was they who were unjust. We didn't do any wrong to them. It's they who did the wrongs to themselves and who did injustice in society. And they will cry, O oh Malik, he's the, king, he's the chief angel who's been um, appointed over the hellfire. Let your Lord make an end of us. Like just... Kill us off. And he's going to say, you are to remain. You're, you're here. You're stuck. You're stuck. This is, this is where you're supposed to be. So this is, this, the, we're talking here of, of the generality of 
punishment here that Allah is mentioning for like, you know, criminals, people who do evil. It, it, we haven't even gotten to the extent of wrath that Allah is going to have for the tyrants, the oppressors, the people who kill children, the people who commit genocide on other people. I mean, it's 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 something we can't even comprehend the level of of payback that Allah is going to do and, and, and exact on them. So in one hadith, it's mentioned that the fire of Jahannam was heated for a thousand years until it became red. Then it was heated for another thousand years until it became white. And then it was heated until for another thousand years until it became a black color. And it is thus black and dark. It's like a dark fire. It's not an orange red fire. The first level of heating brings the redness, but then the heat becomes so intense and strong, something we can't comprehend in this life. Um, but even when one sees the colors of the fire, there's like different colors in the fire. When one is, you, know, you see like a, a, a fire pit or something, you'll see like different types of blue, a blue and orange and a red. It's so intense that it's now just become black. And he said, والسلام, the least tormented of the people of the fire shall be those who have sandals and laces of fire and whose heads boil from them as though they were cauldrons. And they imagine that no one is in more torment than they, than them, and yet that's the most insignificant torment of all. So everybody will think there's nobody who's getting punished more than I am. And yet that might not be at all a significant punishment because Allah has layers of punishment. Prophet said in another hadith, some of them are enveloped by the fire to their heels, some to their knees, some to their waist, and others to their shoulders. And then he said, oh, people, in this life, he's saying, oh, people, weep, weep. And if you cannot weep, then pretend like, you, like you're weeping. Make it like you are weeping. For the people of the fire will weep in Jahannam until their tears run over their faces like streams. And then the tears will stop and blood will flow and eyes will ulcerate out of them so that if ships were launched therein, they would float. This is the intensity. He's describing a very, very, very intense scene. These hadith are very hard to, to hear, but they're very important to hear because this is the type of reflection we should do. And if one reflects on these things very seriously, what is he saying? Oh, people weep in this life, meaning listen to these things. Weep and let the weeping transform you so that you don't get close to the sin. The minute we're about to do the haram, we're about to look at that thing that's inappropriate. We're about to say something we shouldn't say. We're about to listen to something we shouldn't listen to. We're about to treat someone in the wrong way. Whatever, whatever thing is in our control, whatever injustice we could be doing, we reflect, no, do I really want that to happen? I gotta stop. The minute we're, you know, if we're struggling to um, fix a, a relationship with someone who cut off their relationship with us and, they, and it's been, or we're strained in a relationship, we're holding a grudge against somebody, we haven't called them in months, whatever it is, read the verse and pick up the phone and give him a call because Allah will hold us to account for when we, we, we don't want this to happen, but he, he will hold people to account for those who distance and cut off ties. And, and so they're all different types of things. They're supposed to motivate us towards action. They're not just supposed to be things we, you know, learn and then don't do anything about. They're supposed to bring us to action, which is why amazingly the Prophet starts with, um, starts with, starts uh, with, telling us what to do, which is to weep. And then in another hadith, hunger will be cast upon the people of fire until their hunger equals their other torments. They will cry for help and help will come in the form of bitter thorn fruit, which doesn't nourish nor release from hunger. Then they will cry for help and they will be given food that they'll start to choke on. Then they will remember in this world that they used to relieve choking by drinking. So they would cry for a drink and then they will be given boiling water that's raised to them with iron hooks. And when it nears, just gets close to their face, it's so hot, it scorches them. And their face is scorches. And when it enters their stomach, it lacerates the stomach. And then they will say, call the guards of Jahannam, call the, the, the guards of the fire. And the guards will say, did the messenger of your Lord not come to you with clear signs? And they will say, yes. And the guard said, call, call, but the call of the, of the disbelievers isn't going to lead to anything. It's just going to go astray. 
meaning the call of the kuffar, it doesn't mean anything at this point. Your calling is done. And they will say, oh Malik, again, let your Lord make an end to us. And he's going to say, you shall remain. And he said, between the calls, in one, in one commentary on this, and Malik's reply is 1,000 years. Between the amount that they're calling and the reply of the angel, Malik, where he says, not happening. That's 1,000 years, just waiting. That's how intense it is in this situation. But, and then he says, they will then say to each other, call to Allah. None is better than Allah. And then they will say, Ya Allah, our wretchedness has overcome us. We were people who went astray. Our Lord, bring us out of it. So what are they doing here? They're making dua. The people who never made dua in this life now are making dua because they realize there's a Lord who's listening. And he said, Ya Allah, if we repeat our sin, we will be unjust. We won't do it. Give us another chance. Allah will says, Allah responds, be gone therein and don't speak to me. Don't speak to me. And when this happens, they will lose hope for anything good. And just, they will be overwhelmed with wailing and lamenting and sighing. It's just going to be gone. So this is an active experience. It's not that God just, it happens and then there's no, 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 no. They're trying to interact with Allah and Allah is saying, no, not have, you had your chance. We have our chance in this life to talk to Allah by making dua, to understand Allah's messages by reading the Quran, to pray to Allah in our salah. That's our chance, right? And, and, and for the people who have not accepted Islam to be invited to Islam and to accept the call of Allah. But if that's not done, then the du'a in the next life is, 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 is not going to, to work. Meanwhile, for the people of, of Jannah, they don't even have to make a du'a. The, se the second they think about something, they get it. Just think about having this type of fruit or this type of food or something, and it'll just be brought to them. They won't even have to express it. These people, what do they express it? They have to beg, and thousands of years they wait, nothing happens. This is the punishment that Allah has waiting for the people of injustice and for the people of the, the for the um, criminals, for the criminals. And then it's mentioned in another hadith that it's been, or no, it's not a hadith, he's mentioning this. It's been, in the fire there are snakes as large as the necks of bacterian camels and scorpions as big as mules. The sting of which produces painful fevers for 40 seasons, where a bucket of the rotten drink of hell to be spilt into the world, the stench of this bucket will affect all of the people of the world. So if, 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 if we'll finish the hadith first, or the statement first. And should a drop of the tree of zakum, which is mentioned in the Quran, be dropped into this world, it would spoil all livelihood. All fruits, food, water, everything would be spoiled just by a drop of this, of this, of this tree. And should one, oh, subhanAllah, should one of the people of the fire come out into this world, just one person from hell come to the dunya, all, everybody in the world will die because of the stench and disfigurement of this person. This is the extent of, 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 the, of the punishment and of the intensity, that the, the type of um, uh, ways in which we can, uh, we're, it's being phrased in this way perhaps to help us understand that just a little bit were to reach here and everybody will be affected. Imagine one person comes in, you know, uh, Oakland and hopefully never in Oakland. Let's say they come in Israel, uh, probably places of a lot of people in hell and they show up there and now everybody, because of that, everybody just, just dies in the entire world because of one person coming out from the people of hell, from the people of hell. So this is intense. This is very, 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 very intense. And it's important for us to, to remember the, the, the intensity and to seek refuge in Allah. One of the things that's actually been lost in our ummah is talking about Jahannam and talking about the fire. Like it's, it's sometimes as, as, as believers, we, we feel like, you know what? I don't really like um, it when Islam is like too much about the punishment and the fear, and I just kind of want to have the other side of it, which is totally fine to have the other side of it. But balance is key. The Prophet ﷺ said, hope and fear. Hope is produced and inculcated by thinking about the mercy of Allah, by thinking about j Jannah, and we're going to get to that, inshallah, in the next class. And fear is produced by these types of hadith and these types of ayahs and really contemplating them. It's very, very, very important to think about this and to try to visualize it and really, really, really think about, you know, what's, what's going to happen.
it's mentioned then that the gates of Jahannam, the gates of the fire are seven. And each gate has, a por uh, has an appointed portion. And there's also seven layers. So the seven layers, he says, the first is called Jahannam. The first layer is called Jahannam, which is for the people who, of Tawheed. This layer is for the people of Tawheed, the people of La ilaha illallah, but who are, the, who are sinners, who are, who are, and you know, we're all, we ask Allah for refuge because all of us are sinners. This is for the people who Allah, uh, their sins outweigh their good deeds, really is the way for us to understand it. So the, there will be Muslims whose sins might outweigh the good that they've done. And so the, the, this is the layer of the, of, of the hellfire that's reserved for them. He says, then there's other layers. He said, the second is called Saqar. The third is Laza. The fourth is Al-Hutama. Many of these are mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith. The fifth is Al-Sa'ir. The sixth is Al-Jahim. And the seventh is Al-Hawiya. Wa ma adraka Al-Hawiya. So what is Hawiya? Hawiya. This is the lowermost one, which has no bottom or end. It's an endless pit. No bottom or end in this one. And he says, each of these seven layers are filled with agonizing torments, hideous tortures, and great humiliation. And each layer is worse than the one above it. So as one falls through each layer, as one's per per punishment gets worse and worse and worse. And, and then he asks, may Allah protect us, our parents, our loved ones, and all the Muslims from it through, through his grace and generosity. I mean, so he says, then there's two categories of the people of fire. He says, there's going to be the people of um of tawhid and he says they will enter it because of the sins okay this is this is the first big category somebody who believed in god but didn't obey allah the way out of this is to obey allah right allah is too generous for someone to try their best to obey him and seek repentance and and try and for him to throw them into the fire but then he says the second and he buckets a lot into the second. He says the next group is basically the people of kufr, of disbelief, the mushrikeen, the po mushrikun, the polytheists, and the munafikun. So kufr, mushrik, munafikun. He says they outwardly announce their faith, the, the people of hypo hypocrisy, but they conceal disbelief in their hearts. So he says the first group of people of the fire, uh, the first group will not remain in the fire forever. So all the verses that are talking about the fire forever, that iman abadan forever and ever, he says that's not for the people of la ilaha illallah. He says eventually they'll leave it through intercession and through the mercy of Allah. The Prophet wasallam is the main one who's going to help these people. His intercession is key. He says my intercession is for the ahl al-kaba'ir, the people of big sins in my ummah. Big sins, the serious, huge, venial sins of the Ummah. He says, that's who I'm going to be first and foremost, and, you know, or, or we're assuming first and foremost, interceding for. Um, but he says that they that they will be differing types of, of uh, experiences here. So there's like a sentence, kind of like when a judge sentences someone to prison and says, okay, this person is sentenced to 20 years of prison. But then someone is taken out of prison before the 20 years are over. Right? Either they're appealed or something happens and the sentence is shortened and they say, okay, you're released, but you're, you know, you're on probation and this, this, and that. So he says some of them, their sentences will, will they'll, they'll be taken out before their sentences will end and others it will not be. So there'll be differing degrees. Again, loving the Prophet and being close to him, even when we're doing a lot of big things, big wrongs is really, really important. This is why never push someone away from Islam and from Allah and his messenger ever because it's better to have somebody who is drinking alcohol every day, smoking weed every day, partying, doing all sorts of haram, right? like, like adultery, zina, every, think of everything wrong that they could be doing and they're doing it and yet they still believe in Allah and they still believe in the messengership of the Prophet Sallallahu and they have some attachment to Islam. Maybe just in Ramadan, they come to the masjid once, one time in Ramadan, twice in Ramadan. Maybe they just give up the alcohol only in Ramadan. It's still better for that person to do that and have some attachment than nothing at all because the other choice is what? Is kufr. And if they leave Islam, then it's eternal. There is no, there is no more hope at that point because they might have left. So woe unto us if we are the people who push that person away. We should never ever say, oh, you're just a Ramadan Muslim. Never seen you around here. 
Where you been? You, know, you only come for the first five days of, or, you know, I never see you in these Muslim spaces, but you come around and Ramadan, you, all of a sudden you start practicing. Well, yeah, of course they do. At least they do, right? At least they're practicing in Ramadan. And that doesn't mean that they're perfect, but we're, are we perfect? We ever make mistakes? Guess what? The standard is higher for, for the people who are practicing. They're not, the standard is higher for the people who are learning. The standard is not easy. It's not a low standard for them, right? And so uh, that to, in or, our, our goal in Islam is to make the door as wide as possible. And remember that Allah's door is even wider because he is al wasit His door is wide. His mercy is wide. We're never going to be able to understand the vastness of the door of Allah. But our job is not to close the door and be like, no, 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 no. Heaven is reserved for the people who follow my very specific view of Islam and the very specific scholars that I listen to and the very specific approach that I have. And they've never done anything. Da, 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 and and, and they, they, that's the view that we have. This is, this is um, big, big problem. Sometimes I hear, you know, I, I, I met uh, someone at a masjid and, he, and they were like, oh, you go to that other masjid? Why do you go to that masjid? That's not a good masjid to go to. And I was like, bro, we're in America in 2024 and you're discouraging someone from going to a masjid? Fine, what if they go to the club or to the bar or to this place or to that place or to the street? I mean, there's a million bad places for them to go to and you have a problem with going to the masjid because they don't. that masjid doesn't line up with your limited worldview of thinking. These, the, the, the peop, there are Muslims who are doing the work of shaitan. How so? And they're, and they're practicing outwardly righteous Muslims, meaning like doing all the things because the person who turns other people away from Allah is doing the work of shaitan. That's his job. So never turn people away. And especially, especially, especially for those who are the, the you know, the online, um, you know, comment warriors and whatnot, who are always commenting on other people's, I'm speaking now to the people who are on live and always commenting on other people's things and really that you see a sin someone is doing and they post a video about it and you just like lambast them and you make them, you know, bully them. And also this is the worst thing that you can do. It's you are getting sin upon sin upon sin for every comment that you put, for every person who reads that comment and for every minute of hurt that that person feels for the stuff that they might have read. Because it's worse to take, it's, it's, it's worse to hurt the feelings of a believer than it is to take apart the Kaaba brick by brick. Imagine how in up in arms people would be if somebody were to just to go to the Kaaba and just start taking it apart, just like ripping it apart. They don't even let you get near it, near to the cloth, because sometimes people go and out of their excitement, they cut the cloth, they put it in their pocket, they take it home with them. They don't even let you do that, let alone to take it apart. And he says to hurt the feelings of a believer is worse than that, to hurt other people's feelings. So this is the type of way and we should be this is why akhlaq is so important. Character is so important. He says, no person of tawheed will stay in the fire forever. Eventually, anybody for, with even an Adam's weight, like the littlest faith, they didn't do anything about it. They just like, kind of like, yeah, I believe. Like, I guess, I guess so. It's probably possible. Yeah, I guess there's a God. Just littlest bit of faith, right, will be allowed out. Will be allowed out of tawheed, as is stated in sound hadiths. So it's better, again, for someone to have some faith then no faith, and to be in Islam, then in, in, not in Islam. And then what happens, let's say somebody who's in all the sins we just listed, it enters Islam. They don't have to leave those sins right when they enter Islam if they're unable to. It's better that they enter Islam. Then they'll gradually leave the sins, because the, the or it's great if they leave it. But never should they say, you know what, let me first become like pure and then enter the religion. No, because it's better to become a Muslim and to be a sinful Muslim than to be what you think of as a good person but a kafir. Because that kafir, that, 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 that's not going to, going to lead well because disbelief in Allah is serious. He then says there will be people in the second category who will remain in the fire forever. And he says here, this is mentioned, they include the Jews, the Christians, the Zoroastrians, and others who are to remain in the fire permanently. These are groups amongst those, not the people of belief amongst, these, amongst them, but the people of, of, who rejected the message of the Prophet ﷺ and the people who commit shirk by associating partners with Allah. So to believe that 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 there is multiple gods, right? That that Jesus is a god and that Allah that there's a god that's shirk that that, that that doesn't that doesn't align with one's faith. Now, that if we have family members that are Christian, if we have uh, you know, we, our job is not to go to them and to be like you're going you're going to hell, and then they're going to say no, you're going to hell according to my view, you're going to hell, and you're going to hell, everybody's everybody's going to hell. That's not the point. We have to do our job 
and you won't convince them usually through belief uh, debates because everybody has their, their citations and their views on why they're correct. Usually we'll convince people through character and being good to them and showing them the beauty of the religion, not through debating theology. For some, the theological debates are important, but usually for others, and to show you know how wonderful this ummah is and, and, and to convince them. And so Allah says in the in the Quran, and yeah, for those who are asking questions, as soon as we're done with the with the session, which will be just a few minutes, inshallah, we'll get to questions. But um, he says, those who disbelieve and die as disbelievers, upon them is the curse of Allah and of the angels and of mankind combined. Eternally therein, the torment will not be lightened for them and they will not be reprieved. And Allah says, Allah does not forgive that a partner is ascribed to him, but he forgives all else to whomsoever he will. Shirk is the unforgivable sin, assuming someone doesn't repent from it in this life. Whosoever ascribes partners to Allah, for him, Allah has forgiven, or for him or her, Allah has forgiven, uh, has forbidden Jannah, forbidden the garden, and their abode shall be the fire. Their abode shall be the fire. And then in another hadith, or another verse, the hypocrites shall be in the lowest layer of the fire. Hypocr hypocrisy is really dangerous. It's by somebody who says, I'm a believer, but inside they're just disbelief. This was your, there were people at the time, probably some who were, who were, uh, who were, hypo who were hypocrites. Um, and of course that it continues to exist so we purify we want to ask Allah to purify our hearts from all forms of um, from all forms of hypocrisy and so lastly we'll mention this that when the sinners among the people of Tawheeds are brought in out of the fire until none of them remain into it the gates of, of, of hell are locked and it will close on the people of Kufr and the people of shirk, it will close on them. And it is indeed closed on them, Allah Ta'ala says, in outstretched columns. This gate closes. Some of them will be locked in coffins full of fire and just left there for eternity and in God's torment and in his wrath unendingly. And so once this the, the, the stages happen where someone goes in and then they're brought out or someone goes in for a long period of time until their sentence ends. But once all the people who are supposed to come out will come out, that's it. It's sealed shut and it's never looked at. Like nobody can do anything about it. And then that's it. And this is why it's so, so, so serious for us to get it, for us to get our act together in this life. We don't want to experience hell for a day or a minute, let alone for years or thousands of years, let alone for eternity, let alone for um, eternity. And we should not doubt for a second that the people of Kufr, of injustice, of killing, of atrocity, of, of, of uh, this, this, these people of, 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 of injustice and of Western hegemony, that, that they will then not be taken to account just because they have all their arrogance and their technology and their everything in this life and they think they can do whatever they want. I don't think the Lord of the heavens and the earth is watching them and that his wrath, his wrath encompassed many people in the past and his wrath is going to continue to encompass people in the future. That's just that's how Allah that's how Allah describes Himself, and so that should give us some level of understanding of okay when these types of things happen, what are people setting up for themselves, and then what are the people who are um, doing good and who are withstanding difficulty and tribulation through any form of suffer and through patience, what are they getting, and that's what we'll talk about next time inshallah, um, in uh, which is the whole section on jannah, and we'll end the class on that section with hope inshallah. Um, so yeah, next week is the last uh, session on the text. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we'll have reached the end, um, and then it will be Ramadan will begin. There will be um, I don't think we'll do any class in Ramadan, at least not at this time. If we do something, it'll be at a different time, um, inshallah. So with that, we have we have time for questions. And if you posted a question online, uh, I might not see it because uh, the comments are just posted again. Yeah. For those who reject faith and are uh, the question is for those who reject faith and do good deeds, are they um, uh, are they do they end up in fire? 
forever. So only Allah ultimately knows who goes where, right? We've been given these categories and then there's the decision is made. So we never would say like a specific person or even like a very specific category is for sure in this case. But in the Quran, Allah says, amanu wa aminu salihat, those who believe and do righteous deeds. So goodness first requires belief. That's the first tenet of what goodness is built upon. So you could actually have people who are doing what we might think is um, uh, goodness, and there is good in there. But many of them, they'll get the reward for the goodness in this life. Um, or, or out of the goodness that they do, they could actually have opened up a door for them to end, to believe at some point in this life and then to enter into, into heaven. So nobody is like written off until God writes, you know, quote unquote, writes them off, right? We don't know at some point, did they um, ever testify to faith? Imam, uh, I believe it's one of the great Imams of religion, Imam Abu Hanifa, um, or Imam Ghazali, that they are of the opinion that if someone just says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, one time, you, it's one time, they just say it, one time, they could be counted amongst the people who eventually will leave, right? Um, and others, there's other things that they might just do, just a, a, an act of faith that they might do, they might not even know that it's an act of faith, and that they do it. What we're, ref what we're referring to here is like the people who actively reject faith. So if somebody is like, you know what, I'm an atheist, I don't believe there's any God, but I'm going to start a bunch of nonprofits and humanitarian organizations and this, this, and that. They're kafir. Like that's they, they, they would be considered in theology to have rejected belief, regardless of the actions that they do, because they rejected the first action that's required for the goodness to actually bear fruit. Otherwise, it would their, their seeds that they're planting could be for their own nafs. It could be so they could get recognition. It could be so that other people could praise them. Even if the believer does good for that reason, it's rejected, right? If like we go and do a bunch of feed a bunch of homeless people and then we just do it so other people could be like, oh, wow, you fed a bunch of homeless people. Yeah, yeah, I did that. That, that, that would be rejected. It wouldn't be an accepted act if our sincerity wasn't there. So, um, but as Muslims in the time we live in, we should leave like room open in our minds and in our hearts for everybody and not act in the most restrictive way and instead be expansive and, and hope in the mercy of Allah for, for such people like that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, then it's, yeah, so, so even here where we mentioned it was an Adam's weight of faith or a mustard seed. So a mustard seed would be even bigger than the Adam and Adam would be like, one one millionth the size of the mustard seed. So like just a little bit of faith in their heart and the fire will be, well, um, I don't believe the hadith says forbidden. I believe the hadith says that they'll eventually be, or the interpretation would mean that, let's say someone had a little bit, bit of faith, but they didn't do any, any of the righteous deeds. If their sins outweighed their good, they might go into the fire, but they will eventually leave the fire. They'll eventually leave the fire. They won't be permanently um, in, in, in it. Yeah. And wallahu alam, all of these we know that Allah is um, Allah knows best. So okay, there's a question here. Okay, what about someone who continuously sins the same sin? Okay, good question. Um, so someone who does this categories of sins, if if a minor sin is done repeatedly and you see it as it's insignificant, it becomes a major sin, right? So that would be like somebody who we do something, let's, uh, let's say an example, like there's a show we watch, it's like full of inappropriate scenes. And to watch the inappropriate scene would not be the same sin as to actually engage in that action. But we're like, you know, whatever, I don't care. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference to me. And so we just keep doing that and we just say, you know what? That's not even a big deal. It's not a big deal for me to watch this haram over and over again. Now, us minimizing the sin and watching that show every day or every week or whatever it is and just, just, just ignoring it, we're getting the weight of the major sin. Same thing with like, you know, um, cursing, let's say. It, it's, it's a very, believer's tongue should be pure, not full of vulgarity. But if we're constantly cursing and we minimize it, dropping this curse word here, this curse word here, this curse word here, and it's not, we just don't treat it as a big deal, it can become a major sin. Um, 
But there's a difference between that and the person who feels remorse for the sin. So now let's say another thing, the follow-up question is someone who has like an addiction to it. That would be in, the, in this case, if you feel bad about it and you keep turning back to Allah, Ya Allah, I'm sorry, I, forgive me. And then you do it again. And then you turn and you repent and then you ask for forgiveness and so on and so forth. And the cycle continues. But every time you do it, you ask him for forgiveness. That person every time, inshallah, is being forgiven and it's cleaned out and then they're doing it and then it's being, and, and it still has an impact on the heart. It's not the same as the person who stays away from it forever. But um, the key here is to not minimize the sin. So to never say, you know what, it's not a big deal. The key is every time we do it and, uh, you know, there's mention in the hadith about somebody who used to drink a lot of alcohol. And they keep going back to the alcohol. This is among the time of the Sahaba. They keep going back to it, keep going back to it, keep going back to it. And the addiction continued and it continued and it continued until at some point the, 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 the Sahaba asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, curse him. Like, curse him. He keeps doing it. And he says, no, I'm not going to curse him. He has love for Allah and his messenger. This is what he said about him. This is for the, the, the alcoholic addict who keeps drinking, he said he has love for Allah and his messenger. And when, and this man was, the, he was at the time of the Prophet when you do a sin like this, there's a punishment in this dunya known as the had punishment, the, the, um, uh, which is, which is the, the, the punishment you get in this life that a state uh, uh, authority, like obviously a prophet um, or somebody who has been following that chain, um, like a hikayr, uh, implement that had punishment. And so that was happening. And then he, when he heard the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, he never went back to the drinking because of the opinion that the Prophet ﷺ had of him. That he said, no, he does have love of Allah and his messenger because the sin doesn't negate your faith. The sin is just a, it's, 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 it's just a weakness. We're human beings. Allah says we created human beings weak. So we'll make the mistake. But the key is with the addiction, you keep asking forgiveness and keep going and keep going and keep going until one day Allah will just take the addiction away. He'll say, okay, enough is enough. It's gone. And that will happen. I know many people addicted to this drug, that drug, this thing, that thing. And then at just some point after years, it was just cleaned out because they kept turning to their Lord. So it's a very good, uh, it's a very good question. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. The question is how much weight is given to the intention behind the sin? Um, because we're taught that, you know, the intention of a good deed is given a lot of weight, right? Um, so if somebody makes an intention to do a bad, but they don't do the bad, there's no sin upon them. If someone makes an intention to do the bad and they act up on the bad, they're given like the equivalent of one sin uh, you know, one mark against them. But if by intention you mean like, could there be like a really evil intention behind it versus like a less evil intention behind it? Would that be the question? Yeah. So definitely the person who is intending on doing something like really bad and then tries to do something that bad and just can't, but if they had the ability, as mentioned in one of the texts, they had the ability to do more bad, but they just couldn't figure it out and pull it off, they're getting all of it. It's all the bad that they're getting, right? So there is like a weightage that's given to the the, the, the act of the heart. Um, but there's no way to have like, if the, if the question is, if there could be like a good intention or like a positive intention behind the sin, that's not something that would be like considered in, in our religion, right? So there's not really a positive intention. There could be like a less evil one, like somebody who's like a, you know, super, super, super bad dictator and someone who's just like, you know, a less bad person, right? And they could be having differing intentions behind their sins. Um, but does that kind of answer the question or do you have a follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, so somebody who wants to do something that's like for the sake of oh, they want to just engage in you know their vain desires and 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 whatnot, and then someone else who says no, I'm going to do this thing so that I can do more. Yeah. So in that case, there each sin has its own category. So for the one who's doing that person is that this latter category you mentioned, the person who wants to go to the ga- bad gathering and they want to invoke um, harm upon people and so on. They're having multiple, multiple weightage of sins listed against them, right? They would have the sin of, let's say, going to the bad gathering, the sin of engaging in their desires, the sin of harming someone there, the sin of every person that they harm, right? And so on and so forth. Versus the first person, they're going and they're just engaging in the, not just, but they're engaging in the haram activity. They're doing something inappropriate. They're getting like the two or three things that come with that. But um uh, each will have according to how much they would have engaged in that in, in that sin. Yeah. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Great question. Um, and yeah, that's a very nuanced topic. So uh, appreciate the uh, clarification question. Question is about, you know, if we were to, if somebody, um, we kind of like put distance between them, like drew a hard boundary and said, you know, I want to minimize my interaction with them. And um, is that really the same as like cutting them off? Yeah, good question. So the cutting, the cutting off is um, when literally we're like, I don't want to have anything to do with you ever. I'll see you. Like I, I know someone who told someone else, I'll, I'll see you on the day of judgment. I'm never going to talk to you again. And literally cut off their whole family and their family hasn't been able to get in touch with them for like 15 years. No clue where they are in the world. No clue if they're alive. No, no call is ever, like nobody has any information on them. That's cutting off. That's like literally like far cutting off. Then there's a difference between somebody who says, you know what? This person's like a bad influence on my life. I'm not going to like never talk to them, but I'm going to put some serious distance between them. And then there's somebody who might be causing a lot of harm in your life and who might be harming you or your family or so on and so forth. And you say, I'm going to draw, I'm going to like completely limit any interaction with them. However, if they were to change, the door is going to be open for me to invite them back. It depends on the situation that one is in. Then there's also, so that's like a general framework. Then there's weights of the relationship itself. So if it's like our mother and our father, the weight is way more serious than if it's like, some you know distant friend that we you know met when we were like in 10th grade or something like that right that person is not really cutting them off we're just not being friends with them anymore we're cutting off is referring to cutting off family ties usually and the family ties would be like okay our mom and our uh, we 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 did uh, someone in our family did something that's seriously wrong to us but we still have an obligation to find a way to either one day it could be years later to repair the situation, or if we can't bear ourselves to do that, to at least at minimum check in from time to time and never just like completely cut off the 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 the, uh, the relationship itself. But if we need to draw a boundary, um, if we need, I mean, I know someone who had to get a restraining order against a family member of theirs because of they were getting threats from them and so on and so forth. And now they're in very, and everything changed and now they're in very good relationship with them. Everything is just fine. But for that time period, it was essential for them to do it, and then things change. So it really depends on like the level of extremity of what you're facing. The first thing you have to protect is yourself and your family. So physical harm must be protected against. But if like somebody is just uh, causing a lot of like, they're just always saying mean things to us, and it's really disrespectful, um, we would just try not to see them that much. But like, you know, going seeing them two times a year is totally fine. It's not cutting them off. We're calling them every now and then and talking about topics that are kind of neutral would be would be okay right our key is our intention is not that i never want to have anything to do with this person again from from so that's the framework and then from ihsan from excellence would be that one does good to the person who does harm to them this is the prophet's approach 
So people would try to kill him and he would try to welcome them into Islam and call them and send them gifts and do all sorts of good for them. Right? Like that's the level of goodness that he would do. Um, that's the bar that we aspire to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Good question. Um, question is if somebody never heard about Islam. And, and so what test would they have on Yom Kiyama and what the, the kind of validity of what you're saying? So I'm not familiar with the exact narration. I'll have to research it and look it up. Uh, and then I can, inshallah, next week, maybe I'll touch base with you after and I'll just try to remind myself to look it up and then I'll get back to you because I don't know the, the details of the answer. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Someone wants to extend their life and increase their position. That, yep, that's a narration. Yep, that's authentic. that's authentic. Yep, yep, yep. So there's, so what we'll get in 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 um in the hadith is there's differing things we're supposed to do in Islam, and then the Prophet Islam will give us the virtues of doing that thing. So he'll say, okay, if you do this, you'll see great things happening to you in this life. So to, to, to get more provision, the one who actually enjoyed his family times will get more provision. You'll see more risk coming to you. Um, there'll be generally more goodness that is happening in this life. The person who cuts everybody off and is constantly creating problems, they'll have the opposite of that likely happening to them. Um, so yeah, that's a very helpful narration. Okay, there's a question online. Uh, so I said, Okay, how do we repent for backbiting? I heard we have to ask the person forgiveness uh, who we backbited against. So the way to repent for backbiting, um, no, you don't have to ask the person for forgiveness. In the time where people's hearts were more pure and everybody understood that people were on like spiritual paths and really trying to get better, this was the more virtuous thing to do. In the time that we live in, where you telling somebody that could completely ruin the relationship like forever or just really damage it and create more problems, you wouldn't tell them that. What you would do is first you repent sincerely and you ask Allah for forgiveness for the wrong that you did and you seek a lot of istighfar for that. Number two, you make du'a for that person in to the amount that you said bad about them, you now make a lot of du'a for them. Number three, you try to do a good deed in their name. Give some charity. So I intend to give charity for this brother or this sister who I said something bad about and then I give charity in their name. And number four, you try to go to the people who you spoke bad about them in front of, and now you speak a lot of good about them, right? And you try to praise them. And any time something comes up about them that's negative, you defend them. You're like, no, 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 that person, not like that at all. I've, I've actually only seen good come from that person. Even if you don't like them, you've got to go against the nafs and engage in it. And then you also, this would be a good thing to do generally, you are the person who, because you've done the wrong, you now act as the person who tries to like, and, and you feel remorseful for it, who tries to stop that from happening in other places. So anytime someone backbites someone else, you change the topic. You're like, you know, what about the weather outside? Like you just change it up, right? Just, just find a way to bring something else in such that they don't engage in, in backbiting. Backbiting is one of the most serious sins uh, in our religion that's often ignored um, about it. Okay, there's, there's a question about entering Jannah, but you're not a Muslim, but I didn't see the full question. So if you could repost it, that would be great. Any other questions here? Yeah. So another authentic narration, I believe prophecy is that the is forbidden from every soft and kind hearted person. Um I've come across the 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 meaning of the hadith that you that I think you're referring to, but I don't know it enough to like comment on it. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, we would we would in general, people of like what so you mentioned of soft heartedness and kindness, right? People of good akhlaq, usually for the most part, good character, goodness, some door of goodness 
inshallah, inshallah, we, we, we always pray for this. We want to pray for this. We'll hopefully open to them, right, for them. Because um, there's a reason why they have that goodness in them, right? And so this is actually for the other question that was also asked earlier, that we hope at some point, inshallah, some form of goodness or good deed that they did will be accepted. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, there's hadith that mentioned the opposite of people who could be people of faith, but who are just bad character and the bad character outweighs the faith that maybe that they have, yeah. Okay. Um, so, oh, I heard from somewhere that if someone takes their own life, they're not able to enter Jannah. Is it true? Yeah, yeah. Suicide and commit, taking your own life cuts you off. That's it. That, that person, in our belief, is it's one of the biggest harams that you can do, um, and you now are um, uh, cut off from, from heaven. And Allah knows best in terms of how he would do so, but there's other narrations that mention the punishment for the person who takes their own life is that they keep taking their own life over and over and over again and keep experiencing that. So um, that we, we should never, ever, ever let that thought, if that thought ever crosses the mind, seek help immediately from you know, a men mental health specialist or, or uh, someone else who can assist you. Um, but that's not something that would be, uh, you know, that, that, that what you're saying is, is, is valid, yeah. And there's a question here. Once I guess you that question, Did, was it a follow up to this? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, isn't it if you do anything without a fully conscious mind, then people, um, like people get hassled for it, like they're not ready for it. So if you do something like that, in a bad mental space where they don't realize what they're doing, then it's like um, they're not in there. So everything, yeah, good question. This question is about like sanity of mind. Everything we're referring to is assuming that someone is in sanity of mind, right? So that's any sin that someone does. If they are not of sane mind um, and they're not, they, they, they would not be accountable for anything at that point. So somebody could not be in sane mind and, and um, do a lot of other wrong and they actually would not be accountable for that wrong. If Allah knew that they were not, like if, Allah, if what they were actually experiencing was not of sane mind, right? Um, not of these conditions that these like courts say, like every time a white person commits a massacre, they're like, oh, this person is not of sane mind. And then every time someone else does it, you know, that, that would not, that's not what I'm referring to. But if Allah says, no, no, this person is not actually rationally capable of thinking, then the whole standard of the religion changes for them. They're not accountable for praying, not for fasting. Um, they're not even accountable for a lot of what they say uh, and, and so on and so forth. So if in that instance, someone were to do something like this, yeah, the, the the weight would be would, would be would be different. Um, and then someone says, okay, so last question, two questions here, and then we have to end. Uh, for some sins, are we punished in dunya? Yeah. So Allah will punish the believer in this dunya as a means. So all of the sickness that we experience, the adversity that we experience, the difficult the difficulty, the stress, the um, emotional burdens of this dunya, they could be punishment for a wrong that we did. Allah wants to purify us for it. And even if it's not punishment for a wrong, it's actually all our sins are literally falling off of us when we experience these difficulties and then we are purified from them. So we could just be raising in degrees. So yes, um, sometimes we'll do something so wrong that a big tribulation will afflict us and that can also happen. And that's actually a mercy from Allah because he, once he sends you the punishment in this life, we assume, inshallah, there's no punishment in the next life. And so that we always would, you know, we don't want it, but um, that's something we would say. And then there's a question, uh, can I fast shawal and make up the fast miss due to um, menstrual cycle later? Uh, if you miss uh, fast due to um, either menstruation, traveling, and they're far the fast of Ramadan, those are the first fast that one has to make up before they do any sunnah or nafila fast. But some of the scholars permitted combining the intention, so you fast the six days of shawal with the intention that I'm making up the fast of Ramadan and, and this dual intention. But other scholars did not permit that. Um, so it depends on the, the, the madhab. But generally the far the debt that's due must be done before this extra credit is kind of the way to, 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 to think about it. Uh, I think that's those are all the, the questions for now, inshallah.
Um, so yeah, again, next week, last uh, last class for the session, inshallah. Um, and we'll tr we're gonna try at some point in the masjid to do a um, like a Ramadan prep seminar or class or something at some point. So we're discussing that with uh, some folks in the masjid to see who's able to do that. So if that's the case, we'll announce it next week, inshallah. And it'll probably be like right before Ramadan. Um, but it's a good time now. It's about 13 days left before the month of Ramadan begins. Really start getting in the zone, preparing, preparing ourselves logistically, getting everything in, you know, in, in a good place, um, getting ourselves spiritually in the right mindset so that we can um, be, be planned uh, accordingly. And, and for the person who is posting this question, who's asking me to answer it, I don't see the question. So I think it's being blocked uh, by the filter or something like that. So I apologize. We'll get to it next time, inshallah. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil awwalin wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil akhirin wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil malaika ala ila yawm al-din. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanah wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana afrig alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu minal zalimin ya Allah ya Rahman. Ya Rahim ya Fadah ya Mubin ya Arhamar Rahimin. We ask that you bestow your mercy and your gentleness and your love upon us, Ya Allah, and your special mercy and your special gentleness upon the people of Gaza and your special protection, Ya Hafib, upon them and that you provide for them from where they never expected and that you provide food and water and shelter and ease and mercy for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you end this situation, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you end this genocide that is taking place, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we ask that you bestow your mercy and your comprehensive protection upon them and that you give them that, that million times over reward for everything that they are enduring and for all the difficulty and adversity and that you accept all of those who have passed away as shuhada and that you grant himma and strength and resolve and tawakkul and sabr and pour upon them sabr those who are in your way and who are resisting this occupation and those who are doing whatever they can in this situation. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, we ask that you help the Muslims, that you give relief to the Muslims, that you give faraj to the Muslims, that you give guidance to the Muslims, that you give himma to the Muslims, and that you give Muslims victory over the oppressors. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask, Ya Allah, that you allow us to be people of khair and goodness and who people who are people of Jannah and not people of Jahannam, we ask that you protect us from the fire. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you protect us from the fire. We ask that you protect us from the nod and that you that you grant us a comprehensive protection and a protection for us and our parents and our loved ones. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you allow us to implement the teachings of your Quran and of the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And we ask that you allow us to live the most righteous life possible. Fi khair wa lutful afi. And we ask you for our good pleasure, for, for your good pleasure for us and for this entire ummah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that we enter, that we die upon La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and that we enter hand in hand with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into Jannah for those Al-A'la. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And we ask that you bless this remainder of Sha'ban and allow us to reach Ramadan and make it the most blessing, a blessed of months. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Somebody could uh, make the adhan. Can you make that up? Bismillah. Are, are you?